stay tuned for Nero Wolf, who follows transcribed in 30 seconds. Later tonight, over most of these NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way. And on the menu at Duffy's tonight, there's a blue plate special of grilled English language, served up by the delightfully ungrammatical Archie. Plus, laughs garnished with chuckles, brought to you by Archie's remarkable crew. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC. And this Sunday means another broadcast of The Big Show. And your guests include Fred Allen, Douglas Fairbanks, Danny Thomas, and many, many more. Tallulah, of course, is your hostess on The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. Oh. The mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized I... armchair I... is Nero Wolfe. Mr. Wolf, we've got a case. I'm not sure whether somebody's going to kill a rabbit or a rabbit is going to kill somebody, but either way, it's going to be murder. Please, Mr. Wolf, even orchids have to eat. Oy. Yes, sir, Mr. Wolf will take the case. As a matter of fact, he's working on it right now. Money, work, bah. Huh. Greatest detective in the world. Only trouble is, he is. <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Archie is right. Nero Wolf is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight, it's the case Nero Wolf likes to remember as the case of the friendly rabbit. He sometimes prefers his proverb scramble. It began in lots of places. Let's take a look at a few of them. In particular, the richly appointed library of a man named Veek. Mr. Veek, what's happening? Relax, Haynes, your blood pressure... I thought it was a gag, but... You really are shutting the club down. I'm shutting it down. Why? I got the joint roll and the suckers are pouring in. And next week, the governor's committee. Huh? It's moving out of Baylor County. Our joint enterprise is in Baylor County. I think the club needs a rest. Crime committees so rarely admire gambling. Oh, that's different. So it is. The club needs a rest. You need a vacation. Florida, perhaps? I don't like Florida. Pick any place you like, just so long as you get out of reach of a subpoena. The heat's on, huh, boss? You've just coined a phrase that may very well catch on. Get out and stay out of the state until I send for you. Okay, Mr. V. Sure, Mr. V. Marshal? Yeah? That about covers us in Baylor, am I right? Yeah, right. The dear governor's dear committee will be sorely disappointed. However, I doubt it'll give up quite so soon. I wouldn't think so. Therefore, have the truck driver deliver another shipment of carrots to the rabbit farm. Eh, Marshal? Okay, boss. Come in, Williams. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Williams, I'm disturbed. The crime committee, sir? It was doing well, very well. And then... I know, sir. There's a leak. Someone is passing on confidential information. Who? That's the problem. Who? Started three weeks ago. A three-man committee, Wilson, McCarthy, Tolliver. One of them, Williams? I'd stake my life, sir, no. Then who? You've forgotten Collier, committee secretary. You have reason to suspect him? No, nothing that means anything, except... You do suspect him? He's been watched, telephone calls checked, mail. I have no reason to suspect him, except that one thing bothers me. What's that? He has a small farm in Greendale County. He rarely went near the place in all the time he's been up here at the Capitol. But that suddenly changed. Three weeks ago? Yes, sir. He's been staying at the farm for three weeks. Is there anything unusual about that farm? Nothing unusual. Except Jimmy Collier has gone in for raising rabbits. Jimmy. Who is it? Oh, hello, Claire. You've been hiding from me. I... I've been out here with the rabbits. Jimmy, what's wrong? With what? You. There's nothing... You're lying. We grew up together, remember? We lived next to each other, Jimmy. We were going to be married. Hey, wait a minute. We still are, last I heard. You haven't heard recently enough. What does that mean? 
It means we're not getting married. But, Clara... You've been avoiding me. And you've been getting money, lots of money, from someplace. And in a shady way, I feel. All right, you know. So what? I've been concerned about your sudden devotion to these... These rabbits. And the kind of men you've been seeing. What do you mean? Like the one up at the house now, waiting for you. Oh, there's somebody waiting? That's why I came down here after you. I'd better get up there. He's a crook, Jimmy. Look, I... All right. I sort of got myself in a mess. I needed money and... But it's over, Claire. No more. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I wish I could believe you. For your own sake. But I feel I can't. Not anymore. Ah, Jay. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Either stop breathing so heavily or... Take the evening off? Stop breathing. Old Dr. Tidmouse wouldn't approve of that. Who in blue and assorted blazes is old Dr. Tidmouse? My family doctor. May have escaped your puny mind, but you don't have a family. Answer the phone. Oh, but it might be a case. It might be very important. It might mean work, Mr. Wolf. Archie. W-O-R-K. You've got millions in the bank. Why worry? Confound you. Do you want me to answer that phone myself? Now you've got me. No, Mr. Wolf. Couldn't let you knock yourself out lifting a telephone receiver. Near a wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? But wait, Mr. Wolf is to go up to Greendale at... Oh, now, look, friend. Mr. Wolf does not go anywhere, and that includes Greendale. He wouldn't stir out of the house for anybody short of the... Uh, what? I see. Yes, sir, in an hour. Goodbye. Mr. Wolf, brace yourself. You've got an appointment with a Mr. Williams at the Starlight Hotel in Greendale for one hour from now. You're insane. No, I'll admit I've been tempted. Sure, were it not for the fact that often the native view of resolution is sickly to all with a pale cast of thought. Quoting Hamlet will get you no place. I would fire you. And then who would drive you to the Starlight Hotel in Greendale? I'm not going to Greendale. Nevertheless, in an hour, you will be there. And who, may I inquire, Cecil? The governor of the state. Is that all, Mr. Williams? That, Mr. Wolfe, is all anyone knows about the situation. Except the guilty man, of course. An admirably clear summary, Mr. Williams. Obviously, our meeting here at the hotel was necessary. I couldn't be seen entering your house, nor would it have been advisable for you to visit the governor. I can appreciate that. You're quite sure I need pay no attention to anyone on the committee except James Collier? Quite sure. Police surveillance of Collier is deemed unwise. He has suddenly taken interest in rabbits, but although keeping them may perhaps be considered suspicious, it is hardly in itself of value. You have no other evidence against Collier? I know we're clutching at straws, Mr. Wolfe, but there is a leak and work is being nullified. Something must be done. Hence, the governor's call for you. Very well, sir. I shall uh, attempt to be more than uh, a man clutching at a straw. <laughs> I said attempt. Archie, unpack. We shall stay at Greendale near Collier and his rabbits. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Wolf? Oh, naturally, I know that shutting your eyes and pushing your lips in and out indicates you're thinking feverishly, but there's nothing for you to think about. Three. Oh, I accept your correction. What are you thinking about? Hotel beds. They're notoriously flimsy. Oh, you gave up on the case so soon. Fiddlesticks. I already know exactly what role the rabbits play in our problem. Therefore... We're going to drive out to Collier's farm? You are. While you test the hotel beds, fine. It will be necessary for you to spend the night at Collier's place. You will drive out there and pretend you've lost a cylinder or something. <laughs> oh, a lost cylinder. Oh, fine. Confound you, Archie. You can invent something plausible as a pretext. And if you are properly charming, Mr. Collier will, I hope, invite you to stay the night. And during the night I sleep, hmm? Happily breathing the fresh country air. <laughs> Trust not. <laughs> okay, Mr. Wolf, I accept the assignment. I will learn all I can from Mr. Collier's rabbits. Incidentally, remember the play Harvey? I do. Why? Harvey was an invisible rabbit, a figment of a man's imagination. I hope this rabbit venture is more tangible, Mr. Wolf. It is, Mr. Goodwin. Will you desist and depart? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, if anyone calls, just say I've gone out to Greendale to cross-examine a rabbit. Hmm? Ah, Jake. 
I think you're going to be quite surprised. Yes. <laughs> Running out of gas and me such a big boy. Mm. Ah. <gasps> hello. Uh, hello. A tree, a friend of yours? The, the tree? Yeah, the one you're clutching. Oh, I, I was leaning against it. It's an idea, but not a good one. Trees are notoriously skittish. The instant you really need one, they're out sowing wild oaks or something. You sound as if you know a lot about trees. Oh, I do. I was brought up in one. Look, now, if you really have to lean, I can recommend No, thanks. I tried. Nice moonlight we're having. My name is Goodwin, and blondes call me Archie. I'm not blonde. Brunettes call me Archie, too. And what do redheads call you? (laughs) We'll just skip that, huh? And your name is... Claire. Claire. I approve. Now, you may not believe this, but I have just run out of gas. You think I might wangle some up at your house? My house? You mean Jimmy's house. All right, I mean Jimmy's house. Well, I I don't know. He might have some. Now, why don't we go up to the house and ask him? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. Jimmy who? Collier. Uh Uh-huh. I like to be formal when I'm borrowing gas. Would you mind waving your left hand in front of my nose? Waving, Mike? Yes, just try it. Don't worry, I won't bite it. All right. I did. And very gracefully, too. No ring on the third finger. You're not Mrs. Collier. There isn't any Mrs. Collier. Are you applying for the position? Mr. Goodwin, I... Now, remember what I confided in you about brunettes. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Archie, you're a little rapid. Maybe. But I always remember what old Dr. Titmouse said. What did he say? Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. Robert Herrick wrote that. He did? Dr. Titmouse is a liar. How much farther is this house? Well, it's just beyond those trees. I... Oh! What? Uh... Oh, I... There was something ran across the path. It brushed my legs. It frightened me it Must so. have been a rabbit. I... I guess it was. Oh, I'm sorry. That was silly of oh. me. Oh. Don't worry about it. Also, you will have noticed how much more satisfactory I am than a tree. We're clutching at it. Moments of stress, I mean... Archie. Mm-hmm. But you'd better let go now. What I... And we'll get on to the house. See, I don't need a haircut, and you're not the right type for Delilah anyway. You mean something by that. Something nasty. Well, that depends. What I meant is you've already signaled whoever you're supposed to signal. Nothing frightened you back there. Why? That scream had a lot of carrying power. Oh, that's the house, huh? Looks peaceful enough. Archie, I... Who were you supposed to warn if anyone came up the path to the house? Well, no one. Something did frighten Honey, me. Honey, I've I... been lied to by experts, and you're not one. Ah. Oh. Think I ought to knock? No, we don't think I ought to knock. Dark inside. Except for a handful of moonlight filtering in through the windows. Kind of early for Collier to turn in, isn't it? I... Wouldn't know. Let's go find out. (gasps) Now relax, relax. Grandpa's making with the chimes. Time is... Yeah, ten o'clock. It's getting late. Come on. This would be the living room. Filled with early American furniture. The early Americans would be pleased. Nothing here. What's that door lead to? I... I don't know. Or won't tell? Smaller room. Dark as... Come in. Put the beer on it. Oh, you're not the bellboy. I'm sorry. I should have remembered to bring some beer. Indeed, and you are? I'm a fellow guest at this hotel, Mr. Wolf. My name is Veek. Veek, ah, yes. A criminal of moderate intelligence and in moderate pretensions. We won't quarrel, Mr. Wolf. I have something to offer you. You and your boy Goodwin didn't drive up to Greendale for the exercise. I dislike exercise. Shorten's life. James Collier lives nearby. 
The Governor's Committee on Crime is unhappy. There's been a leakage of information. It hasn't helped them in their work. But it has helped you. You wouldn't have left your house in New York on any ordinary job. A request from the governor, however... Shall we stop fencing? Hmm. I don't have to fence with you. The committee's work doesn't particularly bother me. I've already made my arrangements for retiring from active business, shall I say. However, I don't want you messing around in the meantime. Indeed. In your effort to discover how the committee's information leaked out, you might also discover a number of things about me that I prefer to remain undiscovered. No one has employed me to do anything about you, sir? Not directly, but indirectly you might have to. I want to insure myself against any such possibility. I want to make a deal with you. I'm ready to supply you with the name of the man responsible for the leak and papers proving his guilt. I have them here. In return for which you expect... A quick conclusion to your activities and your return to New York, leaving my name out of your reports. I'm neither a public official nor a philanthropist. I should do nothing about you unless it becomes necessary. You may remove your hand from your pocket. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Now then, the name of the man. James Collier. Proof of his guilt? These... A series of reports on the committee's meetings in Collier's handwriting. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. And I hope for your sake that we do not meet again. Phew. Archie, answer the... Oh. Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? I'm at the Collier place. Since it takes only ten minutes to get there, may I congratulate you on your speed? I've been at the Collier place for nearly an hour. Doing what? Oh. Rosebuds. Your uh, delay has been explained. Good night. And for another, I was being around when someone got murdered. Ah, you laid hands on the murderer? No, the room was dark. The time I got Claire untangled from me and started looking for somebody with a gun, he'd left. I see. And the dead man, of course, is James Collier. No, sorry. Found it, it had to be. Who was he? Total stranger. Archie. I'm not being difficult. There was no identification on him. Strange. A description. Early 30s, height maybe 5'10", weight around 175 pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes, a very natty dresser. Suit custom tailored with a built-in shoulder holster. Don Juan shirts. Manicured but very dirty fingernails. And he... Uh Uh-oh. Company. You please? Mm Mm-hmm. Very well, you tell them whatever you think proper, without mentioning the governor's committee, of course. You then bid them farewell and come to the hotel. Can't I say goodbye to Claire, too? You cannot confound you, Archie. Do you think I want to wait up all night? Police were not happy about letting me go, but I threatened to tell you on them, so they gave up. You have told me the entire story of what occurred at the Collier Farm, Archie? Mm Mm-hmm. All details. If you like, I wouldn't mind repeating the parts about Claire. Phooey. You may call it phooey, I call it love. By the way, did you know that it was Robert Herrick who wrote that book? I found you be quiet. Okay, push your lips around, but you've missed something. I have? Mm Mm-hmm. The burning question of the day. Night, brother. Which is? Where is James Collier? Ah. Stop buying. The cops want him on suspicion of murder. The way it shapes up, he shot our unknown pal and then headed for the nearest border. Nonsense. Mean he didn't shoot our unknown pal? I mean, Collier's whereabouts are not a mystery. You know where he is? I know where he is. I don't believe it. You couldn't know. You haven't been out of the hotel. You haven't had any calls. Archie, I use my intelligence. If you had used yours instead of holding the girl... I still wouldn't know where Collier is. Never mind. I'm impressed. What do I do now? You get Mr. Veek on the phone. Huh? He's staying here at the hotel. Oh, old home week. Operator. Mr. Veek, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Veek? Mr. Wolf wants to speak with you. Just a second. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Mr. V, where were you at 10 o'clock? Why, on my way to the hotel. You checked in at... 10.15, and then came directly to your room. One other question. You have an employee, a man in his early 30s, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and well-dressed. Am I correct? Yes, that is Marshall. No, that was Marshall. Good night, sir. Having done that, whatever it meant, we now go to sleep? Hooray, we go to the Collier Farm. Okay, but why? Because, Archie, uh, 
<laughs> the time has come to cross-examine the rabbits. <laughs> Confound you, Archie. You're not driving a truck. Be careful. Truck drivers are careful. Also, they're courteous. Indeed. Furthermore, they will always stop to help a motorist in time of trouble. Archie, are you training to become a truck driver, or have you fallen in love with a truck driver's daughter? Her name is Susie, her hair the color of wheat fields at high noon. Never mind turning purple. I'm about to change the subject. Boss, I have a theory. Stick to truck drivers. As follows. Our boy Collier, who had been selling information to Veek, had a change of heart and decided to turn ethical. But Veek's man, Marshall, at Veek's orders, tried to apply pressure, so Collier shot him and headed for Canada. Uh, and the girl's robe. Must have brightened my life. Uh, oh, you mean about her playing sentry? Well, she's in Veek's employ, too. Sorry. Don't like my theory. It's charming. It merely happens to be wrong. It merely happens to be... Why is it wrong? Because Archie of a dead man's dirty fingernails. Marshall's fingernails. Oh. Well, you made me bring you to the rabbit hutches. We have arrived. There are the rabbits. Go ahead. Cross-examine them. Hmm, good many hutches. A large pen for the rabbits to run about in. Notice that they're all cowering at the far end of the pen, ran as we entered. That's because they don't like us, maybe, huh? <laughs> one of them, however, seems to be friendly. The one up here, in at the corner opposite us. Oh, yeah, there is one here. He's not friendly, Mr. Wolf. Indeed? He's dead. Somebody stole in his skull. Interesting. What's interesting about a dead rabbit? He may be dead now, Archie, but he was friendly. Too friendly. Claire, this is Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, this is Claire. Claire, I'm Archie. Ah, a chair, Archie. A chair. Try this one. Be gentle with it. If you break it, all the early Americans will hate you. It was a... Uh... Steady. Oh, ah. well, now then. Mr. Wolf, I'm dreadfully tired. The police have... Are idiots. What? For example, do they know that you were posted as sentry outside this house in order to warn James Collier of any intrusion? Well, they don't... I wasn't. I... Do they know that James Collier and the dead man Marshall were quarreling? No. Do they know that James Collier had armed himself in preparation for this meeting with the gunman? That isn't true. It I... is true. I don't have to say anything. You've already said more than enough with your actions, my dear. What, what do you mean? According to Archie's report, and Archie is always meticulously accurate, when you and he opened the door of the room in which the murder took place, you screamed at the shots. Well, of course. Any girl would scream with... And then you clung to Archie with sufficient force and for sufficient length of time to prevent him from chasing the murderer. Why? I... Because you had seen and recognized the murderer as the man you loved. It was too dark to see anything. True. Therefore, you didn't have to see the man. You thought you already knew who the killer had to be. That, that's a lie. You're shielding James Collier, aren't you? I'll never admit any of it. Never. May not be necessary. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Get all of that policeman outside and remember what happened to one particular rabbit. Well, uh, look around for freshly dug earth. Midnight. What, what are we waiting for? A return? Archie's? No, it'll take him longer. Well, then who's? <gasps> Mr. Veeks, of course, complete with revolver. Come in, Mr. Veek. It couldn't have been easier. No one outside, only the two of you here. I warned you, Wolf. Fiddlesticks, you merely try to use me as a prop for an alibi and a rationalization for a motive. I don't understand Mr. That. Wolf does. Indeed I do. Did you really think me fool enough to believe your proposal, Mr. Veek? It was plausible. It was nonsense. You pretended you were handling James Collier, plus the proofs of his guilt, over to me in an effort to keep yourself out of the picture. But your proposition was silly. No matter how much I might have wanted to help you, I would have been powerless once James Collier went before a jury. You are too intelligent not to know that. That couldn't have given you enough to go on. It didn't. You yourself gave me more. I did. 
When you came to my room, you told me you knew Mr. Goodwin and I had come to Greendale, checked in at the hotel. I did. However, when I phoned you later and asked for an account of your movements between 10 and 10.30, you replied that you had driven to the hotel, signed in, and came directly to my room. Obviously, you already knew of my presence in the hotel. How? I, uh... Only one way you could have known. You had seen Archie at some time prior to the time you checked in at the hotel. And the only place where Archie was... Was here, at the farm. Yes, which told me Mr. Veek had been here at the time of Marshall's death. What was Veek doing here? Only one thing. Murder. <gasps> then he killed the gunman. No other possibility. But, Jimmy, I thought he did it. James Collier couldn't have killed Marshall because at the time he was killed, James Collier was already... Already dead. Archie! What's this? Me, Mr. Veek? Let's play. I'll drop that gun first. My arm! Oh. That's nice and cooperative, so... He'll be quiet for a while. A cop is back in the rabbit pen, Mr. Wolf, guarding Collier's grave. Grave, Archie? Yeah. With James Collier in it. Oh. Poor Jimmy. Veek knew the expose was coming. He had to shut Collier up. So he had his gunman, Marshall, kill Collier and bury him in the rabbit run back of the hutches. You spotted that, boss, because of... The dead rabbit. The others scurried away from the man who bore James Collier's body to that lonely spot. But one rabbit overcame his fear. He was too friendly. And got killed for it. There was that and... And the dirty fingernails of Marshall, the gunman who killed and buried James Collier. Your description indicated extreme neatness. The dirty fingernails were a wrong note. Yeah, indicated he'd been digging. So we know now, don't we? Veek killed his own trigger man to frame a dead man for it. Collier would be thought guilty. He'd be hunted among the living. And all the while... Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Claire. It's all right, Archie. I didn't love Jimmy. That was all washed up. Mr. Wolf, I understand everything, except why did Jimmy suddenly start staying at the farm with the rabbits? He knew he'd be watched. He couldn't risk conveying his information by telephone or the mails. Nor could he be seen holding conversation with men who might be traced to Veek. But who would suspect a truck driver delivering carrots for the rabbits as being the go-between for Jimmy Collier and Veek? Nero Wolf. Which is why I hope there's an adequate bed in this house for Mr. Wolf. I'm sure I'll be able to find one. Splendid, Archie. You will have the police remove Mr. Veek and then... And then maybe Claire would like to uh, go gathering rosebuds, huh? By moonlight? I would like to. Truly. I shall go up to bed now. I've seen the moonlight more times than I care to remember. However, while you and Miss Claire stroll through the moonlight, Archie... Yeah? You might remember that rosebuds have thorns. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Martha Shaw, Hal Gerard, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Impolite Corpse. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial on this NBC station this evening as Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his remarkable friends serve up another blue plate special of grilled English language, fresh laughs and whimsy a la mode. Another Friday fun favorite is the delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as the beleaguered Chester A. Riley. Now it's Sam Spade. Then, the magnificent Montague on NBC.
Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? You're expecting Mr. Wolf at your place in three hours? Your place is where? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm expecting Hetty Lamar in 15 minutes. Yeah, but, mister, we're both out of luck. <laughs> Archie, what are you babbling about? Yeah, there's a character on the phone who's laboring under the naive delusion that you're about to make a trip upstate. His name? Finley, he said. In that case, he's quite correct. Yeah, he's quite the, uh... uh... Yes, Mr. Finley, Mr. Wolf will be there. Yeah, goodbye. I should need some beer, Archie. The bottle opener's in the right-hand drawer. Thank you. What one of us needs is a psychiatrist. You're voluntarily leaving your happy home, exposing yourself to the elements, entrusting your only life to a savage automobile? I am. Oh, oh, oh. somebody's offered you the United States Treasury, huh? Mr. Finley happens to grow orchids. Among them, he has developed a plant possessing spurred labili. I have an opportunity to purchase a couple of the plants, therefore... I don't believe it. But Archie, according to the reports I have received, he has produced a strain of black cypripidium. Oh, well, in that case. <laughs> but, Mr. Wolf, while it's true that black may be the color of your true love's hair, it is also true that black is the color of funerals. It's the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. The beginning of the case of the Phantom Fingers actually had nothing to do with black orchids. The first act was played in an old house at the end of an old dirt road. It was short and simple. As short as life. And as simple as murder. Joe, I didn't believe the letters I got. Didn't believe them until now. I've been a lonely man. No wife, no children. Joe, it was all coming to you after I died. There was no need for you to steal from me. All you had to do was wait. Joe, that gun. Put it down. No. 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 Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. How much longer? Oh, an hour, maybe. Why? I'm a fool. Yeah, well, payday's tomorrow. I refuse to agree with you. <laughs> Besides, the trip's been fine so far, huh? So there's snow on the road, but... Uh, Fooey. Well, it's nice snow. Pretty soon it'll be spring, and in the spring... If you mention old Tidmas once more, I shall strangle you. Uh, no, no, it's against the law. But you know, if that snow melts much faster, the trees won't look so pretty. Trees? Are they really necessary? Uh-huh. People cut them down and make paper out of them. And they take the paper and make dollar bills. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, we're surrounded by future fees. I prefer the finished product. What on earth is that? Sounds like a river. Indeed. Except there aren't any rivers around here. Hey! Yeah? Up ahead. What? Huh? It's a river. Only it isn't a river. It's wet. It's wet and it's got waves on it. Had to start raining, too. Nature. Fui. road behind us is covered with water. We just have to keep going onward and upward. Would you like to recite Excelsior to me? Why, sure. Shades of night were falling fast when through an alpine village passed... An idiot of your caliber, no doubt. Oh. <sighs> An infernal engine has died. No, no, the road dips up ahead. And where it dips, there's a junior Mississippi growing up. Splendid. Not so splendid. We can't go back and we can't go forward. Why not? They didn't build this model to swim. No foresight. What do we do now? Well, we could abandon the car and, uh... Walk, are you mad? Are you seriously suggesting I indulge in a foot race with the flood? Yeah, well, not seriously, but, uh... Oh, you've decided to give the car a swimming lesson? No. There's what looks like a cow path leading off the highway. To your right. Maybe it's a road. 
We progress. We now follow the footstep of the cow. Ah, it is a road. An old dirt road. Not only that, it goes up. Is that good? Theoretically. We might get above the water that way. And if the theory fails? Mr. Wolf, how are you on the Australian crawl? Hey, there's been another car on this road before us. You can see the tire tracks in the mud. Interesting. An indication that there are other maniacs about. I myself would not have chosen this particular spot to picnic in. That's well, not that. There's somebody lying on the road. People have peculiar habits. Ignore him and drive on. Uh-uh. Hold on a moment. Mr. Wolf, you better come out here. My man is, has its limits. The answer is no. It's serious, Archie? Very serious. Oh, very well. Good uh, heavens. Uh, uh, yeah, still alive, but... Uh, the man's being shot. He's mumbling. Uh, Joe. Uh, He's Joe. yelling for Joe. Be still. Uh, don't forgive stealing. Uh, don't. Uh, uh, uh. So much for that. Pick him up, Archie. Put him in the car. Might be bad for him to be moved. No. There is nothing that can be bad for him. He's dead. Is this blasted road leading anywhere, Archie? Well, seems to be a clearing up ahead. Maybe... Hey, it's a house. Splendid. I'm not so sure. It's perched up on top of a cliff, surrounded on three sides by nothing. On the side facing us, there's a deep ravine and a small wooden bridge. An island in the air. Hmm. Yeah. High enough to keep above water, maybe, but... Now, that bridge doesn't look too good. Rain may have weakened it. I have no choice, Archie. I have no intention of being drowned in these barbaric surroundings. The bridge, Archie. Okay. Hold on. No, the thing's collapsing under us. Our momentum, sir. Well, if it doesn't, 37 blondes are going to be wearing black. Correction, 38. I forgot the one in Gimbel's bargain basement. Hey, we made it. The bridge will never be the same, though. There's a car ahead of us in front of the house. The car from which our friend, our dead friend, was thrown. Only one set of car tracks in the mud along the road, and here... And all we have to do is walk in, ask for the owner of the house, and, uh... Possibly, and possibly not. Archie, go through the corpse's pockets. Oh, that's not cricket. Yeah, all right, all right, I'm going through. There's not much on him. Handkerchief, silver, driver's license... The name was, uh, James Miller. Address, Garner Lane. Walden. Now I've got an idea this is Garner Lane, Mr. Wolf. In which case, someone named Joe was looking after the house for him, committed theft, and murdered Miller. Miller's body was then dumped on the road in the hopes that the floods would wash the body away. No one at the house seems to have noticed our arrival. Nope. Well, let's go in and ask for Joe, huh? Very well. Uh, oh. Uh, mm. uh, hard. With the bridge down, there's absolutely no way of getting on or off this place. Except for a mountain goat. I don't know any mountain goats. <laughs> I used to know a plain goat once, though. Indeed. He ran at the fifth at Jamaica. Stop mourning. I never mourned her. Also, I never win bets on horse races. <laughs> That's why I continue to work for you. That is also why you had better ring the doorbell. Okay, okay. Nobody's going to break a leg rushing to open the door. I suppose you try it. I have had more than enough of the weather. Is that polite? Besides, the killer may have some more bullets in that gun. Are you afraid? Sure. Fooey, the door, Archie. But old Dr. Tidmouse would say... Well, oh, never mind. Mm. Hey, somebody was careless leaving the door open like that. On the other hand, does a spider ever shut its web? The answer is no. Are we flies? Yes. Out of my way, Archie. There are lights up ahead. Must be the living room. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, sure, sure, your excuse. Uh, 
Do you live here, sir? Do we... No, don't you? Of course not. This is very strange. I came out to see the people who live here. Or the person. I found the door open and no one about. I've been sitting in this corner now for a long time. Well, it's a pity no one offered you a plum pie. Then you could have stuck in your thumb. You saw no one enter, sir? Uh, no one at all. I didn't want to go any further. It would have seemed like prying. Perhaps you had better come along with us. Well, uh, all right. You know, this place, it has an evil atmosphere. It certainly has. What it needs is fresh air. Hooey. This would be the living room door. A job. It. it is. Looks as pretty as a picture. Have you... Oh. Hello. Well, just think of it. Five minutes ago, you know, I didn't know you existed. And you didn't know I existed. And now... Archie, uh... your existence would have a sudden end unless you keep quiet. Uh... Excuse us for intruding, Miss... Intruding? Uh... Oh, but I really should ask you to excuse me. You do not live here? I wish I did, but... You see, I've been out walking. I live maybe a whole mile from here, and then when the flood began, I, I thought I'd come in here and stay for a while. And you found? An empty house. That's not what I found. <laughs> As old Dr. Tidmouse has often said... Go through the rest of the house, Archie. Go through the rest... Yeah, well, never mind. I'll, uh... What's on? Somebody's walking. Coming downstairs. I'll go and see. Hey, you! Hey, hey. Come on into the living room. Meet your guests in one or several pieces as you prefer. You what? Oh. Hiya, folks. Ah, a host at last. That's very funny. I think I'll laugh. Uh, uh. May I ask why? Because this here ain't my dump. I was just casing the joint. I mean, I was just taking a stroll. Through the house? I'm eccentric. Oh, clever. However, I think you'd better stay. Why? Because you may turn out to be the owner of this house after all. I rather think introductions are in order. Well, I'm Peg Shirley. Uh, my name is Wagner. Joseph Wagner? Uh, Lewis. How about you, Stroller? Cregan. Sam Cregan. Hmm. Peg, Louis, Sam. Mr. Cregan, while you were strolling upstairs, did you notice anyone else about? No. There was no one outside when Archie and I entered. The bridge is down, effectively cutting us off from further visitors. We may assume, therefore, that we are the only people in not about this house. Yeah, it's cozy, ain't it? Which further means that one of you three is a murderer. Am I? Am I? Oh, what what are you saying? The murderer is the person who owns or lives in this house. All three of you denied being that person. Conclusion, one of you is a liar. Well, well, I, I, that. How dare I hardly expected a full immediate confession. However, we are absolutely isolated here. No one is going to come or leave until we have our killer. You know, you can't really keep us here. The flood can and will. Remember, the bridge is no longer. So you see, just the five of us alone. No one else inside the house, no one outside. Therefore... <laughs> Correction, Mr. Wolf. Maybe it's a branch or something tapping against the door. Unlikely. Archie. Okay, I'll go see who or what it is. Oh, hey. Yeah. Oh, oh, what the what? What? I got him. Somebody shut the door. Yeah, all right, I get it. A disreputable and unwashed gentleman. Head badly hurt. Is he conscious, Archie? Yeah, I don't know. He's mumbling something. Legs pushed off. Fell from the leg. He's passed out. I guess he was trying to say that somebody pushed him out on a ledge. On the side of the cliff, maybe. He must have regained consciousness and crawled to the house. Where'll I put him, Mr. Wolf? Bedroom, I suppose. Well, you need first aid. We can't get a doctor. Cregan, where are the bedrooms? Yeah, one right up at the head of the stairs. And don't ask me how I happen to know. We shan't. Okay. Okay. I'll need somebody to help me carry him up without shaking him too badly. Cregan? Okay. Uh, let's go. As for the rest of you, Mr. Wagner, Miss Shirley, I suggest we return to the living room. But I don't see any reason why we should take orders from you. One of you is a murderer. I include Mr. Cregan, of course. Oh, but that poor man wasn't dead. Not for lack of trying. However, I was not referring to him. You mean... You mean someone else has been killed? Precisely. That is why I hope we should not hear another knocking at the door. He... Could only be a corpse. Archie, 
Dodgy. And Cregan. Yeah. And the injured man? Still out. Probably got a concussion. Uh, did he say anything further? Well, he babbled a bit. I don't know if... Uh, we should assume we're among friends, Archie. Exactly what did he say? Well, he was pushed over the edge of the cliff because he saw Miller killed. Ah, did he also see who? No, passed out before he had a chance. He's an old tramp, Mr. Wolf. He was bumming his way through the country when he saw the murder. He must have decided on a touch of blackmail and receiving a concussion instead, which may last for hours or for days. <gasps> Somebody's playing with the lights. Some fool. Yeah, the switch was over this way. Ah. Yeah, the lights are on again. Whose idea was that? Well, I had nothing to do with this. Me neither. Miss Shirley, why did you scream? Oh, well... Someone brushed against me in the, in the darkness. You were standing? Uh, near the table, this table. Archie? No, nothing on the table except a bunch of keys on a ring. Eh, hey, something screwy. Why should a guy put the lights out just to deposit a bunch of keys on a table? Obvious. Without doubt, those are the keys of this house. Possession of them would have disclosed which of you lives here and which of you therefore killed Miller. It's late. I shall sleep down here, lacking an elevator to transport me upstairs. The elevator's lacking. Yes, the rest of you should be able to find bedrooms upstairs. Good night. Good night. Archie. Yeah? Follow them upstairs. Spend the night awake. Okay. Good heavens, Archie. On my way. What's cooking up here? Yeah, somebody's playing with the lights up Strike a match. You don't have to. I got a flashlight. Oh, yeah. oh, here it is. Light switch. You know, this putting out of lights is getting to be somebody's bad habit. Well, all three of you seem to be okay. Stay here. Where, right. where are you going? Tramp's room, right here at the head of the stairs. Think of all your good deeds while I'm gone. All right, downstairs again. What again? Oh, oh dear. What happened? Well, it was more than a bunch of keys this time. Oh, that knife. There's blood on it. There should be. I just pulled it out of a man's heart. Well, Mr. Wolf, one of these three babies doused the lights, popped into the tramp's room, deposited the knife in his chest, and popped right out again. The knife you're holding? Yeah. Intelligent of you to wrap a handkerchief around the handle. Well, whoever killed the tramp didn't have time to fool around with gloves, so... There should be prints on the knife handle. Satisfactory, Archie. That's mild enthusiasm. Archie, on that desk, an ink pad. Yeah. Miss Shirley, mm -hmm. you carry face powder, of course? Yes, I do. Archie will need it to bring out the prints on the knife. He will then fingerprint each of you. Compare your prints with those on the knife, and we shall have a murderer to hand over to the police. Archie, will you begin, please? Here they are, Mr. Wolf. Three cards labeled with Miss Shirley's name, Cregan's, and Wagner's. Their respective prints are on each card. Good. I have the knife here. Several quite distinct prints on it. It should be child's play to, uh... Hmm. Archie. Yeah? Take your own prints and mine. What? Do as I say quickly. Yes, sir. All right, give me your thumb. Thank you. Ah, that's it. Now mine. Thank me. Ah, that's it. There's something wrong. Something wrong and deadly loose in this house tonight. Well, there's a card with your prints in mine. Thank you. <clears throat> now you got five cards all together. So I have. Uh, Archie. What now? Take the ink pad and a fresh card with you. Where am I going with them? Upstairs. But, Mr. Wolf, there's nobody upstairs except the corpse. Precisely. It is his prints I want. <laughs> Oh, this is so oh, ridiculous. I'm over with. Archie? Yeah, I got the dead man's prints. Will all of you please sit? All right, but it's... Good heavens, young woman. Be careful. We want no accidents. I'm sorry, I caught my high heels in the rug. Archie, the card with the corpse's prints on it. Hey, yes, sir. Thank you. Mm. You know, I've had quite enough of this nonsense. Have you, Mr. Wagner? Yes, yeah, so have I, Mr. Wolf. Also, I don't think you know what you're doing. Perhaps not. However, I have something rather interesting to tell all of you. There is no one in this house besides yourselves, except, of course, for the dead man upstairs. There is no one on the rock on which this house stands, except for another dead man in our car. Look, we already know all that. Bear with me. We may rule out secret passages, unusual hiding places... 
or anything of that esoteric and childish nature, we may also rest assured that no one has come to or left this house or rock within the last few hours. Well, that means we're kind of hermetically sealed here, huh? Meaning also that whoever was here when the tramp was killed is still here. Still here in this room. Great, Gargi. Now then, I have checked the dead tramp's prints against those on the knife. Theoretically, suicide was possible. However, the prints do not match. That guy was in no condition to kill himself anyway. True. Then I checked Archie's prints and mine against those on the knife. No similarity. Oh, but no one suspected either of you. Thank you, but I had to be thorough. That left only the three of you. I compared your cards and the prints on them with the prints on the handle of the knife. And? I want you to remember one thing very clearly. We're the only living people in this house or on this rock of land. No tricks are possible and may be ruled out. All right, so what? This. The prints on the handle of the knife that pierced the heart of the man upstairs do not match his prints or... The prince of anyone in this room. Yeah, oh, no, well, mine wouldn't match. Would you mind saying that again? He doesn't have to. In those cards, Mr. Wolf has the prince of everybody here. And yet none of them match the prince on the knife handle. But, well, in that case, who or, or what killed him? Why, there must be someone else in the house. I give you my word, there is not. Hey, you thinking about ghosts or something? Ghosts never leave fingerprints. I... I, I've got to get away. I can't stand this. Me too. Come on, lady. But I, I'll come along with you, if you don't mind. Mr. Wolf. Let them go. The bridge is down. They can't get far. Okay. I don't get it. Get what? Well, the fingerprint business. And who killed Miller, plus the tramp? The identity of the killer, Archie, is quite obvious. It is? To who? To whom? Who's whom? <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah, I'm stalling for self-respect. You know? Uh, of course I do. I have no conclusive proof, however. I had hoped the fingerprints would be of assistance there, but they proved to be phantoms. I'm still smarting about the other thing. You know, it's at times like this that I almost agree with you about my intelligence. Lack of intelligence? Yeah, well, don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. Just go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe you better rub it in. From now on, you may refer to my brain in the negative. In the negative? Bless you, Archie. What I've just done, I don't know, but can I have a raise? No. I'll take it back. You can't. Get the others in at once. Mr. Wolf, you now have the appearance of Mr. Wolf being surrounded by several dozen bottles of beer. What have I done? You've explained the fingerprints, Archie. Hurry. I don't want to keep the killer in suspense. I'm very nervous. I don't like this. Archie. They're all here. Yes, but they're all making a noise. Stop them. Miss Shirley, Mr. Craig, and Mr. Wagner, will you please shut? Uh, uh, Mr. Wolf, they have. Thank you, Archie. Now then, I have known for some little time which of you killed the tramp and Miller. I lack proof, however. And you... you have it now? I will admit for a while I was flummoxed by the negative evidence of the fingerprints. They seem to indicate that the tramp was murdered by a phantom. However, the word negative itself has solved the minor problem. Minor to who? To whom? Never mind. Shh. Archie, what is the salient feature of a film negative? Well, I suppose it's the fact that the darks are light and the lights are dark. Huh? Precisely. A reversal, then, of the actual appearances. Now, are there any similarities between filmed images and fingerprints? Oh, in a way... You could call the whorls and hollows that determine the individual characteristics of a fingerprint the lights and darks, huh? You could. I shall. Miss Shirley, yes. would you help in an experiment? Well, of course. Thank you. Archie, I want you to take Miss Shirley's fingerprints once again. Okay. Pad and card. Here you are, Miss Shirley. All right. Archie, quick. Huh? Grab her arm. I, I got it. Well, Usually I don't have to be coached, but... Let go of me. What are you trying to do? Miss Shirley... You already had pressed your fingers on the ink pad once. Why were you about to do it a second time? Well, I... I just wanted to make a better impression. Truly. Archie, wipe some of the ink off her fingers. Oh, but then it won't be any good. It'll be very good, Archie. I've well, done it. And take the print. No. No, let go of me. Maybe I never hurt women if I can help it, but right now I won't be able to help it. Mr. Wolf wants your prints all over again, so down on the nice white card. No. Hey, thanks. Will you let me have that card now, Archie? Sure. 
In the meanwhile, hold on to Miss Shirley. A pleasure. Indeed? Would you continue to think so, Archie, if I told you that Miss Shirley's first name is not Peg, but it happens to be Josephine, for which the diminutive is Joe? Glad they're fixing the bridge. I was beginning to think we'd be here forever. Truly, we have been. <laughs> you know, if those black orchids have been holding their breath waiting for you, they're going to be red in the face. Hey, hey new breed, red orchids, huh? Ah, uh, gee, must you talk? Well, it's fun. Also, you've been holding out on me about the case. I surrender. Okay. You know, when we compared the new prints of Josephine with those on the knife, you could have knocked me over with a sash weight. They were identical. Naturally, she stabbed the tramp. Yeah, but what was the fingerprint gag? She merely loaded her fingers so heavily with ink that she falsified the markings. She filled up the hollows and walls with ink. The result was that ridges became hollows and vice versa, in the same fashion that a photographic negative falsifies lights and darks. You got that when I mentioned the word negative? It works, huh? Try it sometime. Yeah, the very next bank I rob. <laughs> but you said you knew who killed Miller and the tramp even before you exposed the fingerprint gimmick. How? We knew Miller's murderer lived in this house. Had been stealing from him and so on. Uh -huh. Stealing what? Cash, of course. He, as the girl admitted, was an eccentric, kept his money on the property. Cregan had probably heard of it, hence his casing of the house. Yeah? Our problem, therefore, was to discover who lived in this house. All three suspects denied it. Josephine Shirley told us, as you may remember, that she'd gone for a walk and then been driven by the flood to this house where we found her. Well, that's what she said. It could have been. No. Because, as you may also remember... She tripped at one point over the living room rug and mentioned why? Sure. Sure, she said she was wearing high heels. Uh-oh, because out in the country there are no pavements, so girls don't go for walk in high heel shoes. Therefore, she hadn't gone for a walk. Therefore, she was lying. Therefore, she killed Miller and... <laughs> I should have noticed those heels myself. You should have, Archie. Your trouble, I suspect, was that uh, you didn't notice the feet for the legs. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and G.G. Pearson, Howard McNear, Tim Graham, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Vanishing Shells. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? No, he isn't. Huh? Oh, well, for you, maybe he is. I'm not here. Oh, yes, yeah. He's always here. I've gone out. No, no. He seldom ever goes out. I won't start on anything tonight. Oh, sure. He'd love to start on a case tonight. What's your name? Oh, that's a beautiful name. Address? Archie, it's another woman. Hang up. No, no, no. Honest, I'm not Mr. Wolf, but I'm his agent. Yeah, I'll be right over, miss. Goodbye. What's her trouble? Where are you going? Well, she said she's received some threatening notes and she's afraid to leave her hotel. So long, boss. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. 
Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> to call tonight's story The Case of the Vanishing Shells. It didn't seem to be difficult at first, but, well, I'm not a stupid individual, but so often, ooh, so often, I allow myself to become mesmerized by beautiful women. <laughs> Heaven bless them. Doris Murray was such a woman. She phoned us first late one afternoon about 5 o'clock, then again at 5.30. Very well, Mr. Goodwin, but I, I would prefer to see Mr. Wolf. Well, I said I'd be there at 6, Miss Murray. I don't want to talk any longer on the phone. Please hurry. There, there's someone at the door. I'll see you in the cocktail lounge at your hotel. At six o'clock. That's half an hour. Don't fail. Who is it? Emil Stoner. Oh, come in, Emil. You got my call, darling. Here, let me take your briefcase. I, I, I'll just put it here on the piano, Doris. Oh, I'm terribly upset about those threatening notes, darling. I, I know it's upset you, too, but I'm determined to find out who it is. I'm not going to let them bluff me out of my first chance to play the star part in one of your shows. But look, Doris, there's that other part. Other? Is that all I mean to you? Well, what can they divulge that'll harm us? What? Several things. And I can't afford... A, I mean at this time... You're frightened, Emil. Doris, I'm going to give the star part to Paula. Paula! You've been divorced for four years. Why? Because I feel she can... Can play it better. Is that what you're going to say? Well, I can act rings around her. Now, 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 look, Doris. I know it's a big disappointment to you, but that's the way it is. Get out. Get out. Go on across the hall to Paula. Give her the part. Louse up your show. She and that playwright of hers. Get out, Emil. But, Doris... You frightened little... Get out! <laughs> I believe, Mr. Wolf, you're making a great mistake in not coming along. Indeed. I'm sure that what attracts you could not possibly be of interest to me. A gal needs help. Money is money. Girls, money, fooey. Yeah, well, we could have dinner out for a change. They have one of the finest chefs in town at that hotel. You're most impolite. I'm trying to read this book. Poetry. Archie. Uh, yes, sir? Shut up. Uh, yes. But we need money. That filthy green cabbage is necessary to our existence. This may be a tough case, you know. I... You're sufficiently intelligent. Sometimes. Mm. If I sat around like you do, I'd weigh 500 pounds, too. How'd you leave the room besides it's only 300? What a way to run a business. Orchids, beer, books. <laughs> Don't keep the charming kind waiting. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. And always remember, that is a telephone. <laughs> Thank you, waiter. <clears throat> oh, good evening, Miss Moray. I'm Archie Goodwin. Well, I didn't expect... Uh, I mean, please sit down. Well, I think I should explain the absence of Nero Wolf. <laughs> there's, uh, there's so much of him that it's not too convenient to transport it about. I do all the outside work. And I'm sure you do it well. Mr. Well, you know, some women call me Goodwin and some call me Mr. Goodwin, and uh, yes. uh, the unattached call me Archie. Hello, Archie. Oh, splendid. I'm glad to hear it. Now we can get right down to the nasty old business that's troubling you, Doris. First, here's the 500 retainer fee. Well, oh, thank you. Now, what's the note about? Well, there are two notes, both printed by hand. Uh huh. Oh, will you hand me my purse, please? Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh. I see. Doris Moray. If you fail to withdraw from the cast of Stoner's next production by start of rehearsals Monday, both you and Stoner will have a blasted reputation and perhaps other injuries from which you will be unable to recover. The other one is like it, only more vehement. Yeah, someone or a group of someones are intent on keeping you out of Stoner's shows, huh? It's too bad. His next one is said to be a sure smash hit and a star-making part for the leading woman. Yes, Amos Stoner wants me to play it. He's been planning on it ever since David Banning wrote the play. What does David Banning think of you playing the part? Well, I... I don't think he's too enthused about it. You see, Mr. Stoner and Paula Kenyon have been divorced for four years, but she has continued to be his top leading woman. 
Now she's engaged to David Banning, who wrote this play. Oh? Makes things a bit difficult. Well, of course, Rick Hunter, Stoner's director, is... Hunter is somewhat in favor of your playing the part. Well, Rick Hunter is very fond of my work. And very fond of you as well, huh? Yes, unfortunately. I... I like Rick Hunter tremendously, but... Amos Stoner has been of greater interest to me. In fact, we're more or less engaged, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, had any words lately with the ex-Mrs. Stoner? Paula Canyon, is that her name? Paula and I were great friends when I first joined the Stoner Productions, but... I don't know, she... I, I don't think she appreciated the fact that Mr. Stoner and Rick Hunter, the director, took such an interest in me. Tell me, did you ever think you were in love with Rick Hunter? Yes, at first I was thrilled by his artistic imagination. And then as time went on, I realized that he was subject to melancholia. Mr. Stoner was more stable, and I needed someone older to advise me. Well, what's wrong with your reputation of Mr. Stoner's? Well, there's nothing I fear, but I'm afraid Mr. Stoner is somewhat disturbed by these threats. He... He feels there's something in his past of sufficient import to really harm him. I think it's nonsense. Well, then what we have to do is uncover this person or persons before you end up with ruined careers on Broadway. Where does the ex-Mrs. Stoner live? Well, as a matter of fact, she lives just down the hall from me. Lived here for years. Oh, well, I think it's advisable, honey, that you stay close to your room until we solve this thing. Oh, but I'm not afraid for my life, Archie. No? Well, I am. I'll see you into your room, Doris. Oh, now, please, Mr. Goodwin, if oh, you... Oh, you don't trust the boy, huh? Oh, well, I... Such beautiful eyes. Oh, I... Lovely red hair. Yeah. You could have the lead in my new play. I never wrote one, but for you, I'll try anything. Come along. Here's your bag. Well, hello, Doris. Oh, hello, Rick. Mr. Goodwin, this is Rick Hunter. Hiya, Hunter. Nice shows you've been putting on. I've just been admiring your work, Goodwin. Oh, well, that's nice. I'm glad. Nothing like encouragement for a beginner, Mr. Hunter. You're ready for the big time from what I saw. Heard from Emil Stoner today, Doris? I talked to him once this morning. Uh, have you been sitting in the cocktail lounge all afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> that I have, honey. I want to see you play that lead, baby. And I think I just about got it all settled. Dreaming about it won't settle it. Like I never accomplished anything in itself, Rick. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. He's a very jealous man, Doris. In fact, right now, I can feel his thoughts piercing me between the shoulder blades. <laughs> oh, excuse me, here's a phone. Call. Yes, Archie? How do you know it's Archie? I felt the time was exactly right for you to call. I wish you felt it was time to earn some money. Is this a worthwhile case? Well, she's a beautiful redhead, and, uh... And that, of course, makes it very worthwhile. Yeah, well, I got 500 as a retainer. Fooey, a pittance, and probably all you'll ever get. What do you mean by that? She's probably guilty. Now, look, boss, she's the victim. Received notes threatening her reputation and her health if she plays the star part in Emil Stoner's new production. Also, they threaten Emil Stoner, likewise. The playwright, Dave Banning, is engaged to Paula Kenyon. Incidentally, she lives here at the hotel, too, just down the hall from Doris. I remember her. And the playwright wants Paula Kenyon to play the part. Well, Archie, you have only the beginning. It is probably too late to prevent whatever is going to happen. Like what, for instance? Have you found a body yet? Call me after you find the body. What body? There's no body. But there will be, Archie. There's always a body where you are concerned. Either a body beautiful or a dead one. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for seeing me to my room, Archie. Oh, I'm not stopping here, Doris. I'll take a look inside. But I'm not... Oh, I insist. Part of my job, you know. If I fail to take every precaution, Mr. Wolf would never... Well, look in that chair. Emil. Emil? Emil Stoner? Uh, uh, oh, three red dots on his shirt front. Uh, uh, Doris, Doris, hold on. I, I'm all right. Yes, I, I'm all right. All right, sit down. That's it. Uh, now, let's see. The body's still warm. What's this crumpled in his left hand? A horoscope. Between the fingers of his right hand, an unlit cigarette. My grand PK. Paula Kenyon. This horoscope is from March. Something he picked up from your desk here? I don't believe in astrology. Where'd he get this cigarette with Paula Kenyon's monogram? Oh, poor Abel. Poor Abel. I didn't believe anyone would really harm us. Why was I so stubborn? When did you see him last? Please, shouldn't we do something? Call the police? No, 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 not yet. 
When did you see him? Why, I, I saw him this morning. I, I'm so shocked I can hardly think clearly. Doris. <sighs> yes? There's a briefcase here on the piano with a newspaper on top of it. What? Oh, it, it is, yes. It's, it's Amos. He, he must have left it here this morning. That's strange. Emil Stoner was bald, but... But what? Well, I'm sure he's a man who always wore a hat, but I see no hat. He must have come up the elevator as I went down to meet you. Who would know he'd come up here? Your director, Rick Hunter, he said he'd been in a bar all afternoon. What else was it he said? Thought he had everything just about settled. Oh, no, Rick couldn't. He just... Oh, Mr. Goodwin, I, I couldn't believe that. I can believe anything about anybody. I learned that the hard way. In my book, everybody's guilty until proved otherwise. Even you, baby. What? Even you. Yeah. A Herald Tribune newspaper. Are you sure you haven't seen him since this morning, Doris? What are you doing? Absolutely nothing. Someone came in here and shot him. Called the police. I insist. Maybe. What? Maybe I did leave my door unlocked. Why did I do that? Well, they couldn't have opened the door otherwise, could he? No. Give me the check room, please. Oh, hello. Did you, uh, do you know Mr. Emil Stoner, the producer? You do? Well, uh, tell me, did he check his hat with you this afternoon or this evening? He didn't, huh? All right, thanks. He must have carried it up here to this floor. Doris, do you have a gun? I own a gun. A small twenty-five automatic. But it's not here. Where is it? I had the handle repaired, and it's been in my dressing room for a week or two. I hate to do this, Doris, but I'm going to move the body away from the back of that chair. Oh. There. Yeah, three wounds. One bullet went through the upper part of the chest, out the middle of the back. I'd say right through the heart. By the angle of the wound, he was shot while sitting down. Please, Mr. Goodwin, must we stay here? I, I want to I give must... this room a thorough going over. We'll go down to the lobby. I want to use that phone booth again. And, Doris, I hope... I know what you're going to say. You hope that gun of mine... Is still in your dressing room at the theater. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh, Mr. Wolf, may I have your autograph? <laughs> I'm taking a correspondence course on how to be a detective, and I think you're a wizard. <laughs> so kind of you to say so. I would be just thrilled to have your autograph on the bottom of a paycheck. Why are you calling from a phone booth? What? Who said I was? It's obvious. There's no room tone reverberation. Uh, oh. Well, you shouldn't have to ask. You know everything before it happened. You found the body then. Happened just before you got there. Oh, now, look. I took the girl up to a room to be sure it was safe for her to go in, and... <laughs> okay, okay. And there, sitting in a big leather chair, was Emil Stoner. Shot three times with a small caliber gun, dead about an hour. One shot went through the body from the upper part of the chest to the middle of the back. Therefore, he was shot while sitting down. The killer was standing, huh? I'm listening. Oh. Well, his left hand was clutching a horoscope folder, and between the index and second finger of the right hand was an unlit cigarette with a monogram on it, P.K. Emil Stoner is bald, but there was no hat in the room. However, on the piano was his briefcase, and on top of it... A four o'clock afternoon edition of the Herald Tribune. Better look in the briefcase, Archie. No weapon? No, no weapon. But Doris Murray says she owns a twenty-five caliber automatic, and it's in her dressing room at the theater. Also, she claims she hadn't seen Stoner since this morning. You found no empty shells about the floor? None. What did you do with the bullet? What bullet? The one which passed through his chest and lodged in the back of the leather chair. Are you there? Boss. Stupid fella. Stop bragging. The bullet. Boss, there ain't no hole in the back of that chair. I just realized it. Maybe he was standing up. Ah, then the killer must have been on stilts. Archie, let us pretend, only pretend, that you're very observant. Now proceed to Paula Kenyon's apartment, just down the hall, you said, and see what she knows without divulging the fact that Stoner is dead and look sharp. My gears must be slipping. Archie, do you know what great event will be celebrated tomorrow? Yeah, my birthday. What'd you get me? Cuthbert's Correspondence Detective Course in Four Easy Lessons. Bye. This is Paul's apartment. No 
right, so let's see if it's open. Ah, there's no one in sight. Come on in. Now, look, if anyone walks in on us, we found the door open and we just came in to wait. Which is the truth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ah, here on the desk we have a stack of horoscope stars and a box of Paula's monogrammed cigarettes. Mr. Goodwin. Huh? This is Emil's grave fedora hat. And he was in this apartment this afternoon. What are you staring at? Oh, small pearl-handled automatic. Yes. Twenty-five caliber. Yeah, it's been fired very recently. We won't touch it now. Does it look like yours? Archie, it is mine. Yeah. Your initials? I found old Jenkins, the stage doorman at the theater, to look in my dressing room. And, well, my gun isn't there. Did you leave the gun out in plain view in the dressing room? Yes, for several days anyway. Then I put it behind the mirror. I suppose many people have seen it. Then. I'm sure. I hope, Doris, that your fingerprints are not the only ones on that gun. If they use my gun to shoot him in my apartment, why would they bring the gun back here and leave it in plain well, sight? maybe they didn't do it just that way. No. His hat's here, the gun is here, and yet he's dead in your apartment. How can you answer that? Well, maybe he was sitting here waiting for Paula and someone called him out and over to your place and shot him. Ah, that's no good. Doesn't make sense. Now, if he was sitting in this chair here and someone entered that door... Uh, hey. What is it? Look in the chair back. Huh? Little round hole. Start looking for some empty shells around here. You find something? No, I want to make a call. He was shot with this automatic. Three shells were ejected. They suddenly vanished. Here, yeah, Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm in Paula Kenyon's. She's not here. Found his hat, a stack of horoscopes on the desk, box of monogrammed cigarettes, a 25 automatic which belongs to Miss Moray, recently fired, but not an empty shell in sight. No blood, but a single small hole in the back of the chair near the desk. Doris Moray is with me. I will call in Inspector Kramer now about the body and have ballistics check the bullets with the gun. And the bullet in the chair back? Did you find anything of particular importance in Amos Stoner's briefcase? Yes, I found... Never mind, bring the girl here at once. Okay, boss. Say, don't you think I'd better wait for Paula Kenyon? Uh-oh, here she is. Bye. Bring her along, too, if you can. Goodbye. Hello, Paula. Well, Doris, what are you doing here? I wasn't aware that I left the door unlocked. Seems to be contagious this evening. I left mine unlocked, too. Hello, Dave. Uh, Miss Kenyon and Mr. Goodwin. Hello, Doris. Hello. Archie, this is Dave Banning, the playwright. How are you, Mr. Banning? How do you do? I've heard all about your new play, and I wanted to meet you. Doris thought you might be over here, and the door was ajar, so we, well... I just walked in. I hope you don't mind, Paula. Certainly not. I'm used to people just walking in. We were here a while ago and went down to the cocktail lounge for a while. When does the play open? Or have you cast it yet? The Mr. Stoner handles that part of it. Are you a prospective investor, Goodwin? Oh, I've had a number of flings in the business. Matter of fact, I expect to see Mr. Stoner tonight. You do? Tonight? Here? I don't understand. What's this fencing all about? Doris, you're not just visiting me. We've hardly spoken for... Oh. Is that your gun, Miss Kenyon? It's yours, Doris. Yes, that's right, Paula. It was in my dressing room. When did you see Mr. Stoner last? But I haven't seen him today. I had lunch with him. Why? What hat did he wear at lunchtime, Mr. Banning? Why, the gray fedora. How did it get here? That's Amos. What is this? What are you two doing here? Where is Amos? Come on, cut out the melodramatics. Mr. Stoner is dead. He's what? Paula. And without any further explanation, I shall have to ask you to accompany me downtown. Police? If you will, please. They're still in the front room, boss. I'll bring them into your office when you're ready. Yes, Archie. I'm sure they're all anxious to talk. They've been sitting there for an hour and now. Maybe we ought to make some sort of explanation to them, huh? Why? This sort of technique should work very well in this particular instance. Yeah, but I don't know about that director, Rick Hunter. He may be difficult. Does anyone know that you found the completed and signed contract in the briefcase? No one. Mm hmm Good. Now we have the threat notes, the contract, the afternoon newspaper, the briefcase, the fedora hat, the gun, no ejected shells, the horoscope, the cigarette, and the two chairs. One with a small hole in it. Come in. Ah, Inspector Kramer at last. Uh, what have you? Well, we covered every inch of that place and didn't find a single empty shell. There were two bullets in the body and the one that passed through him into the chair back in Paula Kenyon's place. They were all three fired from Doris Murray's little automatic. 
Any fingerprints on the gun? None but Doris Moray's. Not unexpected, to say the least. The bullet that was lodged in the chair in Paula's place went through his heart. Now, he was apparently shot in her room, but... Uh... But how did he get into Doris Moray's place? I'll be able to explain that when we locate those three empty shells, Inspector. Bring our guests in, Archie. Come in, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Miss Paula Kenyon. Hello. Miss Doris Moray. Hello. Rick Hutter, the director. How do you do? David Banning, the playwright. How do you do? Won't you be seated, please? May I present Inspector Kramer of Homicide? How do you do, Inspector? Yeah. Mr. Wolf has asked you here to give such details as you recall, which might be of assistance to him in the solution of the murder of Emil Stoner. Mr. Hunter, as the director, whom did you favor as the star of your next production? Why, Doris Murray. You have been deeply interested in Miss Murray? Hasn't done me much good. But you do love her? I do. And you are deeply interested in the progress of her career? I am, most assuredly. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made out and signed a contract for a certain woman to play the lead in the new show? No. You knew that Doris Murray had a gun in her dressing room? Yes. You were in the hotel cocktail lounge all afternoon until you met Doris and Mr. Goodwin? Yes. And you could have seen Emil Stoner into the lobby and go to the elevator? I could. Could you prove that you never left the cocktail lounge until you met Doris and Archie? Maybe not. Did you see Mr. Stoner going to the elevator? I did. Mr. Banning, you wrote the new play. Were you in favor of Miss Murray playing the part? I know. I felt Paula Kenyon was better suited for it. You and Miss Kenyon are engaged to be married? Yes. Anything happened to uh, Mr. Stoner, you as next in line could assign the role as you saw fit? That's correct. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made a final decision on the part? I did not. He didn't tell you anything about it at lunch today? No, I made a strong plea for Paula. You know about the gun in Miss Murray's dressing room? Everyone did, apparently. Very well. Uh, Miss Kenyon, did Emma Stoner visit your apartment often? Not often. We were not on too friendly terms. Did you phone him to visit you this afternoon? No, who said I did? No one? <laughs> I merely asked. Were you by any chance still in love with Emil Stoner? Now, see here, I don't appreciate that kind Just of talk. relax, Mr. Banning. I was not in love with Mr. Stoner. That was over. You and Doris Murray were at one time very friendly. Yes. Well, I found out how two-faced she was. Emil was a fool to fall for her, but you couldn't tell him anything. All she's interested in is a career. You're not interested in your career, Miss Kenyon. Well... Well, yes, in a way. You wanted the star part. You phoned Stoner this morning. Yes, but he said he was going to give it to her. You knew about Doris's gun? No, I you didn't. You recognized it immediately, boss. Well, yes, I knew. What if I did? Then you wrote these threatening notes to Miss Murray. I did not. I did not. You didn't know the contract had already been signed? No. Then you still had a motive to kill him. I wrote those notes. She had nothing to do with it. You can check them on my typewriter. We know, Mr. Banning. We've already done that. I know how it looks, but, but Paula didn't do it. I, I knew he was coming to her place. I called him. I, I knew Paula was out. I did it. If so, what did you do with the ejected shell? I threw them away. How many? Three. Oh, no, David, please don't. I don't believe you, Mr. Banning. Miss Murray, did you know the contract had been made out and signed? No. You're lying, Miss Murray. You said you didn't see Stoner this afternoon. I didn't. You called him and asked him to visit you. You did get the threat notes and they frightened you. But you didn't know they would frighten Stoner. I did not phone him, nor did I see him. Yes, you did. His briefcase was on the piano. And he was there in the late afternoon because he brought with him a four o'clock edition of the Herald Tribune. What if he was there? I didn't kill him. He told you then about his decision. He left hurriedly, forgot the briefcase, and went to Paula's apartment to wait for her. That's not true. That's not true. Filled with rage, you got your gun, which you said had disappeared from your dressing room. Then calmly put it into your bag, walked across the hall, and shot him as he sat reading a horoscope. No, no, no. Archie, a handbag. Thank you. Notice. I run my finger through a hole in the corner. <gasps> she fired through the bag. And see, three empty shells. No. And here's a contract made out to Paula Kenyon. Too bad, Miss Murray. That's a good day's work, boss. The beer, Archie. Right. Say, tell me, how did Stoner, if he was shot in Paula's room, get back to Doris's room? She couldn't carry him. Oh, now, Archie, that's not too difficult. He walked. 
Shot through the heart? Impossible. That's a fallacy, Archie. Our official medical records show that people have walked a block in such instances. No wonder Doris was so shocked when she saw him back in her room. The shooting took place after she called us, and it seemed unbelievable that anyone would leave the gun and not the ejected shells. Ergo, the gun must have been concealed when fired. Yeah. Paula would have no reason to do that, because she was in her own apartment. And these men are not the type who would have fired through their coats. And Doris, before she started down the hall, would naturally conceal the gun, huh? In her handbag. Where else? Boss. Midnight. It's another day. <laughs> I'm a year older. Yes. Mm. Cuthbert's Correspondence Detective Course in Four Easy Lessons. <laughs> Happy birthday, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Vic Perrin. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Party for Death. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf is busy planning a menu. I'll see if he can talk to you. What's the name again? You want to talk to a dame named Mrs. Collins? Hang up, Archie. Do we know a Mrs. Collins? No. I don't suppose you care, but I think her voice is very charming. Doubtless. Every female has a charming voice to you. Hang up. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. Collins, but at the moment, Mr. Wolf is too involved with his digestive system to be interrupted. However, if I may introduce myself, Archie Goodwin, uh, Mr. Wolf's assistant, if I can be of any help. Archie. Uh, yes, Mrs. Collins, I'll ask you. Cocktail party. Hang up, Archie. Well, Mrs. Collins, I'm afraid it would be better if you didn't expect Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Cocktails. Foy. Sad, very absurd. She says you promised to come to her cocktail party, and why aren't you there? Because you are going to attend the cocktail party and the probable unpleasant ending. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, the most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Mr. Wolf and I refer to this as the case of the party for death. Nero Wolf really should have gone to the party since he'd accepted, but I was delegated. I can't complain now since it was there that I met Georgia, the most beautiful redhead. Well, that's my weakness, redheads. Yeah, and blondes and brunettes. And... Well, anyway, Mr. Wolf was adamant about going to the party. I've never been to a cocktail party in my life. You know, I drink nothing but beer. You could take your beer with you, couldn't you? I could not. Do we know a Mrs. Collins whose cocktail party you said you'd go to? The phone rang and I picked it up. Where was I? Exactly. Okay. 
So a Mrs. Collins, with a beautiful, seductive voice, conned you into accepting an invitation to a cocktail party that you knew you weren't going to. Archie. Yes, Master. Just a little less sarcasm, perhaps. Sarcasm? Call it impertinence, then. Impertinence, Master? Exactly. Less of that, much less. Okay. Continue now. Where was I? You were eating the duck recipe. Oh, yes, the duck. Oh, here we are. Dodine de Canard. The Dodine is one of the oldest dishes in the repertory of French cooking, being mentioned in books of the 14th century. Le Grand Cousinier de Tout Cousinier. Hurry, what time is it, Archie? Almost 6.30. Oh, in that case... Uh, you going to get up? Uh, here on this card are your instructions, Archie. If you are still alive tomorrow, you may make your report. I helped the huge bulk that was Nero Wolf out of his specially built desk chair and walked with him to the elevator that would take him upstairs to his orchids. I stepped back to the desk and found the card which bore my instructions. In his small, perfect handwriting, I read, Mrs. Albert Collins, Empire Towers. Arrive at 7, say I sent you. After the murder, telephone me before the police arrive. At exactly 7, I rang Mrs. Collins' doorbell. Mrs. Collins? I'm Mrs. Collins. I'm Archie Goodwin. We talked on the phone a little while ago. Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, come in, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, Mr. Wolf begs to be excused. At the last moment, he was unable to attend. Well, I'm glad you could come. You're not disappointed? No, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm rather upset. I'm afraid, Mr. Goodwin, for my life. That's why I called Mr. Wolf. Oh, oh, just drop your hat and coat there, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, may I tell you something, Mrs. Collins? Well, of course, Mr. Goodwin. Archie will do. Uh, Archie? When I spoke to you on the phone, I thought I knew what you'd look like. And? You do. Well, is that good? It's not bad, Mrs. Collins. Janie will do. Janie will do. Um, Archie, mm -hmm. I, um, I think it would be best if I say you're an old beau of mine. From where? Uh, in Hollywood. When I went to Hollywood High School and you went to USC. Okay, but don't expect me to remember much about it. Well, I'd be flattered if you remember anything about it. <laughs> I want you to keep your eyes and ears open. Observe everything tonight. Well, now shall we join the party? <laughs> oh, Albert, this is Archie Goodwin. Archie, this is my husband, Albert. How do you do? Hello. And this is Joe Boyce, my husband's partner. How do you do? Boyce? I've told you about Archie Albert, but well, I guess you probably don't remember, do you? No, I don't. When I was in high school and he went to USC. Oh. Oh, well, yeah, sure. What do you have, Goodwin? I'd like a plain lime and soda. Oh, now, really? A teetotaler now? Uh, yes, I, uh, well, I used to overdo it, uh -huh. remember? So you knew my wife in Hollywood? Quite a while ago, though. Uh-huh. Been here long? Oh, a while. Did you and my wife run into each other again just lately? Yeah. A few days ago? About. Joe Boyce here is my partner, chemical business. Makes this sort of an old home week, doesn't it, Joe? In a way, Al. I guess it does at that. Joe knew my wife back in those days, too. And they're still very friendly. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You two have got something in common to talk about, haven't you, good one? Mrs. Collins, you mean? Uh, we never knew each other very well. No? Okay, Goodwin, let it go. Why, look. Look what I found. A new man. Just what I need. I'm Georgia. Archie. Archie, dear, will you fix up my drink, please? Anything for a lady. Let's go to the bar. Eh, hey, Archie? I'm determined, Joe. For only the money, our only Jane. I might listen. Oh, Al, can't we talk about it later? I like talking about it now, Joe. You're going to be sorry about this, Al. I am already. But you'll have 20 years or so in prison just being sorry. I've got the papers you forged right here. You're hysterical, Al. Let's face it. The firm went broke, but I suffered too. So let's forget it. Yes, Joe, the firm went broke, but you didn't. And I don't think my wife did either. The two of you had everything figured for yourselves. Well, I'm turning the papers over to the D.A. tomorrow. Mm. 
Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, what do you know about this expected murder, if anything? Has it happened yet? No, but who's supposed to get killed? I have the faintest idea, Archie. Then why don't you stop it? That is impossible. I don't even know who's there. You want me to tell you? Not in the least. How am I supposed to prevent it if I don't know what I'm looking for? You're not supposed to prevent it, Archie. I don't think you could. I don't think anybody could. You want to hear what I found out already? No. I'll tell you anyway. Collins thinks his wife and his partner, Boyce, have been stealing his dough, and he's threatening to send Boyce to the clink. Archie. Yeah? You're wasting our time. Go back to the party. There is nothing you can do to prevent the murder. But I want you to be there when it happens. Now that all the guests have gone, let's uh, sit down here, Georgia. When Janie was in Hollywood, she must have had more good-looking boyfriends. Let's get personal about this, Georgia. Yeah, let's. When you say good-looking, do you mean me? I don't mean anybody else, Archie. You know, I think you're pretty, too. You'd better not let Jane hear you say that. You think she'd care? I thought you knew Jane. Only slightly. You don't like Jane too well, do you? Why? Why? Why what? Why don't you tell the truth about it? No man as attractive as you ever knew Jane slightly. Either they knew her or they didn't know her. Maybe you think I'm getting a little tipsy. The idea never occurred to me. No? Well, it has to me. Refill your glass? I'll come with you to the bar. Well, here's your drink, Georgia. Oh, I find there's no ice left in the ice bucket. Janie? Hey, Janie, no ice. Oh, well, I'll get some. Here, give me the bucket. Uh, Mrs. Collins, uh, Janie, I mean. Yes, Archie? May I use the phone in the bedroom again? Oh, of course. Will you excuse me for a minute, Georgia? I'm coming with you. Uh, why don't you just stay here until Jane brings the ice? Well, why don't you go talk to Joe Boyce? I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce. I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce ever. Now, look, Georgia. I'm coming with you, Archie. Is that clear? Okay, come on. Here's where the phone is. I could have found it myself. You don't want me with you, do you? Just sit down here on the edge of the bed and listen, if that's what you want to do. Mr. Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Well, Archie, what? Just a bit of a report. Go on. At this moment, I am sitting on the edge of one of two twin beds in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Collins. Sitting next to me is a gorgeous redhead named Georgia. Georgia what, dear? Boys. You mean you're the wife of Joe Boys? Of course. Didn't you know? I am sitting next to the gorgeous red-headed wife of Albert Collins' partner, Joe Boyce. Archie, you annoy me. From what I just learned, I can see there's another friction going on. You mean Georgia and Jane? Yep, fireworks between them. This one, no like other one. Have you anything more to say? When I called, I was going to ask if there's any reason why I shouldn't come home now. I wrote your instructions for you, Archie. After the murder, call you. Yeah, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? But what if there isn't any? Don't call me. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Hello. He hung up. Archie. What? That was a strange conversation. Do you want me to explain it to you, honey? What was that business about murder? Shall we join the party? Murder. Archie, wouldn't you be surprised if there was one? Yeah? Who's going to do what and to whom? I don't know. Maybe I will. Elucidate, honey. Do you intend to figure as the killer or the corpse? I don't intend to figure as anything. But you never know. Archie, do you think Jane Collins is better looking than me? Nope. Honestly? Honestly. Then what's the matter with me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, there is. Look, do you want to kiss me? Uh, I... Well, I'll tell you. When I graduated from Sunday school, I took a vow. That's what I mean. But if I were Jane, you'd want to kiss me, wouldn't you? No, frankly, no. Why not? Well, when I graduated from Sunday school, I... Okay, Archie. Let's go back. You boys have such happy faces. Where's Jane? In the kitchen getting some ice. Where have you been? With Archie. Is he an old school chum of yours, too? Do you care, Joe? No. Mr. Boyce. What? How much do you weigh? 187. Why? Then I'll be giving you five pounds. Shall we step outside? This I have got to see. Shut up. Mr. Goodwin, you seem angry. Just terribly, terribly hurt. Would it do any good if I apologized? 
Today I'm a little upset. If I said anything to offend you, I do apologize. Now, um, if you still want me to give you a boxing lesson, I'm at your service. Let's forget it. I'm sorry, too. Jane Collins came in from the kitchen with a bucket of ice cubes, a tray of fresh glasses, and the strapless gown she'd been wearing. <sighs> there. I never thought I'd make it. Now I'm going to mix my own drink, and you can take care of yourself. Iceberg. Huh? Whiskey. And soda. <laughs> it's a simple recipe, isn't it, Archie? All it needs is the ingredients. Well, I drink to the ingredients. Mm. Ah, nice. Janie, darling. What, dear? Would you mind very much if I took Archie away from you? Uh -huh. Haven't you done that already, dear? To listen to those girls, you'd think, wouldn't you, Goodman? Me, I never think. What do you do, Archie? I concentrate. On what? On not thinking. I did some serious concentrating on not thinking about Nero Wolfe or about the conflict of the partners, Albert Collins and Joe Boyce, about the jealousies of Jane and Georgia. The next five minutes hardly seemed an hour. Jane and Boyce murmured to each other. Collins drank gently but firmly. Why can't you be honest, Archie? What's the matter with me? What, Georgia? You weren't listening, were you? To every gorgeous word you said. What did I say? I want to hear it again, just the way you said it before. I said, why shouldn't there be a murder? Why not? It's an order. It's just not considered the thing to do. Thing to do? Can you think of anything better? No, frankly. I can. My glass is empty. My glass is empty, too. Jane. Jane! Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not much of a hostess, am I? Oh, don't answer that. Oh, you're all empty. But I've only drunk half of mine. You don't usually drink so slowly, Jane. Well, I'm just not in the mood tonight. I usually drink faster to keep you from drinking mine. <laughs> See, Albert always gulps his and then reaches for mine. What's the difference? And well, I'll fix you some fresh drinks, but... Uh, put my drink over there by you, Georgia, and lay off, Albert. I only had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more. I suppose we know what dear Jane is going to do, don't we? Lay off, will you? Lay off. It's my husband who said that, Archie. Archie, meet my husband, Mr. Boyce. I will now explain why dear Jane took our glasses away to the kitchen when she could have bought a drink right here. Listen, Georgia, Mr. will you... Mr. Boyce is speaking, Archie. What, Mr. Boyce? Uh... Ah, oh, nuts. Mr. Boyce says nuts, Mr. Goodwin. What do you say, Mr. Collins? I think Joe has covered the field. We were talking, weren't we, Archie? Possibly. We were talking about dear Jane. She's got to be always the prettiest, always devastating. Right now, she's putting on a completely new face. And in about 20 minutes, when our tongues are hanging out, she'll come back, all horsed up and bright and smiling with another tray of drinks. Yes, yeah, she'll take all night to fix them. Well... I'm going to get some air on the balcony. Don't jump off. Al, you're drinking too much lately. I shouldn't worry you, Joe. Especially now. When you start drinking not only your drinks, but everybody else's too, well... Ah, Jane's right. Is that what worries you? Slide Jane's glass down. Hmm. The ice is all melted. You see what I mean? Okay, Joe. Let's not be nasty until tomorrow. Huh. That gives me an idea. I think I'll propose a toast. Until tomorrow. You know, it may be rather fitting that I should drink a toast from the glass that Janie left. Until tomorrow. Go! Al. Al? Jane? Janie! Oh, Albert. Nero Wolf speaking. May I come home now? Oh, hello, Archie. I said, may I come home now? Have you sent for the police, Inspector Kramer? Of course. Who was killed, Archie? Albert Collins. How, Archie? I don't know. You were right, though, weren't you? Naturally. About what? Murder. Oh, that. We can talk about it tomorrow. Good night, Archie. Come home when you can. What do you mean, come home when I can? You'll be held as a witness, won't you? <laughs> Try not to wake me with the elevator when you come in. <laughs> 
Well, Inspector Kramer, you've had me here at headquarters for a long while. For quite a long while. Haven't you asked me enough questions? Goodwin, you say you never saw these people before, Collins or Boyce or their wives. Yet when all the other guests had gone, you were still there. I guess I just don't know how to say goodbye. You didn't know they were partners in a chemical company. You didn't know that Boyce had forged a lot of papers with Collins' name. All I know is what you tell me. Goodwin. Yes, sir? I'm trying to be nice. Yes, sir. Now, I know, of course, that you went to that party because Nero Wolf told you to. Do you? My question is, how did Wolf know it was going to happen? Why don't you ask him? I already have. He told you? He says he never heard of Collins or Boyce. Did he say he'd ever heard of me? He says he isn't responsible for you or your shady friends. Maybe he knows I found a poison pellet in George's bag. Inspector, may I make an important call? Go ahead. Argy, argy. Uh, found it light... Hello? What time is it, Master? Confound it, Archie. I'll tell you what time it is. It's a little after 4 a.m. I'm at Central Headquarters, and Inspector Kramer has been chatting with me about my shady friends. Kramer is a jackass. Just a second. Uh, pick up the other phone, will you, Inspector? Uh, sorry, Mr. Wolf. What was that you were saying about Inspector Kramer? I said Kramer is a jackass. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wolf! Oh? Eavesdropping, Inspector. I was just talking about bringing you down here for a little questioning, Wolf. Fooey. What's that? Fooey. It can be spelled in several ways. I spell it P-F-U-I. Fooey. You think I won't bring you down here as a material witness? Yes, I think you won't. I think you'd be making a great mistake if you did. A great mistake? Why? Because I might not tell you who killed Collins. Then you wouldn't know which one of these people to prefer charges against. Now send Archie home. Even he needs an occasional night's sleep. <laughs> what do you think of that? He hung up. So it seems. Busy? He's probably left the phone off the hook, Inspector. By now, he's probably asleep again. Uh, you know I can go out there, don't you? Sure you can. More important men than you have tried it. And where are they now? Goodwin? Yes, sir? I'm going to let you go. I'm sure Mr. Wolf and I are very grateful, Inspector. You want to know why I'm letting you go? I know why. Why? Because if you're nice and cooperative and don't make too much trouble, Mr. Wolf will solve this case for you and tell you whom to prefer charges against. Goodwin. Sir? Get out. Thank you, Inspector. Good morning, Inspector. At three o'clock the next afternoon, I was rearranging the furniture in Nero Wolf's office while the great man sat behind his desk watching me perspire. Are you finished now, Archie? I guess so. And tell me where they sat. There were two couches, like this, in front of a fireplace. Collins and Boyce were sitting together on one couch. When Georgia and I came in, they were looking at some canceled checks... Where was Mrs. Collins? I told you she was getting ice and fresh glasses. Why was she getting fresh glasses, Archie? Where were the empty ones? I don't know. Maybe they were the same ones she brought back washed and polished. Archie, I trust your powers of observation absolutely. That's why I sent you to Mrs. Collins' cocktail party. Okay, how did you know there was going to be a murder? If it was a murder. It was a murder, Archie. But isn't it obvious? How is it obvious? Suppose Colin slipped a few drops of the poison into his drink himself. It's very strong, very deadly poison, with a remarkably strong odor. Like almonds, I know. I smelled it when I picked him up. Archie, was anything found on the body that might have contained the poison, a fountain pen, whatever? Not even that. Inspector Kramer found a poison pellet in Georgia's handbag. He thinks he poisoned Collins's drink. Say, could be. But it wasn't his drink, it was his wife's. Then Georgia was trying to kill Jane, and Collins got it by mistake. We shall soon see, Archie. I was expecting a murder because you told me to expect it. I watched every move that everybody made. There is no possibility that Jane's glass, the glass with the poison in it, was tampered with by anybody. Yes, I believe. Okay. 
Archie, you're a sore, aren't you? Have you ever spent the night with Inspector Kramer? He's really a good man, too. Why did you say he was a jackass? Because he didn't know who killed Collins. Do you? Of course. Is there ever any question about it? Just a moment, please. The only trouble is it may be difficult to prove. That's why we are giving this little cocktail party this afternoon with the help of Inspector Kramer. By the way... Yes? Call Mrs. Collins and tell her to bring a bucket of ice from her refrigerator. Why? Because our refrigerator's broken down. No, it hasn't. I was just out in the kitchen a minute ago. Our refrigerator has broken down. And it would be very helpful if Mrs. Collins would bring a bucket of ice cubes. What makes you think she'll do it? She will. Call her. 6.45. There we were in Wolf's office doing a repeat performance of last night's smash hit. Two couches faced each other, a cocktail table between them. On one couch, red-headed Georgia and me. On the other couch, it was a big one, Joe Boyce, Jane Collins, widow of the lately defunct Albert, and Nero Wolf. Jane had been drinking a little slower than the rest of us. Our glasses were empty. Hers was still half full. Wolf said... Margie. Yeah? At this point in last night's party, Mrs. Collins got up and left to get some fresh drinks. Repeat what she said. Approximately. Approximately will do. I think she said something like this. She said, um... Put my drink over by you, Georgia. Lay off, Albert. I've had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more, Albert. Am I right, Jane? Close enough, Archie. But what of it? No. What is this nonsense all about, Wolf? Uh, Mr. Wolf is trying to make something out of nothing. I think Mr. Wolf is going to turn up something mighty interesting. Don't look so perturbed, Joe. Since I am playing the part of the late Mr. Collins, pass me Jane's glass. I'll keep my glass, Mr. Wolf. I haven't finished my drink. You're a very clever woman, Mrs. Collins. Would it be too much if I ask what this is all about? What about it, you, Archie? You make it sound as if that drink she's holding is poison. But it can't be, because as yesterday, she's already drunk half of it herself. When our freezer broke down, she was more than willing to bring a bucket of ice cubes, wasn't she? So? What would happen, Archie, if you froze a gelatine-coated pellet of poison in the center of one particular ice cube? Mrs. Collins hasn't finished her drink. Notice the ice is all melted now. She hasn't taken one sip since the ice melted completely. She came prepared in case she was exposed. Smell it, Archie. No, Archie, stand back. I can easily swallow this before you can reach me. Mr. Wolf, in a few seconds, I'll drink it. But tell me something first. Tell me how you knew. Jane, Jane, listen to me. I knew there was going to be a murder last night because you said so. I knew that it was you who would commit the murder because it was you who invited me. You hoped an expert witness would prove that you couldn't have killed your husband. So I sent Archie Goodwin, whose observations are always exact, even when he doesn't know the import of what he's observing. She brought back clean glasses. She poured the drinks out of bottles already open. And if anybody had put anything in or touched one of those glasses, I would have seen it. Exactly. The poison pellet was frozen in a certain ice cube. Mrs. Collins put that cube in her own drink, drank it until the ice had almost melted down to the poisonous pellet center. And then, then she took all the other glasses away, leaving only hers half full. And as usual, her husband drank it. No, no, Jane, don't, don't! Too late, Joe. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Well, boss, Jane didn't get away with the suicide try. That was clever thinking you did. I prepared a cube of ice in which I had frozen a gelatine capsule containing nothing more than a vitamin compound. I substituted for the cube in which Jane had placed the poison for herself. wonder why Jane Collins wanted to have Joe. He'd stolen practically all the money in the company. He was just a crook. Birds of a feather, Archie. I don't believe Joe Boyce had any idea that Jane was planning a murder. And he still had all the money. Well, the forgeries will put him away for a long time. And poor Georgia could have had it pinned on her if it hadn't been for me. Yes, yes. You knew all along, didn't you, that Jane had planned to have Georgia accused by planting another pellet of the poison in Georgia's handbag. Jane would have gotten rid of her husband and Joe's wife in one stroke. You knew all that, didn't you? Well, I... Um... How about a bottle of beer, boss? 
Could you spare the time? Uh, Georgia. Beautiful redhead. Wonder where she is tonight. I'm sure I haven't the slightest idea, but in case you do... <laughs> well, just be quiet with the elevator door when you come in. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gigi Pearson, Herb Butterfield, Peter Leeds, Evelyn Eaton, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Malevolent Medic. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolfe. Transcribed in 30 seconds. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. The orchestra will be under the direction of Bruno Walter for tomorrow's performance, and celebrated violinist Joseph Zagetti will be featured soloist. Selections for tomorrow include the overture to Mozart's Marriage of Figaro and the same composer's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. You're invited every Saturday to a concert by the NBC Symphony. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Mr. Hal Horton, United Industries? Oh, I see. Well, I must warn you, Mr. Horton, Mr. Wolf doesn't take kindly to big industrialists. Says their great wealth upsets his digestion. Why do you want to see him? The connection's bad. I don't hear you. Who? Who? Mr. Horton, who? Hmm. We're cut off. What is it, Mr. Goodwin? Mr. Hal Horton called. I understand that. I won't see him. Tell him what money I have to invest I put into orchid plants. Mr. Horton wasn't promoting anything. And what did he call you for? The great Horton needs a detective. Maybe just my occupational reflex, but I thought he said somebody had been murdered. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. It turned out that what Horton had said had been murder, which became celebrated in the case of the malevolent medic. But its solution wasn't a simple matter of following up his accusation. It had false clues mixed all through it like raisins in a pudding. The man we came to know as the malevolent medic was young Dr. Benjamin Sloan. The case began on the sunny afternoon when Grace Banks, his nurse, came into his private office. Oh, waiting room's finally empty, I take it. Well, there's one more patient, darling. I'm sorry. Doctor, hmm. Mrs. Horton's here for another of the thymine chloride shots you ordered for. I said you could give her those grades. She doesn't have to wait to see me. Oh, she's hung up her mink coat, parked her orchid and her alligator bag, and filled up all the ashtrays with lipstick cigarette stubs. Mrs. Horton prefers to wait for you. She seems very upset. I hoped she'd get hold of herself. Mrs. Hal Horton, with all that money. Whatever gives her such jitters? <laughs> Darling, if I ever get in that condition after we're married, please shoot me. I've advised her to go to a specialist. Hers isn't a true medical case. Well, I'll do what I can. Get a needle ready, will you, Grace, and show Mrs. Horton in. Yes, darling. I mean, doctor. <laughs> Mrs. Horton, will you step in now? Good 
been in that waiting room for hours. Ben, I wrote you every day this week. Why didn't you answer me? You say your health hasn't improved, Leslie. I'm worse, much worse. Still chain smoking, drinking, and the sleeping pills? I have to take something. I can't walk the floor all night, can I? Thinking, thinking. Why are you so unhappy, Leslie? You have what you always said you wanted, money, clothes, excitement. You have the right to say that. But don't, please don't. I'm only pointing out facts you should face. I told you from the beginning you need a nerve specialist. I need you. Nobody else can help me at all. Leslie, you went over this the last time you were here, and in all those letters you've been sending. Now, let's cross it off for good, shall we? Don't talk like that. You don't mean I'm it. no longer a lovesick dope, and you're the wife of one of the biggest industrialists in the country. Yes, Hal Horton, I despise him. He thinks his money makes him God. He thinks he can buy anything that he bought me. He made me think I was getting the world with a fence around it. Everything I want is on the other side of that fence. You don't know what you do want. I want us the way we used to be, happy in love together. Leslie, please be quiet. Why? Miss Banks is in the laboratory. She can hear you. What of it? I'm not ashamed. I'll tell her. I'll tell everybody. Imagine Hal's face when he finds out I'm leaving him. But I'm coming back to you. He already knows about you. I told him you were in love with me, that you're jealous. He doesn't like it. Leslie, you're raving. Now, stop it. You always said I was the most attractive woman in the world. You made your choice. Now, get this into your head. I'm really in love now. In a few weeks, I'm going to be married. Now, I'll get your medicine. So it's really true. You are going to be married. Yes. I'd heard it, but I didn't believe it. Going to marry a nurse. All my friends have known and been laughing at me. Please, now that's enough. I made a plan, a wonderful, beautiful plan about us. Ben, you love me. Ben, say you love me. Mrs. Horton, that is all over. You don't love me. No longer. You're here as my patient, and that's all. After this treatment, I must ask you to get another doctor. A wonderful, beautiful plan for us. And now she threatens to step in and spoil it. Well, maybe I'll spoil a few plans. How would you like that? Threats will accomplish nothing. I can ruin things for you, Ben. All those fancy ideas of yours about having a fine practice, being a great doctor. Do you want to give those up? I can arrange it so that maybe there won't be any wonderful future for you. Are you prepared to face that possibility? Because I'm prepared to make it a reality. And I mean it. You'll regret this day as long as you live. I'll get your medicine, Mrs. Horton. Hand me my bag. Thank you. Oh, I hate you, Ben. I hate you both. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mrs. Horton. Miss Banks had to do a repair job before she could use the sterilizer. Alcohol, Miss Banks? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Now, Mrs. Horton, may I help? Thanks. So nice of you. There. Right side for the hypo this time, isn't it? Just touch with this cotton. Ready now, Doctor. Oh, I... What's the matter, Mrs. Horton? I'm just cold. Alcohol. After this, I advise you to go home and rest. These massive doses are a little painful, but they give results... There. That's all. Just relax here and you can leave in ten minutes. Come, Miss Banks. I want to talk to you. Doctor! Doctor! I I feel sick. I feel very sick. You might as well stop acting. I can't get up. My feet, Ben. Look at her. Something's happened. Hysteria. No, her face. Oh, Ben, she's falling. Mrs. Horton, hold on to me. I've got you. Hold her up. Leslie, what is it? Pain. Terrible pain. Where? What from? Sick everywhere. Pain. Everything's pain. Pain in my head. Pain in my feet. My feet. My feet. Doctor. She's dead. Yes, Grace. Get a card from the files. I I want to study it. From the first day Mrs. Horton came here. What was it, Ben? 
What happened to her? Symptoms are of a heart condition from which it seems the patient has just expired. Then you must call her husband. Grace, did you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Well, I discourage your visit here, Mr. Horton. I do have a sort of curiosity about the operation of so-called big business. Maybe offer you a glass of beer and hear an explanation of the rise and fall of this morning's stock market. You don't think I've come here socially? I wish to engage your services for... Not available. You're a detective, aren't you? Specializing in cases that interest me. Sherry, Mr. Horton? I don't need it, thank you. But Mr. Wolf says he specializes in cases that interest... I've just got here. I haven't told my story. I don't believe you even know who I am. Oh, yes, we do. We do indeed. A millionaire. Did I offend you by speaking of a fee? No, on the contrary. It is that portion of your conversation which interested me most. Frankly, I plan to spend the evening examining the first edition of Henry James I'd like to purchase. And the word fee suggested a possible way. Now, what have you done, sir? What have I done? <laughs> One doesn't have to be a detective to recognize you're in trouble, Mr. Horton. Look, Mr. Wolf, I have done nothing. But I've got a question I've got to have answered. I need facts. They tell me you're the man who can give them to me. If Nero Wolf can't get them for you, they're not facts. They're fancies, Mr. Horton. Well, my story's involved. But the gist of it is uh, your beautiful wife, a former model, died last week. The death certificate indicated a heart attack. You suggest she was murdered. How did you know? Never mind how I came to my conclusions. How did you come to yours? Leslie had been going to a Dr. Benjamin Sloan. She said he was a specialist. Some friend had recommended. She'd been upset. He was giving her vitamin B shots, she told me. You doubt that was true. Dr. Sloan informed me uh, after she died in his office uh, there'd been a heart condition from the beginning. Well, I don't believe it. Leslie was a very emotional girl. She'd have been quite frightened of a heart ailment. She'd have told me about it. Maybe she didn't comprehend its seriousness. Dr. Sloan did. Why didn't he get in touch with me at once about it? Then, when I went to clear up Leslie's room, I discovered something. Leslie didn't go to Sloan through a friend. She'd known him when she was a model and he was a hospital intern. She'd kept letters he'd written to her then. Love letters. Indeed. Well, doesn't that give you an idea, Mr. Wolf? Sloan lost Leslie to me. No man who'd been in love with Leslie would ever get over it. Would a man be jealous enough, kill a woman he loved rather than have her belong to another man? An interesting theory, Mr. Horton, one frequently advanced in fiction. Shall we investigate and see how it works out in fact? Ah, you'll take the case, then. The intricacies of the feminine nature are challenging if you do not have to come in contact with the creatures. The uh, practical research in such matters I leave to Mr. Goodwin here. It is the field in which he specializes. But it's you I want. Our method of operation is not under your control, Mr. Horton. You'll be so kind, Archie. Get a first-hand report of Dr. Benjamin Sloan and the women in his life. Just came to ask a few routine questions, Dr. Sloan. I don't understand your interest in the Horton case, Mr. Goodwin, is it? That's right. The death certificate was signed and a report made to the medical inspector. Detectives are a snoopy lot. Detectives? Are you from the police department? No, I'm employed to note some details before we close up the Leslie Horton estate. Sudden deaths have to be double-checked. I'm afraid I can't add a thing to what I've already reported. Well, thanks for seeing me anyhow. Been a pleasant visit. Ever have a patient die in your office before, Dr. Sloan? No, but I've seen similar cases in the hospital, of course. Was Mrs. Horton warned about her heart condition, Dr. Sloan? I discussed her case with her fully and frankly. And her husband, wasn't Mr. Horton alarmed? He didn't know. Mrs. Horton's ailment was, well, not to bore a layman with medical details, was not a fatal one necessarily. She might have gone on for years. Just played in bad luck, huh? The worst. Mm -hmm. When'd you first meet her? Several weeks ago. And you saw her how many times? It's all on the record. She was nervous. I prescribed thiamine chloride. Her medical report card shows that. You read it for yourself. Well, I guess that's all, Dr. Sloan. Won't bother you further. Miss Banks will show you out. Yes, Dr. Sloan? Sort of a modern Aladdin arrangement, isn't it? Wish I could press a buzzer and have a beautiful girl like you appear. Mr. Goodwin is leaving. Oh, this way, Mr. Goodwin. You can use the side door. The waiting room's full of patients. So long, Doctor. This way, through the lab. There's a door from it into the corridor. Cozy place, all those bottles. I suppose there's enough stuff in here to kill an army. To cure one. Miss Banks, may I say that you're the kind of a nurse that patients dream about? Make it a pleasure to go to a hospital. 
Blonde hair, blue eyes, winkers an inch long. Are they real? If you'll excuse me. Who do I have to come down with to persuade you to take care of me? Huh? I don't take cases. I'm a technician. Good day, Mr. So you work just for Dr. Sloan. That's too bad the way he's involved in this Horton case. It looks serious. Mrs. Horton simply died of a heart attack in Dr. Sloan's office. If you wanted to help your boss, Miss Banks, you'd stop rushing around and answer a few questions. I'm sure Dr. Sloan gave you the necessary information. Guess he doesn't realize the trouble he's in. If you can supply any details that'll change the picture, you'll be doing him a great favor. He's a nice guy. I want to help. What is there to say? The report... Let's get it in your own words. Just what really happened here that day? Well... Dr. Sloan gave Mrs. Horton the vitamin B shot. That was routine. Mm -hmm. But she didn't get up afterward. She said she was sick. And then she fell and I caught her. And Dr. Sloan administered emergency treatment. What did that consist of, Miss Banks? All that is in the office record. What would bring on such an attack? It could have been several things. Could it have been something she ate? Acute indigestion affects the heart. Maybe Mrs. Horton would be here now if the doctor thought to use a stomach pump. He did use one. He did everything there was time to do. She certainly went in a hurry. Suffer a lot? She said she was in pain. Where? Her stomach? No, not her stomach. Where then? She seemed to be in pain all over. Reflex, maybe? When it was over, what did you do, Miss Banks? Call Mr. Horton. Must have been a blow to the great man. I understand she was younger than he is and quite a sultry gal. I've talked to you professionally because you said it was necessary to help Dr. Sloan. Is that all, Mr. Goodwin? I guess it is for now. Unless you'll have dinner with me. Thank you, no. I'm handsome, hardworking, and harmless. I'll bring you references from my employer. What do you say? The express elevator's the one on the right. Must be there's another man. Wouldn't be the doctor, would it? Well, you'll fit better in a Pullman kitchen than here among the test tubes at that. My reluctant congratulations. Verdict, Archie? Innocent as lambs, both Sloan and the nurse. Evidence to prove it? My unfailing sensibilities, not the murderer type. Nice couple, doctor and the nurse, I suspect they're engaged. She's so much in love with him, I could have been you and she wouldn't have known the difference. Very flattering. Records? The usual medical record, Mrs. Horton's first visits, symptoms, subsequent visits. Here are the notes on it. Hmm. Vitamin B shots. No chance they brought this on, huh? Dr. Sloan says absolutely not. I checked that with other doctors. But Mrs. Horton did go into this right after the hypo. There's the story, Jives and Sloan? Mm-hmm. A little more detail. She says he did everything. He even used a stomach pump. The woman was in pain? What's this? Head to feet? My way of saying pain all over. What other papers did you examine? Only the medical record. Get back to Sloan's office late tonight and examine all the papers in his desk. Can't you trust me? I tell you, there's no reason even to suspect these two. When you have one of your adolescent's infatuations on, blood dripping from a dagger in a girl's hand would look to you like crushed rose petals. With this Grace Banks out of the way, maybe you can recognize evidence. Uh, sounds like a long, bleak evening. Hand me that medical book, and then be on your way. I want to think. Mr. Goodwin. Oh, good evening, Dr. Sloan. This is a surprise to us both. I didn't anticipate that you'd be keeping office hours after midnight. What are you doing in my office at two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Goodwin? Reading your mail and having a ghoulish time surrounded by all these shiny instruments of yours. You've been rifling my desk. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've put things back very neatly, even the letters from this little secret compartment, which isn't secret at all to anybody who knows about desks. I've kept only Give one. Give me that easy. Let... It's the my darling mine first shan't ever give you up one way or another one. You remember? I'll bet that nice little nurse you're engaged to never wrote that, did she? What do you intend to do with it? Mark it Exhibit A in the Horton murder case. Maybe you'd like to come with me and explain it to Nero Wolf. Very moving, very flattering, very interesting if you like women. But also very incriminating, Dr. Sloan. What does it prove? A silly woman with a nervous breakdown imagined she was infatuated with me. A woman who is now dead, you must remember, under, shall we say, unusual circumstances. You signed a death certificate which stated Mrs. Horton died of a heart attack. As you signed it, Dr. Sloan, did you remember she had threatened you... And heave a sigh of relief that fate had done you such a good turn? I didn't bear Leslie any ill will. I was sorry for her. 
You felt adequate to the situation. You called another doctor. There, there are several in your building. My first thought, of course, was that it was some extraordinary allergic reaction to the vitamin dose. It was not until an hour or two after she was dead you decided she expired from a heart attack. Yes. How did you explain the pain? I, I reported no pain. Miss Banks said Mrs. Horton had pain from her head to her feet. Grace said that? Well, not in those words, but that was the general idea. Dr. Slow, why did you use a stomach pump on a heart case? Why, I, I, I told you I tried everything, sometimes an acute digestive disturbance. But... I suggest you did it because to you, as to any qualified physician, the pain in the feet suggested poisoning, a particular kind of poison, an inorganic poison. There wasn't any in her stomach. You maintain that? Archie, get the medical examiner on the phone. Tell him the body of Miss Hal Horton must be examined for any evidence of poisoning. I know you think Mrs. Horton was murdered, but it's impossible. There'd been no one near her. Miss Banks. Miss Banks couldn't have done it. She was working with me constantly. That's what I thought you'd say, Dr. Sloan. Mr. Wolf, I had to see you. This is the most dreadful thing I've ever heard of. Trying to accuse Dr. Sloan of murdering a patient. It appears he had a reason to want Mrs. Horton dead, Miss Banks. She was that thing the poets write about, a woman scorn. She had sent him this hysterical letter, threatening scandal, and if he rejected her, he couldn't control her. She kept coming back to his office, making scenes. He gave her nothing but thymon chloride. I know, I fixed the shot myself. Don't start covering for her. I'm not. I tell you, I fill the needle. And I didn't put anything but thymon chloride in it. You haven't any reason to think anybody did, except for that letter you stole. If it wasn't for that letter... Give it to me. Give it to me. Come on, Archie, quick. Now drop it, baby. Come away from that fireplace. Well, why, you little tiger kid. I didn't think you had it in you. Come on, let go of it. Let go. Give it to Papa. Now, look what you did. You almost got Nero Wolf out of his chair. Destroying evidence is a serious offense, young woman. She kept coming to the office, writing and pestering him. I heard her from the laboratory. You read her letters too, didn't you? You knew if something didn't stop her, Dr. Benjamin Sloan was a ruined man. But he didn't kill her. I know he did. I don't believe he did. You... You don't? Well, then who? You've just provided an excellent motive for having done it yourself, Miss Banks. Pears in white wine. Cold, luscious, exotic. Excellent, Fritz. Excellent. Best thing that's happened today. I don't like this Sloan case. If you ask me, I think that Horton Dane got what was coming to her. Those are not the words of abstract justice, nor the phrases of a gentleman of culture. A good detective never plays favorites. Good night's rest, and you will find your attitude more normal by morning. You expect to have this case solved by morning? It's solved now. Thanks to the expedition I sent you on this afternoon. The arrest can wait. No one will escape. I feel like a murderer myself. If I hadn't wormed it out of grace about the Horton woman complaining of pain, and if you hadn't jumped at the word feet... That, Archie, my dear fellow, is the purpose for which you exist, to discover pertinent facts. Have we quite finished? Copy in the study, then. Here's the door. I'll go. Mr. Wolfin? He isn't seeing anyone this evening, Mr. Horton. Well, he's seeing me. Archie, if that's Mr. Horton, I'll see him. You'd better... Sorry you found Mr. Goodman so impossible, Mr. Horton. He, uh, he came to pay you a call this afternoon. I sent him, but he didn't find you in, did you, Archie? No, but I made myself at home. I knew anything that would help to solve this case you'd want us to have. What do you mean? You were in my house? What did you take? Nothing of monetary value, I assure you, that will not be returned in due course. But before I announce the solution of a case, I like to have all my little props in place. I appreciate a well-rounded performance. Mr. Wolf. I've had enough of this foolishness, this, this delay. I hired you to convict Sloan, not to play parlor games. You must be patient, Mr. Horton. Don't force me. I want action. Well, I had planned to wait until the morning, but if you insist, these papers here may interest you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Goodwin here collects them, your wife's letters. Leslie's? You recognize the script? These are addressed to Dr. Sloan. Do they, uh, they prove anything against him? The lady's correspondence should be kept private. This other letter, however, was sent to you. To, to me? Leslie's? 
Watch it. Give it to me. Easy, Horton. Easy. Don't grab. Oh, but that letter's mine. You stole it from my desk. There is a point in a case, Mr. Horton, where letters cease to be personal property and become evidence. What evidence can that letter provide? It seems you had reason for wanting to kill your wife, Mr. Horton. A man can get annoyed by a note saying his wife never loved him, that all his money isn't enough, and that she's going to another man. You're accusing me of murder? It could have been the perfect crime. Poison in one of those pills she was forever taking, or on the tip of the cigarette she chain-smoked, in a doctor's office to die in. If you hadn't been fool enough to try to pin it on Sloan, you might have gotten away with it. If I had known while she was alive what Leslie was, I might have done anything. But that letter you stole from me was one she left under my pillow. I didn't find it until after she was dead. I didn't kill her. Sloan did. You hired me to prove that, Mr. Horton. Suppose you let me go about my business. Nero Wolf's office. Yeah? Oh, you did? Good boy. We'll expect you. I'll tell Mr. Wolf at once. Medical examiner's officer, just as you thought, they found poison in the body. Listen to me. Inspector Kramer's picking up Dr. Sloan and Grace. They'll be here any minute. Kramer's set to make an arrest. I told you. The police know it's Sloan. Put the letters in Mrs. Horton's bag on my desk, Archie. Leslie's alligator bag? You stole that from my house this afternoon, too. Those things are mine. Inspector Kramer will want to take them with him. But you think I wanted made public what Leslie did to me? Kramer can't have them. Maybe the inspector will want to take you, too, Mr. Horton. Let him in, Archie. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Oh. Dr. Sloan, Miss Banks. Wolf asked me to bring them here first before I locked anybody up. Mrs. Horton was murdered, all right. I'm sending a man for Horton, too. You won't have to. Mr. Horton's waiting here to join the party. Come into Mr. Wolf's office. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Wolf. Uh, will you all please range yourselves around the room as I indicate? Miss Banks here. Yes. Dr. Sloan, Mr. Horton, Archie, you stand between the two men, if you please. Mr. Wolf, this is a dreadful mistake. I swear the doctor didn't... Stop thinking about the doctor. What about you? If you're accusing Miss Banks, I might as well tell Hold you Hold it, now. Dr. Sloan. From here on, anything you say will be held against you. That's what I want. Let Grace go home and well, I'll... For say... heaven's sake, why don't you arrest the man? Isn't it obvious he's guilty? You and your trumped-up charges against me. I'll do the talking now, Mr. Horton. Mrs. Horton died from a certain inorganic poisoning. Poison administered in your office, Dr. Sloan, with a hypo syringe. Let's get it over with. I gave her the hypo. But I fill the needle. There you are. They're both guilty. Which would solve the case if they weren't lying. Miss Banks believes Dr. Sloan killed Leslie for her sake. Dr. Sloan thinks Miss Banks put poison in the hypo to save him from professional ruin. They're trying to protect each other. The fact is the hypo they gave was perfectly harmless. It did not kill Mrs. Horton. But then what did? Mrs. Horton came to your office in desperation, Dr. Sloan. But she came prepared for the worst. You see this handbag? Can any of you identify it? Yes. It, it's hers. Is it Mr. Horton? It's Leslie's. The bag she carried to the office the day she died. Open it, Archie. You will see it contains her change purse, billfold, cigarette case, matches, her handkerchief, nothing more. That is, not unless you look closely. Then you would observe this lining has a double fold. A secret compartment. Exactly. We open it this way, and there we find it. A hypodermic needle with which the unhappy woman committed suicide. Miss Banks, Dr. Sloan, you can stop protecting one another. Mr. Horton, the world need never know you were a betrayed husband. Mrs. Horton killed herself while in a confused state following a mental breakdown. The case of the malevolent medic is closed. How did you ever get the hunch about the handbag, Mr. Wolf? I know nothing about women. But on my occasional trips abroad, I have been forced to observe their handbags. Monstrosities. They hold anything and everything. <laughs> now that our guests have gone, Fritz is bringing coffee to the study. Would you like some beer? I believe I would. Somehow I feel I've earned it. Ah, uh, here you are. Poor fellow, I'm very sorry for you. How so? This is one case in which there is no falsely accused, unattached young lady for you to squire about. <laughs> well, here's to your better luck next time. Ah. You 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Ruth Adams Knight was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Bruce Payne, Bill Johnstone, and Mary Lansing. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the hasty will. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery for you every Saturday evening on NBC. For music, tomorrow your hit parade brings you the top tunes of the land with Snooky Lanson, Eileen Wilson, and Raymond Scott's orchestra. And for mystery, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man in search of adventure who travels wherever there is intrigue, danger, and romance. More good mystery at Sam Spade next on NBC. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Traubel as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake, I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, What sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir, very urgent, I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um, shall we say about, uh, oh, a thousand? I will not see any client until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake, come at once. What were you saying, boss? And found you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at a thousand dollars, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his great-grandmother. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. What we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolf was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. You passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, This way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Uh, good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. 
I'm not a member of the bar. Let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I, I haven't signed it yet. Uh, also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a staff of the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted the person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly yeah. could. Archie. Have... Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing, uh, for the time being. Indeed. You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now, the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now, then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. You retain the will, Mr. Wolf, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolf. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said, uh, a thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand uh, will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. Then, good evening, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. You have more than earned this thousand, young man. Archie! Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Boy, Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. <laughs> I'm awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now... 
Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Oh, indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. The hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin? How do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolf. John Blake has disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. Oh, what do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. What, why do you think that? Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable. Mr. Blake. To... Yes? I, I thought you were done for. That is. I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my Uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. Well, that's news to me. I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes. Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They, they were fathers. I... Oh, Wilbur. Suicide. I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. Read it, Miss. You... You read it, Wilbur. Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Archie Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolfe to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it's his, all right. But this still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodman. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will. Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he has to be delivered to you. Oh, well, now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? <clears throat> Joe says, uh, hmm, Hillary, 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia. She was rightfully yours. But I loved her, too, and I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both, and I've uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend, because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. 
uh, when Marcia died last year and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you, and I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened which you will learn soon enough that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hilary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hilary. Mm, well, this, uh, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Well, it's a nice sunny morning. Even though it is around zero outside, the sun is fine to them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium's chlorostel. The but, but... Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. I find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to uh, fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I'd just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? do? Good Good morning, Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin. What's happened? There's a body here. Rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on. This way. Same as Blake. Oh. Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes, that's Father. And you, Mr. Blake? It's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or... Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's Father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. (laughs) Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, be of us. Tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, eh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do. But not by you, of course. Certainly not. (laughs) But who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm. How interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? 
It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair, and they were twins. So enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha. Well, uh, several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. <laughs> I merely asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm. I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... You didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur, write your name here on this pad. Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. <clears throat> Thanks. Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep, but not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed, the will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes, but on the other hand, and this is unusual... By comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That it was Hillary who came to my office? Well, it's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They're still working on those down at headquarters. Uh, what about young Wilbur? And so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie, phone out to the Blake Mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. And I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss, please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. Anita. Anita. What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard. Well, what's happened? Speak up, man. You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look. Look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. Wilbur, what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall. What? Yes, closed the doors. Oh, no, Wilbur, no, I can't believe such a I'm thing. I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white. Then this is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to come up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. Oh, nonsense, he must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita, you mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now, let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her any place. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your Uncle Hillary found the hiding place. And he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. 
Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservation. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John, and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out. I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. Ah, Archie, come in, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They have also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, bring it in here, Sergeant. Just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. Pasted in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a neat order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolfe. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, it just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope, too. But he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. Inspector Gramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that little act. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. In the painting. You sensed there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. <laughs> you 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Disappearing Diamonds. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Willie Inch, did you say? Just a second. Do you want to talk to a fellow named Willie Inch, which I doubt? No. He says he's got to see you, got to. Who is he? I'll ask. Uh, Mr. Wolf doesn't recognize your name, Mr. Inch. He wants to know who you are. Uh, just a second, I'll tell him. Mr. Inch says he's a sneak thief. He says you never heard of him, but he's heard of you. Should I tell him to get lost? Wait a minute, Archie. Ask him what he wants. Uh, Inch, Mr. Wolf wants to know what you want to see him about. A phony murder rap. This is a phony murder rap. It'd have to be, wouldn't it, Archie? How do you mean? Phony, I mean. Did you ever hear of a sneak thief committing murder, if it could possibly be avoided? Yes, I'll. You tell Mr. Inch. I'll listen to his story. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes. None other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. When Mr. Wolfe and I talk about this little difficulty, he calls it the case of Archie Goodwin and how he got hooked. However, I call it the case of the disappearing diamonds. I prefer my title. He prefers his. Anyhow, it started with an improbable character named Willie Inch. That'll be our sneak thief, Archie. Let him in. Okay, boss. Okay. Inch? Yeah. Come in. In there. I'll follow you. Mr. Wolf, this is your client. Mr. Inch? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Tall fellow. Must be over six feet six. Sit down. Uh, where? Archie. Here, Mr. Inch. This ought to be comfortable. Where, well, Mr. Inch? Uh, uh, look, Mr. Wolf. They're going to claim that I killed a woman I never even touched. And I'm going to fry for something I never even done. All right, Mr. Inch. How did you kill her? I didn't. I didn't. I never killed nobody in my life. Mr. Inch, you say you're a thief. Can you prove it? Uh, I got a record. Why? I was wondering about that bulge in your pocket. Oh. Oh, here? It's, uh, it's a silver cigarette lighter, ain't it? I guess it sort of dropped into my pocket as I was going by. Y you see? You see the way it happened? Never mind, Miss Dange. Now tell me how you didn't kill the woman for whose murder you will fry. Well, well, Mr. Wolf, sir, it, it was like this. There was a window half open, you see, and I happened to crawl inside the house. But hey, now. Well, Miss Dange? This, uh, this is just between us, ain't it? Possibly. Well, how do you mean? Explain, Archie. Mr. Wolf said possibly. Oh. Well, uh, okay. So I happen to find myself in the bedroom, see? So I happen to sort of roam around, and I hear there's like a party going on. You know, people and music. So I lock the door. So go on. Let him tell it his own way, Archie. Well, Mr. Inch? Uh, so that's the mistake I make. The mistake? Uh, maybe I, I leave my fingerprints on the door. So? so? So later, a dame gets herself knocked off in the same room, and they look for fingerprints, and they find mine. I'm it. That's all. I, I got a record. So, so the chair. I see. Pitiful case, isn't it, Archie? Very, very mournful. Inch. Uh, yes, sir. 
I presume you came away with some souvenirs? Oh, nothing. It wasn't worth the trouble. You know, just odds and ends, junk. Have you got the junk with you? Yeah. Let me see. Uh, here. Cigarette case, platinum. Lighter, gold. Vanity case, gold. That's, that's all? Mm, positively. Junk, the man says. I promise nothing, Mr. Inch, but it might be better if you told the truth. Me? You. Oh, well. Mm. One square cut emerald ring. I, I just happened to find it. There's something more. A pewter ashtray. Look, the room is dark. I can't see. Piles of coats under beds and hats and handbags. I take what I find. Why didn't you turn on the lights? One of these big standing lamps. You know what I mean. Go on. I bump into it. And it scares the living... I mean, it scares me. So? I, I turn the switch. It don't work. Archie. That sounds like the law, boss. The law. Stay right where you are, will you? May I suggest there is a way to find out, Archie? Okay, okay. We don't want any. Good morning, Goodwin. You remember me, your old friend, Inspector Kramer? Two gentlemen with me are also with the department, Pearly and Ostrakovich. May we come in? What do you want? We want a murderer, and we want some rocks worth 250 grand. Does that answer your question? What makes you think you'll find all those goodies here? Come in, man. We know Willie Inch is here. Where is he? Now, just a second. We're coming with you, Goodwin. Okay, Inspector, come along. Uh, the law. That's Willie Inch. Frisk him. Uh, no weapons? Okay, just put the cuffs on him. Inspector Kramer. Oh, yes. Hello, Wolf. I want to tell you something about this man whom you and your men have so bravely captured in my office. You don't need to tell me about him, Wolf. We know about him. Do you indeed? Yes. We know he killed Mrs. Florence Avery March and stripped a quarter of a million worth of diamonds off her. That's all we need to know. I didn't do no such a thing. Where's the ice, Willie? I never even seen none, honest. Take him away, boys. I'll make the charge when I get back to my office. Wait. Uh, Mr. Wolf, sir. Take him. Look, I ain't done nothing, I tell you. Inspector Kramer. Yeah. We're going to have a little talk now, aren't we? If necessary. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf means you're going to have a little talk if necessary. Very funny. I will now draw up a chair and show you why it's necessary. In the first place, $250,000 worth of diamonds makes it necessary. Archie, if you please, a bottle of beer. Okay. Will the inspector name his poison? You know I never drink on duty. Then just for me, Archie, please. On my way. While I opened a bottle of imported beer, it occurred to me that I had something to be grateful for. At least I wasn't in Willie Inch's enormous shoes. And as I went back to the office, I had time to wonder why Mr. Wolf would stick his fat neck out for a no good like Willie. Thank you, Archie, and sit down, Archie. Inspector Kramer has a theory that may amuse you. Nero Wolf's office. It's for you, Inspector. Hello, Kramer. Yeah? A gold cigarette holder? That's all? Okay. Inspector, do you realize that you have already taken a great deal of my time? Archie. Yes, Inspector? The great Mr. Wolf just said I had a theory that might amuse you. Would you care to hear it? I can hardly wait. Okay. My theory is that both Wolf and you are receivers of stolen property and possibly guilty of murder conspiracy. So far, you got me in stitches. <laughs> Willie Inch, with a record as long as your arm, robs the home of Mrs. Florence Avery Marsh. He strangles her with a silk scarf, takes the diamond she's wearing, grabs everything else that's lying around, and then what? Is it a question? I'll tell you what. He will, too. <laughs> Archie, listen, listen. Dan Inch brings the stuff here, the stuff that's piled on Wolf's desk and the diamonds. You want me to tell you where the diamonds are? They're in that safe right there. Inspector Kramer, I know nothing about the diamonds. They are not in the safe and they're not in the house. Now, you can take my word for it, or you can get a search warrant and make a fool of yourself. I'm going to have lunch. <laughs> By two o'clock, the newspapers were full of the murder of Mrs. Florence Avery March. 
The suspect was already in custody, caught at the home of Nero Wolf, well-known private investigator. Some of the stolen jewelry had been recovered, but not the diamonds. Then we had a visit from Mr. Anson Stark, who had opened Mrs. March's door and found her dead. Stark was a big athletic guy of about 30 or so, with the large, capable hands of a surgeon or a laboratory worker. He seemed annoyed at the inconvenience we caused him, but that was only natural. That's the story, Mr. Wolf. I don't see how I can add anything more to it. Uh, you had known Mrs. March for several years, huh? Mm, casually. When you broke the door open, uh, was it difficult? Not very. You were the first into the room? There were three or four of us. We pushed in together. You saw the body of Mrs. March immediately? She was lying across the bed that was heaped with coats and hats and handbags. You knew she was dead? Of course not. In fact, somebody else discovered that she had been choked to death. And who discovered that the diamonds were gone? I don't know. I didn't. Uh, were there many diamonds, Mr. Stark? No, just a few, but big ones. She wore them on a pendant around her neck. Mr. Stark, I want to thank you again for having been so patient. I have been patient, Mr. Wolf. I have my own business to attend to. Which is? Oh, I have a small but hopeful enterprise. Electronics, tubes for radio and television. Mostly experimental. Well, that reminds me, Mr. Stark. When you entered the bedroom, was the light on or off? Uh, let me see. Of course, it was on. It must have been on. Why? Just curiosity, Mr. Stark. Oh? Anything more? That's all, except thank you for coming here. Archie, will you take Mr. Stark to the door? Mr. Stark departed like a man who'd been delayed by a petty annoyance. A few minutes later, the door buzzed. And I went, expecting anything. Anything but what was standing on the threshold when I opened up. A honey blonde. Or, to put it another way, a blonde honey. I said hello. No, more like hello. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, I'm his assistant, Archie Goodwin, and what can we do for you? Well, I'm Valerie Ladd. And I'm Archie Goodwin. Or did I tell you that? Well, that's exactly where I came in. Well, I mean, where I thought you were going to ask me to come in. Oh, come in, come in. I'm sorry. Well, is he, is he here? Wolf? Mm -hmm. uh, does he know you? No. Is he expecting you? No. I see. Of course you don't see, do you? Well, uh, this is it, Mr. Goodwin. I'm a writer. Well, I may not look like it, but that's what I am. And I want to do a, a profile, a character study of Mr. Wolf for a magazine. Uh oh Well, what's wrong? Well, you see, there's a writer named Rex Stout. Oh, I know. He's written a lot about Nero Wolf, but... Well, can't I write about him, too? I don't know if he's going to like Come on. Mr. Wolf, this is Valerie Ladd. Pardon me for not rising, Miss Ladd. It is not impolite. It is merely impracticable. Miss Ladd wants to write about you for a magazine. Please, Mr. Wolf. Nonsense. Mr. Wolf, if I could just spend a few hours with you, that would be enough. Would it indeed? Oh, yes. Have you written much, Miss Ladd? Oh, reams. You know, uh, the habits of writers interest me. The habits? Yeah, the writing habits. For instance, do you use a pen or a pencil? Do you dictate, or like most writers, do you do your own typing? Mr. Wolf, if you knew the hours and days and, and years that I've pounded the typewriter. Of course. Archie. Yes, sir. Why don't you take Miss Ladd up and you take Miss Ladd up and show her the orchids? You never know about Nero Wolf. At least I never do. This was something I would have bet against a thousand to one. I couldn't understand it. But I certainly couldn't complain. Archie, look at this one. Oh, did you ever see anything so gorgeous? Very pretty. Ah, they're all just beyond belief. Yeah. But you're not even looking at them, Archie. What? Oh. <laughs> Archie, are you always like this? What do you mean, like this? Well, so... So distant and preoccupied. Honey, you got me wrong. Completely. I was thinking. Oh. Yeah, about telephone numbers. Well, it's a lovely thing to think about. What can you think about telephone numbers? I was thinking how some girls have them and some don't. Oh, I see. Archie, I apologize. For what? I did have you wrong. You're not a bit distant. I can be a lot closer than this, honey. What is it? What's what? The number. Oh, it's, uh, it's in the book. Yeah? 
No wonder. Mm-hmm. Sound as if you don't believe me. Oh, I believe you, but uh, here's a telephone book here. Let's lick it up together, shall we? Uh, Archie. Yeah. I, I'm afraid I lied to you. I was afraid of that, too. Are you angry? Well, I can take no for an answer, honey. Even when it's hard to take. Archie, I've changed my mind. I want you to have my number. And I want you to use it, too. You know, honey, I'm beginning to take an interest in this dialogue. Let's have it. Okay. Olympia 9, 3659. And a very, very pretty number it is. Valerie... Lad, two Ds. Mm-hmm. Olympia nine three six five nine. Honey blonde, gorgeous. Oh, spelled <gasps> gorgeous. There. Uh, what are we doing tonight, Olympia nine? And I said that you were distant and preoccupied. Uh, we were talking about tonight. <laughs> All right, Archie. Yes, I'd love it. Oh, these orchids—they're oh, really beyond belief. And you won't even look at them. True. I'm too busy looking at you. Well, how do I look, Archie? Beyond belief, honey. <laughs> beyond belief. Well, there goes the good one luck again. It's a house phone part. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. He wants us to come down. Archie. Yes, dear. Even if he says no, we uh, we still have a date? Honey, though the heavens fall. When we entered the office, Mr. Wolf was frowning over a sheet of letter paper in his hand. He looked up and tossed the paper to me. That is a peculiar thing, Archie. The sheet of letter paper just arrived. Since Miss Ladd is interested in detection, show it to her. Thank you. Well, well, some sort of code, isn't it? Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P. That's all. What do you suppose it means? You're kidding. Archie. Oh. What? Did I say something wrong? No, 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 no. Miss Laird, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I haven't time for an interview just now. Goodbye, Miss Laird. Oh, but Mr. Wolf. Goodbye, Archie. Say goodbye to Mr. Wolf and let's go, honey. Goodbye. That's the way things can be around here. Well, here's the door, and shall we, uh, shall we pause for station identification? Hmm. <sighs> I'll wipe it off, Archie. There. Thanks. Well, what happened, Archie? Yes, indeed. Yeah, oh, Mr. Wolf, I mean. Oh. Why did he suddenly want me to go? Well, I'll tell you, though. I don't know whether I should. That, that code message he showed you? Yes. Quirk you up. You remember. Yeah, sure. Because I use a typewriter. From left to right, it's the first bank of letters on any typewriter. I see. It was a test. Yeah. And you flunked it, baby. You're no writer. Archie, I I, I can explain Sure, sure, sure. Tonight. Tonight, Archie. You do believe me, don't you, Archie? Oh, of course, baby, of course. Well, it's just that I was there at the party, I mean, when, when poor Florence was murdered... Then I read in the paper about, well, how they caught the man at Nero Wolf's. And I always wanted to be a writer, so I thought if I could get an exclusive interview and... Well, that would be a good way to start my career, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, it would. Uh, pardon me a second, will you, Valerie? i got to make a phone call. There's a booth. It'll only take a minute or two. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm at the Riviera with Valerie Ladd. I'm happy for you, Archie. I will remind you that I have not seen you since Valerie left the house. I was otherwise occupied, Archie. With orchids. With orchids? What do you want, Archie? Look, with that typewriter gag, you practically told me she was a phony, didn't you? Of course, of course. Just for the record, how did you know? Have you looked at her fingernails? She never touched a typewriter in her life. I wanted to be sure. Okay, now... Now, do you want me to tell you something? You mean that your charming companion, Valerie, was at the party when Mrs. March was murdered? How did you know that? Simple, Archie. 
I got a list of the guests from Inspector Kramer. Among them was the name of Valerie Ladway. Simple? Ladway. Lad. Yeah, sure. Okay, what am I supposed to do about it? Just hang on, Archie. Just hang on. I went back to the honey blonde, the beautiful phony Valerie Ladd, Ladway. I mean, I went back to the table where she should have been, but she wasn't there. I sat down and waited. Looked at my watch, 11.24. 11.32, no Miss Ladway. 11.45, I finally realized that not only Valerie, but her coat and bag were also absent. I called the waiter. Yes, sir? Uh, what happened to my friend? The young lady left some time ago, sir. Okay, give me the bill. She paid it, sir. She did? Yes, sir. In fact, she said you gave her the money for it. Yeah? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, I didn't know it, but she is certainly right. Oh, oh my. Well, Archie, this is most thoughtless of you. Sorry, I, uh... I lost my keys. My money, too. Your keys, Archie? Yeah. Glad you were still up. You lost Miss Ladway, too? Definitely. I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. You think it's funny, don't you? <laughs> yes, Archie. Yes, yes, I do. Good night, Mr. Wolf. Archie. Yeah? Before you retire, one thing. What? Open the safe, will you? And leave it open. Why? Because there's nothing in it of importance. And it's a valuable save and I don't want it damaged. Good night, Archie. At about two o'clock in the morning, I thought I heard a noise. I got up, put on the rest of my pajamas, picked up my gun and went down to the office. The man had his head in the safe and everything was scattered all over. I stepped inside the door. Put your hands behind your back and stand up. Okay. Now, just what are you after, bud? Uh... When I woke up, I was alone on the office floor. I did not feel good. The place looked as if a hurricane had struck it. Every file drawer had been empty. I felt a draft from somewhere. Got to my feet, trying not to joggle my head too much. It was the front door standing open. I closed it gently. Then very, very gently, I groped my way to the kitchen for ice, water, and towels. Archie! What? Oh, didn't you hear me scream? No. Is it bad? It's better. You're angry, aren't you? Nuts. What, Archie? I said nuts, Mr. Wolf. Nuts. I'm sorry about what happened. Yeah, you expected it. But I didn't expect you to be caught by somebody behind you. You must have known there would have been two of them. Now, how would I know that? How? Think of Miss Ladway's delicate hands. Do you believe she intended to open the safe herself? You think she stole my keys and so on. Well, let me tell you... Hey, wait. That guy was digging in the safe that... Then who hit me in the head? (laughs) Ah, gee, someday you'll be the death of me. In the morning, will you tell Inspector Kramer I'd like to see him here? Fuming and protesting, Kramer arrived about 1.30. When I let him into the office, Mr. Wolf was gazing thoughtfully at the ground floor plan of the house of the late Mrs. Florence Avery March. We'd gotten it from the original architects. Wolf looked up and almost smiled. Thank you for coming to me, Inspector. You know how difficult it is for me to come to you. Okay, okay, what's up? I take it you haven't found the diamonds. No, not yet. We'll break inch down, though. Don't think we won't. Oh, I'm sure. But this is what I want to ask you, and it's quite serious. Okay, okay, all right, what? After the body was found, your men arrived at the house before anyone left. Right. And before anybody was allowed to go, every person was searched thoroughly. Nobody could have gotten a pin or a needle out of that place. I know something about police methods, and I believe you. Now, how thoroughly did you search the house itself? Wolf, look. 
We've got that floor plan you're studying now. There are no hidden closets. Every square inch of that house has been examined. The diamonds aren't there. Willie Inch killed the dame and snatched the diamonds. What he did with them, we'll find out. Possibly, possibly. Goodbye, Inspector. At approximately 3.15, the postman arrived with an envelope for me. The envelope contained my keys, the bill from the Riviera, and the money left after the check was paid. At approximately 5.07 p.m., I discovered that Wolf had been using the telephone all by himself. He explained. He was going to have a party. He had invited all of the guests who were at Mrs. Florence Avery March's somewhat fatal party, including Anson Stark, Willie Inch, and Valerie. Near old Wolf, the natural-born ham, he made an entrance that would have been worthy of Queen Victoria in her heavier days. He sat in his oversized throne behind his oversized desk and beamed at the peasants. Valerie moved toward me. I'm, I'm sorry, Archie, but you must know why I did it. Why? But you said I wasn't a writer. I wanted to prove that you weren't a detective. Did you take the stuff while we were dancing? I could have, couldn't I? You could have bumped me on the head last night, too, couldn't you? Oh, Archie. Let it go. It was humiliating, though. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you realize the purpose of this party. We want to know who killed Mrs. March and what became of her diamonds. Mr. Inch. Uh, yeah? When you visited the room where the body was found, the room was dark? Uh, the bulb was burned out. I tried to turn it on. If there had been a body on the bed, would you have seen it? Maybe. With all those coats, maybe not. Sir. Sure. Mr. Stark? Yes, I said the light was on. Perhaps I was wrong. What of it? You're engaged in the manufacture of tubes for radio and television, huh? I told you that. Inspector Kramer. Yeah, why? A light bulb was found in the wastebasket in the room where Mrs. March died. Yeah. Like you said, we tried the bulb in the socket and it worked. So what? One more question. Does anybody remember whether Mr. Stark was carrying a bundle or a package... Under his arm when he arrived at Mrs. March's party. Oh, I do, Mr. Wolf. I think he had a box of flowers. That's true. I did bring flowers. No, Mr. Stark. That box contained two parts of a light bulb and some adhesive. During the party, you strangled Mrs. March, put the diamonds into the light bulb, assembled the thing, and screwed it into the lamp socket. Archie, stop him! Really, Archie, it was quite simple. Light bulbs are only a stem glass bowl and a brass sheet. Yet nobody, including the police, would think of looking inside one. And Mr. Stark could come back and collect his treasure any time after the excitement had died down. What's the matter, Archie? I got a headache. Valerie Ladd. Led me. Poor girl. She and whoever the man was with her must have thought the diamonds were here. That bump on your head will be better in the morning. A bottle of beer, please, Archie. I'm going to bed. <laughs> yes. Why must you place such confidence in women? Remember what happened to Mark Antony and Samson and Archie Goodwin. <laughs> Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. This is an Edwin Fadiman production. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and G.G. Pearson, Bud Heaston, Gray Stafford, Dick Ryan, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Midnight Ride. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. 
Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, yeah, hello, Doc, how are you? <laughs> what? In trouble, you? <laughs> More trouble, you track trouble, Archie, hang up. It's our dentist, Dr. Thrumming. Let him wait. We never can find him when we need him. Tell him it's after office hours. Doc, Doc, you're talking so fast, I can't make head and the tails of it. Look. Look, listen, Doc. Come on over here and we'll be able to hear you. It'll only take you a few minutes. Right. You consistently disobey me. I want to work on my paper about odontocosms. Doc Thrummick has a friend who's in some trouble and he needs our advice. Besides, we owe Doc a fair-sized little bill, remember? Money again, Archie. Money is the curse of our times. Yeah, man. Bring on all the curses that is available. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This story is one we refer to as the case of the Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah, there was a ride, all right. But it would never have happened if we hadn't received another phone call a few minutes after our Dr. Thrummig phone. It was late in the evening, and Nero Wolf was studying his paper on orchids while I was absorbed in playing some phonograph records. Archie, Archie, not so loud. I can't possibly think when you play that infernal thing at such volume. What was that you said, boss? I said I can't understand why you can't get music from a phonograph without vibrating the top of the instrument. That's right, that's right. I can't understand why the neighbors haven't called the police. Do you hear that, Archie? Archie! All right, I'll answer. You're fired, naturally. Hello? Hello. Is this Archie Goodwin? I know, Mr. Wolf's... What? Me? Archie. Yeah, who is it? I need help, Archie, please. Come at once. Please. Oh, please. You and Nero. Who is this? This is Gloria Bo- No. No, don't. Gloria who? Ronaldo West. Hello? Hello? Well, did you hear that? Another female bar. What happened? Boss, who do you know named Gloria? Gloria? I know nothing about anyone named Gloria. She said her name was Gloria something. I couldn't quite get the last name. But she did say Ronaldo Road. Well, it's quite possible that she resides on Ronaldo Road. First she asked if this was Archie Goodwin speaking, and before I had a chance to say anything, she asked me to come to her at once. She needed help. And for you to bring me along. I mean, for me to bring Nero along. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, she said she was Gloria Barr or Mar or something like that. And then she said Ronaldo Road West. And then the scream, and that's all there was. Hmm. The usual pattern of your experience with women. Sounded like a hand was slapped over her mouth or she was grabbed by the throat. Bring Nero with you. I am taking no more assignments this week. Ronaldo Road West. Where is it? I don't believe there is a Ronaldo Road West. If I remember correctly, Ronaldo Road runs north and south and is approximately 12 miles long. But she said west. What she probably tried to say when she was interrupted was Ronaldo Road West Chester. West Chester, of course. Asked Inspector Kramer to try to check on that phone call. I'll ask him to try. By the way, do you expect to find this Gloria alive, Archie? I certainly hope so. And are you aware that if someone strangled her, then they must have heard her speak your name? Yes, and yours too. Shall I open it, boss? Why not? Let us face it, Archie. Huh? It's me, Archie. Oh, 
Wait till I slide the night chain off, Dr. Thrummy. Yeah, my nose. <laughs> I forgot all about you, Doc. Where have you been? <laughs> it's only been three or four minutes. I've never had such a disturbing night since I had my first patient. But at first I was afraid to leave the house. And why were you so afraid, Dr. Thrummy? Well, there were two men sitting in front of my place in the car. Oh, oh good evening, Nero. Uh, were they waiting for you, Doctor? Well, why not? It's very likely. Since she called me, I've been so completely unnerved. Here, Doc, I... here. Have some brandy. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, I never... Uh, well, that is... Uh, well, a small one. I, I am upset. Uh, you understand, Archie. Uh, 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 oh, well, that's better. Just who called you and upset you, sir? Oh, hello, Nera. Did someone call me? Uh, when? You phoned me frantically that a woman called you. I couldn't understand you on the phone. Oh, yes, yes, poor Gloria. She was cut off. Oh, Gloria. Did you say Gloria? Well, didn't I? I thought I did. Oh, dear. What did you say? I said Gloria. Oh, my, isn't that strange? I thought that's what I said. No, no, no more, please. We just had a call from Gloria. Who is Gloria? Well, you remember. We all went to school together. Uh, that is... Oh, you do too remember. Uh, Gloria, you know, she was... Um... Uh, just what is Gloria's last name, Dr. Thrumming? Well, it was Gloria Barnesworth. I don't know what it is now. That's what she was trying to say to me, Barnesworth. Did she tell you where to find her? Uh, no, she didn't. Uh, oh, dear me. She was just about to tell me when I said I'd call you and Archie and get your help. And then she was cut off. How do you know she's the Gloria Barnesworth you knew and I'm supposed to know? My. Uh, could you open the windows? Why, yes. Archie. Uh, oh, sorry, Doc. The air outside's contaminated. Oh, is that so? With what? Oxygen. Mm, oh, these factories, factories, factories. Oh, well, I found her picture in an old class photo. Here it is. Oh, yeah, now I remember. But, Doc, you and this gal were several years ahead of me in school. I, I'm not in this picture, so she must be about 40 now. Well, gentlemen, you both seem to have the situation well in hand now. So, if you'll excuse me, I will retire to my room. Oh, oh, oh yes, but we don't have anything figured out yet. Ah, but you will. Let me know in the morning how successful you have been. Good night. Well, anyway, a woman called here, and just as she was about to tell me who she was and her address, she was cut off as though she was strangled. Yeah, Archie, did you say someone strangled her? I don't know, Doc. I hope not. Well, let's start our search along Ronaldo Road. Hey, hey, Archie, Archie, don't answer it. They're after me. The men in the car, they saw me come in here. After you, nonsense. They found out Gloria phoned me. Don't let them in. Now, how could you know all that? Oh, dear me. Do you mind? A short one? I'm so weak today. Please, Archie, don't open it. I warn you. Now just relax, Doc. I'll handle this. Good evening. Evening. Are you Archie Goodwin? Uh, no, he is. Yes. No, I'm not. He is. Put up your hands. Unhook the night chain. Now just turn off this light. Oh, I told you. I told you. Where's Wolf? Oh, he's been in bed for hours. And who is this little man? Uh, why, I'm... Don't you know? This is my, uh, my, my brother, Brother Cuthbert. Yes, he's quite right. I'm a bit older than he is. Shut up, uh... Cuthbert. All right, get your coats and hats off that rack. What for? We're all going for a little ride along the river. And it's a bit chilly. Oh, dear me. Uh, I feel faint. I'm getting dizzy. Get your hat. Uh, yes, sir. And put that bottle down. Yes, but it's so cold out there. Get along. I... Here's the car. Now, Mr. Goodwin, hand over that gun in your pocket. But I haven't got... Okay, there you are. Thank you. Now, get in the car. You get in the front seat with the driver, Goodwin. Your brother can get back with me. Okay, you know where we're going, driver. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah, but I... what? Get going. But do you know who this guy is? I do. Why? Well, now, look, I... Well, this guy is Archie Goodwin. What if he is? Well, this won't work. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be Goodwin. He's with Nero Wolf. What's your name, pal? I can't see you, but I seem to recognize your voice. Well, well, you see, it was like this. I was in a... Are you going to shut up and start driving? Okay, okay, I'm going. Now, see here, it's getting very late. I, I don't like this. Uh, where are you taking us? Keep calm, Doc. Yeah, don't get excited. Just take it easy. Listen, Goodwin, I got a record Shut for up, you. Shut my... What's the idea back of all this, friend? We're off the road here, driver. Yes, but we're way out in the country. Now, we'll all get out here. Now, wait a minute. I said get out. You too, driver. Oh, now, wait a second. What's the big idea? Now, all of you start walking over to that clump of trees. Go on. What's he going to do? What do you think? 
Okay, that's good. Just stand there. Now get out your gun, driver. Get... Oh, now wait a minute. This is Get out way your you... gun and don't turn around, driver. Now let him have it. Go on, or I'll kill you. I don't go in for this kind of stuff. Besides, come on. Shoot your gun into them. Go on. Now just drop your gun on the ground. There. Now, I will take Goodwin's gun, and after I finish with it, I'll just toss it over beside his body. You what? Hey, now, wait a minute. You'll notice I have gloves on. Hey, Doc. Dr. Thrumming. You all right, Doc? Oh. Oh, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got you into this. I... I can't last long. Where are you hit? Tell Nero I make him a present of his new bridge work I put in. Let me have a look at you. I wanted to die in my bed with my friends around You're me. You're not bleeding. I wanted the choir to sing. What? I'm not bleeding? No. Are you? No. The driver was a bad shot. He missed both of them. Then what am I doing down here on the ground? You fainted at the first shot. I dropped purposely on the second shot. He missed every time. Come on, get up from there. Uh, We're very lucky people. Uh, what became of them? Hand me my gun. Uh, oh, is this your gun? Wrap it in this handkerchief. Come over here. Yep. Here he is, the driver. And he's dead. This is dreadful, Archie. What do we do now? You got a lighter? Uh, here's my pocket flash. Well, here's his gun beside him. Don't touch it. Have a look through his pockets. Wish I knew what he meant when he said he had a record for me someplace. A picture of a girl says to Mike from Violet. Mike. Mike. This fellow's face is certainly familiar, but I can't... Hey, wait a minute. Mike. Mike... Mike Jordan, that's it. Mike Jordan? Yeah, Wolf cleared him on a frame-up three years ago, and this, uh, this girl Violet is an entertainer in a nightclub downtown. Uh, Violet, yes, but what does all this have to do with Gloria? Strange, there's no other identification on him. Maybe the other guy took it off of him. Well, now we got to find Violet. How? We can't even find Gloria. I think now that this guy, Mike Jordan, missed us deliberately. Let's start hoofing it back to that last crossroad. There was a telephone there. I'll call Nero. So that's the story so far, Mr. Wolf. Sorry to wake you up, but we wanted you to know. Yes, we did. Oh, such a night. What was your reason for telling the man that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? Well, I didn't want him to know that it was Doc because Gloria had called Doc and he must have known about it. And the driver turned out to be Mike Jordan. And what did Mike say to you in the car? Well, he didn't finish, but he said, I got a record for you, Goodwin. It... And then the man shot him up. And when you located Violet at her place, she was cataloging recordings, hmm? Bring it in here now, Archie. Sit down, Dr. Thrumming. Uh, yes, yes, I am a bit weary. Come in, Violet. Uh, Violet, this is... Hey, wait a minute. You, you're you Nero Wolf. Sit down, Miss Violet. Well, what's the idea, Mr. Goodwin? Why'd you bring me here? Will you look at this photo? It says, to Mike from Violet. Where'd you get this? I got it, Violet. What we want to know is, where's Mike now? What's he doing? Can you tell us where he lives? What's Mike done now? Can you tell us his address? Maybe. Do you know who he has been working for? Yeah. A guy with a big car and a lot of dough. You seen this man? Yeah, kind of a good-looking guy. I think his name is Durant or, or something like that. I understand you've been occupying yourself with cataloging some phonograph recordings. Yeah, that's what I was doing when Mr. Goodwin came in. Mike's got a home recorder over at his place. Do you have all the records that have been made on the machine so far? No, just what we made in the last week. Lots more at his place. Do you and Mike know of a woman named Gloria? No, at least I don't remember. It was on Rinaldo Road. Gloria Barnesworth was her maiden name. Where is this Rinaldo Road? I, I don't know. It's in Westchester, we think. I've never been there. What has Mike done, Mr. Wolfe? Is it bad? As a matter of fact, Mike is in the clear. Good. There is no charge against him, and there never will be. You haven't seen him for a couple of days? No. And I never go to his apartment unless him and some guests are there. Do you know where he is? Will you give me the address of his apartment? Okay. 
324 East 35th Street. Thank you very much, young lady. What's all so mysterious? Oh, something's happened to Mike. I can tell by the way you talk. Very well, Archie. You have a special visit to make. Look for the machine, and it's quite late, so you had best hurry. Well, I'm going with you, Archie. Uh, good night, Nero. Oh, I mean, good morning. Oh, I don't even know what day it is. Come along, Violet. We'll drop you at your place first. Well, there we are, Doc. Yes, has his name right on it. Mike Jordan. You know, we're fairly certain that no one's in there. Hey, what do you know? It didn't lock. The lights are on. I know. I know. Listen. Yes, a light humming noise. Huh. But where is it coming from? Over in that corner, those wall cabinets. There it is. A radio. And a phonograph combination. Yes, and a recording machine. And the recording arm's still down on the record. I'll just lift it off and put the playback needle on. Yeah, there we are. But look, I don't go in for that kind of stuff. You've been working for me for several weeks now, haven't you? Well, sure, boss, but I never went in for no kind We're of going to pick this guy up and take him for a little ride. It ain't my life. All you do is drive the car. Okay, I'll take a chance. But remember, I'm just the driver of your car. If anything happens, I didn't know nothing. You'll do just as I say. Incidentally, I know a lot about you. Things the police would like to know. Okay. Okay, I'm working for you. I came out to Ronaldo Road to make an honest living. But I see I'm right back where I started. And worse, the guy just ain't got a chance. Oh, remind me. I've got to phone the place. did say Ronaldo Road. And that's where our Gloria called from, so they're all tied in together. Come along, Doc. We're going back to Mr. Wolf again, and we'll just take this record with us. Well, Archie, I guess this phonograph was worthwhile after all. Yes, indeed. Hey, don't you find this a very interesting recording, Nero? I'm sure we're going to add it to our collection. And these are the two men who took you on the right. That's right. But we're really no further along in our desire to help, Gloria. That's right. We're on Ronaldo Road. Boss, if we can find the address, will you go with us down there or over there or wherever it is? I might. And you already have the clue to the address. We have. Where? In that phonograph recording. Play it again, Archie. Just the part where he uses the telephone. And slow the speed way down. Then take down the numbers I call off. Okay, boss. Six, five, three, two, two, three. That's enough. By slowing down the record, we were able to count the clicks of each number he used on the dial. Now, there's the number the man called. We hope it is on Ronaldo Road. Have Inspector Kramer get the address of that number combination, and we are ready to make our assault. I'll call Kramer, and then I'll get the car out. It hadn't been out for weeks. Maybe it won't start. <laughs> no such luck, Archie, I assure you. No such luck. Oh, here it is. I think we must go through this big gate. Uh, yes, yes, there's the number. 23, Ronaldo. Slip up to the entrance as softly as possible. Turn out your headlamps. Here we are, boss. Easy now, getting out. 
Don't pull it up, Captain. Don't pull on me. Yeah. There we are. Now come along. Yeah, spooky sort of place, isn't it? All big houses are like that. Must be 20 rooms. Yeah. There's not a light in the place. Use the knocker, Archie. Stand back. Here comes somebody. Yes? Uh, is Gloria in? What? Gloria? And who are you? Uh, uh, we are here to see Gloria. Uh, uh, come, come. It's this hour of the night? Certainly not. Uh, just a moment. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, yes, and his too. He's Archie. My good man, what is your name? Uh, Jennings, sir. In the um, household is in bed at this hour. What is it, Jennings? Who's at the door? Uh... They're asking for you, Miss Gloria. For me? Well, come in, gentlemen. You may go, Jennings. Please. Very well, miss. Just as you say. Now, what did you want? Say, Doc, is this the Gloria? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem... Are you Gloria? Yes. Well, why did you call us? Oh, then then you're Archie Goodwin. Yes, and I'm Dr. Thrilling. Uh, but you I are... called you because I need your help. Desperately. Gloria, oh. what is going on here at this hour? Oh, and who are these gentlemen? Well, you... You see, Uncle, Mr. Goodwin came... Came to see you? Why? Well, I... Because I... I think you'd better go to your room, my dear. Don't you think that is best? Your room and rest? No. No, I don't want to. I won't. Go to your room. No. No, I won't. I can't. All those people walk in and out. They want to kill me. Jennings, take her to her room. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, please. No. No, I won't. I won't. Let me go. There are hundreds of people. They'll kill me. Come along. No, no. Please. No. I'm so sorry. But there's nothing we can do with her. Now, Mr. Goodwin. Yeah? What is it you wish? The girl called you Uncle. Oh, pardon me. I'm near a wolf. How do you do, Mr. Wolf? Yes, she called me Uncle, but I'm not really a relative. I'm Dr. Gunther, retained by the family. As you can see... The girl is quite ill. Uh, well, we're old friends of Gloria's, and we'd like to see her. But you just saw her. We don't refer to this young lady. We have in mind the elderly Gloria. Now, come, Dr. Gunther. You know to whom we refer. What? You, you mean the girl's aunt? Well, it's very strange. If you are a friend of the aunt's, that you are not aware of her condition. Her condition? Yes. The aunt has been bedridden for nearly a year. Paralysis. And it seems to be most coincidental with your visit, but she passed away this afternoon. Died? Gloria? This afternoon? But how could that be? We'd like to see the remains, Dr. Gunther. Yes, we'd like to see the remains. Just where are they? They are here, Mr. Goodwin. And if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way to the small parlor. There you are, gentlemen. I'll leave you alone. I'll be in the library. Well, gentlemen, there she is. What do you say? Do you recognize this woman? Well, yeah. It's been many years, but that is Gloria Barnesworth. Well, good heavens, yes. It's Gloria, all right. Poor woman. I remember now. She married a very wealthy manufacturer named Kenton, who died. She's remained a widow, I guess. Uh, he said she died this afternoon. Are you sure it was an elderly woman who called you this evening? And by the way, just feel her forehead. It's warm. She couldn't have been dead more than an hour. She isn't dead. No signs of pulse. Your cigarette case, please. Hmm. Very slight moisture. Respiration, barely perceptible. She's under heavy narcosis. Been given a heavy dose lately. Uh, let's get out of here. Wait. Do you recognize the uncle? Rather, Dr. Gunther? No, do you throw me? No. Does he look like the man who took you for a ride? It was too dark, boss. And he was all bundled up in heavy clothes. Let's get out of here. The door was locked after we came in. He's right. Come on, Doc. Let's put our shoulders to it. One, two... Go! Well, gentlemen, what on earth does this mean? Why'd you lock the door? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's a spring lock. I had no intention of locking the door. And I suggest, Archie, that you have it repaired. 
And now, Archie, will you step to the door and let Inspector Kramer in? He followed us up the driveway. Yeah, about time. Getting cold out here. Inspector Kramer, this is Dr. Gunther. In that room is a woman he claims is dead. She is actually under the heavy influence of narcotics. Yeah? Well, who is she? Mrs. Gloria Canton, widow of the wealthy shoe manufacturer. And this attractive young lady coming down the stairs is supposed to be mentally ill, which I do not believe. Her name is Gloria, too. A niece of the elder Gloria. But Archie and I both knew Gloria Barnesworth. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. And I suggest that this man is not a doctor, but is young Gloria's husband... And they're attempting to force the Aunt Gloria to change her will in their favor. This is utterly ridiculous. The aunt was able to phone Doc Thromig and me tonight, but she was apparently caught in the act. And this man, who is posing as the uncle, hired Mike Jordan to drive his car while he picked up Archie with the intent of killing him. But this, this is the same man? The same. And if Mike Jordan hadn't recognized Archie, both of you would be quite dead. This man double-crossed Mike and killed him. Believing that the whole thing would be blamed on Mike. Mike deliberately missed. All right, so what's he going to do about it? Come on, let's get out of here fast. Look out, he's a cop. <laughs> All right, now get those hands up and keep them up. Come along, Archie. I have another appointment. The inspector can handle it from here on. Oh, oh dear me, I... Now, what happened? Uh, am I all right? Yeah, you just fainted again when the shooting started. Oh. It's really quite fortunate that Mike Jordan recorded that conversation. Fortunate indeed. How did you know this uncle was the same guy who took us for a ride? First by his speech pattern, he is undoubtedly a Canadian. But you must have missed the most important slipper. What was that? When he escorted us to see the body, he said to you, Archie, if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way... Now, uh, how would he believe that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? No one mentioned it. Of course, the clue I planted and then missed myself. Quite right, Archie, quite right. What time is it? Uh, 8 a.m. I certainly appreciate your coming out for me on this deal. Oh, but I didn't do it just for you. There is an orchid lover's convention this morning at 9 o'clock. What? And you mean... Yes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it tremendously. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, brother. Uh huh. What's that? What's that? Nothing, Doc. Nothing at all. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Howard McNear, Gene Bates, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, Grace Lennard, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Final Page. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Oh, Fritz. Yeah, I thought it was the outside line. Yeah? Yes, thanks. I'll be right down, Fritz. Boss, Mr. Wolf, will you please hurry? You're well aware that it will avail you nothing to hurry me? Why is Mr. Ware being such a rush today? But the car, it's downstairs waiting. Fritz is all ready. Let him wait. Isn't it enough that I've agreed against my better judgment to leave the comforts of home to go rushing through the crashing traffic of the city? To a dinner, that should be an inducement. Fritz could have prepared a delicious dinner. He has truffles in the pantry. Well, why did you promise Arthur Merle? You didn't have to accept the invitation. Quite so. He's an old friend. Besides, he does set an excellent table. It's just that I don't like the traffic. Traffic? <laughs> 
I know why. It's that awful oxygen in the atmosphere outside. It's not the traffic. Archie, you're talking much too much. I know, boss. I'm impatient. Would you mind giving me some slight indication that you intend to move from that chair? Just as soon as I finish this beer. Sure you wouldn't care for half a dozen sandwiches before we go to dinner? If we were going anywhere other than to Arthur Merrill's, I'd agree with you. He's the only person in the world I know of, except myself, of course, who has a proper appreciation and respect for the art of preparing good food. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We usually refer to this story as the case of the final page. Under normal circumstances, the last page of a manuscript would be absolutely worthless unless you read all the preceding pages. But in this instance, the final page held the answer to a murder. Without that page, we couldn't arrive at the solution. Actually, we didn't even know the problem. Anyhow, I finally got Nero Wolf to the lobby of Arthur Merle's apartment building. Going up. Going up. Up, please. Are you going up, gentlemen? Are you, honey? Certainly. It's my job. Then so are we. After you, boss. When did they install women elevator operators in this building? I've been here for two years. Floor, please. Arthur Merle's apartment, I believe. It's 814. That's right. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, no. This is Mr. Wolf. I'm Archie Goodwin. Although the name Wolf would be much more appropriate for him than for me. How did you know he was Mr. Wolf? Mr. Merle came in half an hour ago. He mentioned that he was expecting you. You see, Archie, you rush me unnecessarily. We practically preceded him here, and we'll probably have to wait interminably for dinner. I just hate to be late. Arthur Merrill has never been on time in his life. He's no more punctual than any other writer. He's never been known to meet a deadline on time. This is your floor, gentlemen. Arthur Merrill is just down the hall to the right, 814. Uh, thank you. And uh, by the way, I want to compliment you on your congenial attitude, miss. I'll speak to the management. Oh, thank you, sir. Decent of you. Uh, what's your name, huh? Women are usurping everything. Really cost to live here. Merle's really in the chips. Every book he writes sells a million copies. Remember the last time we had dinner with Arthur Merle? I do. Delicious. Mountain quail shot them himself. Yeah, he's quite a marksman. Archie, such proficiency as Arthur Merrill displayed in hunting is evidence of a wasted life. Sure, he probably never made over $500,000 a year in his whole life. Well, ring again. Don't just stand there. Surely he's expecting us. The elevator operator said he was? Yeah, she seemed quite well informed. If I were a judge of women, which I am not, I'd say she has a line on every male in the building. She can get a line on me anytime she wants. Archie, your insatiable interest in the female seems sometimes to border on the psychopathic. You know a more pleasant way to go crazy? Phooey. It's strange as a light on in there. I can see it under the door. Shall I try the door? Do so, Archie. Thank you. Mm, unlocked. Well, at least we can get in. He may be in the bedroom. Probably in the kitchen. I'll just sit here. <sighs> I must forgo the comforts of my own home. I certainly intend to avail myself of the comforts of Arthur Merle's. Hmm. Very much over-decorated. You wouldn't like heaven unless they had orchids and beer. Hmm. Not a chair in the place worthy of the name. Well, I'll try that divan while you have a look around. For what? Arthur Merle, of course. Suppose you have a look in the study. Maybe writing. Have a look, my boy. I am exhausted and thirsty. See if he has any... Boss! Vi- Boss! Good heavens, Archie. Don't shout. Uh, I'm coming. It's Arthur Merle. Look. Slumped over his desk. A knife in his back. Yeah. He's quite dead. You haven't touched anything? Certainly not. I've been around long enough to know that. Well, you just call Inspector Kramer at Homicide. 
How long do you think he's been dead? I'd say a half hour. From all appearances, yes. And perhaps only ten minutes. I can't understand it. Why would anyone want to kill Arthur Merle? Everybody liked him. Nice man I'd expect such a thing to happen to. The answer is probably a considerable distance from the question, Archie. Inspector Kramer, homicide. Archie Goodwin, Inspector. Just a minute, Nero Wolf wants to speak to you. Oh, no. Don't tell me you two have started up something on a night like this. It's ten below zero. I'm sorry. Here you are, boss. Hello, Inspector. Yes? What is it this time, Wolf? Find a dead body on the Grant's tomb? I'm sorry you'll forgive any apparent failure to find humor in your little witticism. But I'm at Arthur Merle's apartment. I suggest you come here at once. Seems that Arthur finally met a deadline. So, you just walked in here and found Merle dead, huh? We were invited here for dinner. Hmm. Anyone else around when you got here? No. You see anyone, Goodwin? Only the elevator operator who brought us up. Well, Mr. Wolf, since you were in on the ground floor, maybe you've got some ideas. Sorry, Inspector. Had I been able to solve the crime so soon, I would have advised you, Inspector. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's obviously murder. Obviously. You knew him well? Quite well. Ever know of his being in any trouble? No. Everybody liked him. Arthur Merle, I felt, didn't have an enemy in the world. Is that so? I don't think anybody pulled this as a little friendly gesture. Don't jump to conclusions, Inspector. That this murder was committed necessarily by an enemy of Merle's. Meaning? It could have been an absolute stranger. A woman? Or a burglar? Or a madman? Or a crank? Or... As far as we know, it could have been anybody in the city, Inspector. Arthur's been dead nearly an hour. And an hour ago, I was in my own home, sitting comfortably in my own big easy chair, drinking a delectable glass of beer. Someone at the door, aren't you? Yeah, just a minute. I'll answer that. Mr. Merle? No. Uh, well, is Mr. Merle here? Yes, he's here. But he's not seeing anyone. Well, he's expecting me. I'm from the Serve Right Catering Company. We're ready to serve for four here tonight. Their dinner has been canceled. Oh, but it's been ordered. Breast of guinea hen, cooked in wine and cloves, delicious. It's prepared and waiting. I'm afraid that I must insist on seeing Mr. Merle. Mr. Merle has been murdered. Well, I'm afraid I must... Uh, murdered? Well, oh, my goodness, but... Well, in that case, I... Yes, good evening. Don't you think you might have taken a bit more time with the fellow inspector? Why? You might at least have let him serve the dinner. Guinea hen, wine, and clove sounded positively delectable. Look, I've had dinner. I'm afraid you're too busy, inspector. So busy that you've just passed up an extremely interesting bit of information. What are you talking about, Wolf? He said he was to serve dinner for four. Well? Arthur Merle, Archie, and myself are only three. Well, who else was supposed to be here? A fourth guest who either hasn't arrived yet or who arrived earlier and left. Oh, I see what you mean, Wolf. Good. In that case, I'll leave you to pursue your deductions from that premise. Archie, will you please stay with the inspector and be of any help that you can? As for myself, I'm going back to my own home, which I should never have left in the first place. Okay, that finishes the apartment search, Goodwin. And what have we? Nothing. Except that Merle had over $300 in his pocket, and he was wearing a ring worth a couple of thousand, so it couldn't have been robbery. And I don't think it was premeditated murder. Why not? The weapon. Obviously, if someone had planned on killing Merle, he'd have prepared it better. Used a better weapon than a blunt paper knife. No, as I see it, someone was here before you and Wolf arrived, and for some reason that person found it necessary to kill Merle, and he did it on the spur of the moment. I'm listening. Well, it's obvious. Merle was slumped over his typewriter. This sheet of paper was in it. He'd been working. May I see it? Yeah. Starbreaker. Strange title. Page 189. He was getting well along with his latest mystery. Apparently. Okay. Gregory Thorne slipped the paper into his pocket. It was just an ordinary piece of paper, but Gregory knew its value. Used properly, as Greg knew how to use it, it would be worth $100,000. He walked away briskly, and as he... That's all. Yeah, that's all. Must have been right. No, I'd like to read the rest of it. We didn't find any more of it. 
Any other ideas? No, at the moment we seem to be right where the murderer himself left off. Oh, what is this? Open house. Sorry to be so... Oh. Oh, what? I was... I mean, I expected to see Mr. Murrow. Is he here? Well, who are you? Cynthia Roberts. He expecting you? Well, no. That is... Uh, come on in, Miss Roberts. Thank you. Maybe the young lady is trying to say that he didn't have to expect her. Maybe she felt free to call without advance notice, Inspector. Inspector? Uh, what did you want to see Mr. Merle about? I... Well, I'm his fiance. Oh. Had dinner yet, Miss Roberts? Why, yes, I had dinner earlier. Uh, when I... were you last here, Miss Roberts? Well, last night, after the theater. Arthur and I were... What's the matter? Is something wrong? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Roberts, but Arthur Merle was murdered. And you say you hadn't talked to Mr. Merle all evening. Is that right, Miss Roberts? Yes, that's right. You didn't have a date with him tonight? Oh, no. Then why did you come here? I told you we were engaged. I just came by, that's all. I see. Any more questions, Inspector? Yeah, none for the present. How about you, Goodwin? Nope. But maybe Wolf. Let me call him. Yes, I guess under the circumstances we can't very well leave him out. Go ahead. Oh, Arthur, I just can't believe it. Why would anyone want to kill him? That, Miss Roberts, is a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Nina Wolf speaking. Archie, boss, I'm still at Merle's. We haven't found out anything new except that Arthur's fiance dropped in a few minutes ago. Did she know anything of interest? I don't think so. What does the inspector plan to do about it? Just a minute. He wants to know what you're going to do with it. Well, hold her, of course. He's going to hold her. Let me speak to him. Okay. He wants to talk to you, Inspector. All right. Hello. Inspector, I suggest you let the young lady go. Are you crazy? I haven't got enough suspects in this deal to be letting the hottest one go free. You can't consider her a suspect simply because she knew Arthur. Now, see here, Wolf. If you go around arresting people at random, you'll suddenly be tipping your hand to the real murderer, admitting that you don't have a real clue to go on. And just what do you suggest? Find a motive, Inspector. Find a motive. Then, if you stumble on a suspect, you'll have some basis for making an arrest. At the moment, I suggest that you let the girl go and tell Archie to stop wasting his time down there and come home at once. So that's the story, boss. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. There's not a single suspect. The last person to see Arthur alive was the elevator girl. Correction, Archie. The last person to see Arthur Merle alive was the person who ended his life. Well, I just can't imagine that pretty little elevator gal. You don't solve crimes by imagination, Archie. Then there's Cynthia Roberts, his fiance. You suspect her? Not exactly, but just suppose she did have a motive. Maybe he threw her over. Wouldn't it have been very clever of her to come back to Arthur's apartment after the police arrived, allegedly looking for her? I thought you were the admirer of the fair of sex, Archie. So far, the best you can do is practically accuse the elevator girl and Arthur's fiancée of murder. Well, who else is there? Certainly the fellow who came with the food doesn't count. I repeat, who else is there? The entire population of the city, Archie. Thanks. Well, that's all I get. Oh, well, there was something else. What? This. Page 189 of what appears to be Arthur's latest novel. It was in his typewriter. As you can see, just started the page. Hmm, Starbreaker. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the rest of it? It's all we found. What? And there was something missing. Archie. Yes, boss? First thing tomorrow morning, get the address of Mr. Morton, who publishes Arthur's books. Then get over to see him right away. Yes, may I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Morton. Uh, did you have an appointment? Tell him I'm from Homicide. Uh, ho oh, yes, sir. Yes? Uh, Mr. Morton, I know you have someone with you, but uh, there's a gentleman here from the Homicide Bureau. He wants to see you. Tell him I work for Nero Wolf. My name's Goodwin. His name is Goodwin. Send him in. Yes, thank you. You may go right in, sir. The large door to your right. Thanks. Come in, Mr. Goodwin. Come in. I understand you're from Homicide. Not exactly. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. We're working with Inspector Kramer. And what can I do for you? You've heard about Arthur Merle. 
Yes, I received the word when I came in this morning. It was a great shock. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Goodwin. This gentleman is Henry Childs. How do you do, Mr. Childs? Glad to meet you, Mr. Goodwin. You're with Nero Wolf? I'm his, well, his assistant man Friday. Mr. And... Childs is a publicity agent. He handled all publicity for Arthur Merle. I've not only lost an excellent client, but a very good friend. Did you know Mr. Merle? Yes, I'd met him a number of times with Mr. Wolf. Yes, indeed. Arthur Merle was a great writer and a fine citizen. He'll be missed by millions. Mr. Goodwin, when was the murder discovered? Last night, shortly before dinner. Well, what are the police... I mean, what do you think the motive was? Don't know as yet, Mr. Charles. A little early for that. Well, it's certainly a shame. I, uh... I wanted to ask you a few questions, Mr. Morton, privately. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Charles. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave. I'll run along now, Mr. Morton. Uh, see you again soon, Mr. Charles. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Goodwin? You did a lot of business with Mr. Merle, Mr. Morton? I published every one of his novels for the past eight years. And you intended to publish his new one, the one he was working on? Yes, we had a contract. The usual agreement between you. Naturally. Although I didn't know the story, I was always sure that if Arthur wrote it, it was good. Mr. Merle's name on a novel was a guarantee that it would sell a million copies. You don't know what this last one was about. I haven't the faintest idea. We relied completely on Arthur's judgment. Not even any carbon copies, huh? Not that I know of. Why? When Mr. Merle was killed, the only thing missing from his apartment was the novel. The novel? The first 188 pages. All we found of it were a few lines of page 189 in his typewriter. He must have been working on it when the murderer stabbed him. The rest of it's gone. You mean, Goodwin, the, the novel's gone? This will cost me a million dollars. Well, it cost Arthur Merle his life. Arthur Merle dead and his novel gone. I can hardly believe it. Well, thank you, Mr. Morton. Oh, I hope I've been of some help, although I I'm don't sorry quite see... you haven't. But we may call on you again. Before it's over, you may be a great help. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. I just finished with Morton. He doesn't know a thing. Merle never discussed his stories with anyone, and as far as Morton knows, he never made carbons. I see. Where do I go from here, boss? See Cynthia Roberts. Oh, then you haven't dismissed the possibility that she may have had something to do with it. Being his fiancée, she probably knows more about Arthur than anyone else. She may know who the fourth guest was to have been last night. And she also may know what Merle's novel was about. Right, boss. I'm anxious to know what the novel was about, too. I personally don't give a hang what the novel was about. What I want to find out is someone who does know the story. Because I have a hunch that whoever knows that is the person who killed Arthur Merle. <laughs> Miss Roberts, I know you want to help us find out who killed Arthur. Oh, yes, of course. I'll do anything. Nero Wolfe and I were invited to have dinner with Arthur Merle last night. Well, I knew he was having friends in for dinner, but I didn't know who they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I hoped you'd know whom he invited. No, he didn't tell me. Miss Roberts, we have reason to believe that there was to have been a fourth person there last night. Uh, a fourth? The caterer came to deliver dinner for four. Now, the fourth party never did show up, or else came earlier and left after Arthur was killed. You mean someone Arthur invited to dinner might have... Killed him? Maybe. Oh, there's no one that I can think of who bore any ill will toward Arthur. We're convinced I... that this was done on the spur of the moment. Unpremeditated murder. Arthur Merle suddenly became a threat to someone. Now we've got to find out what the threat was and who was threatened. We'd hoped you could help. I'm sorry. Did he ever discuss his new novel with you? Oh, no. He never talked about his stories until he'd finished them. So his latest mystery contains the answer to an even greater mystery. Unless we find the first, they'll both go unanswered. Mr. Morton? Yes? Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, yes. Your man Goodwin was here to see me. I presume you are interested in seeing Merle's murderer brought to justice? Certainly. Arthur was a close friend of mine. And his death cost you a best sir, I know. Now, would you be willing to help a bit? Why, yes, if I... I prepared a statement for the papers. I want you to call the literary editors first thing in the morning. Here's what I want you to tell them. Got a pencil and paper? Yes. And take this down. Quote, Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom 
to furnish his publishers with carbon copies of each day's work, consequently with the major portion of his... Good heaven, R.G., please don't be so loud. Look here, in this morning's paper, why, that rat, he lied to me, that... that... What on earth are you talking about? That publisher, Morton, he said he didn't have copies of Merle's manuscript, that he didn't know what it was about, and and listen to this. Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publisher with carbon copies of each day's work. Consequently, with a major portion of his latest work, Starbreaker, in the hands of his publisher, together with a complete synopsis, including the denouement, it will be possible for a ghostwriter to complete the novel. It will be published posthumously in proceeds with... Boss, did you hear that? I did, and it couldn't have been more to my liking if I'd written it myself. Now, excuse me, I want to make a telephone call. Who? Publisher Morton. Yeah, I'm beginning to see. He lied about the whole thing. I still don't see why he'd kill Merle... But on... Hello, Mr. Morton. This is Nero Wolf. Yes, perfect. Now I'll call Kramer, and he and Archie will be waiting for you. Remember now, if anything comes of it, you are to say the manuscript is in the safe in your home, and you steer the party here. Say you've recently rented this place. I hope we'll be seeing you. Yes. Goodbye. Oh, and be careful. Remember what happened to Arthur. The manuscript is in my desk in the middle drawer. What the... D- you mean... Archie, look out of that window. Huh? Yeah? Out there is a city of some five million people. In that five million, there is one who murdered Arthur Merle. Now, we don't know who it is, so we can't go out and put a finger on him. But, Archie, since we can't go to him, we have only one other choice, make him come to us. Tell me why we're sitting here in the dark in Wolf's office. Yes, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Wolf promised us a caller. Mr. Morton is to pretend that he's rented this place recently. Well, who's the caller? Can't tell you until he or she gets here. You seem certain he'll come. I'm quite certain. I'm just hopeful. You trying to tell me that Morton killed Merle? You're almost as dense as Archie was. No, Morton didn't do it. Unless Mr. Wolf is very wrong, which is doubtful, before the night is over, Morton will know who did. And it won't be long until we know, too. Uh, you should get on a quiz program. You're so good at guessing games. Shh. Listen. Huh? Yeah, someone's coming. A brilliant deduction, my dear Kramer. I hope there are two of them. Inspector, behind these drapes. Quick. I'll get behind the screen. All right, Mr. Morton. So far, you've been very cooperative. Just keep it up. I have no intention of doing otherwise. Your gun has me completely convinced, Mr. Child. Get the manuscript. Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. It's in my desk. Wait a minute. I thought you said it was in the safe. A mistake, Mr. Childs. I don't have a safe. Shall I get the manuscript? Yes, but no tricks. You be careful. I'm being exceedingly careful, Mr. Childs. There you are. Yeah. Starbreaker by Arthur Merle. Yes, this is it. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Now, I trust that's all you want of me. I'm sorry. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, you see, it's not the actual novel that I want. Oh? My interest in this copy is the same as it was in the original. And that is? That no one should ever learn the content. I take it you know what it's about, then. Yes. You see, Mr. Murrow made the mistake of telling me when I called a bit early at his apartment for dinner last evening. I was forced to deprive him of his life once I learned the storyline of this novel. This story must be kept secret. Why? Most of you people in the publishing business know me as a public relations and publicity agent for several prominent writers. Yes? Actually, I've been as successful as I might in this business. Because a few years ago, I stumbled onto a very neat and foolproof method of blackmail. Unfortunately, Arthur Merle thought of the same thing and based this story on it. If it got out, I'd be exposed and sent to prison. So you can see why I had to stop it, why I had to kill Arthur and why... Now I'll have to kill you, too. Oh, child, for heaven's sake. The contents of these pages condemn me. You know what's in them. Further, I've confessed to murder to you. You don't think I could let you live after that, do you? Child, you're insane. I'm sorry that I must repay you for your trouble in such an ungrateful manner. 
I'm sorry to do this to you, Charles, but I can't... Charles, please, no! <laughs> sorry, Mr. Charles, there wasn't time to ask you to drop the gun. All right, Mr. Charles, get your hands up and stay where you are. Nice going, Mr. Morton. Who are you? That took courage, Mr. Morton. Sorry we had to wait so long, but we had to make Mr. Charles here convict himself. Convict? What do you mean? We've been waiting here for you, behind the drapes all the time. We heard every word. Mr. Charles, you're under arrest. Police? Yes, Mr. Giles. Only one person could have been so anxious over a copy of that novel. That's the person who killed Arthur Merle for the original. And we heard you confess to that. And that's all we need to convict you. We didn't have any proof until we set it up for you to make a second try to cover up for the first. Fortunately, the setup worked. Setup? Take a look at the rest of the manuscript, Mr. Giles. What? Oh, the front page is there, all right, but look at the rest. Why, the blank... They're just blank pages. You didn't have a copy at all. No, but we certainly got a murderer. Hey, Inspector? Childs! Childs! Stop, Childs! Stop! Well, that's one way to avoid standing trial. Well, Archie, I'm glad you and Kramer got Childs. Some beer, please. That was a clever scheme, boss, making him think there was a copy. Yes. In a way, though, I wish it hadn't been just a scheme. Meaning? I wish there had been a copy of Arthur Merle's novel. Why? You never read detective stories. No, but I've drummed up so much curiosity over this one, I'd like to know exactly what that blackmail gimmick really was. Good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Don Arthur was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production and is directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Evelyn Eaton, Peter Leeds, Lucille Alex, Marna Keneally, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's excitement for you Sunday when talented servicemen compete on the Phil Regan Show. And Sunday on NBC also means another delightful adventure with Cary Grant and Betsy Drake when they star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, the proud but bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Tomorrow for excitement, hear Herbert Marshall in The Man Called X on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure... Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Who? Who is this? Who wants to speak to Mr. Wolf? Nobody. Nobody? I said that. Hang up. It's late and it's too cold. And even if it weren't, I would not consider for one moment moving from this room. Please, Mr. Wolf, I can't hear a thing this old gentleman's saying. Does it matter? You heard what I said? No. Now, what did you say? You were late because she was killed. Well, who was killed? I can't hear you. What is it about, Archie? He says he was due here an hour ago, but she was killed. Who was killed? What does he want? Uh, do you want us to solve the crime? I say, do you want us to find out who killed her? Oh. He says he knows who did it, but he has an important message for you. Well, then come right over. We'll be waiting, Mr. Jenkins. Archie, why do you insist on taking every silly little case? Because, boss, we need to recover from March 15th. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs>
This case I like to refer to as the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Perhaps a better title would be Wolf Goes A-Hunting. For in a way, this was one of those unusual instances in which my boss, of his own free will and without any coercion, actually decided to leave the house and go to the scene of the crime. It started when the strange old gentleman who phoned us finally arrived. Well, there's our client, Mr. Wolf. Evening. It's me. Who's me? Oh, I, I just phoned you. I, I'm Jenkins. I got a dispatch for Nero Wolf. Oh, you're Jenkins. Well, come in, come in. Uh, Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Jenkins. Says he has a dispatch for you. Yep. Yeah. Are you Wolf? I am. Where is the dispatch from? Don't know. You, you don't know? How come? Oh, I know, but I'm supposed to say I don't. See? That's my job. What is? Just to say I don't know. What about the matter? Yeah, who was killed? Oh, my goodness. It was a terrible thing. We were just crossing the turnpike, and this fella come at us out of nowhere. The killer? Yeah. Must have been drunk, I guess. Well, how did it happen? Did he shoot her, stab her? Oh, no, no. He ran into her with his car. And she was only nine years old. Your granddaughter? No, no, it was Bessie. But the police got him. I, I have to appear, I guess. Probably get 90 days, he will. For murder? Murder. Was somebody murdered? I must have missed something. Look, we're talking about Bessie. And what do you want us to do about it? Nothing. Bessie's my old horse. Oh, no. Uh, but say, who was it that was murdered? Nobody yet. Good night, Mr. Jenkins. I thought you said it was important. It might be. At least that's the way I was told. What might be? Uh, this here letter I was bringing to you. This is dispatch. Well, got to get along now. Uh, goodbye. Well, get him. What a pixie. What is in the envelope? Mr. Wolf, look. Five $100 bills. And the note says, Mr. Wolf, your services are desperately needed. Come up this weekend as my guest. Signed, E. Malott. Edwin Malott, the wealthy manufacturer. Hmm. Well, looks as though you're going out this weekend. Well, our GP my respects to Mr. Malott, and I hope you enjoy the weekend. Good night. Something certainly phony about this. There's no party going on here tonight. Yes? What is it? Is this the Malotte place? It is. What do you want? My name's Goodwin. I'm a guest of Mr. Malotte's. A guest? Yes, he invited me down for the weekend. Weekend? Oh. Well, you better step in, please, Mr. Goodwin. Quite a bolt you've got on that door. Yes, isn't it? Just sit down there, please. I'll get Mr. Malott. He's in the library. Oh, here he is. This is Mr. Goodwin, sir. Says he's come down for the weekend. Mr. Goodwin? Good evening. You've come for the weekend, you say? Well, yes. Wasn't that the idea, Mr. Malott? Well, I, uh, I don't understand, Mr. Goodwin. Didn't you send me this note asking me to come here? Note? I did not. Oh, well, well, this is my personal note stationery. But I don't recall sending this. I didn't even type it. And I'm in the habit of signing my name with a pen, not with a typewriter. E. Malott. You're certainly Edward Malott. Yes. Services are desperately needed. What does this mean? What services? Who are you, Mr. Goodwin? Are you serious? I'm a private investigator. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. Oh, indeed. Nero Wolfe, eh? I know of him, yes, indeed. And you really don't know anything about this note? I do not. Are you having a weekend party here? <laughs> I most certainly am not. Then who sent this? And there were five $100 bills as a retainer. I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, uh, Dorothy. Yes? Would you step in here, please? Uh, Miss Davis is my private secretary. Uh, she may know something about this. Yes, Mr. Malott. What is this? I... Uh, Dorothy. Oh. Dorothy, this is Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mr. Goodwin? Well, I... How do you do, Miss Davis? Uh, yes, yes, well. Uh, Mr. Goodwin is assistant to Nero Wolfe. You don't say. Nero Wolfe, the detective? Well, I've heard a great deal about him. And about you, too, Mr. Goodwin. Well, now I'm mighty glad to hear you say that, Miss Davis. Uh, Mr. Goodwin has Edward, a note here. Is anything wrong, Edward? I heard voices. Oh, do we have company? Nothing is wrong, Eva. I was calling Dorothy, that's all. Oh, oh this is Mr. Goodwin, Eva. My wife, Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mrs. Malad? Oh, Mr. Goodwin, I... Oh, yes, how, how do you do? Uh, now, as I was about to say, Dorothy, Mr. Goodwin... What's going on? Mr. Goodwin, uh, this is my son, Larry. Good evening. What's wrong? Uh, Mr. Goodwin has been invited here for the weekend. He has an invitation supposedly written by me. At least uh, it's on my stationery. Look at this, Dorothy. Know anything about this note? No. No. I certainly didn't write it. 
But it's my personal note paper, and my signature is typewritten. I'd uh, never do that. Well, somebody sent it. Who's Jenkins? Jenkins? Never heard of him. A little dried up old man. He delivered it to us. Yeah, maybe it didn't even come from this house. I'm positive that it didn't. Never heard of Jenkins. You have a typewriter here, of course. Yes. I'd like to see it. Uh, certainly, Mr. Goodwin, in the library. How far have you come, Mr. Goodwin? From New York, Manhattan. Oh, and it's such a dreadful night, too. Yes, yes, and it is rather late. Late? It's only 7.30. Why not stay here for the night? Plenty of room? Uh, yes, Mr. Goodwin, plenty of room. Well, I, I don't really think that's necessary. I, uh... On the other hand, it would be a tough drive back to the city in this storm. I'll accept your hospitality, Mr. Mallott. Very good. Oh, uh, Jeffries, show Mr. Goodwin to the uh, east wing. And uh, take care of his car. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Goodwin. You, you, you mean you're all going to retire now? I haven't even had my dinner. We retire very early here. But Jeffries will prepare anything you want. Good night. <laughs> Speaking. Archie, boss. Well, I'm here at Malat's place, but there ain't no party. What happened? Are you in the right house? I'm afraid I am. They've all gone to bed. Weird bunch. His wife, who looks very sickly and I think wants to say something to me alone, and Larry the son and Malat's secretary, Dorothy Davis. She has me bothered a bit. How unusual. Especially if she's pretty. A beauty. But she seems to know all about me. Hmm. You better come home, Archie. I can see you're in no condition to handle this case properly. Give them the money back. Oh, I forgot to tell you. They don't want me here. Malat didn't send the note. No one here knows anything about it, so we can keep the dough. Interesting indeed. The circumstances would indicate that you should stay there and wait for it to happen. For what to happen? For whatever it is the fates have conspired to have happen there while your shining little ego is in the midst of it. Bye. Who is it? It's Archie Goodwin, Mrs. Mallott. Come in. Come in, please. I saw you give me the eye when I was about to leave. I've been waiting till I felt sure they were all asleep. Now, what's up? I wrote you that note. I sent for you. How do I know that? Old man Jenkins is a scissor and knife sharpener who happens along every month or so. They wouldn't know him. I put five $100 bills in the envelope. Okay, why? My life is in danger. I've been threatened. I received three notes through the mail. They were all postmarked in New York City. Could I see them? Here they are. All typewritten. Hmm. The first one reads, There is no love for you in Great Gables. The second, Why stay on in the face of death? And the third, The time is shorter than you think. Do you think this is a, well, an inside job, Mrs. Miller? Well, at first I didn't. But lately I've come to think it is. What caused you to think that? For some time I've been having severe spells. I thought it was indigestion. But then it occurred to me that I always broke out in cold perspiration. I was left horribly weakened, terribly thirsty. Thirsty? You fear you're being poisoned? Yes. And since the thought came to me, I've been living in fear. Fear of every bite of food or drink. It's so shattered my nerves that I have to take these yellow sleeping capsules to even close my eyes. Well, here's your husband and his secretary and your son, Larry. Larry is my stepson. Which one do you suspect? The secretary, Dorothy, or my husband, or both. What's the motive? Well, they're in love. She's been here over two years, and they've spent most of their time together. The idea never occurred to me till last week. And when I watched them, it, it was quite obvious. Anybody else know about these three notes? Oh, no. Then I'll keep them for a while. Good night, Mrs. Mallott, and don't worry. What are you doing, Mr. Goodwin, snooping around in Father's library? Well, Larry, I was just trying to find out if this Remington was the machine you used to type those notes. What? What notes? The notes you sent your stepmother. Why... I don't know anything about any notes. Then why were you so startled? I'm not startled. I just... Well, uh, why would I threaten her? So you do know about them. I didn't mention the contents of the notes. I just happened to see them on the table in her sitting room. You don't care too much about your stepmother, do you? Oh, she's all right. You don't care too much about Dorothy either, do you? I certainly don't. Why not? Well, I don't like her tactics, making a fool out of my father. 
If anybody here sent those notes, she did. You think Dorothy would have a motive? I certainly do. Of course, you wouldn't have a motive, would you? No. Well, I'm inclined to think you would. Well, just what motive would I have? You don't seem to like any woman who's too close to your father. Maybe because you'd resent anyone sharing in the estate if your father died. If I were you, Mr. Goodwin, I'd leave. Tonight. And the sooner the better. Good night. Oh, Argy. Argy. Oh, confounded boy. Yes, Argy? You have the wrong number. This is Sherlock Holmes speaking. Why didn't you go to bed like the others? You don't have to push it. It'll happen. Eva Malotte thinks she's being slowly poisoned. Suspects her husband and his secretary. He could be right. What are the symptoms she suffers? Gastric disturbances, weakness, thirst. Indeed. What about the son? Have any ideas? He doesn't like his stepmother and is decidedly against his father's secretary, Dorothy. He knew all about the notes Mrs. Malotte had received. Saw them on her dressing table. He believes Dorothy's the culprit. Then I should say that Dorothy should be the next on your list. You can say that again. Be careful, Archie. Use your head this time. Incidentally, Larry advised me to leave the place tonight. Bit of a threat it was, too. What shall I do, Mr. Anthony? Do nothing. The trouble will come to you. Bye. Oh. Hello there, Mr. Mallard. I thought you'd turned in for the night. It's quite obvious you thought so, Mr. Goodman. What are you doing in the library? Why, just looking for something to read. You'll find the books all around the walls, not on my desk. Well, I was looking for a particular kind of book. I'm very much interested in poisons. Poisons? Yeah, a hobby of mine. You happen to have any books on toxicology? I do not. And what's that book on the fourth shelf right beside you? Why, I... I uh... Oh, oh toxicology... Where did that come from? Never saw it before. Hmm. Uh, perhaps it was in that uh, assorted collection I bought a couple of weeks ago. I uh, hadn't noticed it. Larry probably put them on the shelves. Mr. Mallard, how long have you known Dorothy, your secretary? Uh, a little over two years. Did it ever occur to you that she might be, well, infatuated, in love with you? What? Well, of all the... Now, see here. I don't know what you're up to, and I don't know how you got hold of my stationery to write that fake note. It isn't a but fake I... note, Mallard. I'm only trying to find out what's back of it. Mr. Goodwin, there is nothing going on here that requires the services of a detective, and Dorothy is not in love with me. I didn't say she was. I asked you if you thought she might be. Well, since this conversation seems to concern me, I suppose I am at liberty to come in. Oh, you're still up too, Miss Davis. Did you hear what this man said, Dorothy? Yes, I did, Mr. Millard. And I'd like to have a few words alone with Mr. Goodwin, if you don't mind. Mr. Goodwin, would you mind coming with me for a few minutes? No, not at all. And... Well, it's rather late, Mr. Mallott. Don't you think you should retire? It's a heavy day tomorrow. Well, uh, uh, yes. Yes, I suppose I should. And please, don't let this upset you. Mr. Goodwin has been misinformed. I'll straighten him out. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. The bar is right across the hall. I'll fix you a nice, soothing drink. That'll be nice. Well, now, what would you like, Mr. Goodwin? In the way of drinks? Oh, well, some seven-up. Really? <laughs> well, just sit down over there. Okay, what do you want to talk about? Well, where did you get the idea that I was in love with Mr. Millat? First, suppose you tell me if you are in love with him. Yes, I am. But until a few minutes ago, he wasn't even aware of it. I worship him and his work. I never wanted him to know because he's married. It would have caused trouble and I'd have had to leave here. And now he knows it's true. Well, now that he knows, what will happen? Well, I'm going to leave tonight. Now. I see. And since I don't own a car, Mr. Goodwin, I'm going to ask you to do me a very great favor. Will you run me into New York? I want to leave without a word. If I wait till morning, I'll have to explain to Mr. Millard and... Well, that would be most embarrassing, Archie. Oh, now it's Archie. You, you don't really mind, do you? No, no, I guess I don't. I should, maybe, but, uh... Don't you like your drink? What'd you put in this drink? What do you mean? What'd you dope it with? <laughs> Archie, why would I do that? Might be several reasons. There's nothing in that drink. No? Then suppose you drink it. Why? <laughs> Give it to me. I'll throw it out. If you want another drink, fix it yourself. I'll have my things ready in five minutes. Are you going to take me? Sure. 
Certainly I'm going to take him. But are you sure you have to go tonight? I must go tonight. Now. I wish I knew why. Mr. Wolf's always so right. What? Just talking to myself. Dorothy! Larry! Jeffries! Come upstairs! What's happened? Call Dr. Hauser. Something terrible has happened to Eva. <laughs> Well, Dr. Hauser? Oh, poor Mrs. Malott. No, there's nothing to be done now. It's all over. Eva, Eva. You'd better lie down, Mr. Malott. I'll phone and take care of everything. I'll be here if you need me. I uh, have to make out the certificate. Yes, come along, Mr. Malott. Just a minute. You too, Larry. I don't want to make this any more unpleasant for you, but, Doctor, just what are you going to put on the certificate as the cause of death? Acute gastritis. Is that what you've been treating her for? Well, she's had several attacks lately. I'd warned her to be cautious of her diet. And that was wise advice, too. Did you know about these attacks, Mr. Malott? Yes, I did. And you, Dorothy? Yes, I knew. And you knew also, Larry? Uh, no, I, I knew she hadn't been feeling well. How long had Mrs. Malott been suffering from insomnia? Oh, a year at least. I prescribed Nemitol. In yellow capsules? Of course. I wrote a prescription ever so often calling for 12 capsules. You all knew about that, of course. I thought so. And would this be the prescription, this little box of capsules here on... Well. What's the matter, Mr. Goodwin? That box was open on this nightstand when we stepped into this room. All right, let's have the box, Mr. Malad. Thank you. Why'd you pick it up? Uh, because I... I didn't want the stigma of suicide on Eva's name, her mind. Suicide? Yes. Eva had this prescription filled yesterday morning. The dose is one at bedtime. Twelve capsules. She took one last night. I glanced at the open box when I came into the room, and there were only eight capsules left. I... I knew instantly what had happened. She'd taken an overdose. Doctor, do you think three capsules would be sufficient to cause her death? I doubt it very much. So do I. Mrs. Malott didn't die from an overdose of sleeping capsules. She was poisoned. Poisoned? Are you crazy? By whom? By you. Or Dorothy. Or Larry. No. I didn't do it. I didn't write those notes. What notes? Mrs. Malott had received three notes threatening her life if she didn't leave this house. Each of you had a motive, so I'm sending this body to the coroner for an immediate autopsy. I won't permit it. The police will see to it. You have no choice. Yes, Archie. What now? Do you know who did it? How do you know anything's happened? Let us call it extrasensory perception. Well, Mrs. Malott was right. She's dead. Her doctor knew nothing about the spell she was having as being caused by anything but indigestion. How about an autopsy? It's all in the works. Looks like a metallic poison, all the symptoms. Oh? Did you search the house carefully for such a poison? I did. I'll check the drugstores in the morning. Somebody in that house will purchase some poison. Let me know when the autopsy report is in. Right. Let's see now. We have Mr. Malott, Dorothy Davis, and Larry the son. He's Mr. Malott's son, but not the child of Eva Malott, remember? Yes. Is it true that Dorothy is in love with Malott? Yeah. Dorothy admitted it to me, but claimed Malott wasn't aware of it until tonight. And earlier this evening, Dorothy tried her best to get me out of the house, insisted that I drive her into town. She tried to give me a drink, which I think might have contained knockout drops. You don't say. Archie, I should have Fritz drive me up to the Malott place at once. Archie, are you there? No, boss, I just fainted. <laughs> And that, Mr. Wolf, is most of the story up to now. Very interesting. Yes, indeed. But it isn't true. I did not put anything in Mr. Goodwin's drink. Then did you ask him to take you into town? Yes. And I might have been found in a ditch. Oh, it's ridiculous. Why did you try to get Mr. Goodwin to take you to town? Because I felt it would be too embarrassing to remain until morning. Maybe you'd already given Mother the big dose of poison and wanted Goodwin out before it was discovered. Well, you Wait a minute. That... Now, Mr. Miller. You claim that you knew nothing about Dorothy being in love with you? Should we believe that? You can believe it or not. Dorothy had a motive to get rid of Mrs. Malott. It seems that Mr. Malott had one, too. And so did Larry. What? You admitted to me that you didn't like your stepmother. And that you disliked Dorothy even more. I didn't say that. You said Dorothy was making a fool of your father. You resented the possibility of any woman sharing in the estate. You knew about the sleeping capsules, and you could have put poison in some of them. You could have written those threat notes. And by getting rid of your stepmother and placing the blame on Dorothy, you'll be getting rid of them both. But I didn't. 
I did not write those notes. You were the only one who knew about them. I was not the only one. I saw Dorothy coming out of Mother's room. It was this afternoon. Mother was out taking his son back. Dorothy did it. She's the one. I think you're the one. No, no, Dorothy wrote those notes. That's a lie. No, she probably slipped into Mother's room and wrote those notes on Mother's portable. What? In just a minute. Archie, come here. I never heard of sex lies. I didn't do it. You can't send me to jail. I'll kill you first. Larry, drop that gun. Don't come near me, any of you. You're such a fool, Larry. Give me that gun. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Come on. There. Now, you better quiet down, kid. Or Inspector Kramer will take care of you when he arrives. Well, Mr. Wolf, what goes on here? Where's Goodwin? I sent him upstairs, Inspector Kramer. Upstairs to Mrs. Malotte's room to check on something. Now, here he is. Yeah? What have you been doing, Goodwin? This, Inspector, is the piece de resistance. This is what Mr. Wolf has been waiting for. This little black box contains a typewriter, a portable noiseless Remington. Mrs. Millard's typewriter. What? I didn't even know she had a typewriter. And Larry knew she had one. And this is undoubtedly the very typewriter the threat notes were written on. All three of them. You were right, boss. Oh, I knew she had a typewriter, but I didn't write those notes. Oh, shut up. Archie, how do you know the notes were written on this typewriter? I've compared the type and the ribbon. They're both the same. These notes were written on this Remington. It was Dorothy. Larry, I don't believe a word you've been saying. Dorothy couldn't possibly be guilty of such a thing. If anyone is guilty, you yourself certainly have all the earmarks. Everybody's against me, even my own father. But I'm innocent, I tell you. Let me get it. I think I know who it is. Hello? Yeah, just a second. You better take it, boss. Wolf. Oh, yes, go ahead. Let's have it. Yes. He's here, but he won't mind. Yes? I see. Uh Uh-huh. You just finished. Oh. Good. Right. Bye. Was it the coroner? The coroner. Reporting that poison was found in the sleeping capsules. And the body. Did they find poison? They did. You're right again, boss. I'm going up to Mrs. Minot's room for a while. I want you to come along with me. Find anything yet, Archie? No, mostly bills and invitations to bridge parties and so on. Ah. You find something, boss? Yes and no. This pocketbook detective story. What about it? I was just flipping through the pages and I find this corner turned down. Well, well. What is it? Look and read. Why stay on in the face of death? Interesting. The very words used in one of the notes. Give me the book. Of course, uh, this doesn't prove a thing either. But it does confirm what I was... Oh, oh. What now? This cinches it. Get them all up here, Archie. Tell Kramer to bring them all to the bedroom. Well, Mr. Wolf, what now? As you all know, Mrs. Millot was poisoned. By someone who had an opportunity to put it in the sleeping capsule. Someone in this household. Yeah, but which one? The kid? I never bought any poison in my life. Be quiet, will you? No, Inspector, it wasn't Larry. And I suppose you think I put the rest of that rat poison in your drink, Mr. Goodwin. No, Dorothy, it wasn't you. But how did you know it was rat poison? I didn't. I just guessed. I can think, too. Then if it wasn't Dorothy or Larry, you you must mean me. No, Mr. Lott? No, wait a minute. It had to be somebody. Yes. This is going to be painful for you, Mr. Malott. Well, you... You mean that Mrs. Malott did commit suicide? It was more than suicide. It was suicide with an attempt to have both you and Dorothy convicted of murder. She planted things? She did. I can't believe it. Show him the pocketbook, mystery. Here's the proof. Some of the threat notes were lifted bodily from this novel. But look on the back cover. Isn't that Mrs. Malott's handwriting? Yes, and this is the other note. The one to you, Mr. Wolf. Composed in pencil before she typed it out on her machine. Then, Wolf, the note you received was the same typing as the threat notes. See for yourself, Inspector. Then why the Dickens didn't Archie compare them right away? Just one of those things, Inspector. There are times when even a good detective is a bit on the, uh, shall we say, dull side. Don't you find it often too, Inspector? Hmm? <laughs> Nice of you to go all the way out there, boss. I was a bit stuck. Quite all right, Archie. Yeah, there's something that still bothers me. So? 
How can such a sweet, motherly type as Mrs. Malott cook up such gruesome ideas? She was a very sick woman, mentally as well as physically. She probably felt she was going to die. And her warped mind seized on the opportunity to make sure that this Dorothy didn't get her man after she was dead. And speaking of Dorothy, she's a mighty pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Some beer, please, Archie. If you were so certain that Dorothy wasn't guilty, what was the idea of spending so much time questioning her? Huh? Why, I, I, I... Never mind. The raised eyebrow department answered the question. Well, there are certain rules a good detective always follows. Some are in the book, others aren't. You mean there's nothing in the book which says a good detective shouldn't spend a few minutes with an attractive brunette, even though she is a murder suspect? The author of that book can be none other than the incomparable Archie Goodwin. <laughs> good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Irene Winston, Ted Von Elts, Jerry Hausner, Vic Rodman, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the shot in the dark. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music in the air tomorrow evening, music and fun, brought to you by Dennis Day, Judy Canova, and Grand Old Opry. Charming and boyish Dennis gets himself tangled in another bewildering situation, while Judy Canova gets together with her comedy pals for some mountain-style goings-on, and Saturday also means a killer cycle trip to Nashville for Grand Old Opry. Friday's fun includes Sam Spade and, of course, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Dick Carter, Master Detective. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting adventure, the life and death search for a man who didn't see a murder that was not yet discovered. The witness saw nothing. Jefferson Heights is a suburb of the city that's still half country. Only a few houses are sprinkled over the winding roads, and Lundy Lane is the lonesomest of all. There is a small white cottage at the end of Lundy Lane, and in it, Mrs. Peter Grogan, a small, white-haired lady, is entertaining her first visitor in many days. Another cup of tea, Mrs. Dennis? No, no, I thank you kindly, Mrs. Grogan. Another crumpet, maybe? Oh, no, thank you. I've had five already. You've had six, Mrs. Dennis? What? Ah, but then who counts? Oh, Mrs. Dennis, would you believe you're the first visitor I've had in two weeks and three days? Oh. Ah, but not the last, Mrs. Dennis. Oh, no, indeed. Time was when the trip out to Lundy Lane was too much trouble. It isn't now, eh, Mrs. Dennis? I don't know to <laughs> what you're referring, Mrs. Grogan. Oh, oh. Why, to the story in the newspaper yesterday about me. They called me Lady Miser of Lundy Lane, all about how I don't trust banks. And how I have $50,000 hidden in pots and pans and other similar places around the house. If you think for one moment I believe that story, Mrs. Grogan. <laughs> Them that reads it will. Ah, uh, just like you, Mrs. Dennis. 
They'll all be visiting me now. Why, Mrs. Grogan, I never so much as thought of your money and when I And there ain't a word of it true, Mrs. Dennis. I made it all up. What? It was only a trick of mine to relieve the lonesomeness. Ah, sure, I got that tired of looking at the four walls with never a new face. Ah, now there'll be plenty of faces coming to visit old Mrs. Grogan, the lady miser of Lundy Lane. <laughs> well, I never. I'm taking myself out of this house of No, Mrs. Dennis. Oh, sure you do not begrudge your old friend. Leading your friends to believe you were rich and all the time it's a lie. You'll not be seeing me again, Mrs. Grogan, I oh, assure you. No. And them that do visit will be nothing better than low fortune hunters. <laughs> I wish you well of them, Mrs. Grogan. Goodbye. <laughs> now I wonder how many others saw the story in the paper. Ah, they'll all be coming sooner or later. <laughs> Now, don't act nervous, Wilson. Just make like we're a couple of businessmen with a little proposition. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, okay, Case. Ring the bell. Yes? Afternoon, ma'am. Could we speak to Mrs. Grogan? Ah, uh, you've got your wish, young man. Mrs. Grogan, me and my friend got a little business proposition we want to talk over with you. Could we come in? Yes, sir, are always welcome, young man. Sure. Come in, come in. Yes, so maybe you'll be having a cup of tea while we talk business, eh? No doubt it's regarding the money of mine you read about in the newspaper. Eh? Yes, ma'am, it's about the dough, but we can't stay for tea. <laughs> Quick, Wilson. <laughs> uh, nice work, Wilson. You got that wire in your pocket? Yeah. Get her tied up. Stick a gag in her mouth. I'll start looking for the dough. Shouldn't take us more than ten minutes to locate it and get out of here. <laughs> Ten minutes, he says. Ten minutes. Cash, we've been looking through this place for half an hour. I know. But the dough ain't here. It's got to be here. You heard her talking about it when we came in. Well, if it's here, we can't find it. This is no good, Cash. We're wasting our time. Come on back to the living room. we already been through it four times. I know. This time, we're going to ask Mrs. Grogan to find the dough for us. She ought to come, too, by now. Yeah, her eyes are open. Give me a sap. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Mrs. Grogan, my friend's going to take the gag out of your mouth. You see this sap in my hand? It's a leather bag full of steel shot. If you try to yell, you get slugged in the head with it. Got that? Take the gag out, Wilson. Okay. Uh, what do you want? Why did we you... We want the dough, Mrs. Grogan. The 50 grand you got stashed away in this house. Where is it? Uh... There isn't any money. Ah, don't give me that. I've been lied to by experts. Where's the dough? Where you got it hid? But I... I tell you, I haven't any money. It, it's all a mistake. Says you. Ah, you're crazy. There isn't any money. There never was any $50,000. It's just a newspaper story. It's all a joke. Hey, there's somebody at the door. Uh, uh, hey, you old uh, bitty old uh, shut uh, up. Uh, yeah, that'll keep you quiet for now. Gee, Cash, you slugged it too hard. I think you killed her. Yeah, she's dead, ain't she? Well, she must have been pretty feeble if that little tap I gave her croaked her. There's the doorbell again. What do we do? Keep quiet. Whoever it is will go away. Yeah, but maybe whoever's at the door heard her yelling. Look, I don't want to get caught in here with that corpse. Shut your mouth and keep quiet. Hello? Mrs. Grogan? Are you home? I see the door's open. Ah, you didn't shut the door, you dope. What do we do, Cash? That guy might come in here. Hello? Anyone home? I'll take care of this. Stay back here, Wilson. I'm coming. Who is it? Ajax vacuum printer salesman. Are you right with you? Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Grogan, I presume. Uh, the lady of the house in? Uh, no, I'm sorry, mister. Well, I'm Albert Higgins, salesman for the Ajax vacuum cleaner. Oh, here's my card, Mr. Grogan. Oh. We're conducting a door-to-door -door demonstration campaign to acquaint the public with our sensational new post-war vacuum cleaner. Now, if you hey, allow me to come in, Excuse me, I... Mr. Higgins, I'm just a little busy right now. I wonder if you'd come back tomorrow this same time. My wife will be glad to see your machine. Why, certainly, Mr. Grogan. Tomorrow at, uh, say, four o'clock? Uh-huh. Goodbye. Did you read them? Yeah. 
But he saw you, Cash. He could get a good look at your face. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Wilson, after we finish locating the dough in this house, we'll spend tomorrow locating Mr. Albert Higgins. He ain't gonna sell many more vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Removed from the wound was a 255 45 automatic slug of the type known as. All right, step right in here, folks. Oh, it's all right. There's nothing to be afraid Waldo. of. Waldo! Oh, well, Hello, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Uh, I-, I want you to meet Mr. Albert Higgins and his sister Barbara. Nick, this here's a serious problem you've got to apply your brains to. But, Walter, we've got so much work to finish. Oh, just a couple of minutes, Nick, you please. All right, all right. Please sit down, Miss Higgins. You too, Mr. Higgins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, what's the problem? Albert's haunted. What? He is, Mr. Carter. Now, look, Barbara, this is ridiculous. He is haunted, Nick. Haunted by death. I heard him arguing about it out in the street, and I brought him in. Mr. Carter, I I think my sister's crazy. I don't want to bother you with... All right, now, wait a minute. Let's start at the beginning. Albert was almost killed three times today. But, Barbara, they were natural accidents. They could happen to anyone. Suppose you tell me the whole story, Mr. Higgins. Well, Mr. Carter, I I was nearly killed three times today. Once in the morning, I was jostled on the subway platform and almost thrown in front of the train. A second time, as I left my office at noon, I was standing at the curb waiting for the light to change. Somebody bumped into me and almost knocked me in front of a passing coal truck. And the third time after lunch, when I was crossing the street, I was almost run over by a cab, that's all. And I say that three accidents like that are impossible in one day, Mr. Carter. Why should anyone want to kill you? There isn't any reason for anyone to murder me. I haven't got any enemies. I I lead a calm, peaceful life selling vacuum cleaners. It's just that Barbara's got too much imagination. She Maybe. Did you notice anything funny about those accidents? Oh, not a thing. Subway platform was crowded. It could happen to anyone. The cab driver was just as scared as I was. Did he stop? No, he just kept on driving. Get a look at him? He was just an ordinary hacky, gray hat, gray coat. Gray cap? No, gray hat, a felt hat. Hmm, very interesting. Oh, Mr. Carter, now that we've bothered you enough for the day, I'll be going. I've got an appointment at four o'clock. Higgins, so happens your sister was right. These weren't accidents, they were attempted murders. But why, for Pete's sake, why? I don't know. Maybe you've got enemies you don't know about. Maybe you saw something you shouldn't have seen. Maybe you heard something. Where were you yesterday? I was... Making the rounds up in Jefferson Heights. I I sell vacuum cleaners. Nick Albert, he saw something in Jefferson Heights. The only thing I saw was customers. All right, we won't argue about that now. Higgins, I want you to go home. Your sister will go with you. So will Waldo. Waldo, you're the bodyguard. Nick, why do I always get the dull jobs? You brought this case in, you work on it. Guard Higgins. But, Mr. Carter... Higgins, you must know something that someone doesn't want you to tell. That something may cost you your life unless I can prevent it. So go home and try to remember what it is. I'm going down to headquarters to see if I can find anything that might help your memory. Hello, Matty. Oh, hi, Nick. What's up? Tell me, Matty, what's the news from Jefferson Heights? Uh, Why are you interested in Jefferson Heights? Read off the crime sheet first, then I'll explain. Okay. You want yesterday's reports, huh? Yes. Now, let me see. Inwood, Washington Heights, Harlem, Astoria. Yeah, I've been pretty quiet all around. Nope, nothing for Jefferson Heights. Nothing, huh? No. Hmm, that makes it tough. What makes what tough? Matty, I'm involved in a peculiar case. A young man named Albert Higgins was up in Jefferson Heights yesterday. He must have seen or heard something he wasn't supposed to. Someone's trying to kill him. Yeah? Who? I don't know. It was kind of a reverse murder, Matty. I know the intended victim in advance, but I don't know the killer or the motivation. Hope maybe I could get a lead through the crime sheet. No crime in Jefferson. No crime reported from Jefferson. Ah, oh, beat it, Nick. If you think that I... No. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Hello, Sergeant. Is Nick there? Yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Nick. Buffalo Bill on the phone. Thanks. Yes, Waldo? Nick, Nick, you got to come over to Higgins' place right away. Why? Albert Higgins is gone. He's disappeared. (laughs) 
mistake. I, I, I tell you, it, it happened like a thunderbolt. Like, like, oh, I don't know how it happened. All right, all right. Take it easy. Now let's have the story. We took a cab home, Mr. Carter. Albert was pretty angry, but Mr. McGlynn here insisted he follow your orders. That I did, Nick Boy. And when we got out of the taxi and started up to the apartment, Albert said he wanted to get some cigarettes. So you let him go alone, huh? Well, he was just at the corner, Nick. Now I thought... She... Yes, yes, I know. You and Miss Higgins started up the stairs to this apartment. You didn't realize anything was wrong until you got up here. Albert wasn't following, so you ran back to the corner store, right? Right, Nick, and he was gone. Did you ask the store man what happened to him? There wasn't a soul in the store. No one in the store. Let me have that phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Walter, you've been pretty stupid. But, but Nick, I... How many stores I... have you ever seen with no one in them in the middle of the day? Nick Carter's office. Patsy, Nick. Get this and get it fast. Uh-huh. Call the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Tell them you must have a record of the calls Albert Higgins made yesterday. He was a door-to-door salesman. He must have filed a list of those calls this morning. Right. I'll call you back in ten minutes. Now, let's get moving, Walter. We're going down to that store. But, but, but you Nick, idiot, you realize Higgins has probably been hijacked by the men who've been trying to kill him. If we want to keep him alive, we've got to do it in minutes. <laughs> You see, Nick, this place is empty. Never thought to look in the back of the store, huh? I did, so help me. There's not a soul there. All right, I'll take your word for it. How about behind the soda fountain? Behind? Yes, behind. Take a look. Nick! There's a body here. Yes, not cold. See the bruise behind his ear? Nothing worse. Help him up. Now listen to me, please. I'm Nick Carter. I can't take the time to be gentle with you because a man's life may depend on minutes. What? A man was kidnapped from this store by someone who came in and slugged you. Did you see who it was? No. My back was turned. I saw nothing. That's too bad. Wait a minute. Look here at the floor, Waldo. Uh, You mean them BBs? They're not BBs. They're chilled steel shot. Dollars to a penny, the killers bought the shot and fixed up a homemade blackjack and used that to knock this man cold. See, that's right, Nicky. It must have broken open. Waldo, pick up some of that shot. Yeah. Go down to the wholesale munitions district on Fulton Street. Take that shot to every manufacturer. Find out who made it and to what retail stores it was sold. Nick, you're turning me into an errand boy. Me, a fine surgical instrument. Waldo, we're ki- fighting for a man's life with no ammunition for our guns. We don't know who wants to kill him or why. The smallest clue may turn the balance. I'll get moving. All right, Nick. I'll see you later. Oh, oh, my head. Now, look, my friend. I'm going to make a phone call. And I'll have to leave you. But I'll send a policeman into you on my way out. Thanks. Nick Carter's office. Patsy, Nick, what about that report? Oh, Higgins made 11 calls yesterday in the Jefferson Heights suburbs. Read them off backwards. Last calls first. Uh, Mrs. John A. Gerst of Alton Road. Demonstrated vacuum cleaner from 4.30 to 5 p.m. Right. Next. This is Peter Brogan, Lundy Lane. Not at home. Her husband made appointment for her for following day at 4. That must have been the date he wanted to keep today. Next. Mrs. Allen B. Oh, wait, wait, hold it, hold it. Huh? Well, was that Mrs. Peter Grogan? Yes. Thought the name was familiar. That's the old lady who was written up in the paper two days ago. That's right, Nick. The Lady Miser of Lundy Lane. You say her husband talked to Higgins? Well, that's what the report says. There's something fishy right there, Patsy. I'm going up to Mrs. Grogan's house. Stand by for a report from Waldo. Well, what's fishy, Nick? Mrs. Grogan is a widow. There isn't any husband. Hmm. Not the newspaper still on the front step. No sense ringing the bill. Not waste any time getting inside. So Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Matty, this is Nick. Yeah? You better hustle up to Lundy Lane in Jefferson Heights, home of Mrs. Peter Grogan. What for? I found that unreported Jefferson Heights crime. It's murder. (laughs) 
Nick, I swear I'll never doubt your word again. Even if you tell me I'm a murderer. This is fantastic. One of the nastiest, rottenest murders I've seen in a long time. Yeah, some cheap Ginzel must have read about Mrs. Grogan's dough and tried to grab it. And slugged her to death in the process. Well, look, Nick, uh, where does Higgins come into the picture? Matty, I figure it this way. Higgins came to the house while the killer was here. Yeah? In some way or other, he got in. I get it. The killer thought fast and played he was Mr. Grogan. Gave Higgins the brush off. Right. And then the killer was afraid Higgins might be able to identify him, so he tried to murder him. Yeah, probably has by this time. No, Matty, I don't think so. No, why not? Because if he'd wanted to kill Higgins, he wouldn't have kidnapped him. Why the kidnapping? Killer was probably following him all day. So he must have seen Waldo bring him to my office. I get it, Nick. The killer wants to know how much you know. He's got Higgins someplace, and he's trying to sweat it out of him. And sooner or later, the killer's going to get tired of asking questions that Higgins don't know how to answer. So, he'll knock him off. Right. Matty, I have an idea how we can gain a little more time. What? In the meanwhile, get your department working on that wire that was used to tie up Mrs. Grogan. See if you can trace it. Right, Nick. I'll meet you down at headquarters in the stolen car department in one hour. For heaven's sake, how long are you... Gonna keep me here like this. Until you're ready to talk, Higgins. You got no right to treat me like this. Keep me blindfolded, tied up, beating me. Now, what did you tell Carter about the murder? What murder? I tell you, I don't know anything about... I told you not to hand me that line of guff anymore, Higgins. You know plenty. You told Carter. I want to know what you told him. Uh, Oh, I swear I never told him anything. How could I? I don't know anything. I'm getting a little tired of smacking you around, Higgins. You better spill it. What'd you tell Carter? Ah. Now you're playing dumb, huh? Okay, Higgins. I guess maybe I'm finished asking questions. Maybe I better fix it so you can play dumb forever. Ah, uh, is that you, Wilson? Yeah, Cash. Come on out here, quick. Okay. Well, what's the matter with you? Here, take a gander at these headlines tonight. Huh? Lady Miser of Lundy Lane murdered. Albert Higgins, key witness to murder, disappears. Yeah, and he's going to disappear for good. I made up my mind. We bump him, Wilson. We don't take chances. No, no, you, you, you don't understand, Cash. Read the rest. In an interview today, Nick Carter revealed that Albert Higgins had identified the murderer as George Spelvin, small-time crook and racketeer. A police dragnet has been set for Spelvin and also for his accuser. Ah, so that's what he told Carter. You see? We're in the clear, Cash. They can't put their finger on us. They're looking for this Spelvin character. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right, Wilson. Uh, maybe we better not knock off Higgins' cash. Maybe if we bump him, we'll be killing our alibi. Let's just sit tight and see what happens. How'd your department do in that wire trace, Matty? Well, not so good, not so bad. Here's a list of 21 retailers that sell the kind of wire used on Mrs. Grogan. Thanks. Waldo? Uh, finish the trace on the steel shot, Nick. Patsy's got it. Right here, Nick. Seventeen stores sell that type of shot. Thanks. And I've got the list of the 14 cars reported stolen for today. What stolen cars got to do with Higgins? He was almost killed by a taxi, Matty. And I know that taxi was stolen by the killer that was after him. Oh. Well, I'm going to read this list of stolen cars out loud. If I mention any neighborhood, it's on any of the other lists. Let me hear it. You ready? Right. Yeah, go ahead. Checker cab... Stolen from corner of 70th and Broadway. 70th and Broadway. Uh-uh. No. Packard cab. Stolen from Bayon Park District. Bayon. Uh-uh. Mm. Checker cab. Stolen from Nelson Square District. Nelson Square. I've got a Nelson Square here, Nick. Yeah, I got one, Nick, right here. Galvanized iron wire. Two reels sold to Hanley's hardware store, Nelson Square. Ten pounds of number seven chill steel shot. Sold to Adam Sporting goes Nelson Square. Hmm. Cab stolen from Nelson Square. Shot bought at Nelson Square. Wire that bound Mrs. Grogan from Nelson Square. Mary, I think we've got our first break in this case. Gosh, Nick, you're right. The connections are too obvious to miss. Killers evidently using Nelson Square as a base of operations. Let's get up there fast. I think that's where we'll find Albert Higgins. I only hope we find him alive. <laughs> This is 
Nelson Square, Nick. Now what? Let's see. About 12 small apartment houses on the square. Say about 10 apartments in each. Yeah, making 120. I figure the killer is hiding out in one of them and he's got Higgins there. Okay, the question is, which? I don't know. We'll have to cover every one. Hope we have enough time. But look, how are you going to know it's the killer when you see him, Nick? I'm going to make him give himself away with Waldo's help. Oh, what do I do, Nick? Take this business card. It's one of Higgins. Uh Uh-huh. They're to go from door to door as Albert Higgins, vacuum cleaner salesman. Ah, I get you, Nick. When he hits the killer, the crook will be so surprised, he'll give himself away. Right. Especially in view of the fact that he's probably seen Waldo already. You ready, Wobble? I'm ready, Nick, but, but I prefer action. Now, my old 44 Forget is... the 44. You sell vacuum cleaners. Leave the action to us. Good evening, sir. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Is the lady of the house in... Say that fast. Uh, 99 wrong numbers. I'm beginning to get discouraged. Good evening, madam. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. My card, madam, I'd like... Wait a minute, come some Glory be. Well, that makes a hundred dead ends. And it must be crazy, but orders is orders. Well, this one's next. Good evening, sir. He is the lady of the house here. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Who are you saying you was? Oh, me card, sir. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Why Cleaner you, Company. You're Carter's leg man. I've seen that mug of yours. Now, really, sir. Get your rod, Wilson. This is a plant. Yep. Get inside you before oh, I blast you. Your drop that gun. What? You're covered on both sides, mister. Reach. Fast. No tricks. Step aside and we'll come in. I think I know this gentleman, Matty. His name's Cash Hagen. Yeah. That's Wally Wilson inside. A fine pair of thugs. Hey, you got nothing on us, Carter. This here's an invasion of privacy. If you ain't got a search warrant... Did you bring a search warrant, Patsy? Uh, no, Nick. How unfortunate. And that means we'll have to find Albert Higgins here to justify this illegal entry. Where is he, Cash? Never heard of Albert Higgins. In the bedroom, Eddie? No. Nowhere in sight, Nick. Must be in the kitchen or bath. How about it, Waldo? No, he's not here, Nick. You killers murdered Higgins. Me and Wilson never heard of this guy. He's got to be someplace in here. Hey, look, Nick. They might have bumped him off and got rid of him already. I hate to believe it, Matty. We'll never have a case against these mugs if they did. They must have got rid of him, Nick. There's, there's nobody else here in the apartment. You'd be stymied like this at the last minute. Nick, point. there's something wrong with this living room. Now, Patsy... Well, look at it. It's lopsided. There's more wall on one side of the window than on the other. And there's more floor showing on one side of the rug than on the other. Patsy, this is no time for interior decoration. Even the chandelier is off center. Patsy! Wait a minute, wait a minute, Maddie. Patsy's right. Huh? Come over to the wall, quick. Listen here, if you... Shut up! Now, wait a minute. This bookcase is high enough to conceal a door. Help me swing it away from the wall, Waldo. Yes, sir. All right. Hey, uh... By heavens, you were right, Nick. It is a door. In a false plaster wall, making a partition just big enough to conceal a man. I'm only hoping that... I'll tell you, I didn't tell the count or anything. I didn't tell him anything. All right, Higgins, all right, take it easy. You don't have to lie anymore. You told Nick Carter plenty. Enough to execute Cash Hagen and Wally Wilson for murder. There's just one thing about this case that I don't understand. What's that, Patsy? When Albert told the story about those so-called accidents, how did you know they were attempted murders? Oh, that. Well, remember Higgins said the cab driver looked like an ordinary hacky? Uh Uh-huh, in gray hat and gray coat. When I said gray cap, Albert said, no, gray hat, a felt hat. That was a tip-off. How? Because no genuine cab driver wears a hat. All cab drivers in this city are required by law to wear caps. So obviously, the driver was a phony. Well, you certainly put the lid on those thugs with that felt hat. Mr. Carter, I take my hat off to you. (laughs) 
And now here's Nick Carter himself with an extra special announcement of interest to every one of you. This is the last time that the adventures of Nick Carter will be brought to you on Sunday. Beginning Tuesday, March 5th, this program will be heard over most of these stations at 8 o'clock in the evening. So put this down in your little black book starting on March 5th. That's one week from day after tomorrow. The adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, will be heard every Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. So be with us at that time and tell your friends about the change, too, won't you? Now, Nick, can you tell us something about next week's story? Well, can next week, I'm going to tell you about a brand new post-war racket that's robbing Americans of thousands of dollars and driving hundreds of Europeans to death. Nick found out about it when my janitor went to check a grocery order and disappeared. He was found murdered with his shoes full of rice. What's rice got to do with murder and racketeering? You'll find out when you hear The Case of the Wholesale Killer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester. And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Ken Powell saying so long until Tuesday evening, March 5th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Carter, that I've quite accidentally stumbled upon evidence that a horrible murder has been committed. But, Mr. Field, why come to me? That sort of thing should be reported to the police. But to what police? Where was this murder committed? I don't know. Well, then how can you be sure there was a murder if you don't even know where it was done? That's what makes this particular crime different from any other. Somewhere, sometime, a woman has been brutally murdered. Yet I don't know when or where. As a matter of fact, I doubt if anyone in the world knows of it except those who did it and me. Really? Well, how does it happen that you alone know all this? Because the victim has told me so in her own words. I heard the horrible story from her own lips. Ah, then you talked to her. No, no, never. But you just said But it. she has talked to me. See here, Mr. Field, are you trying... Mr. Carter, here's the story. About a month ago, at one of those sales of unclaimed packages that the express company holds twice a year, I, I bought a box. Uh, about uh, one-third the size of a steamer trunk. When I took it home and opened it, I found it contained a blood-stained dress, a photograph of a beautiful woman, and eight phonograph records. What kind of records? Well, they were the small record blanks you buy when you want to make your own recordings at home. And it was from these records that I learned about the crime. Hmm. Well, Mr. Field, if you wanted to arouse my curiosity, you've certainly succeeded. How soon can I hear these records? Immediately. They're in my rooms. If you care to, we can go there right now. Excellent. Patsy? Yes, Nick? Get your hat. We're leaving at once to listen to a murder. That was the start of one of the strangest cases that ever came into the office of Nick Carter, Master Detective. A murder which came to light only because a man bought a box at an auction sale. Eight records which told the amazing story of the brutal killing of an innocent victim. Eight records of death. This is the box, Mr. Carter. How long ago did you say you bought it, Mr. Field? Oh, about a month ago. And the express company holds things for a year before selling, which means the murder's at least a year old. Were the wrappings on the box when you bought it? Yes, but I'm sorry to say they were destroyed before I knew they might give me a valuable clue to the mystery. Oh, too bad. 
You recall the name to which the box was addressed? Oh, yes, yes, I do. It was addressed to Alex Delanor, New York City, no street address. The rest of the label was obliterated. I have searched every city directory, every telephone book, every place where names are listed, but no such name anywhere. When are we going to get to the records, Nick? Right now, Patsy, I hope. How about it, Mr. Field? Uh, right away. I'm very curious to get your reaction to them. Are they numbered? No, but I've played them so often, I'm sure I have them in order. Uh, here's the first one. I don't suppose anyone will ever hear this record, but it's the only way I can think of to tell my terrible story to the outside world. I'm being held a prisoner in my own house. Held prisoner without any hope of rescue, except death. And I know that will be the end for me. All I ask of you who are listening is to avenge my death by putting my murderers where they belong. My name... She sounds as if she really meant it, doesn't she? I thought he was coming in then, but he didn't. My name is Nancy Deering. You will undoubtedly recognize it. As you know, I'm very rich, but all my money is no good to me now. I've tried to escape, but he keeps too close a watch on me. I only hope they don't kill me. Oh... That's all on that. He apparently came back unexpectedly. She certainly had trouble getting her story on the record, didn't she? Yes, she was interrupted many times, generally in the wrong places. Oh, what a terrible feeling to expect to be killed any minute. Here's the next one. I don't know where I left off last time. I don't dare play it back. If they should ever hear what I'm trying to do, they take the machine away from me. From the way they talk, the end is very near. They may... I'm sure Ralph was listening outside the door, so I switched on the radio till he went away. Ralph is the one who will kill me when the time comes. Bad as Olive is, I don't believe she could kill her own cousin. But her husband is different. When I refused to sign the deed last night, he hit me several times. But he can't make me sign because I'm positive that would be the end of me. He can do anything he... And that's all there is on that. I wish she'd planned what she was going to say a little better. How to make head or tail of it this way. Well, she manages to get most of the story on the records, one way or another. The only thing she missed out on was telling us who she was or where she lived. All we have is her name. And she said she thought we'd recognize the name. Maybe she lived a long way from here. Maybe. Here's a third one. She apparently knew Ralph was coming to see her, and she prepared for his visit in advance. This is what she got. Come in. Well, my beautiful cousin, have you decided to sign that deed? I told you I'd never do it. Never. All we want, my cousin, is your money. As soon as you've made it over to us, we'll set you free, just as we promised. You don't fool me for one minute. The minute I put my name on that paper, you'd kill me. Set me free. Oh, that's funny. I haven't had a free minute since that cousin of mine moved into this house. I thought she was going to be company for me after Leonard died. But I'd have been better off living here alone. It was very sweet of you to invite her to come and live with you, Nancy. It was even nicer of you to let her bring me along. We've had such fun here. I wish I'd known then what I know now. <laughs> A little late to worry about that, dear cousin. Well, for the last time, will you sign No, me? no, no. Very well. But it won't be long before you wish you had. <laughs> Oh, how I wish this were all over. I'd rather be dead than living like this. Not a friendly face anywhere since they got rid of my old servant. Nobody left but Alex. He's too busy with his rose bushes to know what's going on. Oh, I wish I were dead. And that's all there is on that one. Oh, the poor woman. But it's too bad she didn't use more of those records than she did. She only uses a small portion of each blank. It's probably hard enough to get as much as she did on them, the way she was watched. Nick, where do you suppose she got the blanks in the first place? Probably had a radio phonograph in the room where she was shut up. And must have had the record blanks in with the other records where they didn't notice them. I've never been able to make much of this next one. Maybe you'll have better luck. The whole first part is just scratch. Here, I'll start it where the voices begin. What's the idea of voting? Nancy. Isn't she in here? Why, of course she is. Nancy, come out here. Hiding, is she? Well, we'll drag her out. I'll find her, the little Let's sheep. Let's look around devil. here, little fool. I'll find her. 
Aha! Look there! Ah, come out of there! No, no, don't wait! Come Let me alone! Out of there, I tell you, will you? Come on! Oh, oh, no. oh. Try to kill me, will you? And with my own gun. Oh. Too bad for you, you didn't succeed. You devil, why, Ralph? Doesn't... Not very clear, is it? I think so. Nancy locked her door and started the recorder. For some reason, she waited before saying anything. Then Ralph and Olive came to the door, found it bolted, and broke in. Nancy hid, and they dragged her out. She grabbed Ralph's gun and took a fast shot at him. It's too bad she missed. It's clear enough when you tell it. Well, here's the next one. I must hurry, as I may be interrupted any minute. They seldom leave me alone anymore. Maybe they're afraid I'll kill myself. But to get on with the story... When my husband was killed in Italy, I invited Olive, a distant cousin, to come and live with me. She asked if she could bring her husband. I foolishly consented. Everything went well for about two months. Then one after another, my servants left. I know now that Olive and Ralph drove them out. Then Ralph suggested that I put him in charge of my estate. I refused, of course. The next day, I was shut up in my rooms. He told me that when I made my fortune over to him, he'd let me go anywhere I wished. But I could tell he was lying. I knew... Someone is listening outside the door. Yesterday, I wrote a letter to Alex. The only one of my servants left and threw it out the window. If he finds it, maybe he can... And that's that. Well, we didn't get much out of that except a few background details. Now oh, it all pieces together, Patsy. A little at a time. This next record is more interesting, you'll find. Good. Let's have it. Well, Nancy, how do you feel today? You're not interested, so why ask me? I'm extremely interested in the state of your health, always. If you had your way, I'd be dead. Now, why don't you stop being so stubborn, Nancy? It's not getting you anywhere. Why don't you stop torturing me? Or do you enjoy seeing me suffer? I don't particularly mind. Why, you... You she-devil! You ever throw anything at me again, I'll tie you hand and foot so you can't move. Why don't you kill me and be done with it? That's what you're going to do anyway. Why, Nancy? What an unpleasant thought for such a beautiful woman. You know, I could go for you. You could only say the word. We... You dirty sneak! I told you that I fixed oh, you. No, you. No, I... Ralph, I... please. Next time I will kill you. I'm almost tempted to do it now. Ralph, will you get me a glass of water, please? I don't see why I should. Oh, all right. But no tricks, sir. I'll. Gosh, wish I could have heard more of that. I thought he was going to make a pass at her. You will hear more. Nancy must have known the record was about ended, so she sent Ralph after the water so that she could change the record. She's clever, that woman. Or should I say, she was clever. I'm afraid it's past tense for sure, Mr. Carter. What a terrible thing. Quiet, Patsy, please. Thank you, Ralph. I, uh, I think I should tell you, Nancy, that... Olive and I have decided that we'll give you one more day to do just as we want. Just one. Do you think death frightens me? That's the only way I'll ever get away from you two. At least that way my fortune will go to my sister and not to you two murderers. Are you sure? Of course. My will leaves everything to her. Ah, but we have a new will leaving everything to us. What? Properly signed, sealed, and witnessed. No, you, you can't get away with it. Oh, yes, we can. Of course, we'd rather not have to use it, but if we must, we must... <laughs> And I assure you, it's a masterpiece of fortune. I can't believe two such inhuman creatures as you and Olive actually exist. Well, we do. And we shall continue to exist long after you've gone. Look forward to tomorrow, Nancy, dear. You, you heard what he said. It was practically a full confession of everything. Oh, I beg you, whoever you are who may hear these words... See that those two monsters get their just desserts for what they've done to me. I should feel... Huh. If you didn't know she was in deadly earnest, you'd think she was putting on an act. Truth is generally more effective than fiction, Bessie. There's one more, the eighth and last. How she managed to get it, I'll never know. But here it is. The first two-thirds are blank. It starts about here. Keep away from me, both of you. As you see, I have a gun and you both know I can shoot. I'll kill the first one of you who comes near me. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Olive gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie and you know it. What if it is? Nancy. Ah! Give me that gun. Give me that gun, Nancy. Give it to me. I say you're wrong. Now, come on. 
I guess so, Ralph. The bullet just grazed my head. Good. Is she dead? Uh, she's dead, all right. Even Nancy Deering can't live with a bullet through her heart. Well, I'm glad it's over at last. You, you say you've arranged with a doctor to... Oh, poor Nancy. What a tough break she got. I truly believe that's the most remarkably told murder story in the history of crime. Well, Mr. Carter, do you have any ideas? I think so. But I'm not ready to talk about them yet. What's your first step going to be, Nick? First, I want to take these records back to the office and play them over and over until I know them by heart. Then, I'll be ready to go to work. Got a sandwich in your pocket, Patsy? Oh, Nick, I thought you'd never finish listening to those records. I wanted to be sure I didn't miss anything that you'd possibly... Be helpful to me. Did you find anything worthwhile? Yes, indeed, Patsy. There are several clues plainly marked out for us. Certainly enough for us to get started, huh? Well, tell me, Nick. Don't keep me waiting. Of course, the most obvious clue we have is the blood-stained dress that came in the box with the records. You mean the label in it? Yes. We know the girl's name was Nancy Deering. That the dress was bought at Shipstead's dress shop in Albany. Uh-huh. And as the picture that was in the box had an Albany photographer's name on it, she must have lived in or near Albany. Right. So we'll start our search there. But, Nick... If it was all done as secretly as the records would seem to indicate, chances are that nobody up there knows anything about it. Yes, except for one thing, Patsy. It's obvious from the quality of the dress and from what she said in one of the records that Nancy Deering was a well-to-do woman. Uh And I find it difficult to believe that any rich woman can disappear without the newspapers or the police or somebody knowing something about it, even if they don't know there was any foul play connected with it. I see. And when they give you the facts as they have them... You can give them the inside story you got from the record. That's what I hope will happen. So pack your bag and order a taxi. We're flying to Albany immediately. You were lucky to be able to get us on this plane. Well, this business demands a certain amount of priority. Now, Patsy, here's what I plan to do. Hmm. As soon as we get there, you take the photograph to the address shown. See if it really is a picture of Nancy Deering, and also how recent it is. Uh Uh-huh. I'm going to the newspaper office and see what they can tell me. Meet me there. You're not going to the police first? No, not unless we can't find anything anywhere else. I want to keep this unofficial as long as I can. I think I'll get further that way. We've got to be careful. We don't know what we may be stirring up when we start asking questions. Chief's office? Oh, right over there. Thanks. Come in. Yes? What can I do for you? Mr. Brown, I'm Nick Carter. I hope you can give me some information. Oh, sure, Carter. Glad to help you if I can. What's on your mind? Well, as the editor of a big paper, you must run into things every now and then. Would your files have any dope on a woman called Nancy Deering? Well, what sort of dope are you looking for and why? I'd like particularly to know when and how she died. And I'd rather not tell you why just yet. Carter, I smell a story here. If I give you the information you want, I want that story. I don't know that there is any story, but in return for your help, I'll promise to give you first crack at anything I may find that's worth your attention. Okay. If that's the way you want it, I'll play along with you. Nancy Deering, you say? Yes. How and when she died. Well, Nancy Deering and her husband, Leonard Deering, were pretty prominent people here in town, so I can answer your question offhand. Deering, a colonel in the engineers, was killed in the big push through Italy. His wife died of pneumonia a little over a year ago. Pneumonia, huh? You're sure of that? I am, but I'll check it for you. Give me the morgue. Now, Bill, when did Nancy Deering die and what was the matter with her? I'll wait. Get the name of the attending physician, too, will you? Now, look here, Carter. You got any reason to think that... Yes? December 14th, 1944. Right. Pneumonia, yeah. Um, who was the doctor? Fred Windsor. Hey, wasn't he the guy whose license was taken away a while back for malpractice? Uh Uh-huh. I thought so. Oh, okay, thanks. So this Fred Windsor was disqualified. Any idea where he is now? No. Uh, Wait a minute. I'll have a look in the directory. 
Let's see. Yep, here he is. Fred Windsor, 57 Telfer Road. That's up in the western section of the city, a small suburb. Thanks very much, Mr. Brown. I won't bother you anymore. And if I get any red-hot tips, I'll pass them on to you when I'm ready. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. Later, Mr. Brown. Well, so long. Thanks again. So long. I was just coming to find you. What did you find out? The photographer says there's a picture of Nancy Deering, all right, taken about a year and a half ago, just before her husband left for the war. And that's her husband with her in the picture. They had a big house out on Lincoln Avenue in the West End. Good. I found what I wanted, too. We going out to the Deering house now, Nick? Not just yet, Bessie. Huh? What she said in the records is true. The ones living there now are her murderers. And they'd hardly be likely to tell us anything we'd want to know. Oh. No, we'll wait. So we have more definite information before we tackle them. Then what do we do now? We're going to call on a doctor, or rather an ex-doctor. And I hope he'll tell us something he never told anybody before. Well, now you're in, what do you want? And make it brief. Mr. Windsor, I'll come directly to the point. A little over a year ago, a woman named Nancy Deering died. You, as attending physician, signed the death warrant. All right? Yes, I signed it. What about it? I have reason to believe she didn't die of pneumonia. You're crazy. Of course she did. If you think you can come now, here and minute. start a... I said I had reason to think she died of something else. I might have said I have proof that she did. Well, you haven't. Mr. Windsor, you'll save yourself and me a lot of trouble if you... Get out of here, both of you. You're a pair of metal Hold it, good Windsor. For no... It won't help you any to get rough. I've got nothing to say to you. You might just as well get out. I'd like you to do just one thing for me before I go. I've got nothing to say. You won't have to talk. Just listen to a record. A record? Yes. You have a player here? Yes, right here. What's the record? Let me play it for you and you'll see. I can promise you, you'll be greatly interested. Well, go ahead, play it. But be quick about it. Put it on, Pessy. You mean the last one of the series? Yes. Okay. Keep away from me, both of you. No. As you see, I have a gun. You both know I can shoot. I'll kill the first one of you who comes near me. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Oh, that's right. Oh, gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie, and you know it. What if it is? It can't be possible. Yeah. What do you think of? That takes care of you, you coming. Stop fool. it. Are you Stop it. Yes. I, I won't hear anymore. I won't hear anymore. Tragedy. But he practically confessed before he died. But we can't prove he did, Patsy. No matter how much we know ourselves, we're right back where we started, as far as legal proof goes. Then we'll have to find some other way to prove what we know. We can't stop here. I have no intention of stopping. Well, what now? I'm going to put an ad in the paper for Alex Delano, the man who sent the box to New York originally. He isn't listed in the city directory of the phone book, so we'll have to try it this way. Won't that be dangerous, Nick? How do you mean dangerous? Well, suppose this Ralph should see it. Mightn't he get suspicious? That's one reason I'm using the ad, Patsy. I hope Ralph does see it, and I hope he does something about it. I want to smug him right out into the open. And this may be one way to do it. Pardon me, do you uh, have any answers in box 415? 415. Uh, yeah, one. Here you are. Well, results. What is it, Nick? Let me get it open and I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, from Alex himself. Oh. We'll be looking for you at my residence at 84 Green Court about 8 tonight. Alex Delanoir. You going, Nick? Of course I'm going. But you're going to stay in your hotel oh. room and wait for me to call if I need your help. Oh, Nick, I want to go too. Nothing doing, Patsy. Do yourself said. This may be a trap, and I'd rather deal with it myself. Who is it? You, Alex Delanor? Yes. May I come in? I'd like some information, if you can give it to me. Oh, but of course. Come in. Thanks. Uh, sit there, please. Delano, you used to work for Mrs. Nancy Deering, didn't you? Oh, Mrs. Deering. Oh, yes, I worked for her for many years. It was only after she died that Mr. Morgan fired me. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Yes, yes. Tell me, Delano, after she died, did you pack up a box of records and send them to New York? Oh, 
You have found the records? Oh, I've waited so long for that. Yes, we found them. And why did you send them to New York like that? Well, her letter asked me to, to prove she was murdered. Her letter? Yes. It says she is being kept prisoner, and she is afraid she will be killed at any time. She says if she die quick, I must pack the records I find in her radio cabinet and take them to the police. It will prove what she says. But why didn't you go to the police with that letter? Uh, she have died the day before I find the letter. It is too late. She threw the letter out of the window to me a few days before, but I find it behind a rose bush too late to help. So I, I do what she says. And you didn't take the records to the police? Oh, me, uh, I am afraid of police. Hmm. So I put them in a box and send box to New York. Uh, then I write police to get it and find out what have happened. Do you have her letter now? Oh, yes. I, I keep it in my pocket always. Here it is. Thank you, Delano. With that letter and the records, I'll I think I... will take that letter, Mr. What? Carter. No, I have a gun here covering you. Put your hands up over your head. That's it. So it was you who arranged this meeting? Yeah, I was curious to know what you wanted with Alex. And I find he knows much more than I thought he did. I should have got rid of him before this. And what do you intend to do now? Dispose of you and Alex. The records are still in existence. They'll prove you murdered Mrs. Deering. With this letter in my possession and the doctor dead. Oh, yes, I know about that, too. The records will prove nothing. Now, come on. I have my car outside. You and Alex and I'll take a ride to my house where you'll stay until I decide how best to get rid of you. I say kill him, Ralph. He's too dangerous to be allowed to live. Well, do as I say, Olive. If Carter were to disappear, every cop in this section of the country would be searching for him. But, Ralph, No, he... we'll clean out the safe deposit boxes, withdraw the money we have in the bank, and go to Mexico, South America. We'll leave Carter and Alex tied up there. If they starve to death before they're found, well, that's just too bad. I think you're a fool, Ralph, to let him live. I'm running this, Olive. And if you don't want me to go away alone, do as I say. I hate him. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have to run away like this. I could kill him myself. Well, you won't. I don't leave the house until I get back. Pack all your things, be ready to leave. All right, Ralph. I'll get back as quick as I can. Let him live. I won't. I'll fix him. A knife in his heart is what he deserves. That's what he's going to get right now. Yes. Yes, this carving knife will do. Tied up as he is, he, he can't do anything to stop me from killing him. Are you in there, Mr. Nick Carter? I'm coming to kill you, Nick Carter. I hate you. I'm going to... Now, oh, now, oh, oh, I can reach that knife you dropped. Oh, if I could only see behind my back. What happened, Mr. Carter? I tripped her up as she came in and knocked her head on the floor and stunned her. Now, if I could get to that knife. Oh, where is it? I want to be... Ah. Now, cut the ropes on my arms. There. I'll have you... Free in a minute, too, Alex. Oh, look out, Mr. Carter. She's coming back. It's all right. I'm free now. I'll take care of her. What? What happened? Quiet. Don't make a sound. But I... You try to cry out, I'll fix you so you can't. Ralph isn't here anyway. Wouldn't do any good. Where is he? He's gone to town. Olive. You're lying to me. Olive. That's he calling. He must have come, come back for something. Olive, why don't you answer me? Call him. Tell him to come in here. But you don't think my ropes are tight enough. I won't do it. Ouch! That's the carving knife you feel between your ribs. Now call to him carefully. Ralph. Yes? Ralph, I'm in here. Please come in. Well, what are you doing in there? Get I your hands you in the air. Why, what? Get him up high. That's it. Alan, how did Carter get that gun? Did you? You overlooked this little pistol I always carry in my shoulder holster, Ralph. But it's deadly even if it is small. What? What are you going to do with us now? Round up whatever existence I can find in this house, including Alex's letter, and hand you both over to the police. With what Alex and I can tell them, and the evidence I can turn over to them, you'll both of you pay for Nancy Deering's life by forfeiting your own. Well, 
Nick. How about a few hints about next week's show? Well, next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about a suicide that turned out to be a murder and then disappeared entirely. Hold on a minute now. That's too fast for me. Well, it's true, Ken. If it hadn't been that my woman's intuition told me that what Scubby and I saw wasn't what we ought to have seen, the entire story might have been different. Yes, Patsy, that was one time when you really put the finger on the answer to a very tricky problem. This I gotta hear. What do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the disappearing corpse. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics magazine. In the adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. The Mutual Broadcasting System. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Once more, we're about to visit Dr. Watson, the friend and chronicler of Sherlock Holmes and his amazing adventures. We find him sitting in his well-worn armchair, an eager look on his face and a humorous twinkle in his eye. Can it be that the good doctor looks forward to his weekly appearances before the microphone? Good evening, Mr. Bell. It <laughs> certainly can. Tonight, I have my narrative all picked out. Have you ever noticed that red-headed people always seem to lead very eventful lives? Look at Queen Elizabeth. Yes. And I've heard that Cleopatra was a brick top, and she certainly had very few dull moments. No, I'm sure she didn't. Well, tonight I've decided to tell you the story of the Red-Headed League. The Red-Headed League. What a curious title. No more curious than the situation it gave rise to in Sherlock Holmes' life. And as soon as your word with our listeners is out, I'll begin. Good. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life... Remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressings they try are too greasy, too highly perfumed. I've heard them complain about those sticky goos which plaster their hair down and leave flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And Kreml gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kreml contains a special combination of hair-grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kreml, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kreml always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look as if your barber had just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the red-headed leak? Well, the adventure began one day during the autumn of the year 1890, I believe it was. It was just after my marriage, and I hadn't seen much of Sherlock Holmes lately. Anyway, I burst in upon my old friend to find him deep in conversation with a stout, florid-faced gentleman with the fiercest red hair it has ever been my privilege to observe. I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. Come in, my dear Watson, come in. 
You couldn't possibly have come at a better time. But, Holmes, I was afraid you might be busy. So I am, my dear fellow. Allow me. Mr. Wilson, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Sit down, Watson, sit down. Uh, Thank you. I know that you share my love of the bizarre, although you've never agreed that for the strangest effects and most extraordinary combinations we must go to life itself. Well, you know, I... Uh, Mr. Jabez Wilson here has just started a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular to which I've listened for some time. Oh, really? And now, my dear Mr. Wilson, perhaps you would have the great kindness to recommence your story. Oh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. And as soon as I can find that newspaper clipping, where did I put it? And I sworn it was here in my waistcoat pocket. Uh, Watson, while we're waiting for Mr. Wilson to find his missing newspaper advertisement, uh, suppose you tell me what you deduce from his appearance. Oh, well, now, let me see. Uh, well, I would say that he was uh, middle-aged, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Wilcox, I'm Wilson, and, uh, and he has red hair. Obvious, Watson. Too obvious. I'll come to your assistance. Oh, kind of He has at some time done manual labor. He's a Freemason, has been in China, and has done a considerable amount of writing lately. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you fair give me the creeps. Are you one of these mind readers? No, indeed. Then how in the name of good fortune did you know all this about me? About the manual labor, for example. It's as true as gospel. I begin as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir. Your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. The muscles are more developed. As for the Freemasonry, you use an arc and compass breast pin, uh, rather against the strict rules of your order. I uh, see that. But the writing, how about that? What else can be indicated by that right cuff, so very shiny? And the left sleeve with a smooth patch near the elbow where you rest it on the desk. Well, how about China? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scales a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China. And when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. (laughs) Well, I never. (laughs) At first I thought you'd done something clever. But now I see it was nothing to it after all. I begin to think, Watson, that I make a mistake in explaining... Omni ignotum pro magnifico, you know. Yes, Uh, just what I was thinking. Yes, I'm afraid what reputation I may have will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Uh, Have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Oh, yes, I got it now. It was in my watch pocket. This is what begin it all, sir. Just read it for yourself. Uh, Watson, uh, suppose you do that for us. With pleasure. Uh, First, uh, make a note of the paper... And the date. It's the Morning Chronicle of July the 27th, 1890, just two months ago. Very well. Proceed with the advertisement. It begins, To the Red-Headed League. Owing to the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men above the age of 21 are eligible. Sounds very odd. Fly in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope Court, Fleet Street. Dear me, Holmes, what on earth does this all mean? I think I promised you that this, was, this case was bizarre. Now, Mr. Wilson, if you will continue with your story. Well, it's just about as I was telling you, Mr. Holmes. I have a small pawnbroker shop in Coburg Square. Great years, business has been bad. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only have one. And I don't have a job to pay him, except he's willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. Obliging youth. What's his name? Uh, Vincent Spaulding. And I couldn't want a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. I know he could easily earn twice what I'm able to give him. (laughs) Well, as I say, if he's satisfied, who am I to be putting ideas into his head? Hmm. Your assistant seems to be as remarkable as your advertisement. Oh, he has only one fault, Mr. Holmes. Photography. Photography? Yes, snapping away with his camera and then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. An amateur photographer, huh? He is uh, still with you, I suppose? Oh, yes, sir. And an observant young fellow he is. He was the one who has brought this advertisement to my notice. Hmm. It was just this day, eight weeks, when he rapped on my office door with this very paper in his hand. Come in, come in. 
Oh, Mr. Wilson, sir. Oh, it's you, Vincent. What's the matter? Well, I wish to heaven, Mr. Wilson, that I was a red-headed man. Why? Well, well, look here, sir. What it says in this paper. There's another vacancy in the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth a pretty penny to him that gets it. A red-headed league? Never heard of it. Never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men? No. Oh, Mr. Wilson, and you eligible for one of the vacancies. Huh? What are they worth? Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year, but the work's slight, and it needn't interfere much with one's regular occupation. Hmm. A couple of hundred pounds a year, huh? Let me see that paper, young man. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. As, as far as I can make out, the league was started by a millionaire named Ezekiah Hopkins, a red-headed man himself. He left his fortune in hands of trustees with instructions to provide easy berths to men who had red hair. Hmm. From what I hear, the work isn't difficult. Oh, there must be millions of red-headed men. Oh, not as many as you might think, sir. You see, it's confined to Londoners. Oh. And then again, it, it, it's, it's no use if your hair is light red or dark red or anything but real blazing fire red. They, they've got to pick the reddest hair they can find. Well, if there's a redder head of hair than mine in the length and breadth of London, I'd like to see it. Well, I, I have seen a few that I considered redder. Oh, nonsense. Well, where's Matt? Uh, what are you going to do, Mr. Wilson? I'm going around to apply for that vacancy. If it's rain and gold, no one can say that Jabez Wilson is the man to go out with a sieve. And did you get the job, Mr. Wilson? I did that, Mr. Holmes. There wasn't a head of hair could touch mine for redness. If I do say so myself. And there was thousands competing... And what was the work? Oh, purely nominal, like the paper said. And it paid four pounds a week, regular as a clock. All I had to do was sit at a desk in an office at that address there from ten to two and copy out bits from the encyclopedia. Hmm. Educational as well as remunerative. And uh, how long did this work continue? About eight weeks. I was pretty well through the A's. Abbots, archery, architecture and the like. Then... Suddenly, it come to an end. I went to my work ten o'clock as usual. The door was shut and locked, and a card was nailed to the door. What did it say? Red-headed league dissolved October 9th, 1890. Well, I say, Holmes, that's today. Well, it was this very morning it was, sir. Well, I lost no time trying to find the man that hired me. Four pounds a week is four pounds. You say you tried to find the man that rented the office? Yes, sir. I inquired from the house agent, and he gave me the man's name and said he'd moved to a new address. You went there, of course. Yes, sir. Well? When I got to that address, it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. No one had ever heard of the Red-Headed League. So then you came straight to me. Yes, sir. I thought it best to lose no time. Quite right. Uh, by the by, Mr. Wilson, uh, this uh, assistant of yours, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you when he called your attention to the Red-Headed League? About a month. How did he come? In answer to an advertisement. Uh, was he the only applicant? No, sir. I, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? Oh, because he was handy and would come cheap. At half wages, in fact. Hmm. What is he like? Oh, small, stout built, very quick in his ways. No hair on his face, uh, though he's not short of 30. And he had a white splash of acid on his forehead. I thought as much. Have you ever noticed that his ears are pierced for earrings? Well, yes. He says a gypsy did it for him when he was a lad. Watson, what day of the week is it? Well, it's Saturday, of course. Saturday, dear me, so it is. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think I may promise you some startling developments by tonight. In the meantime, Watson, I suggest we drop round sometime this afternoon to view the attractions of saxe coburg Square and Mr. Wilson's exemplary assistant in particular. Well, certainly, my dear fellow. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll be expecting you. Goodbye, gentlemen. And now, Watson, if you will hand me my violin, I have some thinking to do. Can't you think without that? Oh, all right. Here you are. Here we 
are, Holmes. This seems to be Saxe Coburg Square. Hmm. Shabby, genteel little backwater of a place. And this, I fancy, is our friend's shop. The four-story building with the three gilt balls over the door. Yes. Well, the square itself seems fairly uninteresting, huh? Yeah, very depressing. Well, let's see what streets back, backs onto it on this side. Come along, Watson. Well, I can't see what difference the next street can make to our problem. <laughs> if it is a problem... The whole thing sounds more like a practical joke to me. A practical joke which cost its perpetrator four pounds a week? Nonsense, Watson. No man's sense of humor resides in his pocketbook. Well, this street seems to have more life. It's one of the chief arteries leading to the north and west. Let me see. What is the order of the houses here? Order? Yes, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. First we have Mortimer's, then the tobacconist's. The little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarland's carriage building yard. Yes. Now, now we can go back to the shop of our friend, Mr. Wilson. What's the hurry, Holmes? Don't walk so fast. Well, I found out all I want to hear. Well, Holmes, you behave as if you were taking a memory course. Why should you want to know all the shops on that street? Just a waste of time. Nothing that exercises the brain is a waste of time, my dear Watson. The trouble with most of us is that our brains have become flabby from lack of proper use. Rubbish. Well, here we are back again. Quite. Why are you flapping on the pavement with your stick? Huh? If you want to enter the shop, why not knock on the door? Oh, quite so, Watson. I'm afraid my etiquette is a bit faulty lately. So, just to please you, I will knock on the door. Somebody's coming. I can see him through the glass. Looks like our bright little assistant. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Won't you step in? Uh, thank you, no. I only wish to ask you how to get from here to the Strand. Third right, fourth left. Smart fellow, that. Eh, hey, Watson? I see no signs of a colossal intelligence. Nevertheless, he is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest mine in London. And for daring, I'm not sure that he's not the third. I see nothing so startling about him. The knees of his trousers, Watson. Didn't you notice? The knees of his trousers? What about him? Most enlightening, my dear Watson. Most enlightening. Oh, this is so much balderdash. I've had just about enough of it. I'm going to get myself some tea and a muffin. There's an appetizing little baker shop across the road there. Very good, Watson. Suppose you meet me back here at ten tonight. Sharp, mind you. And kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. What? This business is serious. More serious even than I expected. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange case of the red-headed league. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy-looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kreml massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes dandruff flakes, and it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... You were going to meet Sherlock Holmes that night in saxe Coburg Square. Yes, Mr. Bell. Our rendezvous took place right on the dot. I remember the hour was striking. I say, Holmes, it's ten o'clock now. How long do we have to stand here in this confounded rain? I'm soaked to the skin. Until the other member of our party turns up, Watson. Ah, here comes a cab. I think you'll be in it. Whoa! Yes. Good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Good evening, Holmes. Yes. Uh, I say, Holmes, uh, why have you got to route me out on a night like this? Saturday night, too. I shall miss my rubber of whist. 
It's the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years that I've not had my whist. My dear Merriweather, I think you'll find that tonight you're playing for higher stakes than even you are accustomed to. And I can promise the play will be more exciting. Oh, indeed. Uh, by the way, this is my friend Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? But come, we must hurry. This way, gentlemen. Well, where are we going? Wilson's shop is here on the square. You stop burbling, Watson. Oh, wasn't burbling, Watson. Follow me and don't waste time. In your message to me, Holmes, you said something about John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher, and forger. John Clay? Who's he? My dear Watson, John Clay is one of our most colorful and dangerous criminals. A young man, but at the head of his uh, profession. I'd rather have the braces on him than on any criminal in London. I've heard that his grandfather was a royal duke. And he himself has been to Eton and Oxford. He'll crack a crib in Scotland one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. We've been after him for years, Holmes, and haven't set eyes on him yet. Well, I trust I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. Here we are, down this narrow passageway. You'd better let me go first. Look here, Holmes. I don't like the look of all this. This passage goes underground. Gives me the creeps. Oh, ah. I say, let's run into something. Now, the wall, I fancy. I forgot to warn you. There's a turn here to the right. Yes, I found that out. Thanks very much. Ah, here's the door. Just a moment till I light my dark lantern. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you will unlock the door for us. In just a moment till I find my key. Ah, here we are. Better let me go first, sir, in case we're too late. Ah, yes, the coast seems clear enough. Come along, both of you. Holmes, as I said, I don't like the look of this place. Your lantern throws such weird shadows. It smells like a vault. It is a vault, my dear Watson. The basement of the city and suburban bank, to be exact, of which our friend Mr. Merriweather here is managing director. Well, what are all those wooden crates doing here? They explain why the most daring criminal in London is taking such an interest in this particular place. Yes, Dr. Watson. These crates contain our French gold. French gold? Quite. Well, you see, we had occasion some months ago to borrow 30,000 Napoleons from France. From France? Good gracious, will you? Most of which has never been unpacked. Rather an inducement for any thief. Oh, really, Holmes, I think you are rather unduly excited. The building is guarded by ten burly watchmen. Yes, I dare say you're not particularly vulnerable from above. Nor from below, Holmes. Nothing but solid earth below these flagstones. Listen to this. Don't do that. Do you want to ruin all our plans? But look here, I say it did sound hollow, you know. Not so loud, please. Now then, I think we'd better take up our positions. You, Merriweather, behind those large boxes in the corner. Watson and I will hide behind this crate. I hope you appreciate the honor, my dear fellow. This crate contains no less than 2,000 Napoleons neatly packed in tinfoil. Good heavens. Ready? We must put the screen over my dark lantern. And sit here in the dark? Certainly. Oh, dear, and I'd brought along a pack of cards. I thought we might have time for a three-handed rubber. Not tonight, Mr. Merriweather. We are dealing with a dangerous man, and unless we can take him at a disadvantage, he may do us considerable harm. One thing more. When I flash my light, close in swiftly. And if he reaches for a weapon, shoot. And shoot to kill. Dear me, I... I wish I'd stayed at home. Quite. I'm going to cover the light. here in the dark like this. Really, Merriweather. Holmes, do you hear that? Look, 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 look. There in the middle of the floor, a slit of light. Somebody's raising one of the stone slabs. Look, look, there's a hand. Catch his hands before I can pull himself through the opening. Right, you are. Quick, Watson. Look out, he's got a knife. Take your hands off. No, you don't, you... Oh. oh, well done, Holmes. Well done. You've knocked him out. Good. Drag him up here. Right, you are. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll give us some light. That's better. But I say, Holmes, it's Vincent Spaulding, Wilson's assistant. Spaulding rubbish. This is John Clay, one of the most dangerous criminals in London. I've been after him for years. Help me search him, Watson. Oh. Look out, Holmes. Look out. Oh. He's coming, too. Take your filthy hands off me, you scarecrow. No, no, no. None of that now. You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. Oh, lunatic. 
And when you address me, have the goodness to say, sir, and please. Oh, very well. Uh, would you please, sir, march yourself upstairs where we can hand you over to the policemen who are anxiously awaiting your highness's arrival? And be quick about it. <laughs> Better have another spot of whiskey, Watson. Oh, thank you. Hey, right, Jervis. Feels good to get into dry clothes again after spending hours in that cold cellar. I say, said it, not so much soda, Holmes. Do you want to drown it? Oh, God bless you, my dear fellow. Oh, thanks. I say, Holmes, wh when did you first begin to suspect that fellow Spaulding? I, I mean, Clay. When uh, Mr. Wilson told me he was anxious to work for half price. Always suspect anyone or anything that comes too cheap. There's sure to be a motive behind yes, but it. How did you guess what the motive was in this case, I mean? I suspected his uh, fondness for photography and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. And why was someone so anxious to have our friend Mr. Wilson kept out of his shop for several hours every day? Activities in the cellar again. Uh, by the way, that red-headed league hoax is one of the cleverest dodges I've come across for some time... Too clever, in fact. When I heard of it, I knew there was only one man who could have originated it. John Clay. We've had our skirmishes, but this is the first time we've come face to face. Well, so you went around to have a look at the shop? At his trousers, Watson. Trousers? At the knees of his trousers, to be exact. You saw how worn and wrinkled they were? They spoke of hours of burrowing. Burrowing in the cellar. But what for? By tapping on the pavement, I found that the tunnel did not stretch out to the front. Where, then? We strolled round the corner, you remember. And there stood the city and suburban bank, abutting on our friend's pawn shop. Yes, of course. The inference was clear. Yes, yes, I see that. But how did you guess that he'd make his attempt tonight? Perfectly simple, Watson. Perfectly simple. The offices of the Red-Headed League closed this morning. Mr. Wilson's absence was no longer necessary. The tunnel was completed, but it was essential that Mr. Clay should use it soon or it might be discovered. Tonight being Saturday would be ideal as it would give him two days for escape. Q.E.D. Holmes, your reasoning is perfect. A long chain, and yet every link rings true. Well, it saves me from ennui. These little problems help me to escape the common places of existence. Yes, sir. After all, uh, l'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout. As Flaubert once wrote to George Sand. <laughs> Fascinating story, Dr. Watson. What a thrilling time you must have had during the days you lived with Sherlock Holmes. Well, I can't say that I was ever bored. <laughs> I should think not. Ladies, how often you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory. And how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell. Because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a caustic soap. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam, even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that divinely beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright, yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Well, Mr. Bell... One of the favorite fictional problems of your modern mystery writer is the so-called locked room story. <laughs> yes, I know. Somebody gets murdered in a sealed room, locked from the inside, and the detective has an awful time finding out how it was done. Oh, quite correct, Mr. Bell, quite correct. And uh, next week, 
I'm going to tell you how, just ten years before the turn of the century, Holmes actually encountered such a problem and solved it. I call the story Murder in the Locked Room. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Red-Headed Lee. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about murder in the locked room. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of those increasingly popular cigarettes. Sano, the cigarette with far less nicotine. Encore cigarettes that filter the smoke but not the taste present... Martin Kane starring Mark Stevens. What's your name? What's that? Don't try anything. I said, what's your name? Uh, Thompson. Albert Thompson. Why, something wrong, officer? You sure this is the man? He's the one I saw, all right. He did it. Did what? I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you? I saw you running out of that store after the shooting. You killed that storekeeper. I don't know what you're talking about. What store? I haven't done anything. He's the one. I'll swear to it. Come along, mister. Oh, look, officer. Behave you're making... yourself. Officer, please. I'll need you to. But you're on. making a terrible oh, mistake. I never saw this man in my life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we're all set on our end. Oh, no, nothing's going to happen to that witness. He's in a real safe place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, any time you want him for the grand jury, he'll be there. Well, thank you. Now, I'll be checking with you right along. Right. Well, the DA's a very happy man. He's got a cinch case against Albert Thompson. Oh, uh, what did you drop in for, Kane? Congratulations. Yeah? What'd you do? Not me, it's you that rates the medals, Lieutenant. You and your department, the way you solved that murder, that's pretty good. Well, the whole case just kind of walked in here. Fred Wallace, the guy who spotted Thompson at that bus stop, he's the one who gets all the credit. You got anything new on Thompson? Well, the identification looks pretty solid, Kane. <clears throat> got a smart lawyer, Ed Randall. He could beat you in court unless you come up with more evidence. Including the murder weapon. Yeah, we're working on it. You know, Kane, the take of that robbery was about 200 bucks. When we examined Thompson, he had 207 bucks on him. Yeah, maybe he saved it up. <laughs> yeah, how? His wife didn't know anything about it. Look, Lieutenant, when a fellow's planning on buying his wife a new coat for her birthday, he doesn't tell her what he's saving up for. Uh, tell me, how do you know so much about Thompson? He's Ed Randall's client. So? Ed Randall's a client oh. of mine. Oh. He thinks Thompson's innocent. Thinks that your witness made a mistake. He's a good lawyer. He's smart, too. Mm -hmm. Oh. You, uh, you think the witness made a mistake, too? I don't know. That's why I'm hired to find out. Well, you sure picked a tough way to make a living. Some guys climb mountains. You won't even get off the ground. 
Fred Wallace made a positive identification. By the way, I called his house. You've taken him somewhere. Why? For his health gain. Oh, come on, Lieutenant Thompson. Couldn't hurt anybody. He hasn't got any mob connections. He's just a little guy that fell in a great big hole. I want to see Wallace. You're wasting your time, Kane, and that's straight. You're convinced that Thompson's guilty. I can't be, not yet. Well, I'm only about 90% convinced because we still haven't found the gun. However, Fred Wallace kind of makes up for it. I still want to see him. Well, you'll see him all right. But not alone. I'll be there, too. Everything all right, Mr. Wallace? Fine, fine. Yeah? Yes, sir. How are things? What did the commissioner say to this guy's food bill? Hello, Kane. Hello, Jane. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Uh, this is uh, Martin Kane. How do you do, Mr. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Kane's a private detective. Right now, he's working for Thompson's lawyer. I see. He'd, uh, he'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh-huh. Mr. Wallace, you're sure you couldn't have been mistaken in your identification? No, sir. What makes you so positive it was Thompson you saw running out of the shop after you heard the shots? Why, it just was, that's all. Tell me, was he wearing a hat? A hat? Yeah. Hat. Yes, yes, he was. Thompson doesn't wear a hat, Mr. Wallace. Never does, never has. Well, he could have on this job, Kane. Do I have to talk to him? Why not, Mr. Wallace? We're both after the same thing, aren't we? The truth? That's just why I went after that policeman the moment I saw Thompson. Why, it's my duty as a citizen. You think I like hanging around this hotel room, not being able to go about my normal business? Or seeing my name spread all over the newspapers? I have to testify at that trial. It's the right thing to do. You know, Kane, most people would be afraid to stick out their necks. We could use more men like Mr. Wallace. Yeah. Civic virtue is a great thing, Lieutenant. As long as it doesn't convict the wrong man. Why would I do a thing like that? Just a mistake, Mr. Wallace. A simple, ordinary human mistake. It happens all the time. Every day. Just like it happened here. You couldn't possibly have seen Thompson run out of that store. He was clear across town at the time. That's what he says. I saw it. Tell me, Mr. Wallace, what was the weather that day? What kind of a question is that? Would you answer it, please? I don't see what difference it makes. I, I think it was a nice day. Yes, it was a nice warm day. The man who ran out of the store, was he wearing a top coat? He could have. Was he? No, I just told you it was a warm day. He wouldn't be wearing a top coat. Your logic's good, Mr. Wallace, but your memory is bad. It was a warm day and Thompson was wearing a top coat. The people at his office will swear to that. He's just trying to trick me. Now, I just want you to think and think hard, Mr. Wallace. Isn't it possible that you made a mistake in your identification? Mr. Kane, I'm not a fool. If I listened to you and changed my story, I'd be a fool. Some people would say I was scared off. Others that I was bought off. No, sir. I said it was Albert Thompson. And Albert Thompson, it stays. Well, convinced? Nope. I got a better chance of talking back to Tide. Albert's in here, Mrs. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Why don't you go right on in? I'll wait out here for Mr. Kane. Albert? Oh, Helen. What? You all right? Yeah. Yeah, they're treating me all right. Mr. Randall's here with me. I said he was coming. He's a very fine lawyer, Helen. He, he tried to get him to lower the bail. He's still working very hard. Yeah, I know. They won't do it. A guard told me that $25,000 is the lowest bail he ever heard of. For a murderer. Mr. Barnes came to see me from the office. Wanted to know if we needed any money. What would you tell him? I, I thanked him very much. I, I, I told him we'd manage... Oh, well, 
but he said... He said all your friends believe in you. Helen. Uh, Mr. Randall's very optimistic. He... He thinks this Mr. Kane is sure to find some new evidence. He, uh... I may not even have to go to trial, Helen. I... Helen, I... Hmm. Oh, well, this is going to happen soon. Oh, Helen, I want you to meet Martin Kane. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Kane, can you help us? I don't know yet. Have you talked to Wallace? Yeah, I talked to him. He'll make an excellent witness for the state. How do you see it, Ed? Well, it's not good. It's not bad. District Attorney's Office has been working just as hard as we have. Has he got an offer an indictment? Brady has. See, Albert, our main problem is your alibi. If we could only prove that you were nowhere near that store when it happened. No, but I wasn't. I wasn't. I was on my way home. A, a dozen people must have seen me. Two dozen. A hundred people could have seen you, Mr. Thompson. Nobody ever sees you on a subway or a bus. I'm afraid you have no alibi. Ed, I'll keep right on working, mainly on finding the gun. The big job will be yours in court. I know. I'll need everything you can get me to shake Wallace in cross-examination. Oh, no. let's not give up the ship. Never can tell about juries. <laughs> Sometimes they go for the strangest stories. What's strange about Albert's story? That's the truth. Well, he never hurt a soul in his life. He... Well, he's an honest, decent, hard-working man. What jury would believe he's a murderer? Yes. Yes, I know, Inspector. Yes, sir, I know this isn't that big, but the... Well, the district attorney's been on my neck all week. Yeah. He says he's got to have the gun that killed Thompson or else. That's right. So I put all the men I could spare on it, sir. No, sir. No, sir, nothing so far. What? Well, Inspector, I think my men know their jobs. I pick most of them myself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I, I understand you. Yes, I certainly do. Now, uh, thank you, Inspector. Uh, good night. Want some, Kane? Warm out tonight. Not for a private detective. What do you want? I want some help. Still working for Ed Randall? That's right. Well, come around and see me when you quit. Maybe that'll be too late. For Albert Thompson? No, for you, Lieutenant. You want to find the gun, don't you? What do you think? I get it or I get fired. I don't know whether it'll be the inspector first or the DA. Maybe neither. You huh? want to help me? Hey, Kane. Are you holding out on me? Hey, do you know where that gun is? I know where that gun isn't, and I know a little fellow that doesn't know anything at all about it, Albert Thompson. Now, Kane, say what you've got to say. All right, you won't find the gun until you find the man who used it, and it wasn't Albert Thompson. You've already proved that. Yeah, how? You've had your best men out looking for the gun, and they can't find it. They've questioned any, every enemy, every friend that Thompson ever had. They've looked every place where he could have bought or rented a gun. And they're going to keep right on looking. Well, they can keep on looking from now until next year, but they're going to come up with nothing. Yeah, maybe and maybe not. We'll see. Look, Lieutenant, stop wasting time. Now, look, Kane, tell me what you want or, or take off. Get me a rundown, a description of every every pickup artist that looks like Thompson. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, how many can there be? Fifty, a hundred, five hundred, I don't know, and I can't spare a crew on the files Why to find out. That store, yeah, Peter? well, then you find him, and while you're at it, try and find a witness who saw him do it. Meantime, I'll go along with Thompson. I got a witness for him. Ne Lieutenant Gray. Yes, sir? Oh, she did, huh? Yeah, that's too bad. No, no, I didn't think of that. Well, all I can do is keep right after it. Yes, sir, of course, as soon as I get anything. District Attorney. They just took Mrs. Thompson to Bellevue. A complete nervous collapse. 
How much you can do about that, is there? Kane, everything we've got so far says that Thompson did it. You show the DA one solid fact on the other side of the ledger, and Thompson's practically a free man. Look, will you give me the rundown? I'll try to get that fact, and you show it to the DA. Did you ever meet Mrs. Thompson? Yeah. Real nice woman. That's right. Sergeant. Meet me in the photo gallery in five minutes. This better be good, Kane. For everybody's sake. Especially for my clients. If we miss, we get another chance. He doesn't get another chance, Lieutenant. This is his last time at bat. Hello there, Mrs. Malone. A cotton of your usual? No, Hap. I've decided to make a change. My goodness, after all these years, a change? That's right. You see, I smoke so much, I thought I should try some of those cigarettes they claim have less nicotine. Do you know anything about them? Well, Mrs. Malone, it just so happens that I do. More and more people are switching to Sano cigarettes for exactly the same reason that you mentioned. Oh, uh, care to have one on the house? No charge? Thank you. Well, from that sample, I'd say people are switching to Sano cigarettes not just because they contain less nicotine, but because they like them. That's right, Mrs. Malone. And uh, speaking of nicotine, uh, do you realize that you've never seen any? Really? But I... Well, I thought the stain test showed just the amount of uh, nicotine in a cigarette. Ah, no, you see other substances, but not nicotine. Nicotine is absolutely colorless when it's removed from the tobacco. Removed from the tobacco? You mean they can take nicotine right out of the tobacco even before the cigarettes are made? That's exactly what I mean. That's the reason why there's less nicotine in the smoke of a Sano cigarette. The nicotine is removed from the tobacco before Sano cigarettes are made. Well, that's really getting rid of nicotine. Yes, indeed. The fact is there's less nicotine in the smoke of a Sano cigarette than in the smoke of any other leading cigarette. Actually, less than one-tenth of one percent. Hap, that certainly answers my question. As I said before, I don't know when I've smoked a better-tasting cigarette. You've just sold me a carton. All right, Mrs. Malone, you'll never have to change brands again because you can stop worrying about nicotine when you smoke Sano cigarettes. Thank you for telling me about them, Hap. You're entirely welcome. Well, Kane, I hope you pay your taxes. I had three men working on that list all night. Thanks, Lieutenant. Only nine names, huh? That's right, out of about 400. We eliminated every one who didn't correspond at least roughly to Thompson's physical description. Only two possibilities. Uh, three are in prison, two are on the West Coast, two were in the hospital at the time, and the other two are right here in New York. Carl Shaw, Larry Spencer. Uh, with a complete rundown on each. Okay, this isn't a lending library. If I tag one of these guys, I'll buy you a set of cast iron bookends for your birthday. You'll be hearing from me. My first possibility, Carl Shaw, was working in the garage. He told me a straight-sounding story about not being crooked anymore. He had a wife and kids now. His past was really behind him. And so on and so on. I thought he'd never stop telling me how he'd become a new man. But all I wanted to hear from him was his alibi for the time of the killing. And he had one. He was working here. The fellow at the next bench could prove it. Carl Shaw was in the clear. What'll it be, Mr. Kane? A little information, Charlie, on a guy named Larry Spencer. Well? He comes around. Regular customer? He was till a couple of weeks ago. Then last night he showed up again. Uh -huh. How come? Says he was away. Vacation. He wouldn't have gone away around the uh, day after Columbus Day, would he? Maybe. Why? On October 13th, the druggist was killed in a heist. Yesterday, they indicted a man named Albert Thompson for the murder. The 28th. Between those two dates, Larry Spencer decides he needs a vacation. That's quite a coincidence, isn't it? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Kane. Charlie, 
I've got customers, Mr. Yeah, King. I know you got customers. You got customers because you still got a license. Remember when I proved that those high school kids didn't pick up their booze here? I remember. What's Spencer been up to lately? I don't know. Honest. You got any money? Oh, well, I let him run a tab once in a while. The last one had me worried. Oh, why? Well, when he didn't show up those couple of weeks, I figured he was gone for good. And yesterday he came in and settled up. Okay, Charlie. Thanks a lot. Hi, Kane. Lieutenant Gray phoned me. Come on in. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Well, Mr. Kane, how are you? What do you want? I want you to look at a picture, Mr. Wallace. What picture? Well? Who's this? Where'd you get this? The guy named Larry Spencer. He's got a police record. He's got a hobby also of holding up storekeepers. Are you sure, Mr. Wallace, this isn't the man you saw run out of that store? What are you trying to do to me, Mr. King? Never mind what I'm trying to do to you. Think of Albert Thompson. Are you sure this isn't the man you saw run out of the store after the shooting? No. I told you once before you're not going to make a fool of me. Not now or not on the witness stand. I'm not changing my story. Lieutenant Gray. Oh, here's Kane. Say, I'm glad you got my message. Listen, uh, some of the boys down the hall brought in a, quite a gang of crap shooters. One of them was Larry Spencer. You want me to hold him? I don't know. Did you get anything on him? Nope. I was hoping to. Well, there's no point in holding him. He won't do me any good in the tank. Uh -huh. You think he'll lead you to the gun, huh? I don't know. I think he's got his stash to in some nice, quiet place ready for another job. Yeah, I'll buy that. Uh, how's it look? I made a contact with a friend of his. Oh, uh, it. No, his girlfriend. She works in the Diamond Dance place. I'm going over there now. Hey, you don't care how you spend your money, do you? <laughs> Let me know if it was worth it, will you? Sandy sure forgot about Spencer fast. She's been dancing with that new guy all evening. He wouldn't need to give me any tickets. I dance with him for free. Well, I hope Spencer doesn't come in, that's all. Sandy'd be awful sorry. So would that dream boat. Spencer'd kill him. Larry Spencer'd kill him? Why, you kid. You know, I don't get it. What's a guy like you doing in this place? Maybe I like to dance. Uh-oh, there we go. Here. Hey, you must own an oil well. Anyway, the next set's on me. No, you keep them. Well, I could use you. <laughs> you getting tired? A little. Want to sit down? No. I like dancing with you too much. It's not a job. I like it. Oh, that last one was sure living it up. One ticket. Hey, Sandy's still dancing with that guy. Can you blame her? Maybe somebody ought to tell Larry Spencer about it. Who oh, mind your own business? Hey, 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 hey. Say they look nice together. Eh. Make yourself at home. Thanks. I'll get some coffee. You're awfully nice. I'm glad you're here. I was glad to be here, too. But all I had in mind was finding out if Larry Spencer used this flat for a gun drop. Who's the guy? His name's Larry Spencer. Mm -hmm. The girls told me about him. The guy you're going to marry, huh? I don't know. 
much. You haven't helped much. Oh, come on, Sandy. No, please, let me say something. You know, things... Things happen quick. Too quick. If you want something, you have to put out your hand and grab it. Or else it goes right by. Larry thinks fast. He gets things. I never wanted to know how, but... You get what you want, too, don't you? I try, Sandy. Only maybe with you it'd be different. It'd be a chance to stop being scared. Scared? I try to tell him every time I see him, but... I don't know. Time rushes by and there's never enough left. What are you scared of, Sandy? What Larry done? I don't want to talk about him. What's You're he here. done, Sandy? Why? Tell me. Well, why? Why do you have to know? A long story, Sandy. Hello? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is someone here. Well, who told you? Hello? You can ask Larry yourself. He's coming over right now. There is something new under the sun. A filter cigarette that lets you taste what you're smoking. Encore cigarettes. The one filter cigarette that gives you complete taste satisfaction as well as full filter protection. The secret of this unique advantage can be found at Encore's own open-end filter mouthpiece. It draws so freely and easily. It filters the smoke, but not the taste. Yes, Encore filters the smoke, but not the taste. It gives you the protection you naturally expect, yet it does not diminish the full flavor of Encore's superb tobaccos. And since Encore's filter element is set deep within the mouthpiece, where it cannot touch your lips, you enjoy a neater, cleaner smoke as well. Get Encore in this smart, crush-proof case. You'll agree, Encore is the one filter cigarette with a flavor you can really taste. What do you want? I'm waiting for you. Who is he? Friend? Oh, get out. If I ever catch you around here again, I'll break your face in. You hear me? I hear you. Who is this guy? <laughs> Let me go. I said who is he? Ah, what do you want? I want you to change places with a nice little guy that's being framed for murder that you committed. You're nuts. Pretend I went out and came back. Go on, beat my face in. Let me alone. I'm going to start paying you off now. Get the gun. Go ahead, get it. Sandy, help me. Thanks, Sandy, for not helping him. I couldn't. Not after what you said. I always thought Larry was small time. He killed somebody and hit the gun here. Kane, I told you, didn't I? If you want something, you have to reach out and get it. Will I will I ever see you again? Did you ever need me, Sandy? If you're ever in trouble. Right now, I want to start the wheels rolling for somebody who is. Lieutenant Gray, please.
makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Make your own Camel 30-day test, the sensible cigarette test, and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable Camels are. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yes. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in, sir. Well, thank you, Francis. How's the pantry Einstein tonight? Oh, oh, my goodness, sir. That was a dandy. Oh, you like that, huh? Oh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> chuckle along and tell Miss Asher sweet and frostbitten is downstairs. Right away, sir. I'll be in the study. Yes, sir. The snow is snowing. The wind is blowing. But I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Hi. Hi. What's new? Nothing with me. I want to know about you. Uh, nothing much with me either, honey. What have you been doing for the last couple of days? Mm, case. Oh. Got a nice big fat retainer. Oh. Yeah, oh. Look at the eyes light up. Well, I'm happy for you. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want your money. But now that I'm independently wealthy, you figure you don't have to feed me anymore. Rick. Don't have to take me to any more shows. Stake me to an occasional chocolate malt. Oh, don't be silly. You know I don't mind. Just because I made a couple of hundred dollars. A couple of hundred dollars? Stop kissing my hand. Rick. You idiot. Mm. I have tickets for the ballet tomorrow night. Dinner at 21 after the show. Oh, Rick. <laughs> Afterwards, we neck. I love you. Of course. Now, I suppose you want to hear all about the case. Well, not unless you want to. Well, as long as it's optional... You'll be too tired some other time. It all started three days ago. You don't really have to. I can hear about it any time. I was sitting in my office. You don't have to put yourself oh, up. Oh, shut up, woman. <laughs> as I was saying, the whole thing started three days ago. I was sitting in my office reading Gaylord Hauser and soaking my feet in a tub of blackstrap molasses when the door opened and then walked six feet of mink cape wrapped around five and a half feet of what little girls are made of. I remember thinking about the sugar and spice and everything nice, and even with the mink cape covering most of it, I decided that this little girl could have given a bee farm a nervous breakdown. Mr. Diamond? You have been reading the sign on the door. I'd like to hire you. Well, I'd like you to. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I want protection. From what? My husband. What's the matter, Can he Stand the pace? He's getting out of prison at five o'clock this afternoon, and he's threatened to make trouble. I think you better tell me the whole thing, Miss... Uh, uh, Connors. Marilyn Connors. Uh, okay. Uh, who's your husband? His name's Joe Connors. Oh. You know him? Helped send him up ten years ago. Armed robbery, wasn't it? Yes. He hasn't served all of his time, but he's being paroled. Go ahead. Well, since Joe was sent up, I had to find work. A man Joe used to work for gave me a job in his club. Martin Cope? Yes. Do you know him? Mm, slightly. We're hating acquaintances. Mr. Cope has been very wonderful to me. I'm sure he has. I don't think I like that. Your husband doesn't either, huh? You're very blunt, aren't you? Like the front of a streetcar. I don't like your boss, and I don't like your husband. I think it's better that you know now before you make any investments and then have to fire me. You're the best private detective in New York. Only because I'm brilliant, shrewd, and loaded with talent. <laughs> and a little ridiculous. Oh, sure. 
Add that on and just think what you're getting for a lousy hundred a day in expenses. Even though you don't like Joe and Mr. Cope, you'll still take the job? Look, uh, Mrs. Connors, I- I've been honest with you about your husband and Cope. I never let personalities interfere in my business. A job's a job. Besides, I'm starving to death. <laughs> She gave me a slow smile, complete with a high fever, handed me a retainer, and swayed out of the office like Mata Hari leaving an atomic research stag party. We agreed to meet again at four o'clock, so I spent the next hour on the roof, relaxing in three feet of snow, and around four o'clock, walked my frozen blood pressure down to Martin Cope's nightclub, the only king-size safe decorated by Bergdorf Goodman, complete with an intellectual piano player, a $15 minimum, and enough intrigue to make a Senate investigation look like a taffy pole. The girl who had been to my office earlier was standing on the edge of the empty dance floor rehearsing a song while the piano player was trying his best to overdo the accompaniment. I grabbed a chair and sat down to listen. Something wrong? Look, if you'd like to do a single, why don't you say so? You're unhappy? When you're playing for me, I would appreciate it if you just backed me up quietly, simply. Stop hating our Tatum. Darling, I'd be happy to do anything you say except for one thing. Yes? You can't sing. Why, you anemic excuse for a musician. You couldn't get a song right if you ran it through a player piano. Temper, darling. You listen to me, Bernie. I've put up with you for a long time. You've put up with me? Yes, with you. Oh, I've let you mess me up night after night. You did that all by your little lonesome, honey. You just better remember who's paying your bills, honey. I get out here and break my neck to try and give a good show. Don't you get cute with me. You better wise up, Buster, or you're going to end up playing for your meals down on Skid Row. Oh, for Pete's sake, Marilyn. No, Bernie, I'm... They kept going round and round. And about the time the piano player looked like he might possibly throw caution to the wind and stamp his foot, a door opened at the other side of the room, and Martin Cope, big-time gambler and owner of the club, walked over to the piano. Look, if you two insist on raising the roof, take it to the back room where nobody can hear you. I'm sorry, Martin, but Bernie just won't... Mr. Cope, I can assure you that it wasn't... You stay out of this. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. You two can kick the walls in when I'm not in my office, but honey, when I've got work to do... It won't happen again. What's the matter? Who's that? Who? Sitting over there. Well, I'm surprised, Cope. I thought you'd spot my blue eyes. Oh, it's Mr. Diamond. Diamond? Yes, he... He says you know each other. Diamond, the private detective? Sure. You remember, Cope, all those times down at the precinct, playing 20 questions? What are you doing here? I got tired of talking to nice people. Beat it. I asked Mr. Diamond here, Martin. You did? Well, I know you're not worried about Joe, but I am. And you had this two-bit gum shoot? Temper, temper. Mr. Diamond's supposed to be the best private detective in the business. Says who? Well, I did mention it a few hundred times. Did Sloan put you up to this, honey? Martin, with Joe getting out this afternoon... I told you not to worry about Joe. Did Sloan tell you to hire yourself a bodyguard? He thought it would be a good idea. He did, huh? Everybody's got a good idea. Nobody thinks I know what I'm doing. I just happen to run the place. Sloan was thinking about you, Martin. Yeah, but I'll give him something to really think about. Now, Martin... No, I'm tired of the whole mess. Everybody's scared stiff of a two-bit punk who's getting out of stir. Hiring an ex-cop who couldn't protect an old lady from a boy scout. Have you been tested for rabies lately? Look, Diamond... Martin, I'm afraid of what Joe might do. Oh, but hiring a private cop and to top it off, you got to pick this one. Look, uh, uh, Mrs. Connors... I don't want to cause a lot of trouble. Well, you're trying real hard. Maybe you'd better just take your retainer and we'll forget the whole thing. That is the only bright thing you've ever come up with, Mr. Diamond. How about it, uh, Mrs. Connors? Well, you keep the retainer, Mr. Diamond, but maybe under the circumstances it would be better... Sure, if keep the money, Diamond. Go buy yourself a new joke book. I don't want it. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll donate it to your restaurant's hospital fund, Cope. We haven't got one. <laughs> That's the trouble with you, Cope. No vision. You should always have a little insurance in case of a bad accident. I left the club with Martin Cope, stretched out on the dance floor, and Marilyn Connors looking too startled to say much. Bernie, the piano player, accompanied my exit with a fast course of the funeral march, and I headed for my quiet little apartment. I napped for the rest of the afternoon... And by 8 o'clock, I was appropriately dressed in my best blue suit. The other one being a casual sienna and suitable only for badminton and runyon hunting. I had paused to admire myself, surreptitiously humming a few bars of temptation when, uh... 
Mm-hmm. Yeah? Richard Diamond? Depends on who wants him. My name's Sloan, William Sloan. Oh, uh, I'm Diamond. What can I do for you? I'm here because Miss Marilyn Connors asked me to come by and talk to you. Well, come in. Thank you. I believe Martin Cope mentioned your name earlier this afternoon. In all probability, he did. I'm Mr. Cope's attorney. I have seen. Thank you. Cope uh, seemed a little unhappy with you, Sloan. That was because I suggested that Marilyn hire herself a private detective. I gathered as much. I picked you because of your reputation. I had no way of knowing that Martin didn't like you. Why are you here, Mr. Sloan? To ask you to go back on the job. Protect Marilyn until we're sure that her husband is not going to cause trouble. I'd like to know something, Mr. Sloan. Why do you expect Marilyn's husband to cause trouble? Isn't it obvious? Maybe I'm a little dense. Why, but... Marilyn and Martin Cope have been in love since Joe Connors was sent to prison. You think that's enough to make Joe Connors try something? Well, it uh, goes a little deeper than that. How deep? Joe Connors used to work for Martin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. I'm beginning to remember. Joe Connors swore Cope had him framed. That's correct. He swore that when he got out, he'd get him. Well, it's a little tough under the circumstances. It'll just cause another argument between Cope and Marilyn if I show up again. Why don't you get yourself another boy? A lot of good private detectives in New York. Because you'd be about the only one who wouldn't be afraid of Martin. And uh, Marilyn has a great respect for you. Even after I belted her boyfriend? Well, I think that convinced her you were the one for the job. Hmm. Joe Connors got out this afternoon, didn't he? That's right, at 4.30. Where's Mrs. Connors? At the club. Well, if I go down there, there's going to be more trouble. Martin went out about an hour ago. That's why we want you to come down. Martin got a phone call. He seemed worried. Marilyn was in the office with him. She said that when he left, he didn't say where he was going, but uh, he took his gun with him. Sloan and I went downstairs, climbed into his car, and headed for Martin Cope's nightclub. When we went in, Marilyn Connors was on stage. So we went to the back of the building and sat down in her dressing room. About ten minutes later, Marilyn came in. She was wearing something thin enough to make a silkworm come into Harry Carey. Hello, William. Mr. Diamond, I'm so glad you reconsidered. I think we both reconsidered, didn't we? Has Martin come back yet? I'll go see. I'll be right back. I'm worried, Mr. Diamond. Uh, how long ago did Cope leave? About half an hour before I went on. If you'll excuse me, I have to take off my makeup. Oh, sure, go right ahead. He's back. Martin? Yes, and I'm sure something's happened. He's worried sick about something. I'll go see him. Uh, Mrs. Connors. Yes? Uh, do you want me to stay? No, no, I, I don't think that'd be a good idea. Why don't you go over to my apartment and wait? It's 48 West 74th Street, number three. It's a walk-up. All right. Wait, you'll need a key. Here. She handed me her key and left with William Sloan. I walked out of the club, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was walking upstairs to her apartment. The room was in darkness. I felt around for a light switch near the door. Then I froze. The room was still and quiet, but there was a smell in the air. A heavy, pungent odor that a gun leaves after it's been fired. The smell was cordite. I flipped the switch on and looked down at the dead body of Joe Connors, lying on his back, shot through the head. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here's an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? One sniff won't tell you. One puff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to judge the mildness of a cigarette, to see how well it gets along with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll know how mild camels are. Pack after pack, week after week. Yes, for 30 days, enjoy the rich, full flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos and see just how mild a cigarette can be. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make your own Camel 30-day test, the sensible test. And see for yourself why more people smoke camels 
than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and free. And now back to Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. Who is it? The police. Oh, goody. Otis. Yeah? You're standing on my foot. Oh, sorry, Lieutenant. Well, good evening, Lieutenant Levinson. Who's dead, Diamond? Right over there. Name's Joe Connors. Shot in the head, Lieutenant. Well, Otis is getting brighter. Who did it? How do I know? Whose apartment is this? Uh, Mrs. Marilyn Connors. Same name as the dead man. No, his name's Joe. Oh, I mean the last name. Look, meathead. Well, it is. Well, he's right, Walt. They were married. What are you doing here? Me? Well, I come with you. Oh, it is. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, what are you doing here, Diamond? Well, Marilyn Connors asked me to wait for her. And let's all wait. Walt, Walt, have you noticed all the windows are locked? So it's cold out. Well, let's not wait. Let's go over to Martin Cope's nightclub. What's Martin Cope got to do with it? Leave Otis here until the coroner arrives. Put a tag on him so the coroner will be sure to get the right body, and I'll tell you about the whole thing on the way over to the club. Lieutenant Levinson to see you, Martin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Hi. What are you doing here, Diamond? He's with me, Cope. You own a gun? What is this? He said, do you own a gun? Yeah, so what? Mind if I look at it? Okay. It's loaded. Let's see. Hmm, been fired. You're nuts. Rick. Has been. What is this? I haven't fired that gun since I owned it. You took it out of here with you, didn't you? What's that to you, Diamond? You took it out tonight, didn't you? Don't answer that, Martin. Now look. Let's go down to the station. What for? Martin, you knew Joe Connors, didn't you? Yeah. Well, somebody shot him. You think I... Martin... Don't say any more. Well, I'm surprised it's you, Sloan. You were the one who told me Martin took the gun with him. You did? How the devil did I know Diamond would go to the police? What were you doing with Diamond anyway? Marilyn hired him. And fired him. She hired him again tonight. He was working for her. Anything I told him was in confidence. Murder just isn't confidential, Sloan. Look, uh... Wait a minute, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I went out to see Joe Connors. He, he phoned me. Martin. I didn't kill him, though. Yeah, I took my gun, but I didn't use it. He was dead when I got there. You went to Marilyn Connors' apartment? That's right. Well, let's all go down to the station and have ballistics check on this gun. And in the meantime, Cope, I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. Well, here's the ballistics report, Rick. Cope's gun was the one that did the job. Slug they took out of Connors matched. Hmm. Now let's talk to Marilyn Connors and Sloan again. Why, we've got our boy. Just want to talk to them. Send in Miss Connors and Mr. Sloan. Now what have you got on your mind, Rick? Oh, I was just thinking about all the windows being locked. So what? You want to see us, Lieutenant? Mr. Diamond does. Have a chair. Mr. Diamond, I'm sorry things worked out this way. Well, so am I. Oh, uh... Here's your apartment key. Thank you. How many people have a key to your apartment, Mrs. Connors? What? Martin has the only other one. Mm hmm. What time did Martin get that phone call? Oh, about 7.30, I guess. I got to the club about 7.15. Martin usually comes in about 7.30. I met him in his office and he got the call. And he took the gun and left right away? Uh, it's all right. Uh, Martin has already admitted taking the gun. Yes, he took the gun and left almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Where were you, Sloan? At home? I got to the club just after Martin left. Marilyn told me what had happened, and I came right over to you. Oh. Well, all right. Thank you very much. Hmm. That's all? Are you going to defend Mr. Cope? I doubt it. I don't think he wants me to. Well, thank you very much. We'll be talking to you. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Mr. Diamond, so long. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, what was all that about? I want to talk to Martin Cope. Rick, now look. I we... want to talk to him. I'm going to find out how Joe Connors got into a locked apartment without a key. I don't want anything to do with you, Diamond. You better cooperate. 
Diamond's got an angle that's worth listening to. I didn't shoot Connors no matter what that ballistics report says. You have a key to Marilyn's apartment. Yeah. Connors was dead when you got there. Yeah, I told you that. You left the club about a quarter of eight. That's right, about a quarter to eight. Connors had been dead about three hours when I found him, Walt. I found him about 9.30. By gosh, that's right. And that, uh, that part of your story stands up, Cope. He, he was dead when you got there. What about the gun? You always keep that gun in your desk, Cope? Yeah. Who was in the club with you? Oh, the usual people. Waiter, bartenders, busboys. Marilyn? Yeah. And now, wait a minute. Uh, who knew you kept the gun in the desk? Oh, half a dozen people, maybe. You think somebody lifted that gun, killed Connors, and put it back in the desk? You always come in about 7.30, don't you, Cobe? Yeah, every night. According to the death certificate, Connors had been dead about an hour before you came in. What time did you leave the club this afternoon? Right after you slugged me. Oh, you got up rather suddenly. It was about 4.30, wasn't it? Somebody could have gone into your office, taken that gun, killed Connors, put the gun back before you came in at 7.30. Then I'm cleared? No, 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 not a bit. You have a key to Marilyn's apartment. The killer had a key to let Connors in. Miss Connors said there were only two keys. Well, Walt, let's go talk to Mrs. Connors. Uh, Mrs. Connors, where were you around seven this evening? Seven? Where were you? Why, downtown. You weren't in your apartment? No. Did you come back from downtown before going to the club? No. Uh, who was in your apartment? I know one that I know of. Have you ever given your key to anyone except Cope and, uh, oh, me, of course? Yes. Who and how long ago? My piano player, about a week ago. Hello, Bernie. Hello. Oh, hello. You're the nice man who slugged Mr. Cope this afternoon. Let me buy you a drink. Oh, no, thanks, Bernie. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant? Hi. Uh, what time did you get the club this evening, Bernie? Oh, about 7.30. Why? The cook says he saw you come in around 7.15. Mm, Fifteen minutes one way or the other. Where were you at 7 o'clock, Bernie? My house, I guess. Mm. Bernie. Bernie, we checked with the state prison. They, uh, they censor letters up there. Do they? Mm-hmm. A man named Joe Connors got a letter two days ago telling him to meet someone at Mrs. Connor's apartment around 6.30 this evening. Hmm. What's this all about? Well, we'd like to have you come down to the station for a paraffin test, Bernie. A paraffin test? Yeah, we can determine if anyone has shot a gun in the last 48 hours. Oh. When did you take Mr. Cope's gun, Bernie? Right after he left this afternoon. You had a duplicate key made from the one Mrs. Connors gave you several days ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, the green hardware shop, I believe, over on 64th Street. Why'd you do it? Oh, love, hate, lots of reasons. What difference does it make? For a week now, I've heard him talking about Joe Connors and what he might do when he got out. I saw a chance to get rid of Martin Cope, so I had the key made, wrote Joe Connors a letter, and killed him with Mr. Cope's gun. After you killed Connors, you came back, put the gun back in the drawer, and when Martin Cope came in, you called him and said you were Connors. From that phone booth right over there. Were you in love with Marilyn Connors? That is an extremely earthy question that can do no good at all. Well, let's go, Lieutenant. I was getting tired of playing the piano anyway. It's too bad it didn't work. Think what Marilyn Connors in for when she marries Martin Cope. Oh, speaking of Marilyn Connors, you certainly did take a lot of pains describing her um, her attributes. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't painful at all. Was she really that pretty? Pretty, pretty. Well, I'm jealous. Well, don't be. She had one thing that was wrong. What was that? She had long blonde hair that hung all the way down to the floor. Well, that sounds beautiful. But it was her mustache. Uh, better sing something, huh? I think you'd better. Mm, what would you like? Anything that will make up for that last remark. I thought it was pretty clever. Just sing. Okay. How about this? Maybe I'm right. 
And maybe I'm wrong Maybe I'm weak And maybe I'm strong But nevertheless I'm in love With you Maybe I'll win And maybe I'll lose Maybe I'm in for crying the blues But nevertheless I'm in love with you Somehow I know at a glance The terrible chances I'm taking Fine at the start Been left with a heart that is breaking Maybe I live a life of regret And maybe I'll give much more than I'll get But nevertheless, I'm in love with Thank you. Rick. Hmm? I'll bet she really did have pretty hair. Oh, I guess so, but she kept it all rolled up on her head. What's the matter with that? I like yours better. I wear mine up. Yeah, but I've seen you with your hair down. (laughs) Rick. Come here. Rick? Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Among the millions of camel smokers, there are many stars whose voices are their fortunes. John Wayne, Reza Stevens, Martha Tilton are a few. They find that camels' cool, cool mildness gets along fine with their throats. Friends, make your own 30-day camel mildness test. And see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves the appreciation of the American people more than the men and women who have served in our armed forces. The camel people send weekly gifts of cigarettes to those servicemen and veterans who are hospitalized. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospital, Martinsburg, West Virginia, and Carl Gables, Florida. U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Hood, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, Chelsea, Massachusetts. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Pipe smokers, enjoy the national joy smoke, Prince Albert. Yes, P.A. is made from choice tobacco, rich tobacco that's naturally flavorsome. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite and crimped cut for smooth smoking. So get P.A. in the handy pocket tin or the pound size. It's America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day camel mildness test, and see just how mild a cigarette can be. Yes, and you'll find out why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the Milton Burl of Homicide. Pretty bad. Oh, hi, Helen. What are you doing? Playing canasta. Who's there? Well, just me and that Japanese beetle I found hiding in my bills. Japanese beetle? Yeah. And you're playing canasta? Well, what do you expect us to do? I'm tired. He just finished giving me my judo lesson. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think you believe me. Oh, sure I do. Who's winning? I am. He can't speak English. Besides, I make up the rules. Mm Mm-hmm. Am I going to see you tonight? Well, I... You what? I don't know. Something just came into my office. Client? I don't know. Here comes another one. One what? Well, beats me, but they're pretty strange. Hey, uh, where'd you leave your saucer, fellas? Maybe they're shills for the beetle. I'll call you back. Bye. Bye. Well, uh, what can I do for it? Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I would be happy to hold your nooks for yourself, though. Diamond. Diamond. He is very out. Well, here, Salvador, try this pitch of water. Uh, wait, I'll remove the gladiolus. <laughs> I felt as if I was lying in the middle of a crowded sink and someone had piled all the dishes on my head. They turned on the faucet and I floated up with a dirty coffee cup and took a look around. I treaded water and squinted through my dewy eyelids at two of the ugliest dishwashers I had ever seen. Look, he's twitching. Mm, Oh. (laughs) You see, Salvador, it's just a little lazy. How do you feel, Diamond? Oh, let us know when things start making sense. Oh, oh, not, uh, what's going on? What happened? Mm. He's confused. Yeah. Uh. I think maybe you sapped him too hard. Oh. Yuki, I take that as an insult. You know how careful I am. I apologize, Salvador. Thank you. Hey, hey uh, how, how'd you monkeys get in here anyway? Well, it sounds like he's collected most of his marbles. <laughs> Looks like a complete recovery, Yuki. I want to know what this is all about. Oblige the man, Salvador. Sure. But keep him with us. <laughs> Naturally. Hey, right, now wait a minute. Oh. That's enough, Salvador. That's enough. <laughs> Can you hear me, Diamond? Huh? It's going to be obstinate. I don't think he likes it. Belt him across the ears. He'll listen. Mm. Can you hear me now, Diamond? He's nodding his head. I guess he don't want to open his mouth and let the blood out. Oh, that's fine. Now, mm. listen, Diamond. In a while, you'll get a call from a Mr. Wharton. Oh. He'll offer you a job, but you will not take it. Do you understand? Mm. Salvador, please see if he understands. <laughs> He says, yeah, he mm. understands. But now he's got a sore arm. Uh, remember, Mr. Warden, you don't want to work for him. I think he understands, Yuki. Yeah. But he looks tired from the strain. He certainly does. Look at those dark circles under his eyes. Well, 
Put the man to sleep, Salvador. Certainly. Night. <laughs> Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, can you hear me, Mr. Diamond? Oh, 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 this can get monotonous. Go away, will you? Should I call the police, Mr. Diamond? What? Oh, oh I was expecting uglier company. Can you sit up? Oh, I'll take a crack at it. <clears throat> oh, I, uh, I'll bet your name's Wharton. Well, that's right. How did you know? Get out of here. Well, I want to talk to you. Well, I just had one long conversation. It was too one-sided. Now, go on. My health is doubtful, but it's fun to have it around for company. Maybe $500 would pick you up. It might for a while, but I don't like to waste that kind of money on funerals. Seven fifty. dollars eh, So they line the coffin with velvet. A thousand. Well, you're beginning to make a short life sound practical. If you do the job successfully, there'll be another thousand. You just bought yourself a corpse. Let me wash up. Uh, talk some more. I, I can hear you. Well, it's my son, Roger. He thinks he killed a man. He, he thinks? What do you want me to do? Find out for sure so he can brag about it? Ever heard of a John Alter? Oh, Sure. Walt Levinson sent him up five years ago on a manslaughter rap. Well, he doesn't like it up there, and he'd like to get out. I don't blame him. What's this got to do with your son? I'm chairman of the parole board. Man, you look much better now, Mr. Diamond. So you're chairman of the parole board. Yes. Some of Alter's friends promised to keep quiet about my son if I let Alter go free when he comes up before the board next week. Uh -huh. And you think maybe your son was framed? Yes. About a month ago, he met a girl in Florida. Her name is Lenore Brown, and she's a friend of Alter's. When Roger went to pick up the Lenore girl at her apartment, he found her struggling with some man. Mm, that happens. It looked like he was trying to kill her. There was a gun on the floor, and she called to Roger for help. He picked up the gun and shot the man. She told Roger he'd killed him and that he must get out. When we went back, they were both gone. About a month later, some of Alter's friends got in touch with me. They forget about the killing if you let Alter out of Sing Sing, huh? That's right. Hmm. Well, I don't remember reading anything about it in the papers. You're the first one outside of Alter and his friends who knows anything about it. You see, they say they're hiding the corpus delecti, so there was no report of the murder. Now, you think maybe they staged the killing, put blanks in the gun, and after your son beat it, the dead man walked out on his own steam? Well, that's what I want you to find out. Uh-huh. The man your son thought he killed, uh, what did he look like? Dark man with a scar from his nose to his chin. Mm -hmm. If my son is innocent, I want you to bring the parties responsible to justice. Amen. Well, here's a check for a thousand dollars. Thank you. If you find the girl and prove my son innocent, there'll be another thousand in your pocket. Well, I'll sew up the holes. Thanks, Mr. Warden. I'll start right away. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. You can reach me at the Wentworth Hotel. I'm staying there until this matter gets cleared up. Well, I won't get in touch with you unless I find something. The guys who worked me over are pretty set in their ways, and there's no sense in you tripping over a lot of dead bodies. I grabbed a pack of camels, looked at the thousand-dollar check, thought about the warning the two bruise-itis had given me, and decided it was a toss-up. If I spent the thousand like I knew I would, I'd wish it was dead anyway, so I left the building, grabbed a cab for the fifth precinct. Ten minutes later, I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis, looking like an advertisement for a sour stomach. Well, Richard Diamond, Private Sloth. Well, Sergeant Otis, Private Sloth. Huh? Well, look it up. S-L-O-T-H. I will. Under S. I know. The three-toed variety. And get your uniform press, won't you? Looks like you've been hanging it in a taffy machine. Oh. Well, hello, Rick. I... Hey, you must get tired changing your face every day. Somebody shove you around again? Oh, I've been catching up on my patty cake. Tell me, Walter, do you ever know a girl named Lenore Brown? Yeah, sure. John Alter's expense account. They used to hold hands before I sent him up. Know where I can find her? Alter's still got her staked out. When he gets out, he's going to come back and dig up the claim. You better forget about it. She's got the antidote for lonely nights, but some of Alta's boys are protecting it. I know, I know. They gave me a pep talk this afternoon. Then listen to him. It's better watching the game from the bench. 
Oh, you never can tell. I might make a score. Well, you're outweighed, outclassed, and liable to be outlived. But she used to work at the Black Swan in Florida. We heard Alder was trying to get a parole, and she came to New York to be close to him. Any line on her here in town? No, but if she's seeing Alter, you might spot her on a visitor's day. Well, Rick, how are you? It's been a long time. I know a lot of people wouldn't like to hear that, Warden. <laughs> how are you? Oh, fine, fine. What's on your mind? Well, I hear Johnny Alter's been having company. I'd like to take a look at her. Oh, Miss Brown. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't blame you. <laughs> well, I just want to spot her and see where she goes. <laughs> you can't miss. If she walked through the yard, there'd be a jailbreak tomorrow. What time are visiting hours? Well, if she's seeing Alder today, she should be downstairs right now. Like to take a look? Uh-huh. I'll have a guard take you down. Good. Well, well on uh, second thought, I'll go myself. There she is, sitting at the end table, talking to Alder. Hmm. Well, now I know why Alder needs a lot of money. She's wearing enough mink to carpet Radio City. <laughs> you should get a load of her on a warm day. Huh? Well, the coat doesn't stop me. If she'd show up, she was wearing a tent. How long has she got with Alder? Mm, about another five minutes. Warden, you know, uh, maybe I'll let you put me away for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. With something like that to look forward to on Visitor's Day, I might go for the change. <laughs> You'd get tired of just talking. I hung around by the big gray buildings until she came out. She walked over to a long white convertible and got in. I decided to let her buy me a new fuse, so I walked over to the car. Uh, going into town? Oh. Back up three feet and I'll let you know. Three. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your tailor couldn't do all of that. Get in. Visiting? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the warden's an old friend. How many years did you know him? Uh-uh, baby. I've been going home every night all my life. Every night? Well, uh, almost. What do you do with the, uh, almost? It depends. Everybody likes something different. You must get tired thinking up new ideas. Oh, I don't think much. It's more fun being surprised. Hey, what's the idea? Surprise. Oh, yeah. And a nickel-plated one. Look, baby, you don't have to pull a gun. If I'm getting fresh, I'll get out and walk. You'll sit right there, Diamond. Name dropper? Mm-hmm. Expecting company? Mm-hmm. And you've met them before, honey. Well, it's nice. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with the introduction. Uh, aye. Those your friends driving up? It should be. Now, you hold real still. They'll only shoot you this time. When a gal's got a gun, you don't stand much of a chance unless she's got her mind on something else. This one did. And when she looked up in the rearview mirror to make sure it was her boys, I tagged her. My two playmates were just pulling up and I jumped out of the car. There he is, Yuki! He's slugging the door. She's out cold. Well, shoot him, Salvador. Shoot him! Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. One reason is flavor. Camels' costly tobaccos have a rich, full flavor you won't find in any other cigarette. Another reason is mildness, proven mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test. The sensible, thorough test. Not just a sniff of the tobacco. Not just a puff of smoke. Only by day-in, day-out smoking... 
can you discover how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Smoke camels for 30 days and see how mild camels are pack after pack, week after week. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. There he goes! Get him, Salvador! I was running through the trees then, and I could hear Salvador somewhere behind me, falling all over himself. I pulled my gun and thought about waiting for him. But I had another idea. I stopped and listened. He's around here somewhere, Sweetie. Well, come on, we're spread out, Salvador. They were somewhere behind me, and both of them were looking now. So I cut off to my left and headed back to the highway. The cars were about a hundred yards down the road, and I used my last lung getting there. Lenore was still unconscious, so I climbed in the white convertible with the unconscious nylons and drove off. I'd been driving for about 15 minutes when I noticed something lying on the seat beside the still-sleeping Lenore. It was her purse, and she didn't wake up when I grabbed it. Doing a rummage job at 80 miles an hour isn't easy, but there wasn't much of interest anyway, just a little black book. I needed a gimmick, so I stuck it in my pocket. I put the purse back on the seat just as she started coming around. Well, now that's it, baby. Sit up and look at the scenery. How did you get here? Where's Yuki and Salvador? Playing Peter Pan. Jaw hurt? Yes. You heal. Well, play rough and you get hurt. Where do I take you? My apartment, I guess. I drove her to her place on East 51st and walked her to the door. She looked at me like a fat woman eyeing a French pastry, and her mouth slipped down to her shoelaces when I gave her a peck on the cheek and left her standing with an old front doorknob in her hand. I went back to the office and took out her little black book. There were a lot of names, and some of them I knew. Yuki, and after it, likes his work. And Salvador. And after his name, has own gun. And oh, yes, yes, Richard Diamond, too. I never did figure out what the three stars were for. But three other names and addresses put me in second gear. One was in the village, another down by the East River, and the last was somewhere in Chinatown. All of them were a setup for a dead man who wanted to make himself scarce. I wanted to talk with Wharton uh, before I started hunting, so I called him at the Wentworth. Did you find out anything yet, Diamond? Uh, not yet. Look, Mr. Wharton, you said the man I was looking for was... Was dark with a scar, hmm? Yes, from his nose to his chin. Well, thanks. Maybe I'll call you tomorrow. I hope you clear this thing up in a hurry. Well, so do I. I want to get my nerves untangled. I took the easy address first, grabbed a cab, and 30 minutes later, I was walking down the steps of a shabby little dive on the east side of Greenwich Village. You want something, Mac? Yeah, a pound of egg noodles. Just sweep them up off the floor. Hey, uh, you know anyone around named Lenore? Sure, Lenore Brown. She comes in here about once a week, listens to the kid at the piano. Now, why would a classy dame like that go out with him? He don't play the piano so good. You ever see a guy with her? man with a scar from his nose to his chin? No, she always does a single. Oh, well, thanks. You've been swell. <laughs> I walked out, got back in the cab, and marked off Greenwich Village in the little black book. The second address, down by the East River. The night was black, and the fog had rolled in, staked out a claim all the way to the Hudson. I stopped cold, looked down at two gleaming eyes like two pieces of polished glass shining in the glare of the dim street lamp. Steady, boy, steady. Steady. Hold it, Lucifer. Yeah. Now, hold it, Lucifer. He won't hurt you, mister, unless I tell him to. Well, think about it for a while, will you? I'm a poor substitute for horse meat. What do you want? Do you know a Lenore Brown? You a cop? Shamus. Beat it, Lucifer. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. You can come on up on the porch. You're looking for Lenore Brown, huh? Yeah, you know her? I met her. My wife works for her. Is your wife in? Yeah. Esther, come here. Some private dick wants to talk to you. She's Miss Brown's private maid. Yes? Uh, Your husband tells me you work for Miss Brown. Yeah, what's she done? She got many friends. Man friends? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know a man with a scar? Sure, I know lots of them. What are you talking about, woman? I met someone who Miss Brown knows. What did you mean by that, mister? Look, I really don't know anybody with a scar now. You better beat it. Yeah, get moving. And I want to talk to you, woman. Get in there. Yes, yeah, honey. I knew she was going to get bruised, but he looked rough enough to cut my windpipe, and I wanted some place to pour my coffee down in the morning. So I got out of there fast and headed for the last address in the little black book. The place was on one of those narrow, dark streets that looked like the inside of a grave. The sign above the door read Tangy, so I pushed open the door and went in. If I didn't find the man with the scar here, I was out on two strikes. It was a little restaurant on the bottom floor of a two-story building. A quiet waiter slipped up and showed me to a booth. He shoved a menu in my hand and disappeared before I could ask him anything. The place was empty except for an old couple sitting near the door. The waiter said something to them and they looked quickly over at me and then they left in a hurry. The room was completely empty now. Even the waiter had disappeared. I looked up at a flight of stairs at the far end of the room. A pair of very healthy ankles came into view and they were holding up a pair of legs that ran my blood pressure up to 190 again. I eased my gun out and held it under the table. She turned the corner and started down toward my booth like a loose snake in a rabbit pen. Mind if I sit down? Well, it's, uh, it's your party. Shame on you. Don't you know it's not nice to pilfer a lady's handbag? Now Lenore will have to spank. Looks like the last address paid off. If you're buying shrouds, it did. Where's the guy that young Wharton was supposed to have killed? Upstairs. But he's very unsociable. Hates long conversations. I only need a couple of lines. <laughs> he can't even do that. He likes to keep on breathing. The old man figures Arthur framed his son. He's not going to let your boyfriend out of Sing Sing until he finds the man with a scar. Think he can do it better than you did? I found him. Was it worth dying for? I don't know. I can tell you better after I talk to him. Mama's going to have to spank sooner than she expected. Come on in, boys. Well, 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 look who's here. Are Mama's two big idiots out collecting blood? Where are your buckets? He's bitter, Yuki. A present. You've met Yuki and Salvador before, haven't you? Yeah, on the end of a fist. They want to show you the town. I know the beat. Well, I'll bet you've never seen it from the bottom of the East River. No, but if you'll put on a bathing suit, I might buy the idea. It's too bad we'll never make the beach together. I'd like to show you the sights. Boys, you'd better help Mr. Diamond out of the booth. I think he's stuck. You know how it is. Boys like to keep moving. Sure. And so do I. I shot once and caught Yuki in the stomach, and I dumped the table over on Salvador. He grabbed like he was going to waltz with it and went down on his back. I didn't have to get up. I just shot him through the table. Lenore was out of the booth fast and running for the stairs. Look out, Tony! Tony, look out! I caught up with her at the foot of the stairs, and she started up. I saw him standing on the upper landing, scar and all. All meaning gun in his hand. He missed me, but nailed her halfway up. She spun around and fell all over me. With both of us down, he was in a good spot to finish the job, but my arm hit the lower post of the staircase and swung me right into line. I just rested my elbow on the banister and let him have it. Should have kept your nose up, mister. A bad landing washes you out. Oh, oh Walt, Walt, I'm, I'm, I'm bushed. Tell me, did Wharton's son identify the man with the scar? Yeah, he was the one he thought he killed. Mm-hmm. 
But the old man's feeling pretty good. Yeah, just left. He's happier than Otis on payday. Mm. Who was the guy with the scar? A oh, cheap hood. Record. Name of Lucio. Mm. The girl in Alter had him hidden out in that place so he wouldn't be seen. And I... I, I don't think you're funny, Diamond. Mm, what's the matter, Otis? Yeah, what do you want, meathead? I looked it up. The three-toed variety. Oh? Uh-huh. What are you talking about? Oh, I uh, called him a sloth. Yeah, a sloth. You should see the picture in the dictionary. It's an animal. Well? It's funny looking with three toes on each foot. Well? And it's noted for its laziness. Okay, Lieutenant. Just forget it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, buy your Camels the handy, thrifty way by the carton. That way you always have Camels when you want them. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels deem it a privilege to send free cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week's camels go to veterans' hospitals Topeka, Kansas and Oakland, California. U.S. Army Percy Jones General Hospital, Battle Creek, Michigan. U.S. Naval Hospital, Portsmouth, Virginia. More than 194 million camels have now been sent to servicemen, servicewomen, and veterans. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Men, for pipe smoking pleasure, get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is rich and flavorsome. It's crimped cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Yes, P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Time now for Rocky Jordan. There's nothing I like better than a good game of poker. But I get tired of always drawing the straights that never fill. You have to keep throwing your chips on the table. Only the last card pays off if you're lucky enough to get it. This time I had to fill my straight. The stakes were too high. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts. 
alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Ace High Straight. I'd spent half the night before in a poker game, and I always kept drawing straights that didn't fill. Finally, I cashed in what chips I had left, wrote out an IOU for plenty, and went home to the tambourine to bed. Even in my sleep, I kept drawing the inside straights and outside straights that never filled. I got up late the next morning, and knowing my gambling friend would soon be around for his dough, I took a bag of money out of the safe in my office. I had just sat down at my desk to count it out when Chris, my bartender, came in. Hey, Rocky. A guy named Jack wants to talk to you on the front pay phone. Jack who? I don't know. Just said Jack wants to talk to you. Yeah, you said that. Why'd he call me on the pay phone? Oh, shall I give him your office number? Smart thinking, Chris. Do that. Sure, Rocky. Oh, uh... And there's a man been asking to see you out front. I told him he was busy. What's his name? Mr. Queen. <laughs> Jack and Queen. Not bad with the first two cards. Cards, Rocky? Oh, uh, skip it. I still got poker in the brain. You want me to send him away? No, I'll see what he wants. Might as well take the phone call while I'm out there. I'll watch the money on my desk till I get back, huh? Sure, Rocky. Bring him to me. Bring him to me at once. As I stepped out into the cafe, it sounded like business was starting a little early. The big voice came from the big mouth of a swarthy, well-dressed Egyptian sitting at the rear end of the bar. I sidetracked over his way. I will not be treated this way. I demand respect. Where is the manager? Bring him to me. I don't tap, mister. Who are you? Name's Rocky Jordan. I own the tambourine. What's the trouble? The trouble? Everything, sir. I ask for food, and what do they bring me? Garbage. Oh, especially... Now listen. The drinks are abominable. And where is your bartender? The service is unspeakable. Then try the hotel shepherd. Why come slumming here? No, you are insulting. Do you know who I am? I am Tom and King. Tom and King. Never heard of you. Take my advice and get some sleep. This is no time. Enough, to... sir. I will show you what I think of the Cafe Tambourine. <laughs> okay, Kingpin. Now we go bye bye. Come on. Stop it, sir. Get your hands off me. I am warning you. I twisted Tom and King's arm behind him, escorted him the full length of the bar, out the front door, and discarded him with a shove two doors down. He retreated, still shouting insults. I brushed my hands and strolled back into the cafe. This routine. I was about to take the call on the payphone when a smiling man of uncertain nationality and thick glasses stepped up. Pardon. Are you Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Ah. I am Mr. Queen. Milton Queen. Oh, sure. I've forgotten about you. I'm a visitor in your city, Mr. Jordan. A chance acquaintance, a Mr. Uh, Willoughby, told me to look you up when I came to Cairo. Willoughby? Oh. Well, have a good time. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am to meet my nephew, Junior Queen. He should be here now. We are especially interested in the mosques of Cairo. Could you direct me to the Sultan Hassan? Oh, right down the street. See, I've got a phone call waiting. So... Oh, well, just one more thing. Perhaps you can also tell me how to get to the Mosque El Azhar. Oh, I... sorry, I lost my tourist book. Did you know the Mosque El Azhar is the first known Egyptian use of the pointed arch? <laughs> Interesting. Oh, very, very. Uh, look, what you need is a guide. You'll find at least three hiding behind every lamppost. Oh, yes. Perhaps you are right. But you being a resident here, my friend suggested that you might... Uh, if you'll be... excuse me, that phone call... Oh, oh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. You have been most kind. Most kind. I dragged myself away from Queen and went over to the payphone. Whoever Jack was, he must have gotten tired of waiting and hung up. I didn't blame him. Before the smiling tourist with the thick glasses could buttonhole me again, I headed for my office. I couldn't help thinking how well my poker hand was filling out. A jack, a queen, and now a king. Then I opened the office door. Lying face down on the floor, an ugly lump the size of an ostrich egg just behind his left ear, was Chris, my bartender. The money was gone from the desk and the back door to the alley swung open. I ran out into the alley and up to the narrow side street. There was no one inside except a native woman. Her somber brown eyes gave me a startled look. She quickly drew a veil over her face and limped away. I've been around Cairo long enough to know not to look at a native woman twice. So I got back to the office, and while the help tried to bring Chris to his senses, I called the police and reported the robbery. It took six pitchers of water and a gin sling, but Chris finally sat up. 
Hey, Rocky, you all right? Hey, of course I am, Chris. What happened? I don't know. Well, come on, you've got to remember. I left you here to watch some money on my desk. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I heard the yelling out front, so I thought you needed help. So I put the money in the safe. In the safe? Sure. And I heard somebody come in the door behind me. I stood up and somebody grabbed me. I stepped back on somebody's foot, I think. Hard. Did you see who it was? No, I guess that's when I got slugged. You sure you put the money in the safe? Oh, I ate it there. We'll have a look. Rocky. Well, what do you know? The money was all there. Every cent of it. We had a look around the office, but so far as we could tell, nothing had been touched. There was a knock at the door, but before I could answer, in walked Sergeant Greco of the Cairo Police. The usual sour look on his face. What's this all about, Mr. Jordan? Oh, Greco. Where's Captain Sapaya? Captain Sapaya's busy. He sent me to get the details of the robbery. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Greco, but it uh, was all a mistake. One moment. I must make a full report. Now, how much money was involved? Oh, a few hundred pounds, more or less. But it's all here. Then what has been going on here? Nothing. Forget it. We do not take slugging so lightly, Mr. Jordan. Chris now... stumbled over his own foot or somebody didn't like his ugly face. Those things happen around here. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to turn around, but if somebody... you please. I will question you one at a time. Look, Greco, I'll put in a good word for you to buy it. Now, if you'll just Now, Mr. Jordan, did you strike No, I told you there's no complaint. Now, for the last touch... Uh, I will take it. Get away from that phone, Greco. It's for me. Sergeant Greco speaking. Who? Oh? oh, Captain Sabai. Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, sir. Yes, yes. Jordan is here. Yeah, I'll take it. It is not at all cooperative. What? Uh, so... Yes, 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 sir. I will ask him, of course, of course. You can depend on me completely. Yes, I will handle everything at once. Because... Don't hang up that phone. Let me talk to him. Well, Jordan. What did Sabaya want? Jordan, uh, when did you last see Ace Warner? Well, don't tell me I drew an ace. Answer my question. I, I, uh, played poker with him about three o'clock this morning. Remind me not to send him a greeting card this year. Why not? No, you won a little too easily, I thought. But I asked for it. I'll pay him off. You won't, Jordan. Ace Warner was just found in his casino, shot to death. Maybe somebody will give me a black tie for Christmas. I believe you own a forty-five caliber automatic, Jordan. Now, look, Greco, you can do better than that. I am instructed to conduct a routine investigation. Let me see the gun. Okay. I keep it in my desk drawer. Haven't touched it in six weeks. Well, Jordan... Here you are, Greco, and you'll find my fingerprints on it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Having fun, Greco? He has not been fired recently. Oh, disappointed? Now, what is in this other drawer? Greco, get out of those drawers or get a search warrant. Hey. Ah, another gun, Jordan. What? How did that get there? Let me see it. Uh, don't touch it. Mm-hmm. A definite smell of cordite. Ah, two shells missing. This automatic has been fired within the last 12 hours. So bland if I ever saw one. I would deliver this gun to Captain Sabaya for his inspection. And under the circumstances, you, Jordan, will accompany me to the Cairo jail. Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Remember, over your CBS station every Sunday night... You'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour, each Sunday evening, is the time for Rocky Jordan. Now, back to tonight's story, Ace High Straight. I was on my way to an Ace High Straight. A phone call from a guy named Jack who didn't wait for me to answer. A loud Egyptian named King and a smiling tourist named Queen. And finally, a murdered gambler named Ace. I wondered when the ten would show up to fill my street. It was no secret that Ace Warner had my IOU for plenty of money, won in a poker game the night before. But when a forty-five automatic recently fired turned up in my desk drawer, I was taken to headquarters. Captain Sam Sabaya sent the gun to ballistics two doors down, kept me in his office. Jordan, I had hoped there would someday be a murder in Cairo in which you were not involved. Just keep trying, Sam. Now, 
you were about to give me one of your fantastic theories. Nothing fantastic about it. The killer knew I owed Ace Warner too much dough after that poker game last night. So he planted his gun in my desk to throw the blame on me. You seem quite certain that gun killed Ace Warner. What's your idea, sir? Never mind. Go on. Somebody contrived to get me out of my office while his accomplice entered it from the alley. He didn't count on finding Chris. <coughs> Where was I? <laughs> Calm yourself, <laughs> Jordan. Ballistics must fire the gun to compare bullets. Sure, sure. Uh, Jordan, supposing you are right, can you suggest who contrived to get you out of your office? It could be any one of three. Somebody named Jack called me on the front hey. phone just before this happened. Jack who? I don't know. By the time I answered, he'd hung up. Then a swarthy Egyptian named Tommen King started a phony one-man riot at the cafe. I had to throw him out. Tommen King. And the third? Well, after I get rid of King... <laughs> Sam, how many times do they have to... Go on, Jordan. Well, a tourist with thick glasses named Milton Queen buttonholed me at the door. I had trouble getting rid of him. Any one of those three could have given the accomplice plenty of time to get in the alley door to my office. One moment. Sabaya speaking. You are sure? No, no, not at present. That will be all. Caught a mouse, Sam? Jordan, Ace Warner was killed with the gun found in your desk drawer. I'm surprised. Now suppose you continue your story, all of it. I told you everything, Sam. How about talking to Chris? For one thing, he thinks he stepped on somebody's foot. Now, he's a big fan. I have his statement. Jordan, I will release you for the present. In the meantime, let me suggest... Did I give up a weekend of my country estate? Sure, Sam. I'll stay in Cairo. Watch me. I got out quick before Sam had changed his mind and was on my way back to the tambourine. Now all I had to do was find a ten spot to fill my straight. I also wanted a better look at a couple of cards named King and Queen. As I walked into my cafe, Chris nodded his head painfully toward a man sitting at a front table. The man got up and drooped his way toward me, like an underfed dog with its tail between its legs. The Egyptian one-man riot, Tom and King. Mr. Jordan, I've been waiting to see you. Hey, get the glasses off the bar, Chris. No, please, Mr. Jordan, I want to apologize. Why didn't you bring your whole card with you? I don't understand. Your helper who delivered the gun. Mr. Jordan, I am afraid you are confused. I created a disturbance here this morning. My actions were inexcusable. Well, I could phrase it a different way. You see, I had been drinking all night. There have been uh, things in my mind. Like murder? Oh, please, worries. Why I came to the tambourine, I do not know. A lot of people wonder that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I am a respectable person. Mm, it's one man's opinion. You can understand why I would not want a disgraceful affair like this to reach the papers. I did considerable damage. I wish to pay for everything. Would uh, 100 pounds be sufficient? 100? That's your last offer? I realize that I am in no bargaining position. Uh, well, uh, give me your card. I'll send you an itemized bill. Oh, you are very kind, Mr. Jordan. And you will tell no one? Well, that depends. Keep in touch with me, King. <laughs> He handed me his card and backed out the door, bowing all the way. I asked Chris if the guy named Jack had called again. He hadn't. There was a chance I could learn something about Ace Warner to help me find my ten. So I taxied over to his gambling joint on the other side of town. A lone policeman was on guard out front, but he let me in. One of Ace's boys was in a back room testing a roulette wheel. Hello, Maxie. Uh, oh, hiya, Rock. Watch your third coming up, watch it. See? Thirteen. What'd I tell you? Yeah, I see. Or something like that poker game I was in last night. Oh, uh, yeah, Rock. Sorry about that. We had a fish to clean out a couple of the other boys. They had some tricks, too. There was too much dough on the table. Ace couldn't afford it. You know it. Ace is dead? Yeah. Twenty-three this time. Watch it. What do you know about the killing? I tell you, Rock. Uh, uh, watch it now. Twenty-three coming up. Twenty-three, just like I said. Come on. What do you know about the killing? Nothing, Rock. Not a thing. Who were his enemies? Who's the angel behind this affair? Angel? It's funny. How do you know? Know what? That was his girlfriend. He met her in France or someplace. Quite a dish, Rocky. He was getting rid of her dough. Why? Ah, he got most of it anyhow. She's too jumpy. Scared her husband to show up. You know what the husband's name was? Let's see. Uh... No, I forgot. It. Ford is time. Try to remember, Maxie. Was it King, maybe? King? Yeah, King, that's it. How do you know? I didn't. 
Where's Angel hiding these days? Got no idea. Hey, wait, Rock. Watch this. Deal. Sorry, Maxie. Time for the next deal. Things were beginning to gel now, but I still needed a ten to fill my straight. I figured I'd find it back to back with a king. Tom and King had given me his address down toward the river on the other side of the bazaar. It takes a taxi all day to get through the bazaar, so I walked. Ordinarily, I like to take in the bazaar, get a kick out of the snake charmers, who always play a little louder when a tourist walks by. I tossed a tattered musician a couple of fiestas, and I saw a familiar-looking veiled native woman coming up from behind. She limped, like the one I saw on the side street off the tambourine that morning. I wasn't sure she saw me, so I dodged into a booth and waited for her to pass. You like my rock? Yeah, sure, but not this time. Only two Egyptian pounds, Effendi, for this thing of it. Ah, not interested, sorry. I see. You bargain well, Effendi. Only for you, one pound. Look, I got a rug. Now, don't bother me. Effendi, you will ruin me. Half a pound and forty piastres. I'm not buying anything. Let it go of me, will you? Very well, but only for you, Effendi. Half a pound. No less, not a million less. Wait. Wait, come back. Tara! Tara! By the time I got out of the booth and shook the excited peddler off, the veiled native woman was way down the street. I thought I saw her turn in somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Anyhow, I couldn't have followed her. Like I said, a foreigner doesn't look at a veiled woman twice if he values his life. So I hurried on down the street. As I passed an open-air cafe, I changed my course again. Another one of my cards had turned up. He sat at a secluded table sipping tea. Across from him sat a shy, brown-eyed boy of uncertain age. I went up to that table. By, by Mr. Jordan. Mr. Milton Queen, I believe. Uh, this, uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, may I present my nephew, Junior Queen? How do you do, sir? Oh, yes, we've met. We have? Why, oh, no, I was to meet him this morning, but he had not arrived when I talked to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a logical mistake. <laughs> Ever played poker, Mr. Queen? Poker? No. No, I'm so sorry. It's so kind of you to invite me. I just thought you might know Ace Warner. Warner? Ace? No, no, I'm afraid not. But I would enjoy meeting him. There are so many, many friendly people in Cairo. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jordan, I must confess a very foolish mistake. You must? Ah, you will recall I said the Mosque El Azar was the first Egyptian example of the pointed arch? Mm hmm. I was wrong. It was the Ahmed ibn Tulun. Stupid of me, oh, but think nothing of it. See you later, Mr. Queen. You too, Junior. Goodbye, sir. Oh, won't you have some tea with us, Mr. Jordan? Uh, tea? No, no thanks. It kills the taste of the lemon. As I left the table, I wondered why I said I had met Junior before. I thought I had a good memory for faces. Well, I found Tom and King's address, a large brownstone modern apartment house. But King wasn't in. The clerk said he'd been out most of the day. I waited around the lobby for a while, then stepped into a phone booth and called the tambourine. Cafe tambourine. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. That fellow named Jack ever called me back? No, never did. But somebody else called. Who? I don't know. Hey, bartender, survey. Ah, uh, just a minute. You said if you wanted to find Angel, try ten daha beer. Ten daha beer? What else? That's all. He hung up. Oh, great. Now you can do something. What, Rocky? Hang up. Well, it looked like I finally had that ten to fill my ace high straight. I remembered the paddle streamers along the Nile are known as Dahabias. Then I thought again. The swank little houseboats anchored along the Nile are called the same thing. A five-minute walk from King's Place took me to Dahabia at number ten. I walked up the narrow awning-covered gangplank that led to the little deck and knocked at the door. Who is it? The name's Jordan. I don't want to see anyone. Wait, I... Can't... Sorry, Blue Eyes, i got to talk to you. But who did you say you were? Rocky Jordan. I was a friend of Ace Warner's. Oh. Well, uh, how did you find me here? Oh, I just filled a straight, and there you were. I don't understand. Straight, it's... Oh, well, if you mean you want a drink, it's on the side cabinet. Go ahead. Thanks. I believe I will. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get it for you, but uh, you see my foot. Yeah, I noticed it. Why, uh, why did you come here, Mr. Jordan? <sighs> to, uh, to 
Find your husband. My husband? Well, did you know you had one? Well, I, I have not seen him since I left Bordeaux. Uh, you had better go, Mr. George. Oh, sure. But the next time you see Mr. King, tell him I said hello, huh? Mr. King? Who is he? Isn't that his name? I don't know what you are talking about. Now, kindly get out of here. Oh, I'm going. Oh, uh, one more question, Angel. What happened to your foot? A camel stepped on it. Well, it seemed almost too easy. But just in case Sam Sabaya hadn't already found the answer, I figured I'd throw in my two bits. So at the nearest payphone, I put in a hurry-up call to headquarters. Captain Sabaya speaking. Sam is Rocky. Well, Jordan, you did stay in Kyle. I'll make it short and sweet in case you still want to know who killed Ace Warner. You mean you can tell me? All wrapped up neat like a package from Santa Claus. Try a man named Tom and King at 1114 Fingal Place. Jordan, I have already talked to Mr. King. And next, look up a blue-eyed beauty named Angel. Or didn't you know Tom and King was her husband? Ah, this is news, Jordan. All right, add it up, Sam. While King got me out of my office at the tambourine with his drunk act, Angel put the gun on my desk. She still has a sore foot. That lovely creature knocked Chris out? Well, she had to. Then made her getaway disguised as an Arab woman, maybe. Ridiculous, Jordan. How do you explain that? Damn, if I figure this any farther, you'd have to put me on your payroll. Come on, better be on your way. Well, from there on, it was Sam's baby. Ten Dahabia did it. My first four cards had been people instead of a house address, but I was satisfied. I found myself walking back through the bazaar, and this time I was enjoying it. I slowed down to listen to the tattered beggar musician. I was about to put in a request for the St. Louis Blues when I saw her again. Right behind me this time. Still following me. The veiled native woman, who limp. But this time I figured I knew who she was. She hesitated. Her somber brown eyes flicked my way. Then she quickened her pace and went on by. I stood there, puzzled. Then it hit me. My house of cars collapsed like a tent in a sandstorm. Rocky Jordan, the prize sucker of Cairo. Sure, I figured it. Just enough to leave a girl named Angel at the mercy of a killer and get another murder rap pinned on me. And this time I didn't dare let the veiled woman get out of sight again. I turned and started after her. Three natives eyed me suspiciously and fell in behind. She saw me coming and limped faster. Then she began running. So did I. And with every step, I picked up another native bent on mayhem. And there we went. The veiled woman, followed by me, followed by a pack of Muslims, right through the bazaar of Cairo. Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a note of importance to you listeners who like top-flight adventure mysteries. Rocky Jordan joins Sam Spade and the Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery adventure listening on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and the Whistler, top-notch mystery on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story, Ace High Straight. If you're ever in Cairo and crave excitement, try following a veiled woman. You'll get it. I did better than that. I chased this woman at a dead run, past the beggars and the snake charmers and the street vendors of the crowd of the Tsar. A pack of natives on my tail were beginning to close in. One big boy tried to block my path. Pulled him over and gathered speed again. I picked up three blocks and thirty more natives when I caught her. She gave me quite a tussle. Let go! Let go of me! Turn around! Turn around and face me! No! No! My veil! Come it off quick and everything you with it! Yeah! Look her over, folks. She's not a native and she's not a woman. He's Uncle's little nephew, Junior Queen. Right then, the cop in the corner came pushing through the crowd. I turned Junior Queen over to him for safekeeping and gave him a message for Sabaya. Within two minutes, the pack of natives had faded away like a snowman in the desert. But I kept moving. I backtracked through the bazaar, grabbed a roving taxi, and directed it to Dahabia 10 on the double. We got there in record time. I hit the pier running, crossed it, and went up the canopy gangplank that led to Angel's little houseboat on the Nile. I didn't stop to knock. It seems I was just in time. Oh, Rocky, you ain't here. Close the door, Mr. Jordan, and lock it. Oh, this is most convenient. I see you found another gun, Queen. Oh, Rocky, Mr. Shut up, Angel. Yes, I know. 
Maxie's memory was bad. Your husband's name is Queen, not King. Oh, yes. A natural mistake. Now that you know, it makes no difference. Naturally. You killed Ace Warner. And he wants to kill me, Rocky. And I will. Oh, no. The oh, husband Rocky. doesn't appreciate his wife leaving him. Especially when she takes his last cent and gives to a no-good gambler. Oh, so you killed him and planted the gun in my office. Then you sent me here to Angel's planning to kill her after I left. You're a little slow, Queen. Not at all, Jordan. Now that you are here, it will be even more simple. I don't know why you came back. Oh, just to clear up a mistake, Queen. I thought Angel's address filled my straight. I was wrong. I should have known I was holding the Joker all the time. A very wild Joker. Joker? Yeah. Junior Queen. Your child of nephew. Yes. He is not my nephew. No, no, no. You hired him to disguise himself as a native woman, knowing I wouldn't dare follow him. He planted the gun on my desk. But when Sophia released me, you had Junior keep up the masquerade and tail me just in case. You narrate quite well, Jordan. What comes next? When you introduced me to Junior in the bazaar, I was sure I'd seen that brown-eyed face before. I finally remembered. It was the face on the native woman in the side street off my cafe this morning. Junior was careless with his veil. <laughs> I will reprimand him. The police will enjoy such an incredible story, Jordan. After they find Angel dead and know that you have been here. Oh, Nelson, please, no. Go ahead, Queen. Shoot her. Get it over with. Oh, what? Rocky, what are you saying? Oh, please don't What do you think Sam Sabai has been doing since he talked to Junior? To Junior? Where is he? Locked up in the Cairo jail? No. The police know everything, Queen. If you doubt me, look out the front window. Oh, I told you. It's an old trick, but it worked. As Queen turned toward the front, I reached out and knocked off his thick glass. He whirled and started firing blindly. I grabbed him and dragged him to the floor, but the bullets didn't hit anywhere near us. Just then, Sam Sabaya started pounding in the front door. Queen dropped the gun, ran through the back room. The last I saw him, he was disappearing through an open window. Open up, there. Open up! Gordon, you here. Where's Milton Queen? Get out your water wings, Sam. Milton went for a swim. Draco! Get after him. But, Captain, I cannot swim. It is an order, Greco. Uh, uh, all right. Don't point. worry, Greco. It's only three feet deep. You'll find Queen among the bulrushes. Now, Jordan, about Angel. Is she... No, she's not dead. She's passed out. I must have stepped on a sore foot when I pulled her down. Yes. Yes. She is suffering only mild shock. No, that's something I'm still trying to figure out, Sam. How did she hurt that foot? Her foot, Jordan? Why, I received a full report on the accident yesterday. Yeah? What happened? A camel stepped on it. Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. for Rocky Jordan. You can't always be right, but with the practice I've had, it doesn't take long to spot a phony. She had on low tan Oxford shoes, service weight hose that disappeared under the hem of a very new lookish tweed suit. Her hair was plastered down in a severe updo that left her ears sticking out as perfect resting places for the brown tortoise shell arms of her glasses. She was carrying a brown leather briefcase, and the end of her nose was tilted just a little as if something smelled. I thought so, too. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter in sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine. Crowded, forgotten men of the waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Up in Flames. Yeah, for 
from her hairdo to her round-toed Oxford shoes, she looked 100% businesswoman. I mentally turned up my sales resistance to medium and sat back. She learned her lines for the role by heart. Mr. Jordan, I am Miss Bates. I represent the International Fire Insurance Company with head office in New York. I am certain that you already carry fire insurance, but with the rising costs of building materials and good labor, is it adequate to replace your establishment if it were to burn to the ground? Oh, Miss Bates, I... am I... certain it is not, Mr. Jordan. Uh. My company, sensing the trend of the upward spiral in replacement costs, has decided to extend for this fiscal period an added inducement policy covering the differential in costs that has developed. Now, look, Miss Bates, no doubt what you say is true, but I'm not interested in any more fire insurance. Mr. Jordan, your attitude is typical. But under the current circumstances, don't you think it would be wise to reconsider? What circumstances, Miss Bates? Surely, Mr. Jordan, you must be aware of the unusual number of major fires in Cairo in the last three months. All right, sister, drop the act. What's the pitch? Mr. Jordan, you do me a great injustice. In all Oh, excuse me. Cases... Hello, Cafe Tambourine. Hello, Rocky Jordan. Speaking. Oh, Rocky, this is Lefty Miller. I met you in the back room of Gus Gimlick's Snooker Parlor, remember? Oh, yeah. How's the broken nose and cauliflower ear business? Same as always, Rocky. I'm in a semi-final bout tonight at the American Club. You coming to the fight? Oh, I thought I'd drop in. Why? Um, I'd like to have you come down to my dressing room before my fight. I got a little favor to ask. Why not ask me now? I can't, Rocky. It's something personal. It takes too long to explain over the phone. What do you say, Rocky? Huh? Oh, okay, Lefty. I'll stop by. That's uh, well, Rocky. I'll leave a ringside ticket for your information test. Oh, thanks. Don't mention it. See you tonight, Rock. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Oh, uh, you still here, Miss Bates? Here's my business card. Both day and night telephone numbers are on it in case you wish to reconsider. One never knows when a conflagration might cause irreplaceable loss. Oh, I'm certain one doesn't, Miss Bates. Well, if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Agrazian, who owned the frozen food lockers at 937 Kamal Street, Mr. Tanut, who owned the hotel at 3014 Shariel Modafar, and Mr. Shoup, who owned the drugstore at the corner of Bakil and Canal, felt exactly as you do. Now, since their establishments have been completely destroyed by fire, they are very glad they reconsidered and took out adequate protection with my company. You might check with them, Mr. Jordan. They might help you to change your mind. With that clincher, she closed the door and left. I decided to check up on her little game, so I ignored her card, looked up the telephone number of the International Fire Insurance Company in the phone book, dialed the number, and asked for the manager. This is Mr. Temple speaking. Who's calling, please? Oh, I want some information about fire insurance. I already have some, but I, I need more. Will your company issue additional insurance? Oh, indeed we will, sir. In fact, at this very time, our company, sensing the trend of the upward spiral in replacement costs, has decided to extend for this fiscal period an added inducement policy covering the differential in costs that has developed. Oh, uh, that's fine. Now, if I wanted a salesman to call, uh, who might I expect? I will arrange to have our star salesperson contact you in the morning. Her name is Miss Bates. Uh, who is this calling, please? <laughs> That was what I figured was wrong with the deal. It was too pat. Everything fitted together too well. No flaws. Then maybe Sam could spot one. So I called him. Cairo Police, Captain Sabaya. Jordan, Sam. Well, what is it now, Jordan? How many bodies and where are they? <laughs> no bodies, Sam. Just me. Uh, is this a pleasure call? Oh, could be. How's about taking the night off and going to the fights at the American Club with me? Oh, I would be delighted, Jordan. Only Commissioner Balumi takes a rather dim view of his men relaxing in such a manner while on duty. Oh, it's too bad, Sam. Some other time then, huh? Uh, oh, uh, Sam. Ah, uh, now it comes out. All right, Jordan, let's have it from the beginning. <laughs> You're in a rut. All I want is some information. I'm waiting. You got any leads on who's been setting all the fires we've been having lately? Jordan, if you know something we... Calm do down. Know. I haven't got a thing. Now, what about all those fires? Well, every one of them, causes unknown, owners away at the time, no evidence of arson. Luckily, most of them were adequately insured. Uh, with the uh, International Fire Insurance Company, Sam? How did you know that, Jordan? Were the claims paid? Every one of them, Jordan. What are you running into? A blank wall, Sam. See you later. I decided to forget about Miss Bates and her fire insurance. I had about two and a half hours to kill, so I did a very strange thing. Went out into my cafe, sat down, and had a steak on the house. It wasn't bad. Maybe I should do it more often. I picked up my ringside seat ticket at the information desk of the American Club. The attendant told me Lefty Miller's dressing room was number seven in the basement under the gymnasium. 
The first preliminary was already underway upstairs. Lefty's door was open. He was sitting on his rubdown table, a faded purple dressing gown over his shoulders. His manager and his sparring partner in second were just finishing tying up his shoelaces. Rocky, come on in. Hey, look, Mac, you and Benny step outside for a while. Will you want to talk to Jordan along? What's the idea, Lefty? You'll be on for me, so. Never mind. You and Benny wait out in the hall. This won't take long. Okay, if that's the way you want it. Uh, Rocky, uh, Gus Gimlick says you're a right guy, that you don't mind doing a favor now and then. Well, I'll return the compliment when I see him. All right, what is it? I came down to see the fights, remember? This won't take but a minute. Uh, Rock, my wallet's in my coat pocket there in the locker. Get it out for me, will you? Sure. Uh, this it? Yeah. There's 250 bucks in it. Take the dough out, will you? <laughs> okay. Now what? Quick, stick the dough in your pocket. They might come back in. Now, here's the favor. When you go back upstairs, I want you to bet it on tonight's... Fu- oh, get the phone for me, will you, Rock? I got my gloves on. Hello? Hello, Jordan. Yes, sir. How'd you find me? I called the information desk to have you page on the loudspeaker. They said you were in Lefty Miller's dressing room. That's how. Uh, I'll buy that. What do you want, Sam? Jordan, if any of my men stop you as you are hurrying back to the tambourine, tell them you are going to a fire. What's that? I'm trying to tell you. It just came over the teletype machine. The tambourine, your cafe, is on fire. Thanks, Sam. I'm on my way. Hey, Jordan, where you going? I ain't back. Never no time to explain, Lefty. I didn't get to use Sam's advice. Nobody stopped me. I pulled up in front of the tambourine. Business was going on as usual, so I wheeled around to the back. There'd been a fire, all right. It seemed the trash barrel had caught on fire and smoked up the back wall of my cafe a little. Uh, if this was a practical hint to buy more fire insurance, I didn't like it. I went inside. Miss Bates' card was still on my desk. I called the night number. A man answered, but I didn't hang up. Hello, this is Mr. Temple speaking. Oh, uh, I called earlier today for some information. Oh, you're the gentleman who called. We must have been cut off or disconnected. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, would you please give me the phone number or the address of your star salesperson, your Miss Bates? Uh, who is this, please? And may I ask why you want that information tonight? Well, never mind, Temple. Just give me your phone number or her address. Who is this speaking, please? My name is Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine. I want to talk to you, Miss Bates, about a little fire. Mr. Jordan, can't the discussion take place tomorrow? Miss Bates is asleep now. What, at this hour? Wake her up and get her to the phone. Mr. Jordan, I am seldom abrupt with the prospect of client. But I am afraid you're overstepping your bounds. This apartment is my home. Miss Bates is my wife, and she's worked very hard today. If I do not choose to awaken her, that is my prerogative. Good night, sir. Well, that was that. It was too late to go back to the fight, so I tore up my ringside ticket and went out into the cafe. About 45 minutes later, Lefty Miller's fight manager, Mac, walked in, spotted me, and came over. Jordan, I want to talk to you. All right, go ahead. Let's go in your office. Oh, real private, huh? Okay, come on. Hey, Jordan. Why did you come to Lefty's dressing room tonight? I'm an admirer of muscles. I'm a smart guy. What went on in there? Look, if it's just 250 bucks you want here. He said he wanted me to bet him on the fight, but I left the club before I could make the bet. Well, what's sticking in your craw? You wouldn't be known that Lefty took a dive in the third round and didn't even make it look good. What? Look, Jordan, I don't appreciate guys getting to my boy. When I find out for sure it was you who did it, I'm coming back. Time's up. End of bout. Beat it, Mac. Take Lefty's dough with you. Mac took the 250, gave me a dirty look for a receipt, and slammed the door behind him. Now, things had been jumping all evening. I hoped they'd quiet down, but they didn't. They started happening two at a time. Hey, come in. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Jordan. Jordan, this is Savile. Oh, hello, Sam. His name isn't Sam, Mr. Jordan. It's Timothy. Keep quiet, will you? What's that, Jordan? Oh, not you, Sam. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, wait, dear Mr. Jordan. Perhaps you did phone. not know, but since I talked to you last, there has been another fire. Why tell me? Well, you seem so interested earlier tonight. Is this a pleasure call, Sam? Indeed it is not. The American club gymnasium has burned down and your prize fighter friend Lefty Miller is lying dead. Lefty's dead? Burned to death in dressing room seven. I am calling from the main building of the club. I want you to come down immediately. Okay, Sam. I'll, I'll be right over. Now, you there, what are you... Good evening, Mr. Jordan. When my husband, Timothy, here, told me how agitated you sounded on the telephone earlier this evening, I realized you must have reconsidered. So we got dressed and hurried right over. Now, Mr. Jordan, just how much additional fire insurance do you think you will need? (laughs) 
Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On New Year's Day, CBS will devote every facility to accurately bring you the happenings in Pasadena. All the beauty and color of the parade and the thrilling play-by-play description of the Rose Bowl game. Now back to Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Up in Flames. It all started when Miss Bates, tweed suit, horn rim glasses, and briefcase had tried to sell me some extra fire insurance. I didn't like the deal. I couldn't put my finger on the spot where it left the straight and narrow, so it still bothered me. Item one, the prize fighter named Lefty Miller, who took a dive in the third round of his fight, and his manager blamed me. Item two, a fire in back of my cafe tambourine. Item three, and this is where things started happening two at a time, Sam Sabaya called me on the phone, and at the same time, at 11 o'clock at night, who should walk into my office but that certain Miss Bates and her husband, Mr. Temple? Subject... Fire insurance. I said, Mr. Jordan, how much additional fire insurance do you think you'll need? Well, look, something has just come up that's going to delay my decision. But, Mr. Jordan, you see... The American Club gym is burned down. Oh, good Lord, another one. And a prize fighter was burned to death in his dressing room. Oh, oh, oh. And Captain Sam Sabaya wants me to come right over, so if you'll both pardon me... We'll do more than pardon you, Mr. Jordan. We'll drive you down there. Come on. It came out during the ride that the American Club was insured with International. I had a feeling it would be. There was still some equipment and a lot of people around when we arrived. Mr. and Mrs. Temple went looking for Bert Johnson, the manager of the club. I went looking for Sabaya. I found him with some of his men in the basement of the gym. He turned his flashlight on me as I came up. So, Jordan, you finally got here. Yes, Sam, now that I'm here, why were you so anxious for me to come down? I thought perhaps the atmosphere here might induce you to tell me what is going on. Sam, believe me, I would if I could, but, but I, I can't. can't. You mean you will not? Very well, Jordan, look around you. Sam began pointing things out with his flashlight. They weren't pretty, especially the body lying beside the burned rubdown table. Sam played his flashlight on the lockers, then over to the wall in the back. He held it steady for a moment on the electric light fuse box. A little metal door was hanging open. Is that what caused it, Sam? No. If there had been a short circuit, the fuse would have burned out. I checked them. None of them is burned out. Any ideas? Perhaps you would like to explain what you were doing here earlier this evening. Well, Lefty Miller phoned this afternoon and said he wanted me to come to his dressing room before the fight. He wanted to ask me a favor. Yes, go on. Well, it turned out he wanted me to bet 250 bucks of his money on the fight. You called before he could do it. That's all, Sam. Thank you, Jordan. I might have known you would not tell me the truth at this time. Sam's like that. This was once I didn't blame him. That didn't make much sense to me either. I knew I should get to Lefty's manager, Mac, before Sam did. I wanted to clear up a few things, so I took off. On the way downtown in the taxi, I figured Gus Gimlick would know where I might find Mac. I checked my watch. If things were running normal in the back room of Gus Gimlick's snooker parlor... They'd be getting the results of yesterday's races short way from the States. Now, we finally pulled up in front of Gus's place. I told the driver to wait, walked on in, and through to the back room. Things were running normal. They were waiting for the results of the fifth, the Tanforan. It wasn't hard to spot Gus, even in the crowd. He was all Greek and a yard wide. He weighed a little over 300 pounds. He looked up from a form chart as I walked over. Hello, Rocky. You'll have to hurry if you want to get the bed done. The fifth is about to start. Horses are entering the start. Oh, thanks. Just same, Gus. I'll sit this one out. Suit yourself, Rocky. You got something on your mind? Yeah. You know Lefty Miller's fight manager, Gus? His name is Mac. Yeah, they're all in the start. Yes, again. I know Mac. He's not very smart, but he's honest. Why? Well, I want to get in touch with him. You know where I might find him? And there they go. Yeah, the fifth race is started. Blue Flash is going to the front. Ernie Keltner is second. Maximilian is third. Days and is fourth. Flying Knight is fifth. And up in place. Where can I find him, Gus? Later, Rocky. Okay. After the race. Blue Flash in front by a nose. Ernie Keltner is second by one length. Days and is pulling up between horses. It is now third. Maximilian is fourth. Flying Knight and up in flame. Who's the favorite, Gus? Days and. 
But most of these guys the have bets on the long side. Up in flames. Up in flames. Ernie Keltner is third, flying night is fourth, Maximilian is fifth, and up in flames. <laughs> up in flames. They said it was a hot tip, Rocky. Ah. Stays in the second by half a leg. Flying night is third, Ernie Keltner is fourth, up in flames is fifth, and Maximilian. And there goes up in flames. He found a hole in the rail and is moving up between horses. Yeah, I guess your bankroll is going up in flames. It's blue flash, stays in and up in flames. Now it's days in and blue flash and up in flames. They're in a drive and coming down to the line of finish. It's days in and up in flames. And up in flames gets up to win it by a nose. Days in is second and Ernie Keltner is third in front of blue flash. Not too bad, Gus. You can't win all the time. Don't worry, Rocky. I'll get it back. There are still two races to go. No, they'll all bet on the long shots. I hope they do, Gus. But to get back to where I can find Mac. Oh, yes. I don't know where he lives, but he hangs around Lefty's apartment all the time. It's 847 St. George Street. 847 St. George Street turned out to be a medium-sized apartment house in a middle-class neighborhood. I paid the driver and walked up the six stone steps to the entranceway. The entrance light was burned out, so I scratched a match. The name Lefty Miller was on the mailbox numbered 311. I started to flick out the match and stopped. Just under it on the mailbox, number 211, was the name Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Temple. It was a mild shock, but I'd been waiting for something like this all evening. Things had to tie together, and maybe this was it. I went upstairs and knocked on the door just under where it said 311. I hoped the door would open. It did. And I got another shock. This one gave me the full treatment. Oh, Rocky Jordan, come in, come in. It was Lefty Miller, and very much alive. Come in, Rocky, come on in. I went in. Lefty seemed glad to see me. While I stood there trying to believe my eyes, I noticed on a long table about five or six radios with their parts scattered all around them. I'm uh, glad you dropped by, Rocky. Did you get that bet down on me to lose? Well, this may come as sort of a mild surprise, Lefty, but not more than an hour ago... I left your dead body lying in three inches of sooty water in what was left of dressing room seven after the fire. My dead body? Fire? What fire? You don't know that the American Club gym burned down? Well, no, Rocky, but what do you mean? There was a body in your dressing room that everyone figured was you. Good Lord, Benny. Benny? Yeah, my sparring partner in second. Rocky, this is awful. They'll say I killed him. Well, did you? No. I'll admit we had a quarrel. I, I knocked him out, but I didn't kill him. Wait a minute. You said just now, did I get the bet down on you to lose? That's what Benny and I had to fight about. I didn't tell him I was going to take that dive in the third round. Then it was a phony dive. Sure, I admit it. Benny bet on me to win. He was sore about it. He swung on me after Mac left. I let him have one on the chin, left him lying on the rub-down table. I turned out the lights, closed the door, and left. That's all. Hey, you didn't bet my money on me to win, did you? I didn't bet your money at all. I gave it to Mac when he came over to my cafe later. I said that's where he went. Maybe he figured you got me to take the dive. Why did you? That was Gus Gimlick's idea. I owed him some money. Some horses, I bet, on decided not to come in. He said if I take the dive in the third round, he'd cancel it that. That's a quick way to end your fight career. As far as I'm concerned, it's over right now. I wasn't making any dough in a fight game. None of bouts. I've been making my rent money repairing radios. Well, it's quite a hobby for a prize fighter. I picked it up during the war. Essential industry kept me out of the army. Oh, Hey, let me show you the combination screwdriver and solder nine I invented. Uh, some other time. Hey, uh, what did you come here for, Rocky? I was looking for Mac to convince him I didn't get you to take the dive. I guess it won't be necessary now. No, I guess not, Rocky. Going already? Yeah, but you'd better stick around. I think you're going to have another visitor. An official one. Lefty shrugged his shoulders, picked up his combination screwdriver and soldering iron, and turned towards the table with the dismantled radios. I closed the door and walked down three flights to the front entrance. The timing was perfect. Sam's limousine pulled up at the curb just as I was going down the six stone steps. Jordan! Jordan, what were you doing in there? Talking to a very much alive dead man, Sam. You'll find his story very interesting. No doubt, Jordan. The body is not that of Lefty Miller, but of his sparring partner and second, Benny Myers. Miller was seen leaving the club quite some time before the fire. Yeah. Hmm. Jordan, a penny for your thoughts. You just rang a bell, Sam. 
See you later. Jordan, come back here. I guess Sam figured he knew where he could find me later because he didn't follow me. I grabbed a taxi at the corner and headed for dressing room seven of the American Club gym. I didn't ask for permission and nobody tried to stop me. Just as the fourth match was burning my finger, I found what I was looking for. Fourteen minutes later, I pulled up at 937 Kemal Street at the charred remains of Mr. Egrazian's frozen food lockers. The next stop was 3014 Shariel Motifar and what used to be Mr. Tanut's small hotel. From there, we wheeled around and went to what used to be Mr. Shoup's drugstore at the corner of Bakil and Canal. Then I gave the driver the address of 847 St. George Street and settled back to count my evening's loot. Adding them up carefully, they would just come to the price of the new American airmail postcard. I told the driver to wait, ran up the six stone steps and went inside. This time I knocked on the door right under where it said 211. I figured when the door opened, it'd be Timothy Temple. It was, and he was in a bathroom. Mr. Jordan. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking me in, Temple. What do you mean by forcing your way in like this? What do you want, Jordan? I'm on to your game, Temple. Did you ever see these before? What? You're asking me to identify four American pennies, Mr. Jordan? They're yours, aren't they? How would I know? Look, would you please go? Mrs. Temple and I were about to go to sleep. Who is it, dear? What is going on? Oh, Mr. Jordan. Well, you look quite different without your... Uh... Glasses, Miss Bates. Uh, Mrs. Temple. Mr. Jordan, I don't know why you forced your way in here like this, but will you please go? We would like to go to sleep. With that radio on in the bedroom? Sounds more like you were dancing. Mr. Jordan, that radio is not in our bedroom. It is in the apartment upstairs. That awful man plays his radio day and night. And what is more, he is a prize fighter, and when Timothy reprimanded him, he offered to knock my husband's block off. We're going to move just as soon as we can find another apartment. Uh, it's just possible I could be wrong about you two. What are you getting at, Jordan? Why did you want me to identify those four coins? Let me ask one, friend. Who besides you and your wife would know to whom you had sold extra fire insurance? It is odd you ask, Mr. Jordan. My husband and I have tried to keep that information a secret between us, discussing it only here at home. The number of our clients having fires is alarmingly high. The head office is quite disturbed. Well, what would happen if you could prove those fires were deliberately set just to collect the insurance? Why, we could force them to return the money and put the guilty persons in prison. Uh, but what makes you think the fires were not accidental? There's no proof. I've got the proof, Temple. Wait a minute. You stay right here. I've got an idea. I left Mr. and Mrs. T looking at each other without saying a word. I didn't count the steps between 211 and 311, but there weren't many. I tried the door of 311. It wasn't locked, so I opened it. And here they are. Lefty was gone. The music was coming from one of the radios. I walked over and turned it off. Mr. and Mrs. Temple's voices were coming out of a pair of headphones lying on Lefty's work table. It all fit now. I had my answers. I walked over to the phone and called Sam. Cairo police. Captain Zabaya. Uh, Jordan, Sam. Any of you boys around this time of night? Certainly. Why? If they want to know where you're taking them, tell them you're going to a fire. Jordan, what are you talking about? No time for details, Sam. Meet me at my cafe as soon as you can. Maybe we can catch the guy red-handed. I think somebody's getting ready to set fire to the tambourine. Hurry, Sam. <laughs> When we pulled up in front of the tambourine, there was no sign of Sabaya. I tossed the driver a five-pound note and reached for my keys as I crossed the sidewalk. Except for the little service light in the back of the bar, the cafe was dark. I opened the front door, started for my office. I figured I'd find him there. I was just about even with the foot of the stairs going up to my room over the office when the upstairs door opened and he was framed in the light. I started up the stairs after him. He met me halfway and proved the theory that what goes up must come down. We untangled at the foot of the stairs and I swung on him. I should have known better. He was a trained fighter. He caught me right on the button and I went backwards against one of the service tables full of glasses and silverware. I got up and started for him again. His back was to the front door. Just then, Sam, with full siren, pulled up out front. My opponent turned. His chin was silhouetted against the glare and the headlights. And I let him have it. And for the second time in one night, Lefty Miller took a dive. Only this time, it wasn't fate. <laughs> Uh...
Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. On New Year's Day, the Rose Bowl kickoff will be at 2 instead of 3 p.m. due to the return of California to standard time. Remember to enjoy both the Tournament of Roses and the Rose Bowl game on your local CBS station, New Year's Day. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. Well, I'll say this for Sam. When you really need him, he's right there. If there were more like him, the world would be much better off. But as usual, he wanted all the details. And from the beginning... All right, George, and how did you know we would find Lefty Miller here in your cafe? Well, Sam, it just figured. When I heard Mr. and Mrs. Temple's voices on the earphones in Lefty's room, I knew he'd been listening in on them. Hmm. Maybe first as a gag, but he was the only one besides the Temples who could have known who they'd sold fire insurance to. So he was the one who had gotten the owners to agree to let him fix up the accidental fire. Exactly. He convinced them that he could do the job, and when they collected the insurance money, all he wanted was a percentage of the profits. Hmm. Jordan, how did you figure out he did it? Well, first of all, Lefty was an electrician. Fixed radios. He also had invented a combination screwdriver and solder. Jordan, wire. keep it simple. Oh, I will, Sam. He went to those places and did a little work on a light switch. A couple of drops of solder in the right place. Then he put a penny behind the fuse to keep it from burning out when the short developed. All the owner had to do was to turn out the lights, lock up the joint, go someplace where he'd have a perfect alibi. After a while, the short would develop, and the penny behind the fuse kept it from burning out. And there you have it. Fire. Cause unknown. Hmm. But you still haven't told me why you knew he would be here at the tambourine. Oh, it's the pattern, Sam. Lefty's sparring partner, Benny, must have caught on to him. So after Lefty knocked Benny out, he fixed the light switch in the dressing room, put the penny behind the fuse, turned off the lights, closed the door, and left. Perfect alibi. But the tambourine, George. Well, that follows, Sam. He fixed the light switch in my bedroom. I'd come in and figure I'd forgotten to turn the light off. Finally, I'd turn it off and go to bed. Then when I was asleep, the short would develop. No tambourine, no Jordan. Up in flames. Up in flames? Hmm. <laughs> you don't miss a bet, do you, Jordan? I wondered what you were doing in Gos Gimlick's back room tonight. <laughs> Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was produced, written, and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. We all know that our detective friend Mike Shane is the hardest working member of his profession in San Francisco. We all know that he's a dynamo of energy in his tireless pursuit of the criminal. But at the moment, it seems the criminal is in pursuit of Mike. His assistant, Phyllis Knight, ushers into the office two rather odd characters. Uh, Mr. Shane, my name is Belsey, George Belsey, Jr., my friend here, Richard Stowe. How do you do, Mr. Shane? I'm glad to know both of you. Gentlemen, my associate, Miss Knight. Hello. How do you do? A pleasure. Mr. Shane, this is a very peculiar business call. I might say it took considerable persuasion on my part to get Mr. Stowe to come here this afternoon. Oh, well, it's so embarrassing. We I... handle many embarrassing problems, Mr. Stowe. Dick's problem is more than embarrassing. It's almost driving him crazy. You see, Dick is afraid he's going to murder me. Murder? Could we have that last chorus again? Well, <laughs> I don't blame you, sir. Dick thinks he is going to murder me. Uh, Mr. Stowe is going to murder you. <laughs> At least I'm afraid I might. This is not a practical joke, Mr. Shane. Nor I'll be crazy. I... 
I'm not sure just when it started. I, I've been very upset in recent months. I guess I've brooded too much. I'll say he did. Dick got so bad, I finally dragged him down to a psychiatrist friend of mine, Dr. Neiman. Mm-hmm. Neiman, yes, I've heard of him. Well, the doctor seemed to help me for a while. My health improved. But then I, I began having this dream. It's always the same dream. It never varies in any detail. It's, it's the perfect crime. I kill Mr. Belsey in such a way that the police are completely baffled. Which could happen only in a dream, but uh, go on, go on. Well, George Belsey's office is up in the Commerce Building. On the ground floor is a cocktail lounge. Well, I dream that about 8 o'clock at night I go into the bar. I order a drink. I drink half of it. I tell the bartender I'm out of cigarettes. I go out to the lobby, but I don't buy cigarettes. I slip through the door on the left and hurry down a hall. I get into the freight elevator. Room 707 is right in front of the elevator. I open the door. I walk through two offices. George Belsey's room is the third. I see the light shining through his glass door. George is working tonight. I take out my revolver. I open his door gently, quietly, just a crack. George is behind his desk. It takes just one bullet. I close the door, wipe off the doorknob, and run back to the elevator. In a minute, I step up to the bar again. I ask the bartender to light my cigarette. I finish my drink. And the dream is over. Well, that's really something for the scrapbook. Well, the dream is so horribly vivid that sometimes I don't know whether I've dreamed it or actually done it. I see. And you want me to set your mind at rest, Mr. Stowe? All right, I think I can show you why you couldn't commit a perfect crime. First, uh, Mr. Belsey, are the bar, the freight elevator, and your office situated as in the dream? Yes, they are. Dick has been up to my office often enough to have the details straight. Mr. Stowe, would you have any motive to kill Mr. Belsey? Oh, no, not the slightest. Are you in any business deals together? No, my line is mining. Dick's is wholesale hardware. Mm -hmm. Mr. Belsey, do you work at your office every night? Oh, no, very seldom. No matter how carefully a murder is planned, there's always the danger of something unforeseen. Mr. Stowe would have to know which night you're working. Then somebody might notice him sneak out of the lobby. An operator might be working after hours on the freight elevator. And then there's the scrub woman upstairs to avoid. And the gun to dispose of afterwards. Yes. No matter what gun you use, the police would trace the bullet. You'd have to prepare yourself against all these slip-ups and a dozen others. <laughs> well, now, does that take a load off your mind? Uh, uh, yes, it, it does. And if you dream it again, Dick, just laugh at it. Roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> well, really, I do feel better already. George, we'd better not take up any more Mr. Shane's time. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, we want to pay you. No, forget it. I don't charge for just talking. Oh, you've done more than that, Mr. Shane. You've pointed out my mistakes. You've told me how to commit the perfect crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to meet you, sir. And Miss Knight. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, goodbye. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Well, this is just fine. Mike Shane, consultant on murder. Hand me that phone book. Who are you going to call? Who do you think? That psychiatrist. Of course I understand, Mr. Shane. Mr. Stowe has been my patient for months, but there is no cause to be alarmed. Well, the way he talked, Dr. Neiman, I, I, I just wondered if he had all his buttons. Oh, there is nothing wrong with Mr. Stowe. He has had a series of especially vivid nightmares, and it has become a habit with him. There is nothing to worry about. I see. Nothing to worry about. Hmm. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed your drink, sir. Yeah, very much, thank you. Here you are. Much obliged. Good night, sir. Good night. All right, honey. Let's head for the lobby. Okay. Now, let's see. Mr. Stowe said the lobby, then the door to the left. Must be this one. And there's the freight elevator. We've done everything in the right order. We had a drink in the cocktail lounge. We went through the lobby. We found the freight elevator. All checks with Stowe's dreams so far. Yeah. Room 707 right in front of us. Mike, the lights are on inside. Hmm. Belsie working tonight? Through two rooms and then his office.
like it. It's this next office. There's a man's shadow against the door. And it isn't Belsey's. No. Those shoulders look awfully familiar. And the angle of that hat. It's the inspector. Who's out there? Hey, Mike and Phil. What in the name Inspector, of... you're here on a murder? Why, yes. It's a man shot to death? That's right, but how did... Oh, uh, one more question, Inspector. In that next room is a desk, and behind that desk is the body of George Belsey, Jr.? How in the name of everything did you know? Ah, I hate to tell you, Inspector. I really hate to tell you. We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, nearly everyone knows about carbon and the trouble it causes in automobile engines. But what most people don't know is that the kind of motor oil they buy directly influences the amount of carbon in their engines. That's because many drivers still believe that carbon comes from the gasoline, when actually nearly all carbon formed in gasoline engines comes from the lubricating oil. But, and this is the payoff, some motor oils form a great deal more carbon than others. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the kind of oil you buy. Now, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any other of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based motor oil, an oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. A man's dream of murder has turned into a nightmare of reality for Mike Shane. In the office of the dead man, Mike and Phyllis have explained to the inspector how they knew George Belsey had been shot to death. So you and Phil were tracing Mr. Stowe's dream footsteps. That's right, Inspector. Phil and I came up here just to see if Stowe could commit the crime the way he dreamed it. Mm-hmm. And when we saw you here, the inspector of homicide, we knew what had happened. Uh-huh. It happened all right. Bullet right through Belsey's heart. Well, we'll have Stowe picked up right away. I know where he was 40 minutes ago. Uh... Who's this? Frank Mann. I was in business with Belson. Yeah, Mike. He found the body and phoned us. I saw Stowe down in the cocktail lounge about 40 minutes ago. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Go down to the cocktail lounge and have Mr. Stowe page for a phone call. If he answers, bring him up here. If he doesn't, send a couple of men to pick him up. Right away, sir. Uh, Mr. Mann, you say you were in business with George Belsey. The mining business? Yes. I'm a mining engineer. Well, maybe you'd call me a prospector. George and I were just about to hit it rich. No, it's hopeless. Oh, well, why's that? Why? Well, you don't find gold mines with every blow of a pickaxe. I've rawhided over every mile of the Sierras looking for a good digging for George and me. George grub staked me. I found him a couple of little mines, but now I need some real cash. That's what you came here tonight to talk over with Belsey? Yes, I just got in from Nevada. Uh-huh. Hadn't seen George for, oh, five or six weeks. He was back east a while. I walk in the door tonight and, well, you know the rest. And, uh... This is uh, the way you found him, slumped over in his chair? That's right. You can see the bullet embedded in the back of the chair. Went clean through him. Mm-hmm. Looks like a forty-five caliber. This is uh, Mr. Stowe, Inspector. Yeah. Found him in the bar, like you said. Where's George? Where's... Oh! Uh-huh. All right, Mr. Stowe, suppose we have your story. You were in the cocktail lounge, you went out for some cigarettes. Yes. It's, it's just like my dream. But I didn't kill him. Inspector, I checked with the bartender. Mr. Stowe came in about an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, I went out in the lobby. I even went to the freight elevator. I was just curious about my dream. But I went right back to the bar. I didn't know George was working tonight. I didn't kill him. I know I didn't. Sergeant, was he carrying a gun? No, sir. Well, if Mr. Stowe doesn't believe he did the killing, we've got to go ahead and solve the case ourselves. Now, let's see. The usual stuff on the desk here. Is a bottle of whiskey the usual? Hmm? Hmm. Bonded. Mm-hmm. Must have been open recently. The label's still wet. But this one drinking glass is clean and dry. Mm-hmm. Appointment pad shows Belsey's last caller was at 5 p.m. Mike, there's a 
There's a phone number jotted down. Fairfield 62041. Hey, that number. Mean anything to you, Mike? You bet it does, Inspector. I called that number this afternoon. It's Dr. Neiman. Well, maybe we better check up on it. Yes, and speaking of checkups, uh, how about the angle of the bullet? Was it fired from the doorway? Looks like it, though we haven't traced it yet. Well, let's do it now. Must be a good 20 feet from the desk to this door. Mm. Listen, I think I hear somebody coming. Probably the coroner. He's late. Uh-uh, that's a woman's footsteps. Mm, yes, it is. All right, miss, in this way. Oh. What's the meaning of this? Perhaps you'd better tell us. What are you doing here? I came back for something I forgot. She was Belsie's secretary, Marie Farrell. Hello, Marie. M- Mr. Mann, wh- why are these people here? In case you really don't know, look behind Mr. Belsie's desk. Oh, then it happened. Mr. Stowe's dream. No, Marie, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. Miss Farrell, do you know anybody else who might want to kill Mr. Belsie? Why, no. Mr. Stowe kept dreaming about it, but nobody would have a reason. Well, we don't think anybody killed him for the pure sport of it. You say, Miss Farrell, you came back to the office because you forgot something? What was it? I... I I can't remember. You've forgotten what you forgot in the first place? Oh, I remember. I'm so mixed up. The the theater tickets. I was on my way to the theater with some friends. They must be wondering what happened to me. Well, I guess there's no point now keeping you. We can always find you. (laughs) Yes, then... I'll get the tickets. They're in my desk. We may want to talk to you tomorrow, Miss Farrell. So if you'll give the sergeant your address and phone number. Oh, of course. Marie Farrell, Calistoga Apartments, Dawson 90351. I, well, I guess that's all. Good night. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, yes. Checking the angle of the bullet. Sergeant, you might take Mr. Stone and Mr. Mann to the next room and let them dictate their stories. Yes, sir. This way, please, gentlemen. Mike... Look at this. Mm-hmm. I found Belsie's account books in this desk drawer. Uh, let's see, Phil. Hmm. Partnership. Belsie and Mann. Gold shipment. Huh. Mike, from these figures, I'd say they were doing all right for themselves. Mike. What? How's this little item for the third finger left hand? An engagement ring. Where did you find it? In this middle drawer. Look at this newspaper with it. Photograph with a blue penciling around it. Uh, Miss Carly Schaefer announces her engagement to Mr. George Belsey, Jr. of San Francisco. Hmm? Right good-looking gal. It's a Pittsburgh paper three days ago. Must have been mailed to Belsey. Wait a minute. Huh? Hey, kids, look at this picture again. Uh. Miss Carly's showing her engagement ring to some girlfriends. But now the ring is here in San Francisco. Uh Uh-uh, it's not the same ring. It's smaller, a different cut. Oh, how can you tell? It's only a newspaper photo. All right, look at it through this magnifying glass. Mm Mm-hmm. Phil's right, Inspector. The Pittsburgh gal is wearing Belsie's engagement ring, yet he's got another piece of Cupid's ice in his desk drawer. For whom? Marie Farrell. Maybe she was after this ring. Could be. I think we'd better have a real heart-to-heart talk with that young lady, and right now... Uh Uh-uh, Mike, you forgot. She's gone to the theater. All the better, my dear. Meanwhile, we can have a look around her apartment. Sergeant. Yes, sir? We're going to see Miss Farrell, the Calistoga Apartments. Looks like our little canary is about to fly her cage. Uh Uh-huh. Suitcase all packed. Hmm. Looks like she's traveling light. Unless she has other bags. Dresses, blouses, stockings, slips. Yeah, perhaps I'd better take the inventory. Yeah. Hey, hold it, hold it. Here's a letter. Return address, George Belsey, Jr., State Hotel, Pittsburgh. Okay, okay, read the letter. Hmm, written last week. Dearest Marie, I'll be back in San Francisco by Saturday, but there's something I want you to know before that. You remember a girl I used to know here in Pittsburgh? Her name is Coralie Schaefer. The good old-fashioned jilt. Yeah. It seems Coralie is the one and only for him. Then Phil was right. The engagement ring in Belsie's desk did belong to Marie. Do you think the jilted young lady might soothe her feelings with a well-placed bullet in her ex-boyfriend? Marie told us there was no reason why anyone should want to kill Belsie, yet 
She's got the only motive for murder we've found so far. Yeah, but you can pile motives up to the ceiling, and Richard Stowe will still look like the murderer. That's true, Inspector. He had the dream, and the killing was exactly as he told it to us. I'm not saying he didn't do it. In fact, there's one angle which may pin it right on him without motive or intent to kill. Meaning what, Mike? Meaning that we've all forgotten Dr. Neiman. The psychiatrist? Yes. And I think we should swap complexes and phobias with that gentleman. Well, you kids go ahead. I'm waiting right here for Marie. She's got to come home sometime tonight. Well, we're not going to leave you here alone. Oh, 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 listen, Grandma. I'm not helpless. I was with Homicide while you were still playing in the sandbox. Okay, Inspector. Okay. Come on, honey. Do you know where uh, Dr. Neiman lives, Mike? Well, we'll get it from the phone book, but first uh, we're stopping by my apartment. There's something I want to have when we visit Dr. Neiman. <laughs> Of course I remember you, Mr. Shane. You telephoned this afternoon about Mr. Stowe. May I ask, Dr. Neiman, if Mr. Stowe has talked to you this evening? No. What do you ask? Oh, curiosity. I am interested in that nightmare which has been troubling Stowe. The details of the dream to kill Mr. Belsey was so complete. I asked, Doctor, when Stowe was talking to us, he seemed to think it was the perfect crime. So? The perfect crime? In fact, Doctor, it looks like the dream was too much uh, of a temptation for Mr. Stowe. Belsey has been murdered. Tonight? Yes. In the same manner? In the same manner. Uh, will you have a cigarette, Miss Knight? Uh, no. Thank you. I understand, Doctor, that Mr. Belsey brought Stowe to you to help him out of a bad mental state. Yes. He was morbid about his business affairs. I might say he was on the verge of a neurotic collapse. Uh, I helped him considerably. How, may I ask? Oh, by various technical means. I'm afraid Mr. Stowe's mind was not quite balanced. That's not what you told me this afternoon, Doctor. You said he was all right, that there was nothing to worry about. How was I to know he would do such an insane thing? Doctor, in treating Mr. Stowe... Did you use hypnotism? Yes, occasionally. I know what you are thinking, Mr. Shane, but you are wrong. It is impossible to hypnotize a man to commit murder. You can't hypnotize anyone into violating his code of ethics. Mm -hmm. I see. Doctor, I brought along a copy of one of your books, Exercises in Psychiatry. I'd like to read you something you wrote on page 93. 93. Oh, I think I know what it is. Quite yes. possibly. This is it. Modern psychologists maintain that a person hypnotized cannot be made to perform acts which violate his ordinary standards of conduct and morality. However, I suggest that if the patient is first convinced by hypnotism that he has no standard of morality, he can be made to follow out any order, even if it be murder. You can't hold that against me. What I wrote eight years ago, I've uh, tested my theory and I found I was wrong. I... How did you test your theory, Doctor? And uh, can you explain why Mr. Stowe did not have this dream of murder till after you began to treat him? Mr. Shane, I refuse to be dragged into this mess. Uh, if you try to smear my reputation in this town, I promise you, you'll regret it very sorely. Very well, Dr. Neiman. Then I think we'll be going. You uh, haven't been what I call helpful. I am not required to be. No. No, but if Mr. Stowe is proved guilty of murder... You may find yourself named accessory to the crime. Think that over, Doctor. Why so quiet, Mike? Thinking. When I look back on it, I think Newman knew what happened from the moment we walked into the door. But, Mike, even if Mr. Stowe was hypnotized to commit a murder, how are we going to prove it? Mike? Mike, what's wrong? We're being followed. Where? No, 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 don't turn around, don't turn around. Look in the rear vision mirror. I saw that same Suzanne behind us when we started over Twin Peaks. Mike, you, you don't think... We'll find out, honey. I'm going to swing into the alley. It passed right by. Yeah, Maybe I'm just getting jumpy. To play safe, we'll go over to another street. Oh. I couldn't see who was in the car. Did you? No. No, it's so dark we... Phil. I see it. It turned around. It's right behind us. Duck, honey. Duck! <laughs> In 
just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. You see, aside from the fact that it makes driving uncomfortable, a motor, when too hot, wastes gasoline. And whether you realize it or not, cars driven around town with frequent starts and stops usually get hotter than those driven on the open road. Now, an easy way to make sure your radiator is on the job and cooling your engine is to have your Union Oil Minuteman treat it with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, with a radiator that is flushed clean, you can be sure of rapid water circulation and a cool motor. So for cooler driving, economical mileage, ask for Union Oil Radiator Service, wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. One of the bullets fired into Mike Shane's car came near its mark. Mike was hit in the shoulder. Phyllis has bandaged the wound, and the two are now back at the scene of the murder, the office of George Belsey. How are you feeling now, Mike? Oh, a little rocky, but okay, Inspector. It was just a flesh wound. We'll have a doctor dress it properly. You better, Phil. Oh, Mike, the sergeant has just brought in Neiman. We got everybody back here now. Stone, Man, and Marie. Have you got anything out of Marie? Yeah, admit she and Belsie broke their engagement. But there's a funny twist to it. We didn't notice when she was here earlier she was wearing another engagement ring. You mean the one we found in the desk didn't belong to Marie? Looks that way, Phil. She froze up when I asked her about the one she's wearing. Have you checked up on where everybody was at the time I got shot? Yeah, they all got alibis. It's up to us to find out which one is lying. That's what bothers me, Inspector. Somebody tried to kill me because he or she thinks I know the answer to this case, and doggone it, I don't. All right, I'll bring them all in now, and we can sweat them. All right, Sergeant. Say, Sergeant. Yes, sir? <clears throat> Open that door again, please. Yes, sir. Well, I'll be... Inspector. What? There must be something wrong with our ears. We've opened and closed that door 40 times tonight. Well, what about it, Mike? What about it? Well, listen to it. There. Don't you see? The killer couldn't possibly open this door to fire his gun without Belsey hearing him. Mm. Let me show you. I'll step outside the office and close the door and then open it again. What's the matter, Mike? I can't see the desk. Look. Look, the door has to be completely open before I can see the desk. That means the killer practically had to come into the room. I catch. Belsie must have seen him, but he didn't jump up or try to escape. He just sat there, paralyzed with fright. Wait a minute. We've skipped a big point here. Belsie was hit by a forty-five bullet. That would knock an elephant sideways. Yet he stayed there in his chair. Yeah, you're right. The nervous reflex alone would make him jump out of his seat. Unless he was unconscious. Inspector, what? we've assumed all along that the whiskey and drinking glass on the desk were unused. I'll bet my gold bridge worked that the killer cleaned and dried that glass. Delcy took a drink that was drugged. That's possible, but there's still the main question. Of who did it? All right. Mr. Stowe dreamed of the killing. Marie... I believe you indicated that you knew of his dream. Well, yes. Mr. Stowe talked about it so much. And Dr. Neiman knew it, of course. And you, Mr. Mann. Well, Belsie joked about it with me once or twice. So everybody knew of Stowe's dream and could take advantage of it. But here's the point. I practically accused Dr. Neiman of hypnotizing Stowe to commit the murder. I still deny it. And I believe you, sir. I've been thinking it over the past few minutes. Dr. Neiman has never been in this office. We checked on it. He couldn't possibly hypnotize Mr. Stowe... And give him all those detailed directions about the cocktail lounge and the freight elevator. Yeah, that makes sense. The same reason would rule out Mr. Stowe. If he killed Belsey, he would do it exactly as he dreamed it, which is not the way the murder was committed. No, Mike has demonstrated that. Huh? By the opening and closing of the door, and by the probability that Belsey was drugged. Marie, Marie, you are the prize suspect except for two things. You didn't know Belsey was working tonight because the last appointment jotted down on his desk pad was for 5 p.m., and you were not in your apartment when Miss Knight and I decided to call on Dr. Neiman. So you couldn't have followed Mike there or tried to kill him afterwards. But that also goes for Frank Mann. Not quite, Inspector. He did hear us say we were going to Marie's apartment. He followed us first to her place and then to Neiman's No, and... no, you're wrong, wrong. 
Frank wouldn't kill Bill, see? He's not a murderer. Oh, so now it's Frank. Oh. You've dropped the formality. Miss Farrell, that engagement ring you're wearing, Frank Mann gave it to you, didn't he? Yes. We're going to be married. I suppose you'll make a crime out of that, too. It's a very expensive ring, several thousand dollars. If you're broke, Mr. Mann, and Belsie was grub-staking you, you couldn't possibly afford that ring unless you knew you were taking over the gold mines of your dead partner. You, you, you can't prove a thing. You can't convict me. You've convicted yourself, sir. You were the only one who knew Belsie was working tonight because you had an appointment with him. You killed him, then called the police. Well, the police are still here, ready and waiting. How about it, Inspector? Mike? Huh? How do you want your eggs? Oh, let's have them sunny side up this time, huh? You know, with this bum arm of mine, Angel, you'll have to feed your poor old boss. And how you'll love it. <laughs> Uh oh, I bet that's the inspector. Hey, wait, wait. I want to hear this too. Hello? <laughs> yeah, you guessed right, Inspector. She's fixing me some eggs. What bacon? Huh? Uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. It's in my pocket. I guess I was just absent minded. Sure, sure. I I'll bring it in tomorrow. Okay. Good night, Inspector. What will you bring in tomorrow? Oh, that engagement ring we found in Belsie's desk. I stuck it in my pocket here and walked off with it. Forgot all about it. Uh, yeah, I know how that is. Huh? When it comes to engagement rings, your mind is a complete blank. Ah, Angel, you walked off with something of mine, too, tonight. This book on psychiatry here. Oh, that. Hey, wait a minute. You've dog-eared a page already. Chapter on hypnotism and its power over the emotions. You give me that book. <laughs> You're wasting your time, honey. It, it doesn't work. I've already tried it. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. <laughs> People who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. In the course of his detective career, Mike Shane has been called upon to track down escaped murderers, to find missing jewels, to recover stolen bonds and sensational diaries. But never before has he been asked to hunt for something 3,000 years old. In his office high in the Rust Building, Mike and his lovely assistant Phyllis Knight listen sympathetically to a worried little man, Dr. Frederick Wakeman, museum curator. Mr. Shane, these thefts have been going on at the museum now for two weeks. Some of the losses just wring my heart. You know how today people save the baby shoes of their children, even have them cast in bronze? Well, yes, but Then I... realize what it means to me to lose the baby sandals of the pharaoh Ramesses the first. Why, I used to hold those tiny things in my hand and think back to the days when they patted around the royal court of Egypt. Yes, 3,300 long years ago. 3,300 years? Well, why would anybody steal baby sandals 3,300 years old? 
Unless they were fresh out of shoe stamps. That's yes. the baffling part of it. The thefts don't make sense. One time it's the court robe of a Chinese emperor, the next it's the original of a love sonnet of Shakespeare or the signet ring of a Russian czar. They're famous. If the thief tried to sell them in New York or London or Bombay, it would be known they came from this museum. In which case, the thief would be caught. Sounds like to me the work of a pretty clever thief. Dr. Wakeman, do you suspect anybody in particular? No, how can I? It's bewildering. It's, well, it's a mystery. The museum is open every day, but we have very capable guards. I believe the thefts occur at night, when only two watchmen are on duty. Any signs of uh, somebody forcing in a door or window? No, none that we can recognize. Hmm. But it's got to stop, Mr. Shane. It's got to. I'm responsible, and there are people who will take advantage of my failure. Even in a museum, one can have enemies, huh? Uh, this is what I want you to do, sir. Hmm? Come out and look over the museum with me. Perhaps spend a few nights there. Well, that's quite an order, Dr. Wakeman, but I guess we're game. How about it, Phil? Certainly we are. All right. Then if you would meet me at the museum tonight in my office, say, about 8.30... Your office at 8.30? Okay, but it's only fair to warn you, Doctor. Every time I go out on a job lately, I seem to wind up with a corpse. Really? Oh, <laughs> then you won't be disappointed. You'll find six corpses. Six corpses? Yes, in the mummy room. <laughs> Oh, Mike, there's something really ironic about tonight. Mm? For years I've worked with you, tried and begged and coaxed you to go to the museum with me, and it takes a crime to break you down. Well, I can't think of a better reason. Well, I'm excited about it. This case is so different. Imagine sitting up all night with Egyptian mummies and things. What atmosphere? Uh-huh. Well, right now I'm more concerned about the atmosphere collecting on our windshield. Oh. It's starting to rain and I forgot to get those windshield wipers fixed. Mm, a night in the museum. A rainy night in the museum. That's even better. Yeah. Dr. Wakeman, to the contrary, I doubt anybody will try to swipe anything tonight while King Tut is entertaining us. Do you think we'll have to hide in a sarcophagus or, or whatever they call sarcophagus, it? Sarcophagus, yes. <laughs> Well, I guess this is the museum. Ooh, hug your coat, Angel. There's a wind with this rain. All right. Ooh, it's a spooky-looking old building at night. Uh-huh. Only one light showing. Probably in Wakeman's office. I ain't got nobody. Well, right on time, according to the clock in the tower. Not very cheerful sounding, is it? What do you want? Well, uh, we have an appointment with Dr. Wakeman. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told me about you. Come on in. Thank you. All right. Follow me. Yes, sir. Mike, that room right ahead, that strange green light all through it. Egyptian department. Mummy room. Oh, it looks so uncanny. Are, are we going through it? Yeah. Shortcut to the curator's office. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice layout of mummies. Reminds me of the morgue. Ooh. Hey, hey, Phil, slow down. Oh, uh, Mike, that, that mummy standing up, it moved. Oh, don't be silly, that's a god. Oh. And, and you talked about hiding in a sarcophagus. Oh. You're right, uh -huh. Go right on in. Thank you. Sure, sure. Well, it looks like Dr. Wakeman isn't here. Well, he's probably around him. Mike. Yeah? That big chair with its back toward us. Yeah, tobacco smoke coming up from it. Uh, Dr. Wakeman, eh? I... Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, I didn't hear you. I, I was reading this manuscript. Oh, I didn't see you, young lady. I beg your pardon, being in my shirt sleeves. I was drying my coat on the radiator here. Ought to be dry now. Yeah, just a little wet, but no matter... Good heavens, is that clock on the desk right? Yes, it's 8.30. I'd better phone Wakeman's house and find out what's keeping him. Get me Wakeman. Hello? Arthur? Uh, this is Cameron. What's holding up Wakeman? Uh, Mr. Shane's waiting here in the office. But he told me to be here at 7.30 and I'm still waiting. Oh, yes, that's possible. All right, Arthur. That's the young professor who lives with Wakeman. Said he left for the museum at seven. He lives just across the street. Well, he must have stopped somewhere else first. Yeah, that's what Arthur said. I'm curious, sir. How did you know my name was Shane? Oh, Wakeman told me about you on the phone. I'm Professor Cameron, one of the governors of the museum. Oh, I see. Well, I'm glad to know you. And this is Miss Knight. How do you How do? How do you do? I hope you people can help poor Wakeman. He's all upset about this trouble in the museum. 
I suppose that's what he wanted to talk to me about tonight. I've wanted to see your exhibits for a long time, Professor. Well, I'm not the Egyptologist here, but antiquities have been a hobby of mine most of my life. I'll be glad to show you anything I can. Oh, perhaps this is Wakeman. No, it's Arthur. Hasn't he come in yet? Wakeman? Not yet. Uh, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight, this is Professor Arthur. Arthur. Sorry, I've been smoking my pipe. <laughs> well, I'll open the window just to crack. <gasps> What's the matter? Good heavens. Wakeman. <gasps> Hanging behind the curtain. Well, well, get him down, quick. Wait a minute, Professor. We've got to see if he's still alive. What difference does that make? If he's dead, we've got to leave him there for the coroner. He's dead, all right. Oh, how could he be so foolish, so foolish? You think it's suicide? What else? Of course, look at him. I just did. San Francisco Police Department. Give me the inspector of homicide. <laughs> Rejoin Mike and Phyllis and their adventures in just a moment. Here's a tip if you're worried about excess carbon in your engine. Just drive into any Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman for Triton Motor Oil. Why? Well, nearly all carbon formed in engines comes from the motor oil and not from the gasoline. Now, there's a wide variation in the amount of carbon different oils form. So it's logical to buy the oil that farm, forms the least carbon. And that's where Triton comes in. For Triton, and this is a proved laboratory fact, contains less carbon-forming elements than any of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, Triton cuts costly carbon. The reason is that Triton is refined by Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent process a process that removes harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur, leaving a pure 100% lubricating oil. An oil that will safely lubricate your car for many hundreds of miles and give added protection against excess carbon. Your engine deserves that protection. You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. <laughs> Mike and Phyllis have located the missing Dr. Wakeman, curator of the museum, hanging from a curtain rod in his own office. The inspector has arrived on the scene and questions Mike and the two museum professors. Now, just a minute. Mr. Shane says it's murder. Professor Barron says it's suicide. I can't be positive it's suicide, Inspector. But I know that Wakeman was a very morbid man and terribly affected by these museum thefts. You mean he may be linked in with them? When he saw the things closing in around him, he chose the one way out? No, no, I didn't say that. Inspector, I... just so you don't fall for a phony suicide deal, take a look at that rope. Uh-huh. See what you mean, Mike. The heads of the rope are all flattened in one direction. It couldn't be suicide. How could that possibly tell you? Because we make a study of such things, Professor... When a person is dead before he's hanged, the killer has to haul the body up into place. When the murderer pulled the rope over that curtain rod, the pressure going over the rod flattened all the hairs on the rope. But who would kill Wakeman? Unless, perhaps, the thief who's been stealing from us. Obviously. We'd better question the guards and check up on any clues of burglary. Dr. Wakeman said he couldn't find any clues after the earlier thefts. But he made a list of stolen articles. Now, if we looked at them, we might get an idea of the type of thief. I'm afraid you'll have to forget that. Wakeman kept the list in the big safe there. But he was the only one who had the combination. Well, let's see. It's unlocked. We kept some of our most valuable items in that safe. You and Professor Cameron better take inventory. Hmm. Everything looks in its place. The chapter from the Gutenberg Bible, the Greek medallions. Carelessness, carelessness. Wakeman never put anything twice in the same place. What's wrong? This papyrus, any fool can see it's a prayer scroll of the Fourth Dynasty, but the marker says Egyptian Book of the Dead. Oh, he just filed in the wrong container. Ah, here's a list of stolen articles. May I see it, please? Mm hmm. Two blue porcelain vases, Ming Dynasty. Jeweled Arabian sword, gold scabbard. Two miniatures, Napoleon and Josephine, set of Egyptian... Napoleon and Josephine? Hey, there's a point. Cameron, you remember how Mr. Bradley fought with Wakeman when Wakeman wouldn't sell those miniatures to him? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about Richard Bradley, the lumberman and art collector? Yes, a creature wholly without culture who buys rare and beautiful works merely to flaunt the power of his money. Oh. But 
But a man with millions wouldn't descend to stealing. Well, I'm not so sure. Bradley offered Wakeman $20,000 for the miniatures of Napoleon and Josephine. Then he upped it to $25,000. Yes, I remember. He was bidding against that art dealer, that, that Francois Lys. Yes, and when Wakeman wouldn't sell at any price, Bradley got so furious he threatened him. He said he'd come down here some night and slit Wakeman's throat and take the miniatures anyway. Oh, I'd discount that. Bradley is notorious for his bad temper. Still, we can't overlook it, Mike. We've got to follow all leads. Sergeant. Yes, Inspector? We're going to call on Mr. Bradley. Nobody is to leave this building till we get back. Oh, so Wakeman is dead, huh? Well, well, perhaps now I can do business with the museum. What time did you say he was killed? We didn't say, Mr. Bradley, but we think between 6.45 and 7.30. Well, that's lucky for me. With my feeling toward Wakeman, you might be coming here to accuse me of his murder. But at that hour, I happen to be eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. May I ask why you're so bitter toward Wakeman? number of reasons. Do you realize I offered Wakeman a quarter of a million dollars to build a new wing on the museum, and he and his board of governors turned it down? Yeah, turned it down, yes. Merely because I wanted my name chiseled over the doorway. Would another of those reasons be, Mr. Bradley, that Wakeman wouldn't sell you two miniatures of Napoleon and the Empress Josephine? Yes. Twenty-five thousand dollars I offered him. And I believe when Wakeman refused to sell, you threatened him. And said something about coming down and slitting his throat to get those miniatures? <laughs> yes, I said that. Anything else you want to know? We asked these questions, sir, because those two miniatures were among the articles stolen from the museum. Well, I hope you find them. And when you do, let me know. I'd still like to buy them. When we find them, sir, we'll have the murderer of Dr. Wakeman. I may be able to put you in the right direction. Mm. Yeah. Let me take a look out of the window. Yeah, I can see the light in his store. It's still open. He's down just a block from this apartment. Who? An art dealer, Francois Lise. Yes, I think he would be a very interesting man for you to question. Thank you, sir. If we need any more answers, we'll be back. <laughs> Now, Mr. Bradley may be a big shot in this town, a millionaire and an art collector. But his heart doesn't pump blood, it's vinegar and arsenic. Yeah, awfully anxious to pack us off to Francois Lise. Mm -hmm. And that alibi of eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. I think the sergeant better double check on that. You kiddies are a suspicious crew. Now, why would a millionaire commit a murder for two useless miniatures? Well, we can continue this discussion some other time. Here's Mr. Lise's gallery. You are looking for something, yes? Oh, yes, we didn't see you. It's uh, it's like this. My friends here and I are redecorating an apartment. It's to be in the French style, and I... Uh... <laughs> so? Uh, what kind of an apartment are you decorating? Perhaps a cell at the police station? Hmm? Uh, what? <laughs> you are Monsieur Shane, the detective. This is Monsieur Inspector of the police and the young lady. She is Mademoiselle Knight. You have come here to ask me about my poor friend, uh, Dr. Wakeman. Alors, it is a great pity. But... But how did you know? It is simple. One of the guards at the museum, Monsieur Olson, he telephoned me about the murder. So now you come to my studio to look for stolen property. Très bien. My studio, she is at your command. Well, this isn't exactly what we expected. It you see, there is no need for apology. You will pardon if I go. I am promised to see Madame Van Allen Haven tonight, and uh, perhaps to buy her library. Yeah, but hold on, uh, just a minute. Uh, yeah. When you have searched my studio, if you will lock this front door, please. Au revoir. Well... Hmm. Well, of all You've the... come to my studio for look for stolen property. I am happy to have you. Yeah, that's what's wrong, yeah. Inspector. Mr. Lease is too free. He knows there's nothing here. If he dealt in stolen goods, he was very careful not to store them in this studio. Mike, let's go after him. He's going to tell us a few things. Wait a minute, Inspector. He's already told us something. A guard at the museum named Olson telephones him that Wakeman has been murdered and tells Lease about us. What for? Yeah. Lise and the guard must be working this together. Maybe, but that's what we've got to find out. And I know how we will find out, Inspector. We are going to search his studio. For what? I want a cardboard box, some wrapping paper, and a shipping label. Then, back to the museum as fast as we can go. The 
Sergeant's got Olsen in the next room, Mike. You ready for him? Yes, Inspector. Yeah, now look. This is the way we'll work it. On the desk here, we've got the box all wrapped and uh, addressed to Richard Bradley. Mm-hmm. Now, inside, we've planted a Chinese vase that we borrowed temporarily from the museum. We'll call in Olsen. We'll tell him we've found this box at Lee's studio. And then when he recognizes it as museum property, we hope he'll get rattled and confess. Right. Huh? Okay, kids, let's begin the act. Olsen, in here, please. Olsen, we just got back from a little trip downtown. In uh, looking through the studio of an art dealer, Francois Lee's, we ran across a package, this box here on the desk. Well, what about it? We'd like you to read the label on it. I don't get what you're driving at. All right, Olsen, I'll read the shipping label for you. To Mr. Richard Bradley. Well, suppose we see what's inside the package, huh? Here we are. Well, very pretty. It's... like It's a vase. A rare Chinese vase, Olsen, from this museum. Why, how... How do you... It was one of the things stolen from here, Olsen. And we know who stole it. We know. Now are you going to talk? No, no. No, I didn't take that. He never told me anything about it. You admit you stole for Francois Lee. <laughs> Look out, Phil! He came through the window. I... I... Didn't take... No, 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 no. Oh! Right through the heart, Inspector. Sergeant! McCarthy! Cuban! The side door, Inspector. Come on, this way. Holy jumping. It looks like it is. Francois Lee's. No, no, no. No, let me go. You are wrong. Inspector, we caught him running for his car. We got his gun. It's still warm and one of the chambers is empty. No. No, you do not understand. But we do, Mr. Lee's. You were afraid the guard would talk and you killed him. But you were just a little too late. He confessed that he was working for you. All right. Yes, yes, I, I admit. I killed Olsen. But not Dr. Wakeman. No, no, never. We let a jury decide that. Inspector, shall I call off all the boys now? I wouldn't do that, Inspector. This case is not closed yet. What are you talking about, Mike? We've caught the man who killed Olsen, but the man who murdered Dr. Wakeman is still at large. We've still got one murderer to catch. In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, the radiator on your automobile plays a definite part in the economical operation of your engine. Like other parts, it needs some attention now and then. You see, the small honeycomb cores and water pipes of a radiator are easily plugged with rust, dirt, and scale. When that happens, the water circulation is impaired, the temperature gauge shouts danger, and the engine loses efficiency. That's why, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. And the quickest way to do that is to have your Union Oil Minuteman clean your radiator with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale and rust right out of choked water lines. Then, with this foreign matter flushed out, the clean water can circulate rapidly and the engine stays cooler. Remember, your Minute Man can flush the radiator while you wait. The cost is nominal, and you'll benefit with cooler summer driving. You can get Union Radiator Service wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Mike is certain that the capture of Francois Lys does not solve the murder of Dr. Wakeman. In the office of Dr. Wakeman, the inspector argues the point with Mike and Phyllis. I'm sorry, Mike. I just don't get your reasoning. Lease admits he and Olsen were robbing the museum. He admits he killed Olsen to cover up. Then why do you accept his denial that he killed Wakeman? You just gave me my reason, Inspector. Lease will be convicted for one murder. It will make no difference to him to confess the second killing. That's why I think he's telling the truth. In other words, Mike... You think the second killing occurred tonight merely because of our investigation of the first killing? Correct, Angel. Okay, suppose you're right. Maybe Olsen killed Wakeman. They're both dead. One murder cancels out the other. No, Inspector, no. The murder of Dr. Wakeman was very clever, too clever for Olsen to have thought of. Mike, you must have something in mind. I have. I was just thinking. When we first started out tonight, we found that safe over there unlocked. Dr. Wakeman wouldn't leave it unlocked with constant thefts going on around here. 
Do you think the the murderer made him open it? Well, let's have another look inside that safe. Huh? There's a lot of valuable stuff in here. If we could find it. Wait a minute. That papyrus. The Book of the Dead, remember? Yeah, sure. The professor said it was kept in the safe. Yeah, the young one. Baron said it was misplaced. That's what he said. Now, I'm no expert on Egyptology, but I do know that the Book of the Dead is an extremely rare old papyrus in delicate condition. Now, if you were going to steal it, what would you put it in? How would you carry it? Well, I see a half dozen long metal cylinders in the safe. I suppose you'd carry it in one of them. Okay, let's check them. Mm, all of them are labeled. Prayer scroll of Imshet Sup. Yeah, and record of Noble's War. Hey, here's one with no label. It's bigger. All dusty and dirty. What? Let me see that. Oh, it's even got cobwebs on it. But the safe itself is almost antiseptically clean. Inspector. Yeah. Look at these spots. They're all over the cylinder. You know what made them? Mm, water spots. <laughs> yeah, water. And I'll bet you the papyrus inside this tube is the Book of the Dead. Okay, Inspector, get everybody in here. <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. Sheen, that's the Book of the Dead. We always keep it in the safe. Yes, as I said, Wakeman must have misfiled it. Uh, Professor Barron, you told us you were studying this papyrus just the other day. Yet now we find it in an old, dusty container. Well, I don't know why that would... All the other papyrus cylinders are perfectly clean and bare labels. Where did this dirty, unlabeled container come from? It must be from the storehouse, a building away out back of the museum. Are there a lot of uh, spiders out there? Spiders? Naturally, it's an old building. All right. I'll tell you exactly how Dr. Wakeman was murdered. This evening he opened the safe for somebody who wanted to look at the Book of the Dead. The only thank you he got was to be strangled to death. Then the killer hung the body behind the curtain so it wouldn't be discovered immediately. The murderer needed a special carrying container for the papyrus. So he went out to the storehouse and got one and came back. Time was running short, so temporarily he tucked the papyrus back in the safe, hidden in the new container. It was almost 8.30, he knew Miss Knight and I were due in the office. So he calmly sat down and pretended to be reading. That's when we walked in on you, Professor Cameron. Why, why preposterous, I, I never heard of Professor, such a thing. Professor, you told us that you came into the museum at 7.30 and spent the whole hour here in the office reading and smoking. It didn't start to rain tonight till almost 8.30. Yet when we came in, you were drying your coat on the radiator. Well, I... That doesn't mean... It means everything, sir. This papyrus cylinder has more than dust and cobwebs on it. It's got spots. Water spots, rain spots. Spots that were collected at the same time you collected them on your coat when you came back from the storehouse after you killed Wakeman. And as final proof, Professor, all four of us here can see wet cobwebs stuck to the back of your trouser legs. Does that convince you, Professor? Yes... Yes, I... I thought I was so careful that no one could prove... That's what every murderer thinks, sir. But the murderer is always wrong. He always makes some little slip, some little mistake. Tonight you made yours. Well, kids, there's my car parked across the street. I'll say good night and thanks again. Oh, come on, Inspector. Follow us over to Phil's apartment, huh? She'll fix us some coffee and sandwiches. Well... No, I'll do better than that. I'll try out a new spaghetti recipe on you. Spaghetti? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. There goes my waistline again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. I'll meet you at the apartment. <laughs> okay, okay, Inspector. We'll see you later, then. <laughs> Mike. Yes? You know I still don't get it. Why would Professor Cameron kill a man just to own an Egyptian papyrus that he could borrow any time he wanted to? Well, it seems no motive for murder. Well, it seems silly to us, maybe. But you remember... Remember how sentimental Dr. Wakeman got about those baby sandals of the pharaoh Ramesses? Mm -hmm. Well, Cameron felt the same way about the Book of the Dead. But Cameron was uh, inherently dishonest. Yes, I suppose so. Cameron buried himself in his work. He isn't married, didn't play golf or dance or go to movies, didn't have any fun at all. Ah, that's dangerous for any man. (laughs) 
Now, well, what are you giggling about? It sounds like a perfect description of Mike Shane. Oh, 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 oh no. No, there's a difference. I uh, may not be married. No. May not play golf or dance. But I've got you, Angel, and I do have fun. again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. Here is a message from our government. It's been a long time since there were any new cars, and naturally we're all excited about them. But let's not forget that it'll be many months before new automobiles are on the market. That means that we still have a pretty serious job taking care of our old cars. More and more cars are junked every day. That places a mounting burden on public transportation facilities that are already overtaxed. Now, a few simple conservation measures will help you keep your car rolling. Join a carpool, check your tire pressures every week, and have tires recapped in time to save the casings. Have your battery checked regularly, and make sure your car is regularly and properly lubricated. Take care of minor troubles before they become big repair jobs. Drive slowly. Speed increases wear. Remember... Your car has to last till victory, and then some. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco. And Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that... Well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney, and he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. <laughs> we pass the buck to you. <laughs> I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is, most of us in the department, either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery. 
I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. <laughs> don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Oh. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself, if I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective. Hi, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. Hello, Sergeant. Report homicide, Inspector. Man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. <laughs> This is the street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you, if you'd just found a body? Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Ugh. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here, here's my handkerchief. Thank well, you. if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I, I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you. I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open... And that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and when I saw he was dead, I I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I came back, and... Oh, I, I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it? That's it. Uh, Then you did what? Well, that's all. I I walked back and forth, and I walked downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. (sighs) No signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workman working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Angel. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. But why don't you suggest something? All right, I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. Well, Richard.
return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose, and you're all through. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it, and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Well, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, Granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, h- here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen. I warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Sign. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with BT. They felt that BT had swindled them. Well, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand, but in such a way that Beatty didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And Beatty told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried, but that was all. Why the dickens didn't you tell me this before? Oh, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill Beatty over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, well, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case of any phone calls or anything like that. Watch out, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, huh? We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes? May I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well, yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I I don't know. 
I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, Yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, Satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters, then that's your privilege. Oh, well, if Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police... I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here and I, uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and... Uh, Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? <laughs> he doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no, we still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, You want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. What a rat trap. Yeah? Well, here's hoping it's more than just a rat trap. A man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. Place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubbyhole of an office. Well, leave us have a look, see There's not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You noticed how the dust is disturbed on the edge of the table next to the wall? That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector. Yeah? Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... It could be blood, huh? Mm-hmm. It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. You see how it's spread out like a... Uh, like a seal? Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now, the chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the roof. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. Oh, it's a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh-uh. Uh, the body's here, all right. Close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil, will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Mm-hmm, shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, JJBD. Driver's license, age 52. Mm -hmm. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. 
Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay. One or two? One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm -hmm. Got it. Checkbook. Balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Wheatley? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills. Gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe. Tobacco pouch and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clip with $25 and loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray. J.J. B.D. from fellow workers, Wadsworth plant. Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it. Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay, the same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run? Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. We'll teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. <laughs> I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint, just one. But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands, and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just ten cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling schoolgirl. <laughs> It's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but, well, it's only hush, one hush, link. Hush, hush, kids. Huh? She's on the phone. Oh, who? The ex-Mrs. Beatty. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beatty. Yes? Mrs. Beatty, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beatty? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but there was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm -hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but someone not to be trusted. 
And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note. But just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Well, yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A boss from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah. Yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver... They didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike. But until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector. But... Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, you can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. Bo both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true. But to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah. But, Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Hey, yes, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this says. Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had. What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beater's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do Oh, mean. that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike, we've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Will I get understand why it's... Quiet, please. Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock, but... Mr. Beatty has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first, although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm -hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment. Went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police and came back upstairs and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beatty hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No. No mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. 
There you see. When we searched Mr. Beatty's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... I admit it. Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. Well, here it is, early in the evening, and... We're on our way home. Aha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I-, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just... Uh... Huh? No, not here in the car. I mean... Why not, Angel? I can drive with one hand as well as the next. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. People who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It was Gilbert and Sullivan who said, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one, end quote. But tonight, just on the stroke of eight, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite ferreter of felonies, is seated in his apartment. He looks down on the bay at the masthead lights rising and falling with the swell as Phyllis, his easy-on-the-eyes associate, does things with eggs in the tiny kitchen, a kitchen which hangs like an eyebrow on the forehead of Telegraph Hill. Uh, yes, Angel? How's the shoulder? It's fine. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, it's pretty good. Why? Ah, uh, because I think you're using it as an excuse to get me over here every night to fix your dinner. Well, Angel, some fellows have etchings. I use scrambled eggs. Uh-huh. Well, from tonight on, if I come over to your apartment, it's to be as a guest. You're going to do the cooking. Oh, Angel. I mean it. I'm through being a detective by day and a cook at night. All right, come and get it. Oh, boy. Um, hello. Hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Inspector. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to sit down to a plate of scrambled eggs. Why? I got a body. <laughs> you sound like something out of a horror film instead of Inspector of Homicide. What kind of a body? It's been in the water a week or so. It looks like an accident. Autopsy surgeon seems to think it was an accident. 
Sergeant here says it was an accident, but... Uh, you think it's murder? Could be, Mike. Where are you? You know where Olium is? Right on San Pablo Bay? Yes. I'll have the police boat pick you up at the jetty. Oh, swell. The sergeant will pick you up as fast as he can get there. Well, uh, give me two more seconds. Two more seconds? Yes, Inspector. One second for each egg. <laughs> There she is. Pull alongside. Are we going aboard that yacht? Yeah, the inspection aboard. Hmm, it's a trim looking craft. Yeah, about 200,000 bucks worth. Hi there. Can you make it up the ladder or do you want a bosun's chair? Oh, half an hour aboard ship and he talks like an admiral. <laughs> we'll use the ladder, Inspector. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter, Angel? Can't cook his own dinner because of a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he can climb a ship's ladder. Well, I... Okay, okay, you go first, Mike. Okay. Well, kids, you made good time. Mm-hmm. Sergeant brought us up the bay as if he knew every wave. He does. Born and raised at San Rafael. Well, <laughs> where's the body? On the engine room hatch. Mm-hmm. Any uh, wounds? One blow on the head. Which could have been made if he had fallen off the rocks. Water in the lungs? Yeah, Phil. Oh, so he was alive when he hit the water. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Dressed in sailor pants, a reefer jacket, scarf. Shoes don't look like a sailor's. Uh, what besides the shoes make you suspect murder, Inspector? A dead man's hands, Mike. No calluses. And the nails have been manicured. Mm. Sailors don't have soft hands and manicured nails. Oh, good work, Inspector. Good work. But uh, how come uh, you're aboard this ship? Is the owner aboard? No, Mike. But we've sent for him. We came aboard because the Bay Patrol found the body near the ship. And because of this. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. The North Star. Owner Nelson Carter. And this is the North Star? Yeah, Phil. Autopsy surgeon said the body has been in the water about ten days. Oh, it's pretty hard to identify him now. Any missing persons reported? I don't know. The sergeant checked with the missing persons bureau when he went back to pick you up. Yes, sir. Nobody reported missing, Inspector. Say, uh, who's aboard? I noticed the anchor light is trim and clear. No smudge on the glass. Must have been lighted tonight. That's right, Mike. Captain is aboard, also the quartermaster. Oh, I don't see any cabin light. No, Phil. The portholes are covered with heavy green curtains. Uh, did you uh, question the captain and the quartermaster? Yeah, Mike. Very noncommittal gents. Said they didn't know the dead man. Never seen him before. Didn't know anything about him, and then they both retired to their cabins. Well, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? Uh, not particularly. Well, most people are inquisitive, Inspector. Especially about anything that smells of murder. Inspector, did you search the ship? Yeah, they're doing quite a bit of repair work. Huh? Placing all the paneling in the stateroom and so on. Oh, uh, Inspector, did you take a look at the uh, ship's log? No. After all, Mike, we really haven't anything definite to go on. Not even a legitimate reason to suspect murder. I think we have. Well, so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent for you. But to try and tie the murder up with the captain or with the ship even... But I do tie it up with the ship, in a way. What do you mean, Mike? Point number one. We're agreed that this dead man isn't a sailor because of his hands. Uh -huh. Agreed. Point number two, we think that these sailors' clothes aren't his clothes, all except the shoes. Oh, yes, Mike, but I still don't see how Dead you... men can change clothes, Angel. Oh. So that suggests uh, violence. Now, take a look at the inside of that right trouser leg. Mm -hmm. You see that uh, smear of orangey red? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. So what? Well, that was made by red lead. The stuff they use to keep iron and steel from rusting. Go on, Mike. Now, take a look at these stanchions on the port side. Freshly painted with red lead. I didn't notice that before. Well, neither did I until right now. But you'll notice, Inspector, that there's no trace of red lead on the inside of either of the dead man's shoes. I see what you mean. To get that smear on the pants legs, whoever was wearing those pants would be sure to get some on their shoes. Right, Inspector, if he were wearing them voluntarily. Now, that smear suggests that he was carried. So I give you a suggestion. The murdered man was stripped of his own clothes, then these sailors' clothes were slipped on him and he was dumped into the bay. And these sailors' clothes came from this ship? Yes, Inspector, yes, these clothes are from this ship. And for that reason, I think we should question our four suspects. Four suspects? I... I don't get you, Mike. Four suspects? Yes, yes. The captain, the quartermaster, the owner. Yeah. And the fourth? The fourth is the ship's carpenter. <laughs> Yeah.
In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the news you've all been waiting for. Post-war gasoline is here. Right now, as we speak these words, Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries are shifting to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, you'll be able to buy a new 76 gasoline that will knock your hat off. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are hurrying it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil Minuteman hasn't received his first shipment of this powerful new gasoline yet, he will within the next two weeks. And just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. <laughs> Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are still aboard the yacht North Star. The dead man's body still lies on the engine room hatch as Mike knocks on the captain's cabin door. What do you want? This is the inspector of homicide. We'd like to talk to you again. Well, I won't say glad to see you because I'm not. I won't say sit down because I'm hoping you won't stay long. We've uh, sent for the owner and I thought we could save time by asking you a few questions. Who are you? I'm Mike Shane, private detective. I don't know that I got to answer any of your questions. Oh, you don't, of course, but I'd like to ask one question anyway. Well? Where's your master's certificate? Why, you went... And don't tell us it's in the chart house, because uh, we looked there. Now, Captain, you may not like to answer Mike's questions, but I think you'd better answer mine. Where is that certificate? Here in the drawer. I haven't had time to put it up yet. I only took over this ship yesterday. Oh, only yesterday, huh? Yes. I answered an ad in the paper. man wanted a navigator to be captain of his private yacht. I got the job. What about the crew? Only need three. I'll pick them up in San Francisco tomorrow. What about your quartermaster? Is he a new man, too? Yes, I hired him yesterday. Ahoy there, North Star! Throw us a line! Here you are, Sergeant! Who have you got there, Sergeant? The ship's carpenter named Wilkinson. What about the owner, Carter? Couldn't you find him? No, he's down in South America. Been there for three months. What's that? I said the owner of the North Star's been in South America for the past three months. But that's impossible. I spoke to him a couple of days ago when he hired me. Ah. That's what Carter's secretary says, and he ought to know. I brought him along in case you wanted to ask any questions. Mm -hmm. Who else is that in the police launch? Well, the woman is Mrs. Carter. Oh, has she heard from her husband lately? No, not for three weeks. Mike. Yes, Angel. You and I have the same idea. I'm beginning to have the same feeling, kid. Well, let's have the secretary up first and have him look at the body. What's his name? Jackson. Mr. Jackson, will you come up the ladder, please? I wonder... Yeah, Mike? I wonder if the ship's carpenter is one of the old crew or a new man... Did you know he's be one of the old crew? I didn't hire him. You want me, Sergeant? Uh, yes. This is Inspector of Homicide. How do you do? Mike Shane. Hello. Miss Knight. How do you do? I wonder if you'd come over this way, Mr. Jackson, to the engine room hatch. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, but... Uh, uh, that's... That's... Mr. Carter? Yes, that's Mr. Carter. Hmm. Inspector. Yes, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion. Sure. I think we should take the body back to San Francisco. Yes? Then we should take everybody, and I mean everybody, to police headquarters. Sit down, Mr. Ride. You're carpenter on the North Star. Yes, sir. Tell me, how long since you were aboard? Well, nigh three months, sir. Not since Mr. Carter left. Is that right? That's right, miss. Mm-hmm. Now, take a look at this reefer jacket. Hey. Hey, that's mine, sir. I left it in my bunk. And these pants? Mine, too. But there wasn't no red lead on them when I laid them on the bunk. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Carter say anything to you about redecorating or repairing the paneling in the staterooms? 
I guess not to me he didn't. And uh, you think he would have, if that's what he wanted done? Oh, I think so. But uh, Mr. Carter was always one to be full of surprises. He could have done it without saying anything to me. You don't know of any reason why anyone should want to kill him? Not me, sir. I didn't know anything about his private life. Only as the owner of the North Star. Did he and his wife use the North Star much? Oh, yes, quite a bit. Sailed a couple of times to a wire with her. Lots of trips to Vancouver, B.C. He was in the shipping business, you know. Yeah. Well, Mike, unless you have any more questions... Oh, yes, just one. Where was the North Star anchored the last time you were aboard? She was tied up at her own jetty. Three miles northeast of Olium. Oh, so she's been moved in the past three months. Yes, miss. Out into the middle of the bay and about uh, three miles south. Uh-huh, I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Wright. The sergeant will show you out. And bring in Mrs. Carter, sergeant. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mrs. Carter. I know this has been quite an ordeal. You identified your husband? Yes. We suspect murder, Mrs. Carter. Have you any reason to suspect anyone? Oh, no, my husband hasn't... hadn't an enemy in the world that I know of. You thought he was still in South America? Well, yes, although I haven't had a letter for a month. I, I used to hear from him regularly every week. I suppose you inherit your husband's property, Mrs. Carter? I suppose I do. Half of it is mine anyway. I inherited it from my mother. Did, um... Did your husband say anything about repairing or redecorating the paneling in the salons? No. But that reminds me of something. Yes, Mrs. Carter? Well, I heard Mr. Jackson talking to someone on the phone the other day about paneling. I didn't know what he was talking about, but then I paid very little attention to my husband's business. I see. And you can't help us anymore? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid not. If I think of anything, I'll call you, Inspector. Thank you. The sergeant will show you out. Bring in the captain, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, we may be out to call on you, Mrs. Carter. It might be necessary to search your husband's papers. Certainly, Mr. Shane. Sit down, Captain. Thanks. I take it that if you only took over command of the ship yesterday, you haven't given any orders? No, I spent yesterday and today checking supplies, looking over the ship's gear. You knew nothing about uh, the replacing of the salon paneling? Oh, yes, yes. The man I thought was the owner told me he was having it replaced and the workman already knew what to do. And this man that you thought was the owner, what did he look like? I don't know. I never saw him. But you said you spoke to him when he hired you. I spoke to him on the phone. Aha. Now we get somewhere. What was his phone number? I don't know. He called me. I wrote him an answer to his advertisement and put my phone number in the letter. Called me on the phone and told me to report aboard yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's all you know? That's all I know. I saw the ad, answered it, and he told me the berth was mine. I came aboard and that's that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I guess you'd better get back aboard ship. I'll wait for the quartermaster. I'm sure he doesn't know any more than I do. As you wish, Captain. You're quite certain that the quartermaster doesn't know anything. How can he? I picked him up on the waterfront this afternoon. He's only been aboard a few hours. I see. All right, Sergeant. We'll see Mr. Jackson next. Uh, Just a second, Inspector. Yes, Mike. I think maybe we ought to take a trip out to Mr. Carter's home before we talk to Jackson. All right, Mike. Keep Jackson and the quartermaster till we get back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Get out into the corridor and see if the captain and Jackson or the quartermaster get to talking. Right, Inspector. Atta boy, Inspector. Uh, are you serious about going out to Carter's place? Well, yes, honey, why? Well, I've been following your advice, Mike. Yes, Angel? I've been listening to the tone of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the captain is lying. Or at least not telling the whole truth. Why, Phil? Well, he said he hadn't given any orders since he went aboard. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd been checking stores and looking over the ship's gear, but... Well, then who painted the stanchions with red lead? The captain? Those stanchions were still damp. Well, it takes red lead quite a time to dry, but Angel... Angel, I think you have something there. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know quite what it is, but you have something. Thanks, Mrs. Carter, for waiting up for us. Oh, not at all. Naturally, I'm anxious to do anything I can to help find my husband's murderer. Hmm? I'm afraid I, I hardly realize he's dead. 
Yes, there isn't much we can say, Mrs. Carter, except that we'll get his murderer if anybody can. This is... this was my husband's office, his home office. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson always worked here when my husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd better check the desk first. Bill, you take this drawer, Inspector. I, I don't know about shipping schedules. Well, Say, Mike. Yeah? Phil, mm -hmm. what is it? Here's the North Star's clearance to leave her jetty on the... an anchor in the bay. Dated the 26th of last month. Well, it might mean something. We'll, uh, we'll remember that. Hey, what have you got there, Mike? Well, something not quite on the up and up, I think. In the fireplace there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Burned envelopes and letters. Here, Inspector. Yeah. Here, if that isn't part of a Panama stamp... Panama? Then I don't... That's where my husband was when I last heard from him. Well, this was mail the 21st. Airmail. The last I received was the 18th. Mail the 21st, and the North Star changed her moorings on the 26th. Yes, Angel, yes. Just time to receive this letter and change the ship's moorings. Does that mean something? It uh, depends, Mrs. Carter. It depends. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? I think we should pay a visit to the North Star's jetty, three miles northeast of Olium, as I remember it. <laughs> Rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who may have tuned in late, we are repeating the announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries have been shifted to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, depending on your locality, you'll be able to buy a powerful new 76 gasoline that beats all pre-war performance. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are delivering it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil man hasn't received his first shipment of this sensational new 76 gasoline, he will within the next two weeks. Just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new post-war 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. <laughs> Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are facing one of their most baffling mysteries. A murder with apparently no motive and no clues. We pick them up at the jetty, where the North Star is usually tied up. Well, there's not a thing that I can see. Bare jetty. Odds and ends of rope, freshly painted staunch. Yes, everything connected with the North Star seems to lead to staunch. What, what is it, Mike? Look, look, a piece of red glass. Looks like part of a ship's lantern. Port lantern. A natural deduction, Inspector, since we're on a jetty. But look again. Then look at the railing here. Hmm? A long scratch with paint rubbed into it. Yeah. A scratch made by an automobile bumper and rear fender. Yes. When the car was backed up to turn around, whoever was driving scuffed along the rail and broke this tail lamp glass. Sergeant. Uh, yeah, Mike. Check with Mrs. Carter's car, Jackson's car, and uh, the captain's if he has one. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. But uh, first get hold of Chips. Chips? Uh, the ship's carpenter, Mr. Wright. Oh. Get hold of him and tell him to meet us aboard the North Star as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then? And then? Then bring everybody back out to the ship, but not before you've checked all the automobiles. Yeah, Mike. And what's our move, Mike? Back aboard the North Star and lay a trap for a murderer. <laughs> Constant creaking of the ship gets me. I think we're in luck. I don't believe the captain or the quartermaster are back on the boat. No, my captain said he was going to wait for the quartermaster, so they're both back at headquarters. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. What are you looking for, Mike? I don't know. But I'm giving these port stanchions the once over. Say. What? You see that dark stain on the deck? Yeah. Sure. What about it? You know what made that? No. Do you? No, but I'll make a good guess. Fresh water. Fresh water? Yes. Deck should always be washed down with salt water. It leaves them white and sparkling. Fresh water makes them dark. Yeah, but even so much. Shh, shh, shh. I hope this is Chips, our ship's carpenter. Oh, there! Oh, Scott! Yeah. 
Here's the line. Tie up and come aboard. All right. All right, All right mate. Well, what can I do for you? Uh, Tommy, what will dissolve red lead? Red lead? Why, oil will if it ain't too old. And you've got to scrape it. Uh, take a look at the stanching. Oh, wipe that off in no time. You've got oil aboard? Sure thing. Okay, let's get going. All right, sir. Now, now for a quick look at the salon. You know, this was a pretty cleverly conceived murder. If that body hadn't been found for a week or two, there would have been no trace of this murder at all. There isn't much trace even now, Mike. Uh, not enough for your district attorney or grand jury, but enough for me. And I think we can trap the murderer without too much difficulty. Well, this is the salon in here. Oh, oh what a beautiful place. Yes. Doesn't seem to me that the paneling needs redecorating. Uh-uh. But I tell you what it does look like, Mike. Yeah? Looks as if the paneling had been torn out in the search for something. The ship's safe, perhaps? Mm. Could be, or something hidden behind the paddling. There goes Chips. <sighs> Why do you call him Chips? His name is Wright. All ship's carpenters are called Chips. At least in the books I read. Well, here we are. I found these rags in the captain's cabin. Good. Look like they've been used for the same job before. Let me see those. Hmm. Blood? I think so. Here, use this one. All right, sir. This is going to make a mess of the deck, though. Uh, that's all right. All right. Do, do I hear a boat coming? Yeah, I hear it too, Phil. Hurry, Chips, hurry. Get some more of that red lead off. All right, sir, I'm going like the roaring 40s I am. Ah, that's the stuff. You got it down to the old paint there in spots. He was right off when it's still soft this way. Ahoy, the star! Tie up and come aboard, Sergeant. Bring everybody aboard with you. I think this ought to do it. Well, now I want to. Here, I make sense. Hey, 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 what's going on there? You'll ruin that deck. I think this deck's already been ruined, Captain. But let that go for a moment. The uh, inspector had you all brought out here to see what we were doing. Yeah, what are you doing? We're taking off the last few layers of red lead that somebody put on this stanchion. Now, would you know who did it? You did it, Captain? You've been aboard two days and this red lead was still soft and wet. Could it have been put on without your knowing about it? Red lead often takes a week to dry. That stanchion hasn't been painted since I came aboard. That stanchion is the clue to this killing. What do you mean? Mr. Carter was killed aboard his own ship. Oh, Mr. He was probably hit on the head with a marlin spike, but that's beside the point. The main point is that while his killers were changing his clothes, putting the ship's carpenter's clothes on him, he bled quite a bit. Some blood was spattered on the deck. The killers tried to clean that with fresh water. Yeah. Then they were afraid that some of his blood was on the freshly painted stanchion. So after they'd thrown his body overboard, they repainted the stanchion. But not before they got a smear of red lead on the pants leg as they heaved him overboard. Oh, but who would do such a thing? My husband... The captain, for one, Mrs. Carter, and I think the sergeant has the answer to the other. Right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mike, we found the car. The car? What car? Yes, Captain, the car which was used to take Mr. Carter out to the jetty while the North Star was still tied up there. That car has a broken taillight and a badly scraped fender. And it is where, Sergeant? In Mr. Jackson's garage. Jackson, you fool, I told you... Shut up, you idiot. Cut out the arguing. You'll need all the arguments you can scrape together when you face the jury. Okay, Sergeant, you can handle them. good. Nearly six in the morning and I'm hungry. You know, I was afraid that the inspector wasn't going to get a confession from those two, the captain and Jackson. They were tough monkeys. Oh, not so tough, really. They had just spent so much time plotting and carrying out this murder that they, they couldn't realize they were trapped. Oh, such a senseless murder, too, Mike. All murders are senseless, honey. But I don't think they started out with the idea of murder in mind. As I see it, the secretary of Jackson had uh, made several trips on the North Star. He knew that wherever they went, Mr. Carter always had plenty of ready cash. Mm. He just got the idea in the back of his head that the money was hidden somewhere on board. He didn't know where, but uh, when Carter went to Central and South America, he determined to make a haul. Mm. So when the crew was on vacation, he got together with this man who called himself the captain. They started taking the salon apart, huh? Right, Angel, right. Jackson needed someone who knew something about ships. And then when he saw from the mail that Carter was coming home, he, he got panicky and destroyed the letters to Mrs. Carter? Mm-hmm. He met the unsuspecting Carter when he arrived, took him out to the jetty where the North Star was birthed, set out into the middle of the bay and killed him. Ah, oh, dressing him in the carpenter's clothes so if he were found, nobody could identify him. Mm-hmm. I see. Have some more coffee, Mike? Sure thing, Angel. How's the shoulder after the night's excitement? Oh, pretty good, but... I still think you'll have to come over for a few nights and fix dinner for me. I will not. 
You can eat out if you're too lazy to fix your own dinner. You know, I've been thinking, Mike. Yes, Angel? Wouldn't it be nice to have a yacht like the North Star and go any place, any time you wanted to? Oh, I don't know. Look what happened to Mrs. Carter. She lost her husband on account of the North Star. <laughs> of course, darling. I don't have a husband. Well, don't give up hope, Angel. Now, if you were to fix my dinners for the next few weeks... Mike, Shane, I believe that's all you think about in a wife, a good cook. Oh, no, Angel, not quite. But uh, being a good cook is a good recommendation. <laughs> Before we sign off, I'd like to repeat the special announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. As fast as Union Oil Company's trucks can haul it, a powerful new 76 gasoline is being delivered to your Minuteman stations. Watch for the signs to go up at all Union Oil stations announcing the first shipment of the new 76 gasoline. Then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of powerful post-war gasoline, soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Written and produced by David Taylor, tonight's story was based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Calling all detectives. Most people consider golf a reasonably mild pastime. But I once had a case where a game of golf killed one person and convicted a second. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. There's one thing I, Jerry Browning, private detective, am sure about. You can't play with the idea of murder. It's a losing game. Hank Foster and I were on the practice green at Swanky Silver Oaks Country Club... Waiting our turn at the number one tee. Sorry we have to wait, Jerry. Big turnout today. There was a rumpus going on at the number one tee. Hank scowled. That's R.J. Walker kicking up a fuss again. Every club has one old crab like that. R.J. Walker was a genuine business tycoon. And I don't get to see people like that close up very often. I strolled over to the tee just as... I won't have this caddy. He's stupid, lazy, and steals golf balls. The caddy was a nice-looking youngster. At the moment, mad, clean through. He flung Walker's golf bag on the ground and stalked off. Walker fumed some more, but just then, Hank came up to me. Come on, Jerry. The caddy master's signaling. Let's tee off. (coughs) Right from the start, I played poorly. I was pressing. And the harder I tried, the wilder I got. Finally, on the 13th hole, (coughs) I hit a screaming slice far into the rough. Both the caddy and I prowled the thick undergrowth in the rough. We didn't locate the ball. But we did find the lifeless body of R.J. Walker. Invited to play golf at a swanky country club, I hit a ball into the rough and found the body of wealthy, cantankerous R.J. Walker. Back at the clubhouse, a doctor diagnosed the death as instantaneous and resulting from a sudden severe blow in the head. In my opinion, Mr. Walker was hit by a golf ball. My friend Hank looked at me. So did my caddy. I knew what they were thinking. That it was the ball I hit into the rough that killed Walker. Well, maybe it was. I walked over to the body. Took a good look at it. 
Hey, doctor, come over a second. Look at these skin abrasions and the depth of the wound. If Walker was killed by a golf ball, it must have been shot from a cannon to hit with such force. In my opinion, this was no accident. It was murder. I walked outside and almost ran into the caddy master. He was arguing with a tall man who had a golf bag slung over his shoulder. I'm very sorry, sir, but this is a private club. When the Greens chairman reported that you didn't appear to be sponsored, it was my duty to question you. Well, I tell you, I'm the guest of R.J. Walker. If you'll call him, he'll identify me. Isn't he likely to do that, sir? Who is your name? And why didn't Mr. Walker sign you in on the guest book? A tall man set down his golf bag, mopped his brow. This is ridiculous. I'm Roger Powell. I'm in the same business as Mr. Walker, cotton milling. He invited me here to discuss a possible merger of our companies. I joined him at the 11th tee. We played two holes. Then I lost my ball and got separated from him. If you ask him, I know he'll confirm it. The caddy master looked unhappy. I'm sorry, sir, but Mr. Walker is dead. An accident. Powell looked stunned. Then, without another word, picked up his golf bag and slowly walked away. I watched him go. Something about the man puzzled me. The story he'd told was straight enough, but... Some obscure mental impulse kept nudging me, warning of a false note. And then suddenly I had it. I found my friend Hank Foster in the clubhouse. Hank, do you know a man named Roger Powell? My father knows him. Why? He's outside, getting ready to leave. We've got to stop him, get him into a game of golf with us. Don't ask questions, just hurry. Hurry. We caught up with Powell just as he was about to step into his car. His golf bag was propped against the fender, and I pretended to trip over it. Powell dived for the bag, recovered it, and stood glaring at me. Well, I'm very sorry, sir. Entirely my fault. Powell nodded curtly and started to get into the car again when Hank stepped up. Aren't you Roger Powell? Powell turned. Well, yes, I am. Why? Well, I'm Hank Foster. My father does a lot of business with your company. Powell gave him a frosty smile. I put my hand on the car door, held it closed. Hank and I heard about your discussion with the caddy master, Mr. Powell. We don't want you to think that folks at Silver Oaks are rude to guests. In fact, we'd like you to play a round of golf with us. Powell obviously didn't want to do it, but Hank, taking his cue from me, was insistent. Finally, well, I don't have time for a full round, but if you insist, I'll play a couple of holes. I let off, hit one straight and clean down the fairway now that I wasn't interested in how well I played. Then Powell teed up, with his bag still swinging from his shoulder. That was strange enough, but when he pulled a number five iron out of the bag... Mr. Powell, you don't really drive with that, do you? Powell was badly flustered. I, uh, I always thought I'd like to try driving with an, uh, this kind of a club. Hank didn't get it. And with a bag over your shoulder? Powell shook his head, took a wild swing at the ball, and didn't even hit the ground. That's when I stepped up. It's no use, Powell. You can't bluff it. You may as well admit you've never played golf before. I think I'd better see what you've got in that golf bag. He put up a fight, but he didn't have a chance. While Hank held him, I looked through the bag and found the murder weapon. An iron club with a steel ball approximately the size of a golf ball attached to the end of it. He confessed after that tough old R.J. Walker had been ruining him. So Powell eliminated the competition. The hard way. After we turned him over to the police, Hank and I finished our game. I was playing rotten again. <clears throat> now that it counted. Hank watched my hook go into a sand trap, shook his head. You sure are a terrible player, Jerry. Is that why you suspected Powell couldn't play at all? I smiled, shook my head. Nope. He was wearing ordinary street shoes with a pointed toe. And I figured no golf player, not even the worst duffer, would appear on a course in shoes like that. And that's all there was to it. Aside from the fact that Hank beat me on every hole. Like I said, a lot of people play with the idea of murder. But those who carry it out are generally left holding the bag. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz. 
and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Calling all detectives. Some people have strange ideas of protection. I once had a case that involved a thief being set to catch a thief. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. A private detective like me, Jerry Browning, never believes in old sayings. As for instance, set a thief to catch a thief. Stop it, Browning! Turn that thing off! I yanked at some wires and stopped the awful racket. What set it off that time, Browning? Well, Mr. Lerner, this super special burglar alarm is awfully sensitive. Dust spots in front of the photoelectric eye must have tripped the alarm. Lerner's mouth tightened into an angry line. Well, get it out of here. I won't have anything in my house. I groaned. Oh, but Mr. Lerner, now that you own the Blue Wonder, you've got to protect it. A diamond like that, 22 carats, every crook in the country is drooling at the thought of it right this minute. Lerner smiled. I'm a simple man, Browning. Made three million dollars with one simple rule. Buy cheap, sell dear. I live by rules. Early to bed, early to rise. A stitch in time saves nine. No a hundred of them. That's fine, Mr. Lerner. But what's it got to do with protecting the blue wonder? There's a maxim to cover every situation. In this case, it's set a thief to catch a thief. You're joking. Browning, nobody with three million dollars ever jokes. Go out, find me a clever jewel thief. I'll pay him enough to be honest and to protect me from other thieves. I walked to the door, shook my head. Okay, Mr. Lerner, have it your way. But don't forget another famous saying. Experience is a dear school, but fools will learn in no other. An eccentric millionaire wanted to hire a thief to protect him from other thieves. Well, an assignment is an assignment. I found the man I was looking for, Velvet Joe Acton, at a waterfront bar. I walked up to him, put my hand on his shoulder. It's a lie! I didn't do it! I got a nail to buy! Velvet turned around and gave me a sick smile. Honest, Jerry! <laughs> Whatever it is, I ain't guilty! Relax, Velvet. How would you like to make an honest buck guarding the Blue Wonder? Uh, sure. I mean, sure! All the way back to Lerner's house, Velvet kept assuring me that he was getting old and slowing down, that he'd thought of going straight several times. Okay, Velvet, and don't forget, I'll be around, too. After a long cross-examination of Velvet, Mr. Lerner appeared satisfied that I'd picked the right man. He led the way to a safe. And let us see the blue wonder in all its blazing beauty. While Velvet and I were examining it, Lerner strolled over to a table that held a white crystal vase filled with flowers. He picked a tiny rosebud, put it in his lapel, then faced us again. That will be all, Burning. Velvet will stay here as custodian of the blue wonder. I was paid for such work as I'd done and gave the thing no further thought for about a week. But I got a phone call from Velvet. Mr. Lerner, it seemed, was at that moment entertaining a guest who said he wanted to buy the Blue Wonder, and who Velvet thought he recognized as Pierre Souton, an international jewel thief. Okay, Velvet, don't let this character leave until I get there. I parked my car, went on upstairs, opened the door, and found Velvet holding a gun on both Lerner and his guest. Why am I glad you got here, Jerry? The blue wand is gone. And it's a cinch one of them two has it, because I haven't. I walked up, took the gun from Velvet. Both Lerner and his guest relaxed. Browning, I was a fool to hire this man. You were right. He's a thief and always will be. How do you like that? And me straight for a whole week. The one I was interested in was the guest, a dapper little man with a waxed, pointed mustache. Uh, I suggest, monsieur, that you search us all. In fact, I insist to end the suspicion. I gave him a cold stare. 
Mister, maybe you've been searched before, but not the way you'll be this time. And that goes for you, Velvet. And you too, Mr. Lerner. I searched all three, found nothing. Nobody had been out of the room since the Blue Wonder disappeared. So I searched the room. Nothing again. The Blue Wonder had simply vanished. Uh, no, monsieur. Uh, since it is evident I have not Mr. Lerner's jewel, I must insist you permit me to leave. Jerry, I tell you, the guy's a crook. Don't let him go. I grinned. He can go, Velvet. He hasn't got the blue under. In fact, we'll all go and lock up this room. In the morning, I'll get an electronic carbon-sensitive detector graph from the police lab, and we'll find the diamond. That calmed Lerner, which pretty well convinced me that he hadn't stolen his own diamond for its insurance value. I locked the windows and took the key to the library door. Locked that. You go on up to bed, Mr. Lerner. I'll take Velvet and this gentleman downtown. As soon as I dropped my passengers, I turned the car around and headed back to Lerner's place as fast as I could. I had plenty of reason for hurrying. That stuff about an electronic carbon detector was strictly comic book stuff that existed only in my imagination. I was sure the blue diamond was still in Lerner's library, and that whoever had hidden it would be back for it. It isn't exactly housebreaking when you pry up a basement window in your own client's house for the purpose of protecting him. I got to the library, unlocked, and then locked the door behind me, went in, sat down, played my flashlight cautiously around. The blue wonder was in here. Not in any ordinary hiding place. If there was an electronic carbon detector graph in my brain, now was the time for it to start working. Hours later, I was sitting in an easy chair in the corner of the dark room when I heard the window being forced. The intruder went straight for a white crystal flower vase. No use fishing that water. The blue wonder isn't there anymore, Pierre. He took a shot at where he thought I was, and after that, he belonged to me. He'd palmed the blue wonder, and then hid it in the perfect place, in a crystal vase of water. Diamonds are invisible in water. If you don't think so, try it. But be sure you try it with your own diamonds, because these days, that's the first place a smart detective will look. Well, learners sold the blue wonder. Having it around made him jumpy after that experience, but he's still got velvet working for him. As a personal companion. Like I said, when you're on the lookout for stolen jewels, sometimes you even uncover a diamond in the rough. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Calling All Detectives. When burglar-proof safes open as easily as sardine tins, then it's time to start looking for a new kind of master criminal. That is the problem on this page from my casebook, the casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. Any private detective like me, Jerry Browning, loves tricky crimes. Because the trickier they are, the easier it is to find out their pattern. Charles Conrad, president of the Conrad Tool and Dye Works, was a very unhappy man. Browning, a bundle of valuable blueprints have disappeared from my safe, $2,000 in cash, and all my personal securities. I glanced at the open safe behind him. It was not only open, but empty. Cleaned out, Mr. Browning. Absolutely cleaned out. I took another look at the safe. It was a new, modern-looking job. How was the safe forced? It wasn't. A safe expert was over here this morning. Claims the safe hasn't been tampered with in any way. Okay. Then who besides you knows the combination? My secretary, Peter Bowen, and my controller, George Randolph. Both have worked with me for years. I'll stake my life on their honesty. That's fine. But I think I'd better check on both of them. I didn't have a chance to check on anybody, because when I returned to my office, I found a stout and highly excited gentleman waiting for me. I am Kurt van Orten, president of Europa Import Associates. Fifty thousand dollars and a packet of unset diamonds have been stolen from a locked safe in my office. 
I told Van Orton to sit down for a moment, called my message-taking service, and learned that I was wanted urgently at the McGowan Elwood Trucking Company. Yeah. Their burglar-proof safe had just been burglarized. Within a couple of hours, I was offered three cases involving thefts from company safes in various parts of the city. I stood by as the expert tested the Van Orton safe. Uh, in your opinion, Mr. Wilson, how was this safe opened? Wilson shrugged. Mr. Anybody can open a safe if he knows the combination. Hey, here you are, Mr. Van Orton. I changed the combination, and this time, keep it to yourself. Van Orton looked helplessly at the paper in his hand. Browning, I trust my associates. Our business is built on trust and honor. At this point, I, I don't know what to do. I've got two other cases like this, Mr. Van Orton. I suggest you do nothing until you hear from me. One of my good friends is an ex-burglar who now runs a restaurant called Louis Hamburger Heaven. That's where I went. And as soon as Louis had a free moment, Louis, I think maybe you can help me. Why should, Jerry? Any time, any place. Can I try a new specialty of the house, peanut burger? Uh, not right now, thanks. Louis, who's the best safe cracker in town? Well, that's easy. Tumblers or Rook. The way he handles the acetylene torch or a bottle of soup, he can crack a crib in nine minutes. Make a hole no bigger than your fist. Well, you can't hit a bang half a block away. I grinned. You mean tumblers is the best there is, but even he works with a torch and nitroglycerin? Can he figure out a combination? Louis curled his lip. Maybe he could, if you give him three, four days. But why bother when he can blow it open in nine minutes? Jerry, in the safe cracking business, time is very important. Louis, I see what you mean. At the McGowan Elwood Trucking Company, the third outfit whose safe had been burglarized, I found the company treasurer, Malcolm Thurston, in a state bordering on collapse. Mr. Browning, I'm the only employee with the combination to the safe. Mr. Browning, everybody thinks I'm a thief. I finally got the old man calmed down. Look, Mr. Thurston, there's been a series of robberies identical with this one. Don't worry about it. I'll prove you're not a thief. My problem was reasonably obvious. To find some connecting link among three safe robberies at the offices of companies that had no relationship with one another, which meant that they had no employees in common. Well, maybe they had something else. Our safe, Mr. Browning, was made by the Atlas Safe Company. The safe, sir? It is an, uh, a child on temper proof. Our safe, Mr. Browning, is the Caldwell Multilock. Well, that wasn't much help. Three companies, three different makes of safe. Just the same, I was sure those safes had something in common that some smart crook had figured out. At the Atlas Safe Company, I talked with its manager, a Mr. Harris. Browning, there's no such thing as a burglar-proof safe. Any safe can be opened by force, given the proper tools and enough time. Yeah, I found that out, Mr. Harris, from another source. Now, could somebody develop a super-sensitive instrument, maybe electronic, so that he could hear the tumblers drop? Harris grinned. Sure, maybe somebody could. Except that we don't use tumblers in our safe, so there wouldn't be anything to hear. Oh. Well, uh, suppose something goes wrong, safe gets out of whack or combination loss. What do you do then? What any other company does, we call it an expert. Most of the time he has to open the safe by drilling it. But then he has plenty of time and nothing to worry about. Mr. Harris... You're wrong. I think he's got a lot to worry about. I got to the little office of T.J. Wilson, safe expert, just as he was starting out on a job. Just a minute, Mr. Wilson, I want to ask you one question. Did you service the safes for the Conrad Tool and Tie Works, the Europa Import, and the McGowan Elwood Trucking Company, all three of them? Wilson smiled. Yeah, I did. I can't stop to talk to you because I'm just leaving town and this says you won't stop me. This was a revolver pointing straight at me. I wouldn't dream of stopping you, Mr. Wilson, but I can't answer for that cop climbing through your window. 
He turned around. You'd be surprised how many of them do, and that's the last thing they remember. Sure. We found all the loot from his three robberies. And one other that hadn't been reported, because two partners suspected each other. Wilson worked on safes all over town. And months after he got an order to service one or change its combination, he came back and calmly cleaned it out. His mistake was bunching a group for a final haul and getaway. Like I said, when crimes have a pattern and you hit the right combination, then it's an open and shut case. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives, Mystery Drama, Mystery Quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Calling All Detectives. When a sidewalk pitchman gives away free samples and their genuine diamond rings... Then it's time to start asking questions. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. A private detective like me, Jerry Browning, has to be a super salesman. Because all he has to peddle is his knowledge of human nature. The pitchman working on the corner of Elm and Vine Streets was doing a land office business. Here it is, folks, the most amazing, the most remarkable item you ever saw. Practically given away. This is our way of advertising. Take a look at this, folks. You say it's a cigarette lighter, and right you are. A twill, a whale, she never misses. But you haven't seen anything yet. Now watch. He blew out the flame, twisted the bottom of the metal cylinder. And now it's a ballpoint pen. Only one dollar, folks. Who'll be the first? The pitchman was doing fine business, but he didn't look happy. While he chatted away, his eyes darted from side to side, always watchful and wary. Oh, well, watching out for cops is an occupational hazard of sidewalk salesmen. No cops showed up, but about a minute later, a mousy-looking little man joined the crowd. The pitchman spotted him. This is our way of advertising. Free samples to every 50th customer. And for you, my friend, this genuine imitation diamond bracelet. From his suitcase, the pitchman pulled a flashy bracelet, tossed it to the latecomer, who grabbed it, put down a dollar, bought one of the combination lighter pens, and disappeared. About five minutes and six sales later, the pitchman repeated his giveaway stunt. This time... A 14-carat simulated almost genuine diamond ring. The man who got the ring looked vaguely familiar to me. I followed him as he edged away from the crowd. He glanced over his shoulder, saw me, and started to run. I grabbed him at the next corner. <laughs> well, well, if it isn't Hot Eyes Harry. Hand over the ring, Harry. I want to see the kind of samples pitchmen give away these days. I took the ring, examined it. It was a six-carat marquee-cut diamond in a platinum setting, worth at least $10,000. A street corner pitchman had a new angle. He gave away genuine diamond bracelets and rings with $1 cigarette lighters. The pitchman had disappeared. But my prisoner, Hot Eyes Harry, was perfectly willing to go to police headquarters after I put the cuffs on him. And when we questioned Harry... Do keys the pitchman glums the stuff, Steve. The, then he passes it along one piece at a time to guys like me, and uh, we peddle it in taverns, uh, take ads in the paper. Nobody suspects a pitchman. It's a perfect setup. Except I got caught. What do you meet, Duke, to give him his share of the money? In a junk, the Green Lantern on 18th Street. The Green Lantern was noisy and disreputable. A place where you can get a drink of liquor, a bang over the head, and your pockets picked all for 35 cents. The bartender was a massive 250-pounder who could have made a better living as a Hollywood villain. Listen, bub, this is the fourth time you come nosing in here. But what are you looking besides a smack in the teeth? Who around here is big enough to do it? The bartender put his hands in his apron pocket. Bub, I'm a peaceful man. I don't like trouble. It makes me sad. He took his hands out of his pocket. There was a bung starter clenched in his right fist. I ducked the wrong way. <laughs> uh. 
When I came to, I was sprawled in the gutter, outside the green lantern. I staggered to my feet, wobbled down the block. Oh, well, I've, I've lost many a first round. I fumbled through my pockets. Sure enough, the twenty dollars I'd had there was gone. But somebody had thoughtfully put in a dime for car fare. I went on back to my office, got my wallet and credentials out of the desk drawer where I'd left them. There was also a revolver and blackjack in the drawer. I looked at them thoughtfully. Finally decided this was a blackjack-type job, took that and left the revolver. Fat boy, the bartender, spotted me as soon as I came into the joint again. Well, well, Punchy is back for more. Come here, sweetheart, let me slug you again. The bartender came around the bar as I approached. He turned for a moment to his silent customers. He loves this. I didn't say anything. I just swung the blackjack and cracked him lightly across the bridge of his nose. He let out a bellow and went down to his knees. I swung the blackjack again. They crashed forward like a pole-axed steer. I glanced around. Show's over, folks. The bar's closed. Everybody out. About ten minutes later, the bartender struggled to his knees. I'll, I'll kill you for this. Sure you will, but not now. When he came to the second time, I dragged him off the floor, flung him into a chair. What are you going to do to me? I grinned at him. I'm going to beat your fat head in, an inch at a time. I dangled the blackjack from my fingers. Where's Duke? The bartender leered at me. You'll never know. Okay. I got time. I swung the blackjack in a wide arc, but before it landed... Wait! He, he's hiding out. Uh, 67 Forest Street, third floor. Uh, don't hit me again. You mean you don't love it? Come on, let's go for a ride. I picked up a street corner cop, turned Fat Boy over to him, then went on to the Forest Street address. The place was a ratty tenement. I went on up to the third floor. There was only one door. I flattened myself against the wall, reached my hand around. The bullets ripped through the doors. They would have ripped through me if I was standing in front of it. A second later, the pitchman dashed off. Once more, I swung the blackjack. And after that, everything was nice and peaceful again. Yep. Fat boy, the bartender, had stalled me long enough for somebody to get word to Duke that I was coming. Then he gave me the address that was supposed to be a death trap. Except that I know a few things about human nature, too. As much, say, as a bartender with murder in his heart. Well, that broke up the jewel gang. I got a fine reward out of the deal. Not bad for a night's work. Like I said, no matter how tough a proposition may seem, it can generally work it out. If you've got the right pitch. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Murdered Detective. This program comes to you from the makers of Anison. You probably have occasion at times to take something for headaches, neuritis, or neuralgic pain. 
But if you've never taken anison, let me suggest that you do so, especially if you want incredibly fast and effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Your own dentist or physician may have given you an envelope containing anison tablets at one time or another. Thousands of people have come to know and prefer anison this way. So the next time you want prompt relief from the pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, try anison. See for yourself how incredibly fast and effective it is. Ask for anison at your neighborhood drug counter today. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Now for Mr. Keene and the case of the murdered detective. Our scene opens in the office which Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, shares with his friend and partner, Mike Clancy. Telephone is ringing at the moment, and as Mike picks up the receiver, he hears a familiar voice at the other end of the wire. Hello. Mr. Keene. Oh, this is his partner, Mike Clancy, speaking. Uh, Mike, this is Jim Ryan. Oh, Jim, my boy, and how are you? Fine, Mike. Would you put Mr. Keene on the wire, please? It's important. Sure. Just a second. Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike. It's Jim Ryan, the police force detective. He says it's important. Oh, all right. I'll take it. Hello? Mr. Keene? Yes, Jim? I'm calling from a phone booth in the Hotel Metropole. I'm working on a case, and I thought you might be able to help me out. That do anything I can, Jim. Do you remember a man named Martin Cook? Martin Cook? He's in the real estate business. He was called as a material witness in an embezzlement case two years ago. If I remember, you had something to do with breaking that case. Just a moment, Jim. I'll ask Mike Clancy to check through the files. I don't have much time, Mr. Keene. As a matter of fact, I've been trailing Cook for the past three hours. It... Uh, uh, Jim! Jim Ryan! Knife fight! I... Uh... Jim! What's the trouble, boss? Hotel Metropole, Mike, quickly. Something's happened to Jim Ryan. And I only hope we're not too late. <laughs> Here are the public telephone booths, Mike. The first one's empty, Mr. Keene. Let's see if the other one... Mike, help me open this door. Right, there's someone inside, crumpled up against the wall. Here, let's see if we can open this phone booth door. Mike. Saints preserve us. It's Jim Ryan. He's dead. He's got a knife in his back. Sure, he was one of my old friends in the police force. A better man never lived. I'd like to get my hands on the man. Easy, Mike. Let's keep our heads. We've got work to do. These phone booths are isolated from the rest of the hotel lobby. That's why it wasn't hard for Jim Ryan's killer to strike and get away. Step into the next phone booth, Mike, and put a call through to the police. I will, sir. I'll notify the hotel manager. Then I want to pay a visit to a man named Martin Cook. Martin Cook? Is he the man Jim Ryan was trailing, boss? Yes, Mike. Jim said he was in the real estate business, and I want to find him before he has a chance to plan a getaway. Here's the office, Mr. Keene. Martin Cook, real estate. Keep your gun where you can reach it quickly, Mike. I've got it handy, boss. May I help you? Is Mr. Cook in? Not at the moment. I'm his secretary, Miss Everett. Did you have an appointment with Mr. Cook? No. My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene? The famous investigator? Well, please sit down, sir. Mr. Cook should be here at any moment. Perhaps you'd better take a look in his office, Mike. Yes, sir. But I assure you that Mr. Cook isn't in, Mr. Keene. I don't doubt your word on that, Miss Everett. However, I'd like my partner to search his office for evidence. Evidence of what? Your employer, Mr. Cook, is under suspicion of murder. Murder? Is that his private office, miss? Yes. I'll, I'll show it to you, Mr. Clancy. I'll uh, wait out here, Mike, in case Mr. Cook arrives. Right, sir. This is Mr. Cook's private office, Mr. Clancy. Let's have a look through this desk. Mr. Clancy, who, who was murdered? 
Jim Ryan, a police detective. A man with a wife and three children dependent on him. Sure, and when we get our hands on the killer, he'll regret it. And I'll take these books and these business papers along with me. Miss Everett, whose picture is that on Martin Cook's desk? Mr. Cook's son, Arthur. Oh, he's got himself a family, has he? Only his son. His wife is dead, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Cook. Miss Everett. What's going on in here? This man is an associate of Mr. Keene's, the private investigator. I'll handle it if you don't mind, miss. You're Martin Cook? I am. Just a minute, mister. Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike. Martin Cook came into his office through another door. Oh. Did you uh, find anything? Well, I didn't have much of a chance to look around before he came in, boss. I grabbed these books and papers on general principles just to read them over. Mr. Cook? Yes, Miss Everett, will you leave us alone, please? If there's anything Just I... see that I'm not disturbed. Very well, Mr. Cook. Mr. Keene, if I recall correctly, we met for a few moments about two years ago. That's right, Mr. Cook. It was in regard to an embezzlement case. I remember you helped the district attorney gather evidence to break the case. You were very brave to testify, since your life had been threatened by gangsters. Have you come here to ask me for additional help, Mr. Keene? No. This time, I'm afraid, you're not an innocent witness testifying for the state. You may find yourself a defendant. In what way? Do you know a man named James Ryan? Is he a police detective? Yes. I believe I've heard the name. He's been murdered. <laughs> murdered? Oh, no. And at the time, he was making some kind of investigation of you, Mr. Cook. I see. Do you know what he was investigating? Jim Ryan was investigating a theft of charity funds, Mr. Keene. Funds I stole. I see. And what about his murder? You have no father to go to find your murderer. I killed that police detective. Sure, and he admits it, Mr. Keene. Just a moment, Mike. Mr. Cook, you say you killed Jim Ryan? Yes. When? What difference does it make? Well... What did you do with the gun? I, I threw it away in the river. Mr. Keene. I must warn you, Mr. Cook, that anything you say can be used against you. But you're under no obligation to talk at this point. Take me away. Put me in jail. I've admitted the crime, haven't I? What more do you want? All right, Mike. We'll drive down to headquarters of Mr. Cook and turn him over to the police. Then we'll continue with our investigation. What more is there to investigate? You've solved the crime, haven't you? Not quite, Mr. Cook. I have a feeling there's a great deal more to be discovered in spite of your so-called confession. Now I want to know who the person is you're trying to shield. No one. No one. I tell you, I did it. Turn me over to the police. Very well, Mr. Cook. Come along. But I mean to find out who you're trying to shield. Well, Mr. Keene, we've turned our self-confessed murderer, Martin Cook, over to the police. Where do we go from here, sir? To Cook's residence, Mike. I've looked it up in the phone book. Drive to Carroll Street. Yes, sir. Sure, and when he said he threw his gun away, I got the shock of my life. And I tricked him into that, Mike. As you know, Jim Ryan was stabbed to death with a knife. I suggested a gun, and Cook took the bait. But why do you think he did that, Mr. Keene? Confessed to a murder he didn't commit. As I told him, in my opinion, he's shielding someone. Well, I heard you tell that to Lieutenant Hale at police headquarters too, boss, but the lieutenant mentioned another angle to it. Yes, I know, and he may be right. Martin Cook may be a clever psychologist. He might be trying to get us to think he's protecting someone, just to make himself appear an innocent martyr. Cook could have actually committed the murder himself. But according to his account books, the money he collected from them charities is missing, boss. That's why Jim Ryan, the police detective, was trailing him. Yes, Mike, I know. Martin Cook may have stolen the money himself, or it may have been stolen by the person he's trying to shield. We're on our way to Martin Cook's house right now to check on that all-important fact. Yes? My name is Keene. This is Mr. Clancy. This is Mr. Martin Cook's house, isn't it? Yes. I'm Arthur Cook, his son. I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Arthur. Bad news? Has something happened to Dad? 
He's being held by the police on suspicion of murder. My father held for murder? May we come in, please? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, you just about knocked the wind out of me, Mr. Keene. Well, there must be some mistake. My father... He couldn't... admitted the murder, young fellow. Admitted it? But who, who was murdered? A police detective named Ryan was stabbed to death while trailing your father. Jim Ryan evidently had gotten information that your father was guilty of stealing certain charity funds that were entrusted to him. No, no, Dad couldn't have stolen that money. I... I don't believe it. But he's admitted that, too. I must get hold of a lawyer. I... Just a moment, Mr. Keene. Hello? Arthur, darling. I, I can't talk to you now, Lola. But, Arthur, what's the matter? I'll call you back. You think I'm going to sit around in my apartment all day just waiting for your call? Mr. Keene, where is my father being held? At police headquarters. I must go down to see him at once. Since we're working with the police, uh, you don't mind if we remain here and look the house over, do you? There's, well, there's nothing in this house that'll interest you, Mr. Keene. Well, I suppose you let me be the judge of that, Arthur. Oh, very well. Stay here if you like. I'm going to get in touch with our attorney and get my father out of this crazy mess. Sure, and he turned pale when you told him about his father being a murder suspect, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike, and his reaction to the theft of the charity funds was just as startling. And I wonder why. A murder charge is a lot more serious than the theft of money, and yet, uh... Hmm. Mike, there's a small book for telephone numbers on that side table. Would you hand it to me, please? Yes. Here. Here you are, sir. That uh, girl, Arthur Cook, just spoke to you on the phone. He called her Lola. Yes, there's a phone number and address in here for someone named Lola Slade. I think I'll call her. Look at this house, Mr. Keene. Well, it seems that a man who can afford an expensive place like this shouldn't be tempted into stealing money from charity cases. That's exactly what I was thinking, Mike. There's something strange about it. Hello? Is this Miss Lola Slade? Well? My name is Keene. I was wondering if I could see you about... I have nothing uh... to do with it. Keep away from me, dear. Here, keep away. Hello? Hello? Did Lola Slade hang up on your boss? Yes. After protesting her innocence about something I hadn't even accused her of. Mike, this case has a number of odd angles. We'll have to check every one before we're absolutely sure who murdered Detective Jim Ryan. I have a hunch, that in spite of Martin Cook's confession, the eventual solution will be an amazing one. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the murdered detective. Meanwhile, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath. Yes, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath that breeds between the teeth. Use Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action. Your dentist will tell you, brush your teeth after meals to stop decay. Clean those cracks and crevices deep between your teeth to guard against unpleasing breath. Now Kalinos gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath. What's more, foamy, refreshing colonos brightens teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Helps stop tooth decay. Get colonos toothpaste with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the murdered detective. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of Detective Jim Ryan of the police department, a friend of both Mr. Keene's and Mike's. Under suspicion for the killing is Martin Cook, who has confessed to the crime, although Mr. Keene believes he is trying to shield the real culprit. Now, Mike and Mr. Keene arrive at the apartment of Lola Slade, a friend of Martin Cook's son, Arthur. Mr. Keene suspects that she knows a great deal more about the crime than she admits to. And as Mike rings her doorbell... Hmm, no answer, Mr. Keene. Maybe Lola Slade doesn't want to answer, Mike. Open this door, I'll force the lock. What do you want? Are you Lola Slade? What about it? My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. 
I spoke to you on the phone a few minutes ago. Stay out of my apartment. Get your foot out of my door. Keep this door open, if you please, lady. Step inside, boss. I'll hold it open with my foot. You've got no right to come in here like this. I'm no criminal. A detective named Jim Ryan has been murdered, Lola. We're working with the police. We have a right to question all suspects. Suspects? I'm no suspect. But you seem to know a great deal about the case. You protested your innocence over the telephone even before you were accused. Well, I heard about the murder of that detective on a news broadcast a minute before you phoned, Mr. Keene. I knew that Martin Cook had been arrested, and I thought his son Arthur would be mixed up in it. But why should that frighten you, Lola? Well, I'm a showgirl, Mr. Keene. I sing for a living on the stage and in nightclubs. I have a reputation to consider. Mr. Keene. What is it, Mike? Take a look on that couch. Yes, I noticed that open suitcase. Evidently, Lola Slade was packing to leave the city. But I have an engagement to sing in Los Angeles. And that's just about as far away as you can get, eh? What do you mean, Mr. Clancy? Have you brought the police with you? Not yet, Lola. I'll answer that door for you, young lady. Mr. Clancy. Boss. Boss, it's Miss Everett, Mr. Cook's secretary. Oh, come in, Miss Everett. Is this Miss Lola Slade? Well, I thought I'd give you a chance to clear yourself before I turn this evidence over to the police. Evidence? What evidence? Are you crazy? Just what is it you found, Miss Everett? Mr. Keene, this letter came from Mr. Cook this afternoon. As his secretary, I opened all his business mail, and I read it. What does it say? It's from a credit company. It says that unless $8,000 worth of bills are paid by Monday, Mr. Cook's son, Arthur, will be brought into court. Hmm. Let me see that letter, please, Miss Everett. Here you are, Mr. Keene. Hmm. According to this letter, the items were charged and several bad checks were passed. Bad checks? That makes it a criminal offense, boss. That's right, Mike. The items include a fur coat and a woman's bracelet, both of which were sent to Miss Lola Slade. But I didn't know Arthur Cook stole the money when he bought me those things. Stole what money, Lola? Why, why the money that... You mean the stolen charity funds? Judging by your slip of the tongue, Arthur Cook must have told you that he stole that money from his father. Yes. It was only a few days ago. He came to me to borrow some money to pay those bills. But I didn't have any. Then he got the money somewhere else. When I heard the story of the stolen funds and the murder over the radio, I just naturally tied it up with Arthur. Mr. Cook was right about you, Lola Slade. He did his best to separate you from Arthur. You keep quiet, Helen Everett. You bled his son for all you could get out of him. I'll make you regret that. What? Down that fire poker, Lola. I'll put it down on her head. Not so fast. Give me that poker. Let go of me. You're all against me, every one of you. But I'm innocent. I swear I'm innocent. Uh, waving fire pokers around won't help your case any. When you recovered your composure, Lola, I suggest you tell the police what part you had in all this. You, you're going to arrest me, Mr. King? I have no evidence that you were involved in the murder of Detective Jim Ryan. At least, not yet. However, you may be involved in a theft before very long. Mr. Keene, I told you I didn't know why the cook stole that money from his father. Miss Everett, just how were the funds stolen? Do you happen to know? Yes, Mr. Keene. They were taken in cash from the safe. The safe in Martin Cook's office? Yes. Mr. Cook reported it as a burglary at first. Well, Detective Jim Ryan must have gotten suspicious, boss, and followed up the case, getting evidence that it was an inside job. I think so, too, Mike. Perhaps we'll have a look at Mr. Cook's safe and see if we can get any information from it. Lola, your attempt to attack Miss Everett is punishable by law. However, perhaps Miss Everett will forget it on the grounds of temperament and fear. I don't want to see her in jail, Mr. Keene. I'll accept an apology. I, I'm sorry, Miss Everett. I just didn't know what I was doing. I'm ready to go to the police, Mr. Keene, and tell them as much as I know. Very well. We'll escort you to headquarters and then proceed to Mr. Cook's office. And perhaps discover the final information we need as to who murdered Detective Jim Ryan. Come into the office, Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. Well, thank you, Miss Everett. Uh, first I'd like to examine Mr. Cook's safe. The safe is in Mr. Cook's private office. I locked the door when I left before. The key is in my desk here. 
Here it is. Oh, just a moment, Miss Everett. Sir? Uh, you don't mind if I smoke a cigar, do you? Why, of course not. I smoke myself, but not cigars. <laughs> you have a match, Mike? Uh, sure, boss. I have one. Wait a minute. Here's a packet of matches in the desk. May I have them, Miss Everett? Help yourself, Mr. Keene. Thank you. Now, uh, let's proceed to Mr. Cook's private office. That's odd. I know I locked the store when I left, but now it's open. Miss Everett, Mr. Keene. Arthur, what are you doing in your father's office? I, I managed to get a key from Dad. I, I came here for evidence. What kind of evidence, Arthur? Evidence that will put me in jail for theft, Mr. Keene, and free my father of a murder charge. You mean you're confessing to the theft of that money your father collected for charity? Yes, Mr. Keene. They wouldn't believe me at police headquarters. They thought I was just trying to shield my father the way he's been shielding me. But I'm going to prove it to them. Is your father also shielding you for murder, Arthur? No, Mr. Keene. I didn't kill that detective, Jim Ryan. But I'm afraid Dad thinks I did. And he's trying to take the blame for me. He found out I stole that money to make up for some bad checks I handed out. And then he tried to lead Detective Ryan to believe he stole the money. Then when Dad found out that Ryan had been murdered... He took the blame for that, too. I want to see. I, I've been a fool, Mr. Keene, a spineless idiot. Dad gave me a generous allowance, but I wanted more. I, I felt I had to impress someone to win her love. You mean Lola Slade? Yes. Maybe if I'd stuck with a girl like Helen Everett here, things would have worked out differently. You and Miss Everett were keeping company at one time, Arthur? Yes. But when I met Lola... You and I were never serious about each other, and you know it, Arthur. But, Helen, I... Let's get back to the stolen charity funds, Arthur. Uh, what kind of evidence did you expect to find in your father's private office? Well, a, a letter, maybe, from the credit company, Mr. Keene. They called me a few days ago and said that they were going to contact my father if I didn't make good on those bad checks. Helen Everett's already shown us a letter. However, there may be further evidence in that safe to support your father's innocence. Open the safe for us, Arthur. But I can't open it, Mr. Keene. I don't know the combination. Well, then how did you manage to steal the money, young fella? Well, the safe was wide open when I came into the office that day, Mr. Clancy. Was anyone else here at the time? No, Mr. Keene. I thought it was odd, too. It was only three in the afternoon. Well, Dad was evidently out on business, but Helen Everett... I was out to lunch. At three in the afternoon? Miss Everett, would you mind opening the safe for us? I don't know the combination either, Mr. Keene. One lie is enough to give the lie to many other things, Miss Everett. And we'll find out if you're telling the truth about the safe. But I am, I am. Mike, call Martin Cook at police headquarters and ask him if anyone else outside of himself knows the combination to his safe. I'll wager that he trusted Miss Everett with it, since he seemed to trust her with everything else. Mr. Keene, are you trying to say that I stole that money? No, of course not, Miss Everett. Arthur Cook here admits to the theft. But what I do say is this. You left that safe open so Arthur would be tempted to take those charity funds, knowing he needed the money badly. That's a lie. Miss Everett, have you ever been to the Hotel Metropole where Detective Ryan was murdered? No. Then what are you doing with these matches with the hotel's name on the cover? They're the weapons I took from your desk. Mr. King, now I see it all. Helen Everett tried to get even with me. She gave me the chance to take the money before she knew about Lola Slade. I'll and... jam this letter knife into the first one who moves. Stay where you are, all of you. That's all I was waiting for, Helen Everett. I wanted to see you give yourself away and prove my theory correct. You murdered Detective Ryan. While he was following Martin Cook, you were following him. He got as far as you've just gotten, Keene. He was just about to arrest Mr. Cook. And he would have included me as an accessory. But he got no further. And neither will you. Look out, Mr. Keene. Get oh. your hands off me. Oh. Let me go. Quiet, no. That's the last knife you've been throwing, lady. Good thing you caught her arm, Mike. That knife missed me by only an inch. Helen Everett had it all planned. She thought that if she murdered Detective Ryan, Arthur Cook would be held to the crime. And at the same time, she'd get rid of any evidence that she induced Arthur to steal that money. I loved him. I loved Arthur, and he turned me down for that painted fool of a showgirl. I was willing to steal for him, lie for him, cheat for him. When your love turned to hate, you were also ready to murder. I wondered why you forgave Lola Slade so quickly. As much as you hated Lola, 
It was Arthur you wanted to strike back at. Yes. And I'd do it again if I had the chance. You won't get that chance, Miss Everett, I assure you. All you can look forward to now is payment for your crimes in full. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of the murdered detective. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. And in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pains strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Dan Hummett. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the eccentric millionaire murder case. Ever suffer heartburn or upset stomach from acid indigestion? Safe new Bicidol mints, medically proven, quickly rid stomach of that blown-up feeling. Give longer-lasting relief than baking soda. Yes, hours of relief. Bicidol mints not only neutralize, but actually carry away excess stomach acids. Soothe irritated stomach lining. Let you sleep all night long when acid indigestion strikes. Carry new Bicidol mints for fast relief anywhere, anytime. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday at this same time. This is Larry Elliott saying goodbye for Mr. Keene and the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison and Kalinos, and many other dependable high-quality drug products. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>